Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were no clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around the house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen and number pad blinded me. Through squinted eyes, I could make out it was a 9 or something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one that was in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank god they did. They gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched on my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they had started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuts and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking into the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. Whoever it was in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noise had stopped. I started counting slowly and when I reached a thousand, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assumed in an attempt to find me. That was the last noise I heard after they stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn all over the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxes and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pin tube which the police said people often use to smoke meth with. So they think they had been watching my house for a while. I realized that they must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with my family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and emotion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I lived there another three years without incident. My boyfriend, who I live with, works as a teacher in a town about 15 minutes away by train. He gets home more or less at the same time every day, give or take an hour or so. I, on the other hand, work from home. In late January this year, we got in a pretty big fight about something stupid. I can't remember what it was by now, but it was one of those fights where we didn't speak to each other, text, or call, or anything the whole next day. So this afternoon I was lying in bed getting work done. It was a Tuesday and I'm pretty sure his last class finished at 1pm on Tuesdays, meaning he'd surely be home at 2.30. But around 1pm I heard the front door open and shut. I thought, huh, I guess he's home an hour early today. 
It was normal for him to skip his class every once in a while, so I didn't really think anything of it. In fact, I was mostly mentally preparing for the awkward post-fight, hey, how's it going conversation. So I continued to lie in bed and do my work and wait for him to come in and change his clothes. The bedroom door was closed and I had earplugs sort of half in, as I usually do when I'm working. But I could hear the heavy footsteps of him walking around the apartment, as he always does. If we hadn't been mid-fight and I wasn't so preoccupied with the awkwardness of all of it, I might have noticed it was strange how slow the footsteps were or how long he spent walking around the living room. But I was caught up in the dramatics of the fight and didn't think about it. I was just lying there, waiting, waiting, and waiting for him to finally come in. Finally, the bedroom door slowly opened just a few inches. I turned my head towards the door and prepared to give him a sort of awkward, we've been fighting for 24 hours, huh, smile. But the door didn't open more than a few inches. I looked and saw that it was a woman's hand with red nail polish on the doorknob. Whoever was there slowly closed the door just as they opened it, without entering the room. I jumped out of bed, ripped out my earplugs, and sort of froze there for a few seconds while thinking rapidly. My first thought, that was not my boyfriend. Then I thought, could that have been his mom, his sister, the landlady? For some reason, I concluded that surely it was his mom or sister. So I opened the bedroom door and walked into the living room. There wasn't anyone there, but the room smelled heavily of women's perfume. Then I came to my senses and realized, his mom and sister don't have keys and have never come before. The landlady has never entered without permission. This was a stranger. I went back into my bedroom and shut the door, now shaking heavily. There was a balcony connected to the bedroom so despite the cold January rain, I stood on the balcony and called my boyfriend. He picked up and I asked him if his mom or sister might have come over unannounced. He told me, no, don't move, I'm calling the police. The police were there in minutes and searched the whole apartment. Of course, nobody was there by this point. It was weird though. Nothing was missing from the apartment despite us keeping a jar full of money right in the entrance. Nothing was even touched. In fact, it seemed like the intruder came straight in the bedroom, saw my legs on the bed, panicked, and left. Plus, you can't open that big wooden front door without a key. Nevertheless, we demanded that the landlady change her locks. When she came to change them with her husband, she made a discovery. There was a square area by the keyhole that had been scratched away with something. The landlady said surely someone used tools to break into the apartment. I never got to meet the person who opened the door that day. And I hope I never do. Okay, this happened in 2016 when I was a 17 year old first year college student in film school. I lived alone in my first ever apartment. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates in the residence that needed to be opened through a code only the people who lived there knew, and my door had three different locks and it was right next to the university, so most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad had ever happened in the neighborhood before. I've always been very careful with locking the door when I leave my home. I always check it twice. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door but for some reason I couldn't get the key out of the lock. It was completely stuck so I went to get the caretaker of the building to help me but he wasn't there and I was getting late for class so I went to class with the key still in the lock. I took off the keychain first so it's not too noticeable. When I got home, the caretaker was back so he came to help me and we couldn't get it off for 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me the lock was damaged, but that I didn't necessarily need to change it if I only locked it once instead of twice. I just said okay and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in this building. Flash forward to two months later, I was taking out the trash one night around 11pm. While on the phone with my sister, I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash. Then I would take a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said, I always locked the door, even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I got back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked, which immediately alarmed me. So I went to the apartment and locked the door immediately, with three different types of locks. When you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you and the bathroom door immediately to your left. I left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower, turning his back to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier and I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment, all I could think of was the fact that I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out the window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution, except I'd live on the second floor, so I completely smashed my ankles in the landing. I started running in whichever way I could, and when I got a little bit further from the building, I looked back and a man was there, at my window, watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes. Either the man was going to jump and chase me, except I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a little further and called the police, who arrived in just 10 minutes because I lived close to the station. They pushed my door open and the man was there just sitting on my couch, holding a kitchen knife, waiting for me to come back, like he didn't think I would call the police. They arrested the guy and later told me he had already been arrested for attempted kidnapping and attempted murder. They also told me how everything had happened. Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students, so he got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard me telling my sister I was going to take a shower, which was why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. 
He apparently noticed me on my school campus and followed me to my home several times before succeeding to actually come in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone and the previous one was still on the table, so he thought I didn't have a phone with me to call the police. I don't live there anymore, but after that, to get into the building, we all needed identification proving we lived there. Building IDs were created and we had to scan them every time and it was the only way to go inside the building. Nothing really bad happened in the neighborhood after that. It's back to being very peaceful and friendly. A friend and I played after school hockey. It wasn't a popular sport so our games took place at another school which was incredibly far away and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The area didn't have any train stations so we relied on three different buses to get there and again to get home. The games usually took place pretty late and ended around 7 to 8 p.m. when it was dark. All the other girls in our team got picked up by their parents but we always busted together home. We didn't feel it was dangerous because there were two of us and being classic 12 year olds, we thought we were mature enough to be independent. Because we had to change buses three times and we lived so far away, by the time we got to our second bus stop it was usually pitch black. The second bus stop was desolate, far off from the school, in front of some kind of abandoned building and basically a bit creepy. The stop was small and wasn't sheltered, it was just a steel pole with a bus painted on the sign. On this particular night, it wasn't raining as well, so we felt extra miserable standing out in the cold. The buses in my area are also notoriously unreliable, so it wasn't unusual for us to wait an hour at this bus stop. That night it definitely felt like we had been waiting there for over an hour when a car pulled up in front of us. A woman was in it. She rolled down her window and asked us where we were going. I told her the suburb we lived in, which was an hour drive away, and she said she could give us a lift if we wanted. If it had been a man, I would have immediately been suspicious and liked it. But because she was a youngish woman, looked about 40, it didn't raise any red flags in my mind. I remember thinking that she must be understandably worried about two young girls standing out in the rain at night. I smiled and thanked her and said it was okay and we would wait for the bus. She hesitated and then drove away. But a few minutes later she came back and pulled up in front of us again. She told us her daughter was in at a play and that she was going there anyway to pick her up, so are we sure we didn't want to lift? My friend was almost about to get in, but I hesitated. Maybe thanks to my parents drilling me about stranger danger, and I said thank you, but it was alright, we'll wait. She was a bit pushier this time and asked us if we were sure quite a few times and mentioned her daughter again, but eventually she drove away. At this point, I think my intuition was telling me that it felt a bit weird that she hadn't mentioned her daughter earlier. Another few minutes later, she came back again. This time she said that she had just driven past our bus further down the road and then it obviously skipped our stop, so she offered to give us a lift to try to catch up to it. This sounded unlikely to me. By this point, I was super suspicious. I didn't really have any time to think, so it was just a bad gut feeling, rather than any logical reasoning. With all the politeness and smiles gone, I straight up just said no. I could tell my friend, who was about to get into her car before, was also starting to feel weird about it because she backed away from the road. The woman hesitated for a while. It lapsed into an awkward silence and I remember she just kept glancing at her back seat. I remember holding my hockey stick tight and playing in my brain how I was going to defend myself. It honestly felt like forever before she finally drove away. A few minutes later the bus came and I had never been so relieved in my life. By this point, we were absolutely soaked. To this day, I still don't know whether she was just worried, a good Samaritan, or a potential kidnapper. I flip between the two and honestly I can't decide. My friend also thinks it's a mystery, but we don't know if we were just being paranoid. This was around 2015 and I was living in Seattle. I worked in an office that allowed me to bring my dog to work, a 100 pound German Shepherd. He's a big sweetheart but looks quite scary to strangers. After work one day, I got on the bus home, which was around a 45 minute ride. I noticed someone stared at me and didn't think much of it. While it's unsettling to be watched, I've had my fair share of odd conversations on the bus and it wasn't out of the ordinary to encounter such weird behavior. I honestly don't remember too much about his appearance, but I do remember thinking he looked fairly normal and didn't seem high or drunk. My bus stop was on a busy street in a bit of a sketchier part of town, but it's not frequently trafficked. When we reached the stop, my dog and I set off on the short trek home, only a few blocks away. As I exited the bus, I noticed the man who had been watching me had exited too. Something was off about him. He seemed intent on keeping stride with me, trailing closely behind. I've heard advice somewhere in the past that you shouldn't go straight home if you're being followed. I'm sure that's situation specific and sometimes it's safer to be in your home, but nothing had happened besides having my personal space invaded and didn't feel immediately unsafe. So I opted not to leave this stranger straight to my door. I knew that my partner at the time wasn't at home, so I decided the best plan was to weave through my neighborhood for several blocks to try to lose him. I think a part of me was also wanting to be sure I was being followed at all or if this person just happened to be walking in the same direction. After several blocks, it became clear he was following me. I was weaving around erratically and he was walking the same path. Neither of us spoke to one another and I was becoming more and more frustrated that anyone would follow a woman home. The streets were quiet and I couldn't see anybody around who I could signal to for help. I don't think I would have been so surprised this was happening if I was alone and without my dog. 
I can't imagine anyone in their right mind following someone with a large German Shepherd. I started walking faster when I rounded a corner and quickly ducked into a hallway, hugging a duplex a block from my house. I was hoping the pathway would wrap around the house completely so I could get out of the line of sight of this person, but was met with a fence to my face and didn't have time to backtrack. I was ultimately cornered in this nook between a house, a fence, and a hedge. I crouched down with my dog and waited for the guy to pass us. I watched as the man strolled by the walkway, seemingly not noticing us at all. He didn't turn his head or even gaze in our direction. I decided that we'd stay there for a few minutes just to make sure he was gone. About three minutes went by. Just as I was thinking it was safe to head home, the man stepped into my line of sight. He didn't make eye contact with me, just as he had it in the first time he walked by. He was moving calmly and deliberately, and slowly came to a stop as soon as he was right in front of me, just off the curb. He was about two yards away, facing me, and not directly looking, with just a sidewalk and a grassy strip between us. I watched him as he started to unload his pockets. He had a number of metal objects he was taking out, placing them in a line. To this day, I'm not sure what they were, but I'm glad I didn't find out. At this point, I called 911 and told them what was happening, that someone was following me and showing erratic behavior. The cops made it there quickly, and as soon as they pulled up, the dispatcher advised me to get out of there. I hightailed it out of my hiding spot and took a non-direct path home since my house was technically in the line of sight of where I was crouched. I don't know what ended up happening with him, but fortunately never saw him again, and I don't know if he had malicious intent. This happened when both me and my friend Jay were 15. I was spending the night at his house, as I often did. It was a normal enough night, we watched movies, played a couple video games, and stayed up way too late. It was about 2am I think when we heard a loud banging coming from the front door. Luckily at the time we were in his kitchen at the back of the house, so no one could see us. We were spooked because there couldn't have been anyone at the door at this hour, but we figured it was just some drunk person and they'd go away soon enough. After 30 seconds, there was more banging on the door and yelling that neither of us could understand. It sounded like an adult man, and he sounded angry so we both were scared. He texted his mom, who we thought was upstairs, but she said that she had just left a bit before without saying anything. She did that often enough. She liked to go to her friend's houses in the middle of the night, so we didn't pay any attention or notice when she left. We didn't know what to do, as we were scared to call the police based off past experiences with cops in our small town being not the best. At this point, we turned off the kitchen light and we were ducked down on the ground. We heard the banging and yelling getting louder, and I decided to see who it was, if it was anyone we knew. I army crawled through the dining room, which was also dark and peeked through the door to the living room, which is where the front door was. There was also a huge window by the door that you can see right into the dining room though, so I was very careful not to be seen. I couldn't see any details of the man, but he looked to be about 6 feet tall and had gray hair. I crawled back to Jay and we quietly decided what to do. We heard the knocking stop, so we decided to wait a bit before seeing if it was safe. We also decided to go around the table in the dining room, in case he tried to come around back, which was where the kitchen was. After around 10 minutes of silence, we rock paper scissors for who had to check if he was there, and of course I lost. So I again army crawled to the dining room door. I saw the man staring through the window, hands cupped up against the glass. I made eye contact with him, and the moment he saw me, and I loudly said, causing my friend to panic and crawl behind me. I saw him pull out his phone, and he told me later that he was texting his mom to come home and save us. The man started yelling again, and this time we could make out a bit of more of what he said. It was mostly cussing, although I definitely heard the phrase, I'm gonna kill you, in there a couple times. I quickly looked past the man to see if any of the neighbors seemed to notice him, but no luck. I crawled back out of his sight and again discussed what to do with my friend. We decided to go into the basement for safety, which you could get to by moving the fridge. Confusing house I know, but it was really old and not meant for modern sized appliances. We pull out the fridge and get into the basement, feeling mostly safe but still terrified. I start having a panic attack, although I'm trying to hold it together best I can for Jay, who is also on the verge of a panic attack. We hear a gunshot and shattering glass from above us, and I cover my mouth so I don't scream. Jay and I look at each other, terrified. We hear loud footsteps and yelling above us, the man asking where we went. We hear him going upstairs and run around up there for a bit. He eventually comes back down and starts turning over our furniture, I'm assuming to find us. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes. Jay's mom pulls into the driveway, which scares the guy as he runs out the back door in the kitchen. Jay and I get out of the basement and run to greet his mom, never happier to see her. She was shocked by the state of the house and hugged us, happy that we were safe and scared by how close we were to being hurt. We were all scared after that. After that night they had better security installed, and we went over safety protocol if anything ever happened again. Luckily it hasn't happened again yet, and I hope it never will. I work at a convenience store. I've had some creepy customers come in before, but this one was a little more disturbing. If it weren't for what had been said and done, I don't think this would have been that bad. I normally work third shift, which is around 4pm to around 12am, and I'm by myself for the last 4 hours of my shift. 
This man had come in earlier that day and was acting odd, jittery, chewing at his lip constantly, fumbling with his debit card, to the point I did everything for him except putting the pen in. Fast forward to around 10.30pm. I'm sweeping the floors as I'm supposed to do every night when the man entered. He approached my register and asked him what he needed. Hey, can I have one of those lighters? I pick one up and go to scan it, but he tells me that he doesn't have any money. I tell him he can't have it and he glares at me before leaving. A man was in line behind him, and the entire time I was scanning his things, the lighter guy was staring at me through the window right next to my register. He eventually walks off, and the man jokes about the creepy guy asking for a lighter when the man in line didn't even have his with him. He tells me to be safe, then walks out to the gas station pumps. I start sweeping again, but when I turn around and move a small crate out of the way, the creepy guy is staring at me again, just watching me work. I quickly make my way to the back room to make mop water so I could get away from him for a second. He stayed there for a solid 5 minutes before stalking off again. I grabbed a random receipt as a cover and basically bolted to the man at the gas pumps. I got close and asked if he was in a hurry to go anywhere. I told him that the creepy lighter guy was still hanging around and that it was really freaking me out. He promises me that he didn't plan on actually leaving after getting gas. At this point, I thought it wouldn't take up too much of his time, since we both thought the man was already wandering away from the store. Unfortunately, he went back toward the store a few seconds later. Soon, an older woman comes in and I warn her about the creepy guy. She asked what I was talking about and I subtly nod in his direction. Mind you, still hanging around my window. She looks a little disturbed, leaning in and whispering, What does he want? I explained that he wanted a lighter, but he didn't have any money so I didn't give him one. I told her to be careful and she quickly told me to worry more about myself since I was at the store alone. She left, and I saw the creepy guy approach the window again. Thankfully, he didn't look in, just hung around it like he was waiting for someone. After a while, a daughter of a family friend comes in with her girlfriend, and we quietly make small talk. Like the last woman, I warned them that the lighter guy was still roaming around and he could be dangerous. Before they get to tell me anything, a woman was talking with the guy from the gas pumps, spotted them while scanning family friend's items, and hurried in and told me to call the cops. Obviously, not familiar with the area I worked in and hearing three different people telling me what numbers to call, I was shaking and in near tears. My family friend said she would call while I calmed down. Another girl had run out at this point, and I don't blame her. Family friend's girlfriend told me that lighter guy threatened to throw rocks through the window and hurt slash rob me. After about three minutes of pacing and trying not to cry, I saw my mom's truck pull in. I bolted to her, telling her what was going on. She calmed down and walks me back to the entrance. As this happened, creepy guy had climbed the hill and crossed the street to Bojangles and sat near the front door. The cops arrived. The man from the pumps gave a statement, I gave mine. And finally, family friend gave hers, which included the threats. From what was said, he was about to break into my car. The man that stayed with me stopped him, but that didn't stop the creep from roaming still. After we talked to the cops, they sped to Bojangles and confronted the lighter guy. After arguing, a quit pat down and more arguing, the man was put in the back of the cop car. Lighter guy, I knew you were probably on something, but please, let's not meet ever again. To set this story, I bike 5 miles one day, 5 days a week to my job, and I've been for 8 months. I honestly love it. It forces me to get exercise, and it's cheap transportation. I take the main road with a lot of traffic, so I've never felt unsafe. I also only ride on the sidewalk, since it's safer. One day, coming home, I was passing by an area with a lot of construction going on. To give you a better visual, I ride on the sidewalk along a busy road. As I'm biking, I see a man in a black pickup truck parked as if he's about to pull out of the area, but he's waiting for a spot to open in traffic. He then sees me and reverses to let me by. I remember thinking, oh great, he's letting me by, and I wouldn't have to ride around behind his car to get to the other side. But as I'm getting closer, he does a stop motion with his hand, and he's wearing a safety vest, so I assume he works there, and there might be a problem up ahead, like a pothole, etc., so I stop. He spoke with authority like as if he's an officer stopping me or something and asked if I bike for transport or leisure. I was a little confused since that's a weird question but I tell him for transport, I bike to my job. He then says, do you bike for leisure? I'm asking because I bought a bike and I'm looking for a riding buddy. I'm not freaking out or anything. I feel a little calm since there are a bunch of cars passing by us so we're not secluded but I don't know this man. He's a complete stranger and I was under the impression he worked there and was stopping me for something important. I tell him not really because I'm too tired on my days off and use them to get errands and stuff done. He says, oh I get it. Well there's a bike marathon happening soon if you want to go with me. I'm Shane by the way. What's your name? I tell him my name and say, oh I don't know, I might be busy then. I'm a little awkward in social situations with people I don't know and this whole interaction was just off so I don't really know what to say. He changes the subject and starts looking at my bike. 
He points at it and asks if it's a hybrid. I say yes, and he says can I see it, and starts getting out of his car. This is where it starts getting weird. He tells me he's seen me riding before and I thought I was cute. He's also looking at my bike and commenting on it and saying stuff like, oh that's nice, it's aluminum, and I'm just feeling weird on the inside. I'm also sitting on my bike ready to get the f out of there. He then asks if I have a boyfriend and I tell him yes I do. He lets out a big groan and says, oh man really? Because if we go biking together, it would be kind of a date thing. I tell him yeah sorry and he goes, are you sure? Are you ready to kick him to the curb or what? I just want to get out of here at this point, but he parked his car literally in front of the sidewalk so it wouldn't be that easy to speed by him. He seemed upset and kept asking if I'm sure I have one and how long we've been together. I said, a couple years. Well, I'm crunched for time and I have to go, bye, and sped off. After that, I had a mini vacation and was off for five days after that, but now I'm back to riding to work again and I haven't seen him since. This probably happened maybe three or four weeks ago. So creepy older man who tricked me and blocked me on my bike, let's not ever meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This was back in 2014. I moved off campus and into a really nice part of town. I was a junior in college and this was my first time living on my own. Campus was only two miles away, so I would often walk back home from campus. I would take the bus or catch a ride with a friend to campus. I walked home because my schedule ending never quite matched up with the bus schedule and my friend finished two hours before my daily schedule did. I was used to walking the two miles to my apartment. I never thought anything of it because I walked through the busy area of my town, along the second main road. So there were always people around. My apartment was actually a stone throw from the most popular frozen custard shop in the area. Every night the parking lot would be packed. So, I'm walking home like usual. I get to the frozen custard shop and notice there's a lot of people tonight. It was just something I always noticed and paid attention to. All of a sudden this huge red truck pulls up beside me. I'm cut off guard because I have headphones in. It takes about 30 minutes to an hour to walk home, so I'm normally listening to music or talking on the phone. I stop and take my headphones out and look at the truck. This man dressed like a country singer was sitting in the driver's seat. He looks at me and asks where the mall is. I put him in the direction to the mall. He said, I've been down that way. I'm a photographer and I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot at a bar behind the mall. I've lived in this town going on three years now. I know where all the bars are located. Makes it easy when all of them are on the same street. I explained to him, there's no bars by the mall. They're all on Philly Street. He continued to insist on a bar being behind the mall. All of a sudden he just changes. He looked at me and asked me to step back. So I did. He looked me over and asked how tall I was. I told him 5 foot 7. He then asked me, I'm doing that photo shoot. Would you like to be a model for it? I told him I don't like getting my photos taken. He insisted, telling me I was beautiful and would look great. Almost like he's given up on the tactic, he moves to another. He then asked me where I live. I told him not far. He wanted more info. I pointed in the vague vicinity in my apartment, making a point not to actually point at it. This dude then asked me if I wanted a ride. I told him no, it's not far, I'll be fine. He kept insisting I let him give me a ride home. I kept telling him no, stepping farther away from his truck. He then out of nowhere asked me how he could get to the mall. I told him, go down this road, at the light turn left. The mall will be on your left. He thanked me and started to drive off. I walked slowly to my apartment. I watched his truck get to the light. Instead of turning left like I said, he went straight. Going straight leads into a small residential area that you need to know this town well to get through. I lived in that town from 2012 to 2017 and still can't figure my way through that area. I made sure that that truck was completely out of sight before I hightailed it to my apartment and locked the door. My dog didn't quite understand what was going on. All he really knew was he had to go to the bathroom pretty bad. I tried to distract him for 5 or 10 minutes to make sure the coast was clear. My heart sunk when I did finally take him out. The same red truck was parked near the parking lot behind my apartment building. The truck didn't belong there. I'm one that memorizes all the vehicles that are normal for the area. No one had a red truck like that. I went back in and texted people describing the man and the truck to them in case something happened to me. I did not go back out for hours. When I did, the truck was gone. I never saw the man or the truck ever again. To the man who probably tried to abduct me in front of the most popular venue in town on my way home, I hope I never see you again. Okay, before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa, for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs. Two Sharpays, two German short hair pointers, and two Dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, maid, and gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them. It's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. 
For the story, our DW is Ellie and our gardener is Vince. So, this happened in 2007 when I was just 9 years old. My older brother who was 10 and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad surprised us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night, due to security reasons, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter Anne, who was like an older sister to us, 18 years old, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was. That's when I noticed it too. Sure, they'd bark, but it was usually the dog shuns that yapped, with the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dogs' incessant barking and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either because my brother asked to investigate with them and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling and going nuts at a dark corner behind our in the ground swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that our garden beyond our pool hits like a slight decline. So we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad had noticed how the lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it worked the other night. Either way, my dad said he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of this and because of how out of the character the dogs were acting. He called after them, they'd usually come running, but tonight, they all just seemed to look at him, then turn back around and continue to go crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come out with him because of this off feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dogs seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out in the view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched the steps and as he put two and two together, he was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and an avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four of the men in balaclavas all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. That he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. My dad said something came over him before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. Assuming my dad couldn't understand, it's not common for white people to speak it, but my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said, in Zulu, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this f grab what we can, and go. The others seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge. They continued to say how he can't go back to jail again, and they need to get the f out of there before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller scared guy started freaking out all the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP or else they'd get caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan slowly turning to as a third guy had put it. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn to dart to the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm mid-ran and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly I know, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quick as possible without even thinking. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything. When my dad rushed to the bedroom door, slammed it shut and told us to go upstairs into the attic, quote unquote, there's five guys outside with guns, they're here to hurt us, get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel not too far behind. We sat there in darkness and silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just wanting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed saying she didn't have a phone, neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police and I kid you not, they asked where we live, we explained and they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry, click, the line goes dead. We're now not only ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. 
My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes. He didn't close the veranda door, and what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us whatever we hear, do not come downstairs. To stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad to not leave us, but he tells us he has to go get Eli and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. Anne's understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They sit away and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up from the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was just my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, no one dared to speak. The dog seemed to have calmed down considerably, but we were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was just the security company, and sure enough, it was. He opened up and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police, and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there was actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed over. We got an electric fence shortly after, so there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and can manipulate the situation to benefit us. This takes place in the early 80s. I grew up in the suburbs in a very friendly townhouse complex. We all knew our neighbors. My first friends were the kids that lived in other townhouses. To describe my home, all townhomes are attached. They're also very tall and slender. I had six flights of stairs to go from the basement to the bedrooms on the top floor. We had a tiny driveway, and then there was the small roadway. On the other side was a raised flower bed that ran the length of the side of the townhouse wall across the street. The most important thing was a very bright street light in the middle of the planter. It shined ominously right into our front windows at night, and it had enough light to illuminate shapes above the kitchen counter on the third floor kitchen, just the top part of bodies. You didn't need to turn on the kitchen lights at night if you needed to get something. One night I had a sleepover with my friend who lived diagonal to me. Us scouts had stayed up late in which of the kitchen for snacks. I peered out into the street to see an unfamiliar guy walking by on the roadway. There was no sidewalks. I noted to my pal that there was a weirdo walking by because he didn't seem right. He was tall and lanky with long 80s hair. With our familiarity with people in the neighborhood, we didn't recognize him. Our complex roadway did lead to a street, but it wasn't used as a shortcut because it was a long way to get around the neighborhood, so you didn't see others often, especially at night. As soon as I commented to Weirdo, he walked by our house. Only a couple of minutes later, he walked by again, going in the direction he came on the roadway. This time, we saw him out of the corners of our eyes coming along. Being scared kids, we immediately ducked as we were visible to the street. Up until then, we didn't think anything more of it but our instincts told us to hide, so we did. My friend said we were overreacting after a few minutes being crouched down, so we carefully peered over the counter. Weirdo hadn't walked by. He was now standing in front of the flower planter looking up at our house. To this day, I remember that bright street light illuminating him from behind very ominously. He looked like a horror film killer come to life. We hit the floor again thoroughly freaked out. I don't know how long we were there for. I can only hear the sound of our breathing for some time, until I thought I heard the squeak of the garage door handle. It was one of those old rusty ones that opened outward. I thought I was dreaming until I heard for the second time that rusty handle squeak. He was trying to get in now. My friend and I were frozen in fear. Luckily, my dad always locked the garage. The squeaking stopped. Even though my friend and I could have run upstairs or shut it to my parents, we were rooted on the spot thinking if we moved he'd get us somehow. We thought that was it as it was suddenly quiet. But a few minutes later I heard the swoosh of the screen door and telltale sound of the front door handle being pressed down. The first screen door was never locked, but thank god the wooden door always was. The noise repeated a few times. The metal scratching of the screen door hinge and the click of the front door latch. I wanted to piss my pants and my friend looked like crying. Again, we were too silly enough to move or do anything to help ourselves. We just shook in terror and hoped he'd go away. He stopped trying to get in after about 5 minutes and all we heard after that was silence. About 8 minutes later on the kitchen floor we moved to stand up. I thought we were still pretty crouched down and invisible. That wasn't the case. This time we heard a clear voice. The other kitchen window near the pantry had its screen window open. Hey, I'm thirsty. 
Can I get a glass of water? My friend and I stared at each other in disbelief. He was still there. We didn't move, but someone had to eventually. My friend being the braver one decided to peek out the screen window while trying not to be seen. He must have heard her. I know you're there. Come on and let me in. I won't hurt you. This was the moment we decided to flee up those two flights of stairs to my bedroom. I always had an active imagination like most kids. I really hated that my bedroom was the very first one at the top of my stairs. My parents were at the back. Therefore, in mind, I would be the first one to be murdered if someone broke in, and that fear was certainly tenfold that very night. My friend and I hunkered down on my bed, deep under the covers, shaking. We did not sleep at all, waiting for the click of a door or worse. We thought we heard him try again, but at that point we weren't sure if we were hearing things. Until the day I moved out, I never really felt totally comfortable in my bedroom ever again. I'm a 21 year old female and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly because it was the first time I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14, I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chautauqua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone here. If you thought you would get away with something, then be prepared to have your ear chewed off by the time you get home. There was this one day though, it was a cold winter day and school unfortunately was still open so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as I was used to walking with my older sister to school since she knew the routes better than me. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day from school, but after that day, I learned that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mom came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go today. Being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friend's parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long while, then told me to make sure I pay attention to cars. I got hit by a car and almost died when I was 9, so the worry that showed on her face was well warranted. I hurriedly nodded and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly dally, so she was always in a rush to get to school early, but seeing as it was just me, I thought it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was on the left side of the road, and even made funny looking snowballs to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school I noticed a white van falling behind me. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down and making another snowball, I wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself I was being stupid, but continued more hurriedly to school. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was on school grounds that it drove away fast by me. I thought that would be the end of it, but throughout the day when I would stare out the window, the van would be there. I assumed that it never really left, just parked. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. The van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass, I knew they could see me. It was now the end of the day and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mom because she was at work and my sister was homesick. I had to suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with the group of kids, but most of them were car riders and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by that van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with a smiley emoji sticker. I tried to stay calm and walk past in, but once I heard the van door slightly click open, I ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly inside of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look at my face and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there until my brother got home. Me and my sister don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing. Whoever you are that attempted to kin at me and do God knows what else, let's not ever meet again. When I was 20 years old, so six years ago, I worked as a delivery girl for a pretty popular pizzeria in my area. Initially, I worked the late morning to mid afternoon shift, but when the guy who delivered for the night shift ended up getting fired due to him losing his license because of a DUI, I was placed on the night shift since my boss hired a family friend who could only work my shift for whatever reason. I really didn't want this shift because you never know if people who order late at night actually want a pizza or if they have other intentions in mind. Unfortunately, my boss isn't the nicest of people and essentially told me if I wasn't willing to work the night shift, I was fired. I wasn't exactly in a position where I could be out of work, albeit temporarily, so I reluctantly worked the shift. The first month of this shift, I went by without any issues. 
until I had to deliver a pizza to a house that just barely made our delivery radius. I punched it in on my GPS, and the house was located in a pretty suburban part of the city. I arrive and it's about 11pm. The block was extremely quiet, decently lit, and mostly littered with modern townhouses, but the house I delivered to was a duplex. I ring the doorbell and wait for about 30 seconds. No answer. I ring it again and wait another 30 seconds. Still no answer. I'm standing there getting pretty nervous that something's about to go down, but thankfully a man opens the door. He looked like he was in his late 40s. He was pretty tall, maybe a little over 6 foot, and he was very skinny. I tell him his pizza is here and he just stands there staring at me. I asked him if he was okay and he responded by saying, Yeah, I'm fine, sorry. I got off work not too long ago and I'm just zoning out a bit. Fair enough, I suppose. He hands me the money. I hand him the pizza and as I'm making change, he says, You're really beautiful, you know that? Not really thinking too much into it, I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his change. I said goodnight and he did too. I walked back to my car and finished my deliveries for the night. A few days later, I get a delivery order to the same place. I head over there around the same time as last time and ring the doorbell. He answers the door very excitedly and says, Hey, it's you again. How are you? I told him I was tired and I can't wait to go home to which he chuckled and said, I know that feeling pretty well, as he was pulling out his wallet. As he's counting his money, he asked me what my name is. Being kinda tired at this point and not really thinking straight, I stupidly told him my name. As I'm making a change, he asked if he could have my number, as he'd love to hang out with someone as gorgeous as I am. I've literally only met this guy like twice to deliver a pizza. I had no idea who this guy was, and I'm positive he barely knew who I was as well. Another thing to mention is I looked way younger than I was at that time. I was told by numerous people that I still looked like I was 15, and I was hoping he thought differently as he wasn't hitting on what he thought was a teenager. I'm just standing there awkwardly for a few seconds before I muster out, Sorry, I have a boyfriend. He gets upset and says, Oh, okay, I see. We stand there in silence before I tell him to have a good night, and walk back to my car. He says nothing and still stands at the doorway, staring at me, until he finally went back inside once I started my car. I got a pretty creepy vibe from this guy, and even brought it up to my co-workers, and they agreed it was pretty creepy. Except for my boss, who overheard everything and claimed I was making up stories and trying to gain sympathy for having to take the shift. A week later as I'm working the night shift, we get an order from the same guy again and this is when it finally hits the fan. I arrive at the house at around 10.30pm, and keep in mind that from my perspective on the road, it didn't look like a single light in the house was on. I get out of my car and I walk to the front door with the pizza box in my arms. As I'm approaching the door, it quickly swings open to reveal the man, except this time, he was wearing a suit and I jumped back. He laughs and said, Sorry if I scared you. I saw you out on the window, and I figured if I just opened the door now, so you wouldn't have to ring the bell. I was getting scared because as I mentioned before, there were no lights on in the house. So he was sitting in the dark this whole time. And if so, why? I nervously laugh and say, it's okay. He asked me if I liked his suit, which I said yes. He then asked me, would you like to go on a date with me tonight? I once again tell him I have a boyfriend, to which he chuckles, gets close to me and says, there's no way a girl your age is in a serious relationship. You should really go on a date with me. He grabs the pizza box from me and throws it to the side and grabs me by my arms hard. I'm officially sweating bullets at this point and now trying to cry from the fear that was overwhelming me. I start pleading with him, dude please, I just want to go home, I don't want to go on a date tonight. He just stares at me with the most sinister look I've ever seen on someone's face and says, I don't care, get inside now, we're gonna have a good time. He starts trying to pull me to the house and I'm trying to resist as hard as I can. After a bit of struggling he lets go of one of my arms and starts grabbing something out of his pocket which I presumed was a knife. I did something to this day that I'm still thankful worked as he was doing that. I used my free arm to punch him as hard as I could in the stomach. This stuns me for a few seconds and as he loosened his grip on me, allowed me to break free. I quickly run to my car and as I get in he runs at me and tries pulling me out of the car, holding the knife in the other arm and just starts yelling. I grab a half empty soda bottle I had in the cup holder and throw it and luckily it hits his head and he lets me go. I slam on the door and then all of a sudden he jumps right on the hood of my car and starts scratching and banging on my windshield with his knife. I put the car in reverse and quickly back out of the spot and quickly reverse down the road with him desperately trying to hold on. He's banging on my hood screaming, stop the car. I turn onto the next road as swiftly as possible and luckily, he falls off the hood of my car. I slammed the gas as hard as I could to get away from him as far as I could. In my panicked state, I drove a couple blocks down the street and kept making turn after turn onto other side blocks as I feared I was being followed. Eventually, I reached a red light and I slammed on the brakes and just sat at the intersection frozen from what had just happened. I began crying and violently shaking as I was just sitting there. It dawned on me that I came so close to losing my life and I couldn't help but feel like I shouldn't have been alive. Once the light turned green, I pulled over to the side and just sat there crying. 
Eventually, I get the energy to drive back to the pizzeria, and almost immediately after I walk in, my coworker knew something was wrong after seeing me. I practically broke down in front of him, and everyone else came to the front wondering what was going on. I fought my tears, and explained everything that just happened. My coworker comforted me, and my boss surprised me, and began apologizing profusely for what had happened and for putting me on the night shift. He took me into the office and handed me the phone to call the cops. They arrived at the store, and I gave them my statement, as well as taking pictures of any marks on myself, as well as scratches on my car for the encounter as evidence. My coworker followed behind me as I drove home and I collapsed on my bed and strangely enough, I managed to fall asleep. I quit my job the next day and luckily a friend of mine managed to hook me up with a new job at her clothing store. As far as the psycho goes, two days later I received an update from the police. The entire duplex is owned by the guy's brother who lived on the right side with his wife and the psycho lived on the left side of the duplex. I learned that he had been in and out of jail constantly at first for robberies and assaults. He had been released from jail about five months ago apparently. When they arrived at the house, he was long gone and his family had no idea where he ran off to, but the police insisted they would find him. And indeed they did, albeit not alive. I spent the next two months in fear that he would find me and finish what he had in mind, but the police contacted me and updated me on the case. Apparently, he fled to another city nearby and attempted to kidnap a teenager walking alone late at night on the street. Luckily, somebody happened to be looking out the window at the right time, called the cops, and the police caught him by trying to force her into his car. He manages to flee and the police chase after him. He blew a red light near a busy boulevard and a van slammed right into the driver's side of his car. By some sort of miracle, the driver of the van only sustained minor injuries while the psycho succumbed to his wounds long before the ambulance even arrived. I thanked the officers for everything they did and for informing me, so I walked out of the station. I walk down the street and I light up a cigarette as I'm taking in everything that I'd just been told. I don't wish death on people, but after hearing about his death, I felt relieved. I felt relieved that he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I was relieved that I wouldn't have to ever encounter him again and that I wouldn't have to go through with charging him and reliving what happened that night. Who knows where I'd be if he managed to pull me into his house. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time when we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending that we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie on the same name that just came out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and to camp little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night, we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we would see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our standby me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a heck of a mix. Soon, we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came, we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, and so I gave it a screw it, and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit just to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from up top of the short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, 
we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be any clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer, just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it and it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews in a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up just to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rake up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and just talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be a candle light from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the crap out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something, and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get the heck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't really make them out very well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill, and they were moving erratically like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town that was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like any kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the most creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. So, this happened about five years ago while I was nine months pregnant. I was Christmas shopping at the mall with my then seven and 15 year old daughters one Saturday night in a very safe city with very low crime rate. There was an Applebee's connected to the mall, and we ended our shopping pretty late, and the mall's stores were starting to close, so I took my kids to the connected Applebee's for a late dinner. We finished up eating at about 10pm to leave out the Applebee's entrance into the practically deserted parking lot with shopping bags in tow. As we got to the car, I was in the middle of maneuvering the shopping bags in my arms to find my keys, when a 50 ish year old looking guy starts walking up from somewhere in the parking lot with shaggy gray and white hair and a faded flannel shirt and old jeans. I noticed him briskly approaching when he was about 40 feet away and he said, Give me all your money now. My blood ran cold and I stared at him owlishly and shakingly said, What? 
He then said he was just kidding and came up and stood right next to my daughters, who were standing on the other side of the car, waiting for me to unlock the door to let them in. He then starts making small talk with me and my girls. He's asking things like if they were being good girls for Santa, how old they were, if we got all of our Christmas shopping done, what kind of things did we get, etc. He didn't seem drunk, high, slow, or anything at all. He was very coherent and seemed sound of mind. Mind you, I was a heavily pregnant woman, alone with my two daughters in a mostly deserted parking lot at 10 o'clock at night. I was being approached by a stranger who came and stood right next to my kids on the other side of the car, just shooting the breeze, talking to me and my kids with his hands in his pockets and occasionally looking over his shoulder. I didn't want to aggravate him, so I was politely conversing with him and trying to look calm and nonchalant while trying to disguise my frantic hands digging inside of my giant purse for my car keys. This exchange went on for about a couple of minutes while he periodically kept looking over his shoulder. I was silently panicking and trying to politely keep the situation from escalating by calmly and nonchalantly talking to him while also trying to in vain to find my car keys to get us out of there. They were in there hiding good. I felt that at any moment he was going to pull a knife or gun or rob me and my kids were right next to him, away from their mother on the other side of the car and I couldn't find my car keys to get my kids into the safety of the car. He kept trying to engage them in conversation, and I could see that my oldest daughter was a little weirded out. She kept glancing at me to gauge my assessment and reaction to the situation. Being that he was only talking and acting friendly, and I was doing my best to stay calm, they were oblivious to the alarming situation we were all in. And being 9 months pregnant, and that I was no match for this full grown man, especially if he was hiding a weapon on him. While still desperately digging for my keys, I tried to politely give him hints that the conversation was over by saying things like, it was nice chatting with you, but I gotta get these kids to bed, and it was nice meeting you, and telling my girls to say that it was nice meeting him too. My polite attempts to get this guy to leave wasn't working because he kept sidestepping my attempts and asking them what their favorite school subjects are and how nice young ladies they were, etc. While I was struggling with the shopping bags and digging in my giant cluttered purse for my car keys, my outgoing 7 year old was completely oblivious to how not okay the situation was because he was being friendly and because of the whole I'm with mommy so I'm safe child mentality. So she started to talk about what she picked out for dad for Christmas and started enthusiastically talking about kid stuff and asking him if he knew what Minecraft was etc and keeping this creep from leaving us alone by keeping him engaged in conversation. They didn't realize that I was becoming desperate to get them out of there. Then I suddenly felt this sinking feeling of dread when I realized that I may have lost my car keys and them all and that we were stuck outside with this strange man who kept looking over his shoulders and was showing no signs of walking away, and I was thinking that he was waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. All he had to do was grab one of my girls and threaten their life, knowing it would make me do whatever he wanted as long as he wouldn't hurt them. I started to feel my adrenaline start to spike, and my heart and stomach started doing flip-flops, and I felt like at any moment something was about to go down, as the gravity of realizing that there were no other people or witnesses around and that they were totally alone with him at that moment, the odds were stacked against us and that he has his chance. He all of a sudden was all like, okay, it was nice talking to you, see you later, and walked off in the same direction as which he came. It wasn't until then, I found my car keys and locked the car and told my kids to get in fast, and I got in too, and locked the doors and started the car and drove out of there. My 15 year old lightheartedly and jokingly said, okay, that was weird, and laughed. I was overwhelmed with relief and then I was confused over what just happened. I thought to myself, why the heck would a guy of seemingly sound mind think it was totally acceptable to go out of his way just to approach a woman and her kids in a deserted parking lot late at night just to chit chat. But being that nothing bad happened, I brushed it off and joked about it too. When we got home, my husband greeted us and asked us how shopping went and I said it went well and my 15 year old told him what happened in the parking lot and how weird it was and was kinda joking about it. I started joking too saying how I was mentally having a panic attack while trying to look calm and I started making fun of myself by telling my husband how I was attempting to inconspicuously rummage through my purse to find my car keys. My husband went completely white and I acknowledged his horrified look of alarm and I assured him that albeit creepy, the guy was talking and eventually left on his own. Now, my father-in-law is a retired sheriff deputy and my husband went through police academy training after graduating high school. He decided to go to business school instead of becoming a cop. And being that the knowledge he gained from that, plus growing up with a cop from my dad, I found out why my husband looked absolutely horrified when I told him about the details. What my husband told me completely rattled me to the bone. My husband told me that he was 100% sure the reason why that guy was hanging around us and chit chatting was because he was waiting for me to unlock my car. And the reason why he was standing next to our kids was because once I unlocked the car and the kids started to get inside, he was most likely going to force himself into the car with the kids and hold a knife or gun to them to gain leverage on me to force me to cooperate, knowing that I wouldn't abandon my kids. 
which would force me to get into the car with him and then do whatever he wanted me to do, which most likely would be to drive to a remote location to do whatever knows what. And being that he wasn't wearing a mask, suggests that his intentions were to also leave no witnesses to identify him. I then remembered that he was positioned by the backseat passenger door where my 7 year old was, standing by waiting to get in. My husband then told me that the most likely reason why the guy ended up leaving was because it took so long for me to find my keys and the longer it took, the more anxious and spooked it made him. And that whole time, me trying to search for my car keys in my purse saved me from potentially being abducted. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I recently discovered this sub and immediately thought of this experience that happened to me two summers ago while I was cat sitting and house sitting for an older couple I met in a French class I was taking. This couple lived near a busy corner with a bookshop, coffee shop, a grocery store, and a movie theater in a nice neighborhood of a big city. For all these reasons and more, I was pretty excited to house sit there. My own apartment, where I lived with my boyfriend and my own cat, was about a 10 minute drive to 40 minute walk further up the street in a quiet, residential area with nothing much around it. Now, my own cat is vocal and super social. Because of this, we try never to leave him alone at night because he will literally cry for us all night. We're always slightly paranoid that he's going to get us evicted due to noise complaints from neighbors. We lived on the top floor and you could literally hear him crying from the bottom floor and outside if the door to the building is open. So my boyfriend and I decided that he should stay at the apartment with our cat while I was house sitting. My boyfriend drops me off at the house and I settle in with my luggage. Look around the surprisingly large three story house and then decide to walk over to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next few days. As I'm walking home with my bag of groceries, I notice this man, extremely tall and gaunt, with a head full of long, shaggy hair, walking parallel across the street watching me. I'm only about two houses away from the place where I'm staying, so I sit down on the edge of the wall as though I'm taking a break and call my mom, trying to keep an eye on him surreptitiously from the corner of my eye. This man stops behind a pole across the street and continues to watch me. I tell my mom this guy seems to think that a pole hides him from my view, but that I can see him from there, standing still as a statue, just watching me. I don't want him to know where I'm staying, so we continue chatting and eventually, I turn my full gaze on the man to let him know that I see him watching me. For a moment he doesn't react at all, then he just sort of meanders on down the small street and I watch him turn the corner and disappear from my view. I tell my mom and gather my groceries and walk cautiously down the street, keeping an eye out for him as I near the place I'm house sitting and don't see him. I dart in through the back door next to the garage as quickly as I can and breathe a sigh of relief once I'm inside. I tell my mom everything's good and I put away the groceries and forget about the entire incident. The couple has a beautiful library, so I continually spend the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening just perusing their walls of books and selecting a few to bring upstairs to the guest bedroom on the third floor. I'm playing some music and just enjoying the quiet downtime all to myself. I finally get sleepy, text my boyfriend goodnight, and fall asleep. I wake up shortly thereafter, after a terrifyingly realistic dream that this gaunt man has walked into the room, trailing his fingertips along my body. The room is dark, all the window blinds shut, and my body goes completely still. Half positive that it wasn't a dream, and that he had somehow broken in, it was waiting in the shadow. I quietly reach underneath my pillowcase for my phone, I always keep my phone tucked under my pillow, and it's not there. My panic rises, and my mind overreacts. He's here and he's playing a game with me. He took my phone. He's somewhere in the house. I desperately begin to pat around my bed as quietly as possible, searching beneath the other pillow for my phone. Not there. I think, surely he'll hear me if I get out of my bed to look. But I suddenly remember that I left my laptop next to me on the bed and I open it, quickly sending text after text to my boyfriend through iMessage until he wakes up. I tell him I can't find my phone, had a bad dream, and I'm super anxious. With him awake and responding, I get the courage to flip on the lamp and get out of bed. I search around the floor, thinking my phone must have fallen while I was sleeping. Nope, not on the floor. Finally, as I search the bed frantically, I find it atop the covers on the other side of the bed. Weird, but I suppose I must have knocked it across the bed or something. I don't sleep well the rest of the night, hearing noises from across the three floors of the creaky stairs and house, thinking anyone could break in through the patio door across from my room. All they'd have to do is get to the balcony and wake up the next morning exhausted. The next day, I'm sitting in the living room at their piano practicing. I'm an opera singer, and I was mostly excited about this house sitting because I'd get the chance to sing without worrying about apartment neighbors complaining, with the blinds open. There are some kids riding their bikes. 
neighbors with dogs, the usual. I'm enjoying my afternoon when I notice there's an odd, run-down, dilapidated, dark house nearly diagonal to this one, which doesn't fit in at all with the otherwise nice neighborhood. Gaunt Man walks out of it and sits on the porch. My stomach drops. I call my boyfriend and tell him that the creepy guy apparently lives across the street. I shut the blinds facing that way so that he can't see me and retreat to the other side of the house with the kitchen. I spend the rest of the day chilling, convincing myself that I'm overreacting, that everything is fine and I don't need to worry. Nonetheless, come nightfall, the house seems just way too large, with too many entrances and the bottom floor is so far away that I worry the noise wouldn't carry up to the top floor if someone did break in. Naturally, I cannot sleep at all. I end up retrieving a knife from the kitchen and stashing it under my pillow. Noises keep me up. Creaks, odd sounds. Around 11pm, I call my boyfriend and beg him to come stay with me, assuring him that our cat could survive one night without us. He drives over and pulls into the garage. I come unlock the hall door from the garage to let him inside. I still don't sleep well, but at least I get some sleep with him here, feeling a little safer. He gets a little weirded out about the knife under the pillow and tells me to put it back where I got it. I stash it in the bedside drawer, just in case. The next day, I pull it together and tell him he doesn't need to stay. I'm clearly overreacting. Then comes nightfall, and the prolifera of odd noises. I decide I can't stay in the guest room at the top floor anymore because I feel like I can't hear anything. I go down to the second floor and try to sleep on the couch in their media room. George of the Jungle is on TV, and I try to fall asleep while watching that. Instead, I get more and more paranoid that I won't be able to hear anything over the movie and end up switching the movie off. I try to fall asleep again. Now I'm sure that I can hear noises from both above and below me. Not the cat who, every night, hid in a tote bag in their bedroom on the second floor and never made a sound except to hiss at me when we crossed each other's paths. I get no sleep, patrolling the entire house all night, finally falling asleep as the night sky tinged gray with dawn. The next day was my birthday, and his little sister was flying up from across the country to spend a week with us. He couldn't stay the night with me anymore because she was still quite young and needed adult supervision, and I insisted that she stay at our place rather than have them come to the house I was at. Fortunately, my best friend had just returned from her trip, and we decided to have a birthday sleepover. I feel a little paranoid, but again, I'm able to get some sleep with someone else there and wake up a little more refreshed. She leaves, and I sit in the kitchen, which faces the street where Gaunt Man first saw me. Gaunt Man is across the street, walking and watching. I duck down against the wall below the window, placing my phone at the gap between the blinds with only the top of my head showing. Gaunt Man gets closer, still watching as I hit record on the video. I get several seconds of him watching the house until he suddenly seems to notice the top of my head or the phone and snaps his own gaze back to the sidewalk below him and walks on. My heart is pounding. Now he knows that I've watched him watching me again. Probably saw the phone recording or taking a photo and he lives right across the street, where he often sat on his porch for hours smoking with a couple of other men, facing my direction. The next few nights were a blur of me wandering around the house, checking closets and other closed spaces upon returning from going out, placing chairs against entrances so that I'd hear them scrape if they got moved, half sleeping in the media room, double checking windows, exhausted until the couple of hours of sleep I would get when the sky would tinge gray and I'd felt I'd survive the most dangerous part of the night. My best friend found out I wasn't sleeping at all and offered to stay with me for the last night. Boyfriend's little sister was still there so he couldn't. I accepted her offer, feeling foolish and overdramatic, but thankful. We stayed back in the guest room on the top floor, watching Parks and Rec quietly with the subtitles on, so that I could still hear the rest of the house. It was around 1am or so when a shrill, piercing siren suddenly echoed throughout the house. My best friend and I sat up in bed, paralyzed for a moment with fear and confusion. Did they say anything about an alarm? She asked me. No, I responded, hesitantly wondering if I had missed something in the notes they had left. We stared at each other for another long moment. What should we do? She asked. I don't know, I said. We should shut the door and lock it, right? She was the closest to the door. She shut it quickly and locked it. I moved the nightstand in front of it, a pathetic barricade. The siren continued to wail throughout the house. Should we call the police? I asked, my heart pounding into my mouth, opening the blinds with my hands and trying to peer through the dark street below. There was a window to the bathroom with the access from the balcony patio. I checked it, just to make sure yet again that it was shut and locked. We should probably call the police. Or should we? She had already begun to call the police, telling them that we were house-sitting and an alarm had just gone off. We were concerned about a man who had been watching me over the past few days and we were alone in the house. The police got our address and said that they would arrive soon. Suddenly, the alarm stopped. With the alarm off, 
We gathered the courage to remove the nightstand from the door and unlock it. I had Pepper Mace gripped tightly in my hand as we swung the door open, ready to confront whatever was out there. Nothing. No one. I checked the giant glass door a few steps away that led to the balcony patio. Locked. We made our way down the stairs, cautious, quiet. We finally made it down to the bottom floor when there was pounding at the front door. I hurriedly made it over to the door, removing the chair I had placed in front of it as quickly as I could, letting in two policemen. They identified themselves to the door. They came inside, asked me a few questions about this man, and then decided it was probably just a harmless homeless man. I didn't tell them that he lived across the street because I thought they'd accuse me of overreacting. Quote unquote, he was just walking home, not following you or watching you. End quote. They couldn't find a security system and told us that it was the fire alarm that had gone off, but they couldn't figure out why. After checking the house and finding no one, they left. I emailed the owners the next day to tell them what happened and that we had called the police to come check it out. They apologized that it happened and thought it was strange. I left the next day and politely declined house sitting for them when they asked again a few months later. We moved out of the city and across the country last summer. My boyfriend only recently told me that he and my dad, who had come up to help us move, had seen Gauntman walking across the street from our apartment and that last week before we moved. So Gauntman, even if you weren't stalking and watching me, let's not ever meet again. A couple years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross-country with his long-term girlfriend to a work job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he did not want to fly his dogs out with them when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his dogs and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we're Chicago folks so the trip would be a long one, however. With the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that if we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves, and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were on a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an eight hour stay at a Denver LA Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth bearing getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving for two miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona, and Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too, as it was located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally, we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before then, and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees, so nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again and the pump reads out, please see attendant. I was annoyed but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kind of quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but that's no matter. As I walked in though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately there is no one milling about in this place. With the six cars beside my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers. And then it dawned on me. What had happened to the gentleman who was at the pub adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing cessation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could trust my instincts and those instincts were screaming at me just to get out of there. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something. Anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. 
It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I am about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. The best way I could describe it, it was like Nick Cage's smile from Face Off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I noped my way back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95-pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could, while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and saw the guy had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what was that smiling man story. So, crazy smiling man and whoever else was lying in wait at the Yermo Ghost Town exit mobile station, let's not meet. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend, Amy, and I, both females, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of the New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling from Ruidoso to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We love those types of roads, up until that day. This part of New Mexico is flat and desolate desert. You can see for miles, and there's virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns, and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. After a few minutes, we saw a white pickup truck up ahead of us, going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him and as we got closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half a mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely, this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off us, and two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us, but he never got too close. He would get to within a few car lengths and then drop back a little and then speed back up again to within a few car lengths. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither one had signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, Mountain Air. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly, maybe 20 miles per hour, if that. This pickup was old and beat up, whereas the one that was behind us was newer. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile per hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the white pickup truck guy talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road, 
We truly thought old beat up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields. We were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now, white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie talkie and he stayed right on our bumper and old beat up pickup truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we'd be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed towards a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of the road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said US Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the other way. We followed the blue pickup to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. So let's not ever meet, or have anyone else ever meet, these guys. This story occurred roughly 14 years ago when I was 12 years old and living in east side of an Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40 acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally, he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town center. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say while we were at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain, roughly three fourths of the way up so naturally most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks and hideaways. We had trails we could walk and they led to a stream and a small waterfall. It was a truly beautiful place but considerably scary to me and my small siblings, one brother and one sister slightly younger than me. We knew our neighbors on both sides of the property. But because of the location of our house was pretty remote, our nearest neighbors were roughly a 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave to us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked for her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy stuff happens when you're living in the middle of nowhere but one in particular involved a guy I certainly don't want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors we didn't know were coming. When people we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man in a car came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here. He immediately walked outside to see who this unwanted guest was. My dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about while my mom keeps us inside. Being protective. The man has a large red fur dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. It snarled at my dad but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog named Millie was snarling and going ballistic while speed chained up to the house. Hi, my name is John. The way the man spoke was like he was a salesman, a really slick and smooth guy who on the outside seemed friendly but with the overtone of wanting something. My dad immediately responded with, So what are you doing out here then, John? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. They then talked for a while and I could hear my dad talking with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. I did however overhear my dad say, What are you thinking? Just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. Anyway, later that night the police showed up to take a statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body when he first arrived. 
The police left without any more questions as it looked like she had died from natural causes. John was still at our house. I found him to be a very unsettling person. The way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar, but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night and I was trying to watch TV and he was playing songs on his guitar with my mom and my dad at the table. I was angry because he was ruining my shows and I told my mom I wanted him to go and I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me she felt the same and told me I should go to bed. The next day things seemed normal. Went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way past her house. It felt strange and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before she passed. I was a bit sad on the walk home, until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's car again and parked out the front of our house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog, Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone that I was going to miss. Again, that sense of overfamiliarity made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't know this man. I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down to our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labeled him a weirdo and told my dad I was hoping he wouldn't come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mom and my dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mom and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him he needed to leave as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around so why didn't this man? Or if he did know, why wouldn't he leave? After ushering him out, my mom and my dad had a big talk in the room and my dad told us all that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore and if we saw John again, immediately to tell him. The next day was a Saturday so we were going to blow up our cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim as it was getting pretty warm. Around 11 a.m., the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John is back. Just like the first time I ever laid eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with my mom, watching and listening through a screen door. John again with his weird, overfamiliar smile and dark eyes greets my dad and is met with, Look, I don't know who you are, but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and my wife and I don't want you to come back, you understand? I didn't hear John's reply from his tone, but it sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. My dad wasn't having it and told him to go or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, my dad said, don't come back or you'll be sorry. This is where things truly get weird. As my dad lays this subtle threat on the man, his face completely changes one of rage. He glares at us in the house, sticks up his finger and speeds out of the driveway shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back and told us we wouldn't be seeing John anymore, and if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man made me feel uncomfortable in my own home, and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got from him when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was the Sunday or the Monday after that day, but John did come back. He tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us to not like him. Before he even got out of his car, my dad said, if you don't turn around and leave, I'm going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them of what happened. Apparently they were going to go and talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happening with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed, or possibly run over. I remember asking my dad what happened, but he wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me that he knew it was John after the way their last conversation ended. The next weekend after the mailbox incident, we went into town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat, and when we came home down the driveway, my dad immediately stopped my mom from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport where we parked our car at the back of the house, there was a window that opened to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got increasingly more tense until we all noticed the window was missing. I remember being confused in the back seat and not really knowing what was going on until I saw it. A man, dark eyes and overfamiliar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage and he told my mom to rush down the driveway. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into thick shrubbery. My dad only being on one leg, let Millie loose as she was going ballistic tied up to the house. She raced down the grass engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with his flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. 
None of our possessions have been stolen or even moved. We must have caught this man just as he was entering our house. The police came the next day and searched for fingerprints with no avail. My father was furious and again alerted them to John and his strange behavior. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. The school I went to was pretty large considering where we were but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within my first week at the school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher aides. I was caught completely unaware when that overfamiliar, dark-eyed man from the previous year was introduced as a teacher aide. Except instead of John, he was introduced as Gregory something. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of all of it. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg something was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live close by? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else was he lying about? What if police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good 10 minutes trying to piece it together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. That is when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognized me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing, just staring at me. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I had found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked if I was sure. He went to the school the next day and discovered the man had put in for an indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learned of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know should John or Greg ever return. So John, Greg, whoever you are, let's not ever meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1, in an extremely rural mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go over to about an hour away and wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15 foot drop onto a rocky hill below leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away. The closest main road was a mile away, and at night, there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically, it was in the middle of nowhere and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline. This was the early 2000s and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception there anyway. I headed out. The baby was already asleep. The four year old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off. And the eight year old was playing guitar here with me up on the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the four-year-old and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. The description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead-end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left driveway, there is a large open carport and that's where my aunt and uncle and anyone who ever visited parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled out area and ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave, and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so you could see right in. But this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat, yard-like area on the property. And being on a mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there. Ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family knew this. It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye, and now my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids play area. This was not my aunt and uncle. This was not anyone they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. I was a small teenage girl, alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, who is that Jake? Do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. No, I never seen that truck before, he replied. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911, and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it the metal doorknob jiggling. 
No one was actually knocking. It's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my 8 year old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to call me, but I knew it would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there, assuming they didn't get totally lost on this mountainside in the pitch dark. I just kept thinking, we are dead, this is how I die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turn around to grab the paper with the number on it and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in a large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, but what had to have been a 6 foot 4 man with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard, and what made it worse, he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. There was a second man behind him I couldn't see as well. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall but a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, oh god they're here, and before the 911 operator could say anything, my 8 year old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, do you know who that is? But before my cousin could answer, I turned my attention to the man in the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door, because I do not think it was locked. The man stared at me hard for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But he then just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back up out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still really scared, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like it was a close family friend, and obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway. Visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, then told me they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until the police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so they could ask them some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early but at this Mr. Jim guy. My aunt was mad at my uncle and told him to tell Jim to never come back. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing, or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known my uncle was not there, because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement, that much is clear to me. There is no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again, and I don't think I ever even went back up there because not long after, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. So Mr. Jim, the grinning mountain man who tried to break into the house where I was babysitting, let's not meet again. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long, it runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forest from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Gills County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there, we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool, perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike, but our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you are supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. We decided to ignore those suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am, I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me awake telling me, Get your gun, someone is outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the 1911 out of my pack and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. 
A few minutes of nothing but the breeze blowing through the trees and then I heard branches snapping. It sounded like it was a bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot, hear who or whatever was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around a bit for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print in some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. It wasn't mine, and it wasn't my girl's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food, then retreated to the tent. I assured my girl that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I woke sometime later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From that faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There was really someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed. Get out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction of whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge, where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we are leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail, in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap from quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up behind us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. Since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we had been out there, I really felt we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for some group of people of whatever knows what. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us, I don't know. But I'll never know because I will never be returning to find out. This happened over a decade ago, somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, my boyfriend's half-sister May, and I drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and we were on our way back home in Kathy's bad little car. By bad, I'm talking this thing had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, it was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere, but Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it on the way to our friend's house. It's a little past midnight and we're roughly an hour away from home. There's nobody on the road, dense woods on every side, no street lights, no moon. I can barely see past the windshield because I have a form of albinism, which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My death perception is terrible, and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most, but usually I can make out lights and other cars when they pass and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow, hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the car makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and we get to the bottom of the hill. The car quits working. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. 
she and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood, which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer, before we realize she couldn't fix the car and needed a tow truck. These were the days of the MapQuest printouts and brick phones, so we couldn't whip out our smartphone and look up the closest tow truck. I decided to call my boyfriend Caleb to come pick us up and suggest we come with a tow truck to pick up the car when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree, so I take out my cruddy Nokia and called my boyfriend. It's then I realize, no service. I ask May and Kathy if either of them have service, they both check and shake their heads. May gets a bit panicky, and we all hold our phones up, trying to get a signal to no avail. It's really hot, and after failing to get any kind of service, we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to call May down, and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking out our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car, and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. Still no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of our car anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's gotta be the trees in the way, so I get the idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there, just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea, but me being an idiot. I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just want to go home, and this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice tree with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher, and about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my shorts pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figured I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone out and hold it up once I get near the top. I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb, but he doesn't pick up, so I call again until he does. He answers in a sleepy, but pissed voice but I'm having none of that and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says he will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy, then he yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad depth perception. I assure him that I'm fine. He's skeptical but says okay, and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree, but my hand touches a big glob of sap, so I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop off of my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross, so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting rid of this crud off my hands, I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. Swish, swish, swish. I completely freeze, not being able to place what the sound is, but it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see anything. Just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. Swish. And then it stops, right under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping, and after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again, but it's heading away from me deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now, besides the sounds of the woods, so I grew up around on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them, so I make my way out of the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice May and Kathy are not standing outside the car anymore, and the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car, and May rolls on the window a little bit, and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth, where were you? I point back over my shoulder towards the hill, and started to explain that I called her brother, but Kathy yelled, what are you doing? Get back in the car. I give them a weird look, but May unlocks and opens the door, and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming it behind me. Kathy slams the locks and double checks them while May rolls up the window and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows has never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger space, so it's not too big of a deal, but May's freaking out about it and Kathy has lost her cool as well. I am still confused and ask what the heck is going on. Maya tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really funny up the hill in the direction I went. They got freaked out and turned the lights off and got in the car. They thought he had got me. I am honestly scared at this point because if I hadn't stopped to wipe sap off my hands, I most likely would have got out of the tree at the time I heard the weird noise. I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story, and everybody in the car is super scared, but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows, surveying the area, and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry up and come rescue us. Suddenly, I hear May whine, what is that, and she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they are facing, I see nothing but the dark, but then I hear it through the small opening in the window. Swish, swish, swish. 
Mae ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead and sort of hunch down in my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man, and then he presses his face against Mae's window, and I finally see him. Nobody screams. You'd think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks in at us for a while until Kathy switches her brights on hoping it would scare him off, but it did nothing. The dude just walked to the front of the car and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving? I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well, but the guy had to be somewhere a bit over 6 feet and no older than 30 years old. He had the face of your average Joe, nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you notice about him if you run into this dude in broad daylight. Dark shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light colored eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned, but there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was, corduroys making that swishy sound when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hands and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the car. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car, but it was a while. Then good old corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as looking like a praying mantis because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically taking two steps forward, one step back like Willy Wonka but on speed or something. This is where I noticed the swish sound matched up exactly to the same sound I heard when I was back in the tree. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me, as though this wasn't weird enough. By now, Mae was sobbing and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit, so I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window, and when he orbited his way over there, I said, Hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Quarter Ward definitely had heard me, so he switched to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield, straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave, and he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonka his way out of my line of vision into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and Mae was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about what a weirdo he was and glad he left and whatever, and we went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured, but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, oh no, he's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing this two steps forward, one step back parallel to us on the side of the road, and this time he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater-covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she'd feel better about it, even though I was ready to piss myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or whatever he was up to. It was kinda like when you knew there was gonna be a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I hear Corduroy switch back towards the Geo and on my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into my window, like he's jousty with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break. But it got terrifying hearing swish, 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 clonk after a while, and he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our savior, Caleb. He brought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joyous laughter as her brothers approach. Now, Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. It felt very safe. Caleb was 6 foot 8 and Alex is around 6 foot 5, so I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jouster would make him leave, but nope. Caleb walks towards corduroy, trying to assess the situation, and Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window, tells Kathy to get out. She does and he walks over to his car, then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out and May makes a bolt for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the corduroy jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to go away. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backward, one step forward, and disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb who sprints the other way down the road, cause that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who had already got out of the car and was opening his car door, leaving me behind the car alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me, but I couldn't really tell. I just hear everybody shout, Elizabeth. This startles me, and I jump to the side of the car, hearing Corduroy smash the stick into the back window with a loud thud and a swish. 
I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel the wind has been knocked out of me and my legs don't seem to work, but Caleb manages to shove me in the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He'd abandoned his stick and just stood there with no intention to move. Alex puts the car into reverse and slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door. Then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods, but gets us back onto the road. Everybody was in 100% panic mode as Alex tore away, far over whatever the speed limit was. Me and Kathy swear they saw Corduroy chasing behind us after Alex made the U-turn, but there was no way he was catching up. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of Corduroy anymore, but when we approached the car, we saw that in the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the Corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was weird. I also still wonder what his intentions were. I still have so many unanswered questions on that night. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21, with a bad job history, a bad job, and bad credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible situation. I was a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend, similar position in life at the time, told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady complex, I had actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in that town is kind of shady. But for those of you who are not here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town with more liquor stores than any other establishment, and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple of months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed at it, obviously missing, and died a little as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Well that's just great, I thought to myself, and decided this was a good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Remember that thing I said about bad job history? Yeah, you can clearly see why. Driving home, at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead, in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. The kid saw me and jumped, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I may have made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully, I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They left me. I need help. The kid looked dazed and was cuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm going to call for help, okay? I grabbed up my cell phone and then remembered the thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone was broke, but I live nearby there, okay? I will get help. I hope he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline, and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's boyfriend's car parked in her spot, and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person, and was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What is going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road, but my cell isn't working, and that I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel, and myself all got out of the car. Help. I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically, 
I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed very wary of this change in the story. Listen man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid lost it. He screwed his face up and clenched his fist, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance, and the police, and I can wait with you till they get here, but we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more, and then in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. The sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the, let's get out of here face, and we jumped back in the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kids started stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house, just let me get in the car, why won't you take me home? The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn up his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt like my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off. The kid grabbed me frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our return, around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment complex, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike, the kid, just gone. No idea where he took off to. Clumps of his hair were still on the road. We never saw the kid again. We searched the papers and internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night, but nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about all of it is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what were his plans for all three of us? In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land, and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be there. This meant no one ever really locked their doors, because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were all there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you, again, all the lights are off, and you try to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with the coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster, heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out a, I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was probably only 5 feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes were hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door in the back of the house. When we talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay, close the curtain. So I did. 
Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear in Ben's voice, so I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work, either from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the second, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up on the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out-of-town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty, while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with a BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, he's back. Back. He's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived on the road a bit, say, you know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming, but he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement though. We just went on with our trip, but we never played vampire again without some mention of that night. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was about 21 or 22 when this happened. I was in the military at Fort Sill and didn't know it, but Desert Storm was right around the corner. At the time, I lived in south central Oklahoma on the outskirts of a small town called Duncan. I was helping a friend round up some cattle that got out because someone had run across a T-section and went through their fence. It tore two posts down and left a 30-foot section open for the cattle to get out. We'd already found most of the cattle and we were missing another three or four, so we were out at 1am on dirt bikes trying to find them before someone hit one of them and sued his father. My friend and I went east and the other guys went north and south. One thing you need to understand about Oklahoma is that most of it is farmed, either cattle or crops. It is also divided into one mile sections for the most part. In other words, the roads all run north and south or east and west and intersect at one mile intervals. If you ask directions for something out in the country, you are more likely than not to get instructions that include go three mile sections north and then two mile sections west. The area at this time was sparse and there weren't many homes. We didn't know how long the hole had been in the fence. My friend's father only checked the fence because he was missing livestock. They owned the entire mile section and a good portion of the adjoining mile section. The hole in the fence was on the east side of their land, at the furthest distance from their house. They checked the fence for such holes on a weekly basis, so the hole could not have been more than two days old. James and I were riding on these old dusty, dirt roads with battery-powered spotlights to both show the way and to search for cattle. We'd stop at any of the million small wooden bridges and look to see if there were any cows down by the water. Our plan was to go out 10 miles and then go over a mile section and drive back 10 miles until we'd gone a total of 10 miles out and 10 miles over. Then we would do it all over again but on the north and south roads instead of the east and west roads. If you were to plot it a map, it would be a 10 by 10 grid. We had been at it since before 9pm, just as it was getting dark and we'd already gone 10 miles out and about 3 miles over. I need to mention at this point that there are some mile sections that are not divided by roads and you have to turn one way or another at a T intersection. If that happens, we always took the road that went in our general direction of travel. If we were traveling east and came to a T and we'd already checked the road north of us, then we head to the south a mile and then head east again. Occasionally, an old farmer would pass away and leave his land to relatives who had no interest in farming and the land would be up for sale or just left alone for years. When this happens, and the roads aren't used as much, nature reclaims them and you're usually left with a dirt road with weeds and grass growing on it, or you're left with little more than an improved trail, usually two ruts with overgrown weeds and Johnson grass and occasionally a tree. We were on one of those rutted roads, headed south to the next intersection where we turn east again. The land here was too hilly for cultivation and had been left alone for at least the last 30 years. We were both familiar with it and we hunted and fished there. This mile section and the next two were basically wild. At the end of the dirt trail would be a T intersection, but the west side was fenced and the only option was to turn east again. 
At the end of this mile section, the road was a dead end, but we had to check it and the double back. We just made the turn back to the east when we saw something burning over the next rise. Brass fires are extremely dangerous and can get out of control in minutes. As we topped the rise, we saw the fire was actually in the middle of the dirt road. When we got to it, we found that it was a recliner that was burning. A blue lazy boy recliner. We stopped and threw some dirt on it and finally got it extinguished. James and I were wondering what kind of an idiot would do this and how strange it was to be in the middle of the road just burning. Satisfied that the fire was out, we got back on our bikes and idled past the recliner toward the end of the mile section, still a quarter of a mile in the distance. We found one of their cows at the bottom of the rise, about a hundred feet down the road. It was laying in half in and half out of the road. Its throat had been cut and it was laying there with its eyes open and tongue hanging out. There was blood everywhere. As we were looking at it and trying to figure out what happened, James said, hey, look at this. It showed me where the blood had dripped from the cow to about 10 feet away from it. There were shoe prints of blood in the road. It was just part of a shoe print, but you could tell that was a shoe print. We found two more when we looked more diligently. At this point, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up and it was suddenly a very cool evening. I looked at James and his eyes were as big as saucers. He thought something spooky was happening too. We talked about going back, but we knew that we'd be shamed if we didn't see if there was anything else. We finally decided to walk the bikes the rest of the way to the dead end just in case there was someone there. We didn't want them to hear the engines. We began walking the last quarter mile or so to the dead end. It was at the base of the last hill and we just started heading up onto the other side. My heart was going at about 200 miles per hour and I had cotton mouth so bad that it was almost impossible to swallow. Then I noticed that someone had stuck paper plates of the barbs of the wire on the fence. We looked and there were plates stuck to the top strand of a wire on both sides of the road. It started about 50 feet behind us, it continued up and over the hill. They were evenly spaced about 5 feet apart. As our gaze followed the row of paper plates up the top of the hill, James suddenly said, there's another fire, and it was at that moment that I could smell it. But what I smelled wasn't that normal smoky smell. It was as though someone had added incense into it. I asked James if he could smell that and he could. I told him that I didn't like this at all. I was okay with losing face in front of our friends and his dad and brothers. I was ready to go. He agreed with me but said that we had to see what was burning. We were both whispering and we were both shaking so much that our voices quivered. We started up the hill again and I was thinking with every step that we were going to be seriously killed or worse. As we got to the top of the hill, one of the paper plates blew off the fence and skittered behind us, making both of us jump and it was all I could do to not scream. After I saw what it was, I started to laugh it off, but James shushed me and told me to listen. We could hear voices. As we topped the hill and were able to see the bottom where the road stopped, we saw a group of about 10 people all standing around another recliner that was burning. They had their backs to us and they were passing a big picture around. From our vantage point, we couldn't actually see what was in the picture, but the slit throat of the cow haunted my thoughts. They would each take a mouthful and spit it into the fire. This went on until the picture was empty. The entire time, they were all saying something in unison. We could only understand an occasional word. They changed their tones in a rhythmic manner with an emphasis in the last word. I can remember hearing here and there and beseech and father. James and I stood there on top of the hill like a couple of idiots. Our mouths hanging wide open and actually scared stiff. After a minute or two, they would repeat whatever it was, all the while passing around that pitcher and spitting it into the fire. There was a small camp table set up on the side and a little behind them. After the last of the liquid was gone, a man turned and sat the pitcher on the table and picked up what looked like a large loaf of bread. Just as he was turning back to the fire, he evidently saw us. I am sure that we made a nice silhouette sitting there at the top of the hill. He screamed, hey, and dropped the loaf of bread and started running in our direction. The others turned and immediately followed him. That was all the encouragement that we needed. It was time to go. We turned up our bikes around. James got his started on the first kick, but I somehow managed to get myself off balance and when I kicked, the bike fell on its side with me. By this time I was near panic and was breathing in raspy short breaths. I picked the bike up again and tried to start it, but it didn't start. I thought about running, but we were out in the middle of nowhere. I finally started pushing the motorcycle down the other side of the hill and jumped on it. It seemed like it took forever to get enough speed, but I popped the clutch and it started. James was waiting at the corner of the intersection to make sure that I was coming and we were headed for his house, going way too fast for safety, especially in the dark. When we finally got back to his house, we told his dad what we'd seen. His dad called a couple of friends and they all loaded up in their trucks with enough weapons to start a small war. James and I sat with his dad and told him where to turn. His dad kept asking us questions on the way. What were they doing? Why was there a chair on fire? They cut the cow's throat? How many were there? What did they look like? What were they driving? The last question stumped us. We hadn't seen any cars or trucks. 
The road was the only way in or out, and there was a creek that ran on the back side of the end of that particular road, so they couldn't have gone that direction. How did they get there with two recliners? When we got to that last stretch of road, the headlights found the spot where the recliner had been sitting. It was gone. We could all see where the road and surrounding grass was burned, but the recliner was not there. As we got closer, James noticed that the cow was gone too. I hate to admit, but I was getting scared all over again. I was afraid that his dad would tell us that it was our imagination and not believe us. When we got closer to the burnt spot in the road, Buster, James' dad, noticed the chair off in the ditch on the left side of the road. Then I noticed the cow on the other side. It was also in the ditch. The paper plates were all gone. Buster got out to look at the cow with the other men. They stood there talking and shaking their heads for what seemed like 10 minutes before getting back into the trucks. We continued toward the hill. The ruts made by spinning motorcycle tires were easily seen, but there was no fire on the other side of the hill. We all went down to where the other recliner had been burning, but it and the camp table were gone. You could see where someone had walked around the charred area and covered it with dirt. After we left, James saw a paper plate about 50 feet on the other side of the fence. Buster called the county sheriff when we got home, and by that time it was daylight and we went out again with the sheriff and a deputy. When we got back to the road, the first recliner and the cow were gone but you could still see where something had been on fire and there was still blood on the road and in the grass. James showed them the shoe prints we'd seen. At the bottom of the hill, you could still see the charred area where the second recliner had been burning and the deputy found the little scuff marks where the table had been sitting. At the end of the road, you could see where the top strand of the fence had been tugged down and wrapped around the lower strand so someone could crawl over it. You could also see where the grass and weeds had been trampled, providing a fairly easy trail to follow. We found a woman's tennis shoe on the other side of the creek. You could see where someone had climbed up the bank on the far side of the creek. We followed the trail all the way across the field up to the next dirt road. Again, the top wire was wrapped around the next lower wire and there was a piece of red bandana looking material caught in it. There were marks on the road where two or three different cars had spun their tires when they left. Buster also found a large piece of glass that had blood on it. Buster filed a report for the missing cow. They'd found four more cows in the opposite direction from where me and James had gone. They never found the recliners or the missing cow. The sheriff called a few days later and told Buster that the blood on the glass was human and not bovine. It was his guess that the pitcher broke and someone cut their hand while carrying it back to their vehicles. Two weeks after that, there was a huge scare in our community about some cult that had promised the area at large that they were going to kidnap someone and sacrifice them. Buster always said that it was just someone running their mouth after hearing about our incident. It was all anyone talked about that summer. Buster also said that he sure would like to know what happened to that cow. The story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking, particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, knowing that I was very far away from health. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the last and national forest in northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long unkept beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandoned personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and simply watched me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately 5 feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed the food wasn't there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite and so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite, two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up to the rope from which the food was hanging. I thought of the couple I had passed earlier and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. 
My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured the couple was simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than food. Several days passed and my mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to be silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent and was ready to slash at whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise and opened my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence something had actually happened were the boot prints, the same as before. Several more days passed and I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 70 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front of me and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, screw this, this trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella located off I-5. The only problem was that it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent and tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sounds travel far in the absence of other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is screwed up. This is so screwed up. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent, lights up the entire thing, and goes dark. I unzipped my tent and climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. Then I heard footsteps running towards the tent and barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately 5 minutes I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours. I was certain they were gone but I didn't move. Eventually, birds started chirping and I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta, and spoke with the police and forest service. They put me in a motel for the night, and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later who told me there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there had been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the couple. This happened in the fall of 1993, when I was 20 years old. In the interest of context, this was before I started college, and I was working in the material prep department of a plastics factory on the night shift. I was the only woman in the department, and my male co-workers were initially skeptical that I could handle the job, but I proved myself and earned their respect. It was hard work, but on the plus side, it also put me in the best shape of my life. I had just gotten off work, and it was about 1.30am. My car was running on fumes, so I stopped at a local gas station to fill up. While I was pumping gas, a woman about my age approached me looking nervous and scared. She said that she had been at her boyfriend's house, and they had a fight. She'd walk up to the gas station to use the payphone and call her to pick her up. On her way to the station, our car pulled up as she was walking and the guys inside started catcalling and harassing her. With a slight moving of her head, she indicated a car that was parked off to the side by the gas station dumpsters. I saw a large light green car, like a caddy or a Lincoln, with at least two or three shadowy figures inside. She said they threatened her and she was too scared to call her friend and wait. The woman was neat, well dressed, and didn't seem high or drunk or anything like that. She just seemed really nervous and freaked out, so I didn't even hesitate. I finished pumping my gas and told her to hop in the car, then I'd take her home. At that time on a weeknight, there was little traffic, so I booked it right out of the gas station and asked her where she lived. She kept twisting around in the seat to see if the car was behind us, and when I asked her to put her seatbelt on, she ignored me and kept looking for the car. I assumed she was just scared. A few blocks down the road, however, I noticed she was looking around the car, and she started asking me about the money. Where's your purse? Where's your bag? I need money. You need to give me some money. My stomach sank. I have this woman in my car, and now she's gonna rob me. But when I thought about it, robbery just didn't make much sense. I was driving a 1985 Chevette and was wearing my work clothes, a ratty t-shirt and jeans with combat boots. I did not look like a person with a lot of cash, primarily because I wasn't a person with a lot of cash. 
She twisted around in the seat again and started yelling, there they are, there they are. She didn't sound scared anymore. I checked the rear view and sure enough, the light green car is right behind me. She started cackling and bouncing up and down in the seat. My boys are going to screw you up. They're going to screw you up. She's laughing like crazy, opening the glove box, looking in the back for a bag or purse, telling me all the messed up things these guys are planning to do to me. Now, if I had been smart, I would have just driven to the police station. Actually, if I had been very smart, I would have just called the cops from the gas station and waited with her until they arrived. That would have been the intelligent thing to do. Unfortunately, none of this crossed my mind until later. In the moment, I just got really, really angry. I realized three key things all at once. There was an intersection up ahead, with cars on either side waiting to cross, and the light had just turned yellow. I had a spare box cutter that I kept for work in the driver's side door compartment. The lady still had it put on her seatbelt. I didn't think. I floored it and passed under the yellow light just as it turned red. I glanced back to see if the green car was still behind me, but the cross traffic at the intersection had started to move, and they had it caught up. The woman started yelling. I slammed on the brakes and she hit the dash and windshield with a solid and viciously satisfying crack. When she rebounded to the passenger seat, I had the box cutter in her face and was screaming some serious stuff. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was along the lines of, get out, get out of my car before I cut off your face and make you eat it. The crazy screaming and box cutter combo worked. She grabbed blindly at the handle and popped the door open, and I started shoving and punching her until she tumbled out the door to the curb. I stomped on the gas, got to the next turn, and squealed around it with the passenger door still open. I made a few more turns because I was afraid that the green car might catch up to me. After a little while, I stopped to close the passenger door, and then I cut across town and got onto the highway to go home. I was on the highway for about 5 minutes before the shake started. I pulled off to the shoulder to calm down and get my act together, and then I drove home. I told my older sister. I was living with her temporarily after the breakup with my ex. She grabbed me in a tight bear hug while simultaneously yelling about how stupid I was for not going to the police. I've never been so glad to be yelled at in my life. I've lived most of my life way out in the valley countryside of Ontario. Given, it's not a whole lot for an 18 year old, but for me it's the only place I can call home. And I like to think that I know the entire area, as far as sprawling that is, like the back of my hand. Adventures across the long, cross-crossing roads, pastures, and woods that made up the skeleton of my village were a common venture in my childhood. As a young kid, I had a habit of biking extremely far out in hopes of finding new places, and sometimes, my dad or one of my friend's parents would toss out bikes in their pickup and take us way out into a back road and let us explore for a few hours. This was how a lot of us first found that on one of these bad gravel roads surrounded by thin woods was a worn down old shack sitting just about 20 meters off of the path. Honestly, I never thought anything of it, except for the fact that it was creepy. It had no windows to see inside, and I never went anywhere near it. But one of my friends at the time said that her older sister had tried to go in it and that the door was always locked. We all had better things to do than to be curious about that at the time anyway. So I quickly moved on and became nothing more than a mundane landmark of that area. Honestly, I had completely forgotten about it for a few years now. Except last Tuesday. I was coming home from one of my very late classes at my university, and I usually take the back routes I used many years ago, as they're more straightforward and never have any sort of traffic. As I drove down the gravel path that would wind along the side of the country and eventually take me to the next street I needed to turn onto, I noticed a faint glinting coming from within the trees up ahead, maybe about 100 meters from my car. A flashlight? I thought, but as my car came closer, I realized what I was really seeing. The light inside of the shack was on. I should mention now that in all of the nearly 13 years I've spent living in my area, I have never seen that door open, and I've never seen a light on inside of that shack, ever. Not even once. I must have driven past that shack probably almost a hundred times in my life, but this was the first time I'd ever seen any sign of a person's presence having been anywhere near that thing. That, coupled with the fact that it was 10 o'clock at night and pitch black outside aside from my own headlights, and the faint glow lighting up the door frame up ahead immediately filled me with what I can only describe as a weird sense of dread. Fortunately, while my car approached the light, I was curious enough that despite the feeling in my stomach, I slowed down as I was about to pass, hoping that I could see what was going on inside, and this is probably the only reason I managed to spot the dark shape that burst out of the foliage on the side of the road, directly into my path. I wasn't going very fast at that point, but I still pounded the brakes rather hard in alarm, so my car came to a crunching stop on the gravel. For a moment, I was just really confused and freaked out. What was that? Had I almost hit a deer or something? This far out in the country, a deer would have been the most likely and most reasonable assumption. But in the beams of my car, I could see what had stopped me. A very tall, a very lanky old man with scraggly and balding gray hair. 
He looked dirty and unkempt, and as his clothes hung off of him, I felt extremely unsettled over what this guy could be doing way out here, and why he had walked out in front of my car. As I sat there confused, the old man came around to my window and knocked on the glass. I rolled down the window just to crack, only enough for someone to be able to hear me and for me to hear them. I was already creeped out enough as it was. Immediately, I had to say what I was thinking. What are you doing out here? In my peripheral vision, I could still see the light from the shack, but in my mind's eye, I wasn't really registering it anymore. Stupid, I know. I should have made the connection immediately, but I was still kind of shaken by the fact that I could have run this guy over if I hadn't been able to stop in time. And being a new driver and all, the thought of that was terrifying. After a small pause, the man started talking to me. He had a thick, croaky sort of voice and he spoke very slowly. My truck. It's broken, he explained. Oh, okay. I was also getting the feeling that he wasn't really all there, mentally. I didn't have to look around to notice there wasn't any truck on the side of the road, but I did anyway, turning my head around to confirm what I already knew. There was definitely no truck. Had he somehow driven it into the trees or something? As far as I can remember and see, there wasn't enough space anywhere in them for a truck to fit through. What was the man talking about? While I was looking, it was honestly as though I could feel that he was watching me. And when I turned back, he was still leaning down to peer inside of my window at me. Where? I don't see it. I was definitely distrustful of this guy already. At first, he didn't respond, and my nerves were only getting worse the longer we were alone out here. Then he replied, It's just up the road, he said, turning just to point with his finger in that general direction. The lights on my car aren't exactly the greatest, but I could still see far enough that I really couldn't imagine where on earth this truck was supposed to be. I couldn't spot the faintest sight of it. While I squinted up ahead, he continued, I'll show you where, if you come. At this point, I really had no idea what this old man was thinking I could do to help. I'm just an 18 year old girl. I don't exactly look like the type of person who knows a lot about cars or how to fix them. And for the record, I'm really not. But I was tired from a long day at school, so I absolutely was not at my brightest. And for some reason, a part of me felt guilty about leaving him out here alone if his truck really was broken. Okay, I said, and I reached to my gear shift to start driving slowly up the road. But as soon as he saw my hand, he shook his head. Just walk, it's not too far. What? Excuse me, but no thanks. How was I going to see anything in the dark if I got out of my car and followed him anyway? There was no harm in driving wherever he was trying to lead me. The more I talked to the guy, the more unnerved I was getting, and the more red flags were starting to pop up in my mind. I couldn't see a car anywhere, and this total stranger wanted me to get out of mine and follow him into the dark on this creepy road in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no. I'd rather drive to it, I responded. I could see his brow furrow, and he looked kind of agitated. He insisted, your car won't fit in the trees, anyway. So, did his truck crash then? Why the trees, if we were going up the road? I remembered what I'd just been thinking a minute earlier about there not being enough space, and I asked him, then how did yours get in the trees? The only logical explanation would have been that his truck had swerved off the road, but even if that were the case, there was seriously nothing at all that I could have done to help him fix his car or get it back out again. The entire situation was beginning to make me very scared. There was a lengthy enough pause between my question and him speaking up that I was beginning to think that he didn't hear me or something. So I asked again, still no immediate answer. When he finally did reply, he was staring at me directly in the eyes. You really don't look old enough to drive. I hear comments like this a lot, since I do look very young because of my size. Normally, somebody would say this with a smile or something to signify that this is, in fact, meant to be taken as a joke. But this guy's face didn't change even slightly. He just kept staring at me with a completely cold expression. That type of a remark in this kind of situation immediately had my heart racing. And all I could think was, what did this guy want from me? What I wanted to say next was, well, who are you? But instead, I anxiously fumbled for my phone in my pocket, babbling in a way that probably made it really obvious that I was completely freaked out of my mind. Uh, okay, I could just call someone to come help you out. There's not really anything I can do. As I said that it occurred to me to wonder, did this old guy not have a cell phone of his own? I know not every older person has one, even if they're becoming much more common, but seriously. And then I also remembered, with a sudden streak of massive fear, the shack with the light on. I could still see the light coming from it just up ahead in the trees. My dumb brain finally put two and two together. The old man hadn't even mentioned it at all. It was like it wasn't even there to him, and there was definitely no one out there that could have turned the light on but the guy who was just standing outside my car right now. What was he doing out here in the shack then, which had been locked for all these years by someone I never knew? There was definitely no truck around here. He wanted me out of my car for a whole nother reason. I think maybe the old man must have seen on my face that I was scared out of my wits and about to book it out of there. 
and said of any words without warning his face contorted with rage and he swung his fist, pounding against it my window with enough strength to make it shudder. His eyes were wide and he looked furious and completely insane. Even though I was panicking more than I ever had in my life, and I was sure he was about to smash the window in if he tried again, I screamed, threw my phone onto the floor, switched gears, and slammed my foot down on the gas pedal. I hurtled down the road, and when I glanced into my rearview mirror, I saw his dark shape turn from standing in the road, and I watched as he turned, and he walked off the road, directly back towards the light of the shack. I didn't slow down at all until I was nearly home, and absolutely sure that there was no way that he could have followed me. When I got home that night, I spent a long time crying about what had happened with my mom, and though I don't think she believed all of what I told her, we don't have the greatest relationship, she called up everyone she knew to ask if anyone knew the old man, or if they knew who owned that shack. In a town like ours, just about everyone knows each other, but no one had any clue who he was. One of our family friends even swore that he was sure it's been abandoned for at least four years now. And since most people don't usually take that road, no one said that they've ever seen a light on or the door open but me. I've been taking a different route home from school since, and I really don't think I ever want to head back down that road. Creepy guy in the shack, please, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This happened when I was in college. I lived in Isla Vista, the student community at UCSB, notorious for being a party school. It fully lived up to its reputation. I liked to party, but wow, these people were off the wall. As such, there were a lot of people who put themselves in dangerous situations, drinking to excess, not being careful, not locking doors, etc. It had a very isolated and insular vibe, and anyone who was hanging around who wasn't college aged immediately looked at a place and strange. One night after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house where I lived with two other girls, probably around 2.30 am. We were all serious students, I was probably the least serious actually, and we partied and it was not your typical UCSB mega razor, more like a small get together with friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, sleep in our furniture, or in our beds as this case may be. That night my roommates had a few people over who I didn't know, and I saw when I returned home that one of them had opted to sleep on the couch from the shadow that I saw there. I didn't turn the light on so I wouldn't wake anyone up, but as I was passing the couch to enter my bedroom, I noticed that the figure was lying very stiff. He just had this weird energy to him. He was lying down, but it was like he was putting all of his energy into lying as still and rigid as possible. I paused, and the guy quickly jerked his head to face me, without moving his limbs, so quickly that it startled me. I could see his wide open eyes glinting in the dark. Figuring that I'd startled him, or that he was drunk, or maybe on some kind of stimulant and unable to sleep, I just hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. The dude made me so nervous, and I wasn't taking any chances. I fell asleep. At 4.30am, I woke up. There was a strange sound at the door, almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood very quietly. I lay still and listened. There were more quiet sounds like someone scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder until it was clear that he was using both hands and scratching as fast and as hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I got my cell phone and texted my roommate because I was afraid to make a sound. Your friend is freaking me out. Is he coked out? Can you talk to him? He's banging and scratching on my door. She didn't text me back, probably because she was asleep. I texted my other roommate to the same effect, covering all of my bases. Keep in mind that the scratching has been going on at this point for a couple minutes. I have no idea how he could have sustained it. Scratching a wooden door with your fingernails can't feel good. He also grabbed at the knob and jiggled it super forcefully. Because neither of them answered, I decided to call and really wake them up, though I was scared to make a sound. I know it sounds stupid, but there was something seriously horrifying about being teased like this through the door. I knew that he was trying to terrify me. I felt like a little kid, but I could tell this guy was screwed up or something and maybe the police needed to be called, and I wanted to loot my roommates in since it was one of their friends. The scratching stopped abruptly, and I called my roommate, who answered sleepily. Yo, your friend is messed up, can you please deal with it? Do we need to call the cops? He's seriously scaring me and he was scratching at my bedroom door. He's really weird. She didn't say anything for several seconds, and when she did speak, her voice had no sleepiness in it at all. What friend, she said. That guy that was sleeping on the couch, I said. She was quiet again. We didn't have any guys over, she said. Call the police. My adrenaline surged and I told her to please lock the bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized that I hadn't heard scratching in a while and I had no clue where the dude had gone. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging in the other end of the house, where my roommates, Lauren and Monica, shared a bedroom. The bangs were followed by the sound of them screaming in fear. 
I quickly dialed the police as this maniac proceeded to bang against the luckily locked bedroom door of my two roommates as they screamed. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt that he was trying to break the door down. I told the 911 operator the situation and she dispatched two squad cars. The police in Isla Vista are generally used to pinning drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawls. This was really serious and strange and I think the dispatcher got the sense from my tone how terrified I was. She stayed on the phone with me. At one point the banging stopped and everything was quiet for a while. I talked with the dispatcher and suddenly looked down to see that this guy had slipped his fingers through the one inch gap between my door and the floor was just kind of waggling them around, making this weird growling sound. I screamed and backed away, which is my biggest regret about the situation. Since when I look back at it, it would have been so awesome to just stomp his fingers and hear the guy howl in pain. When the cops rolled up, I heard running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing, and then he was gone. The cops never caught him. He had broken in through our side door by jimmying the lock somehow. My door was covered in what turned out to be huge gashes he'd made using a pair of scissors, which he discarded on the ground before he left. What terrifies me the most about this was that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the face. I realize now that he was not trying to sleep or on drugs, but was lying so stiff like that because he was hiding. He probably heard me open the door and freaked out because he hadn't realized there was another girl living there and tried to blend into the couch in the darkness. The story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a USAF Security Forces Airman, military police. My girlfriend was at work, and as a sweltering hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange. It was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would not have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out, I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it, all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp, should we need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go, let's get out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. 
As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I called the state police, and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the woman's clothing were all gone, though he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area, and do not intend to. Okay, so I've had a few issues with my next door neighbor since I moved in, but nothing creepy until just recently. There is a man, a woman, and at least one boy living there, and I mostly just avoid them. The man seems okay but a bit weird, and the boy just keeps to himself, and the woman is quite a bit off. Not long after we moved in, she left a note in my mailbox. Our mailboxes are right beside each other, between our houses. Anyway, I stood at the mailbox reading the note. She thought that my dog was using the bathroom in her yard. It was possible, as our friends had some holes in it, that our dog had gotten out then. But those holes had been fixed a long time ago. Still, no big deal. Except, I noticed her standing in her driveway, just staring at me. And the note was very long. I just kept reading it. The more I read it, the crazier it got, and the weirder her behavior in my peripheral vision became. Apparently I was... entitled. She seemed to think I was somehow instructing my dog to use the bathroom in their yard. Her note went on a tangent about how awful dogs are. She was also 100% convinced it was my dog, even though there are always tons of loose dogs, cats, and wildlife wandering around and no doubt traveling through her unfenced backyard. In my peripheral vision, she got into her SUV, backed out of her driveway, then parked it along the street directly behind me and just idled there, staring. The note then went on a weird, long tirade about the previous family to live in my house saying I was Anther Deb, as if I'd have any idea at all what that is even supposed to mean, then concluded in some odd insults and some implied not-quite threats. This is the closest thing we ever had to a conversation at this point. I can understand not wanting a dog using the bathroom in her yard, but this was a bit of an extreme reaction, as this was literally the first time I'd even heard of there being a problem. A simple note would have done, but this note was insane. She was still staring behind me. I decided to try to ignore her and just go to my house. That's when she shouted out her window, Are you playing a game? The reaction made no sense. Are you nuts? I replied, as I officially ran out of patience. She shouted more nonsense and insults at me while blocking my driveway, which was right next to the mailboxes, with her vehicle, while I repeatedly told her to leave before I called the cops. This went back and forth like this for a while, but she eventually sped off when I pulled my cell phone out. Later, my boyfriend, who had not been home at this time this happened, had a chat with the neighbors. He said they seemed agreeable and reasonable, and basically dismissed me of just being dramatic. The woman told a very different version of events, of course. I was annoyed that my boyfriend wasn't taking me seriously, but let it go. I think you just wanted to keep getting along with the man next door, as they sometimes borrow tools. They speak to him a lot differently than how they speak to me. They don't do anything rude to me while he's around. In fact, they don't speak to me when he's around at all. They always wait for him to be away. Anyway, I mostly just avoid them. Sometimes, the woman stares at me, but I just ignore her. Until recently, I've been mostly successful. Here's the creepy story. I don't sleep well at night when I'm home alone, and I'm always home alone now because my boyfriend is out of the country on business for months at a time. I often feel like there's someone just outside my house or at my door. Sometimes, my dogs act up at odd hours, but I never see anyone. I keep my house alarm armed and my pistol in my nightstand. The other night was one such night. I didn't sleep well and kept having a sinking feeling that something was wrong. Anyway, I got out of bed at about 2am because I thought I was scheduled to work at 3am. I had mostly given up on getting a restful sleep then anyway. As I left my house, I heard something to my left, the direction of my neighbor's house, but didn't see anything. I was always nervous in my driveway because the motion sensor light was broken, but there was always a lot of darkness between my door and my truck, so I always moved quickly to my driveway. I got in my truck and went to work. It turned out that I misread my schedule and didn't work at 3 that morning after all. Annoyed at the mistake, but grateful I'd get to go home and sleep a little more before the actual start of my shift at 7, I went home. I pulled into my driveway and didn't see anything in the beam of my truck's headlights. I always look around my truck before getting out. I turned the headlight off and got out. I took a few steps ahead of my truck, and then all of a sudden a large man called out to me, shouted really, from the shadows at the corner of my house. He scared me so bad that I screamed, reached for my pepper spray, and fell down. 
not useful. He apologized in a tone that didn't sound sorry at all. It was my neighbor, and that wasn't much of a relief. Apparently, it was my fault that he occasionally found trash in his yard, in Windy, Colorado. Complaining about this seemed to be a lot more important issue than scaring the heck out of me while I'm alone at night. He showed no real concern or realization that was even wrong at all. Again, I have no problem with neighbors bringing issues to my attention, but seriously, hey, can you make sure trash from your bins isn't blown into my yard is not a question that takes 10 minutes, nor is it one that needs to be addressed at 3 in the morning. I'm not in agreement to keep the peace, but I know the trash isn't mine. We live in a windy area. Trash gets blown around in people's yards all the time. No big deal. But he would just not stop going on about it. He kept needlessly repeating himself and made some not quite but kind of threat about getting along. Think about the lines of, it would be a shame if something were to happen, type sort of threats. He was keeping me busy. I didn't even notice his wife flank me. Before I even knew she was there, she appeared from the shadows by a tree. She wanted to yell at me about some eggs. A few weeks ago, I found a bunch of eggs smashed on the road near our shelled mailbox. As the carton was right next to them, I thought the carton had obviously just been dropped. Not that someone was trying to egg anything. I assumed my neighbor had dropped the eggs on her way to get the mail and just left them. She denies this, but I still think that's the most likely explanation because no one else has any reason to be out at our mailbox with eggs. But I didn't care enough to say anything to her about it at the time, so I just let it go and forgot all about it. Now she was accusing me of leaving eggs around. Again, inexplicably expressing the grievance at 3am. Weird that she hadn't brought it up weeks ago when it happened, but I know why she didn't. My boyfriend was still here then. My boyfriend has been away on business for several weeks now, long enough for them to have noticed his absence. They were also probably aware that my motion sensor light was out. They sure seemed to know how to avoid my headlight beams. Being surprisingly patient, I explained that I knew nothing about the eggs. I mentioned that I later found a lot of the shells in my yard and figured a squirrel must have carried them there. She proudly informed me that she tossed them onto my yard herself. Apparently she thought that was okay, but someone dropping them in the first place isn't. Anyway, this is where I started to get over my shock a bit and started getting pissed. Initially, I had been somewhat relieved that the man in the shadows had been my neighbor, not some random crazy person, but now I was pissed. I had now been outside with them for like 20 minutes, while they accused me about stupid stuff. While I tried to be polite and agreeable even though I had nothing to do with it, but now everything wrong with the situation had just kicked in. I eventually remembered that I don't actually have to put up with any of this and cut her off mid rant and said, It's 3am, I'm going home, Good night," and turned on my heel. I heard her say something in an unkind tone as I left, but didn't catch what it was. They had staked out my house, waited for my boyfriend to leave, and long enough to be sure he was gone. All to complain about some insane stuff long after it supposedly even happened. If they have concerns, surely there are better times to address them than at 3am. What were they doing out at 3am anyway? And that man had totally purposely hidden a shadow at the corner of my house where he could avoid my headlights. I didn't reveal himself until I was out of my truck and exposed. And shouldn't the woman have walked up beside her husband, not gone around while I was distracted? They kept doing odd behavior, never enough that they're doing anything illegal or anything to report the police. But none of this is normal behavior. Honestly, I think these complaints are just excuses and they're really just taking the opportunity to intimidate me. I think they're messing with me on purpose. Then again, I could be wrong. Either way, I will be installing a motion light soon. I was so shaken up and had my adrenaline so high from someone scaring me from a blind spot by my house. Because seriously, that could have been someone else and a whole lot worse. The story starts several years ago. Me and my friends' interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which is when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom, so we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now, keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure that if we were going into any old building in the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was actually a chilly evening. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB area, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. We had been inside the hospital a few times, but never found anything strange, only the occasional sign of others having been or lived there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to the hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks, containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water. 
so nothing too heavy or valuable that would get damaged when tossed over the obstacles before us. A little ways off the road, it was dark if you clung to the buildings. We did for a while before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way over the first wall since the other way around to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain behind to be last over that wall. It was too high up for me to jump and haul myself over, so I resorted to stepping on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over at the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy in imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months, people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse, and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15 chain link fence directly in front of us separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that, someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third over, because I have a slight fear of climbing and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then sat at the top straddling it with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me, and one behind me who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing, then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up into the smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could really get cut up, so that wasn't an option. Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside, there was another drop down where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small, square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked amongst ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there, she said. What? Where? I could see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight and it was too dark. Hello, she called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine, and it was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of the hole in the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet, like the darkness had spilled out and weighed all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said in what I can only describe as a lustful tone gripping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath. Unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat, like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said slowly, that's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing maniacally, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does, and the way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there. And now. I was not about to risk some crazy guy coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. 15 foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were on the street and halfway down the block out of breath. So guy that was down there, let's not meet again. It was 2012 and my best friend Hannah had convinced me to join her on a weekend trip up north. She had, after searching for the longest time, found her dream car and was planning on traveling the 900 kilometer to the very north of Sweden to buy it. It was a secondhand door Suzuki Vitara in a purplish kind of color and I must admit I didn't share her obsession with it. But with her being the closest thing to a sister that I will ever get, I was happy to join her nonetheless. Hannah and I have always had each other, from the cradle and onwards. Sharing each other's love for adventure, we have traveled the world together. At the time this happened, we were both 21 and had recently returned from a trip in Asia. The man who was selling her the car had agreed to meet us at the small airport in Umeå, 
when we arrived shortly before lunchtime and it started to snow heavily. The first snow of the season, no less. The parking lot was almost empty and when I saw the man standing outside the Vitara, I felt immediately concerned. He was dressed like a hunter. A lot of people in this area of the country live a lifestyle with hunting and fishing, so nothing strange with that really. But still, there was something about him that made me uneasy. He was nice though, smiling and waving to us, shaking hands with us both before walking us around the car and pointing all the tiny little flaws. He showed us the work he had done on the car and showed the paperwork from the recently done engine repairs. He made the impression that he didn't want to hide anything. On the contrary, he made a show out of being very forthcoming and honest. The snowing had now intensified and we were getting cold. He opened the car door for us and said, I got the paperwork at home. Let's close the deal over some coffee. Against all my instincts, I climbed in after Hannah, both of us now trapped in the back seat. I had no reason to feel threatened by this man who had been nothing but pleasant to us other than the alarm bells going off inside my head. I can't tell what it was that made me feel that way, but there must have been some sign that something was wrong, something that my subconscious tuned to. The man was constantly talking. He showed the stereo, told us about the features of the car, about the places we drove past, about the wildlife and the nature. There was not a silent moment. After about 20 minutes, I started to notice that we were in no way moving in the direction of civilization. Instead, it seemed we were driving further and further into the vast wilderness. It struck me that he had us in the back of a two-door car, diving us into unknown territory and no one knew where we were. I looked at Hannah who was happily listening to the man telling stories about the area, and I noticed she didn't look at all worried. Maybe I was totally overreacting. We drove past a group of people standing by the side of the road, hunters planning their day or taking a break maybe. This truly is very different Sweden compared to the city. The car finally stopped outside a small wooden cottage with no neighboring houses apart from a small cabin that we drove past a few hundred meters down the road, but it had looked empty. We followed the man inside. He was still talking non-stop and continued to do so until the moment the door closed behind us. Hannah kept asking things about the car, and I could sense that her voice had a new undertone now, a thin, sharp tenseness that made me wonder if she too had started to feel that something wasn't right. I'll put the kettle on, he said, and as he passed us to go into the kitchen, he let his hand touch Hannah's hair and he smiled smugly. May I use the bathroom? I asked politely and made my way to the door with a little red heart on. I was washing my hands when I saw something in the stained bathroom mirror. Something was behind the water cistern. I pulled out a rolled up plastic folder and as I turned the pages, I felt my blood run cold. It was very violent pictures that looked like had been cut out from magazines, and they were glued to the paper. Surrounded by cut up pieces of handwritten text, put it together made a horrifying story about how a woman was lured into a car with the promise of getting to buy the car cheaply, and then it quickly turned into a horror story. I know this will sound silly, but when we traveled together, Hannah and I had a code word for whenever we felt it was time to get out of a situation. We had never needed to use it, just joked about it but now it came in handy. I walked out of the bathroom and looked at Hannah and said, Potatoes. We forgot to buy potatoes. And that's too bad, because we really need some. The look on my face must have told her that the situation was no joke and she said, Oh, should we get some as soon as possible? The sooner the better, I replied. Hannah, always pretty and charming and capable of great acting, casually walked over to the man in the kitchen, tapped his shoulder and said, Excuse me, but I was wondering if I can go have a quick look at the cam belt. He upped something about it being in good shape and handed over the keys. We got into the car and speeded off faster than the weather strictly speaking allowed. We left the car at the airport and hoped we hadn't made a terrible mistake. What if he reported it stolen? It would be embarrassing to explain to the police. But nothing happened. He didn't follow us, didn't report it. We had to take the train since we had no plane tickets. The original plan had been to take the car home, and we didn't want to linger closer to the airport in case he came looking for us. Later Hannah asked what made me use the code word and I told her about what I had found. It might have just been a fantasy, a sick game, and maybe he would never done anything to us. But right then and there, I was convinced we would have died if we didn't get out. I'm glad Hannah didn't need any convincing or proof, just the code word. I truly think that if we hadn't talked about it so many times before, about how we would handle a situation where we need to get out fast, things would have ended differently. Differently. Both of us knew that either of us ever used the code word, it's time to get out, no questions asked, just move. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Okay, so I've had a few issues with my next door neighbor since I moved in, but nothing creepy until just recently. There is a man, a woman, and at least one boy living there, and I mostly just avoid them. The man seems okay but a bit weird, and the boy just keeps to himself, and the woman is quite a bit off. Not long after we moved in, she left a note in my mailbox. Our mailboxes are right beside each other, between our houses. Anyway, I stood at the mailbox reading the note. She thought that my dog was using the bathroom in her yard. It was possible, as our friends had some holes in it, that our dog had gotten out then. But those holes had been fixed a long time ago. Still, no big deal, except I noticed her standing in her driveway, just staring at me. And the note was very long, I just kept reading it. 
The more I read it, the crazier it got, and the weirder her behavior in my peripheral vision became. Apparently I was entitled. She seemed to think I was somehow instructing my dog to use the bathroom in their yard. Her note went on a tangent about how awful dogs are. She was also 100% convinced it was my dog, even though there are always tons of loose dogs, cats, and wildlife wandering around and no doubt traveling through her unfenced backyard. In my peripheral vision, she got into her SUV, backed out of her driveway, then parked it along the street directly behind me and just idled there, staring. The note then went on a weird, long tirade about the previous family to live in my house, saying I was Anther Deb as if I'd have any idea at all what that is even supposed to mean, then concluded in some odd insults and some implied not-quite threats. This is the closest thing we ever had to a conversation at this point. I can understand not wanting a dog using the bathroom in her yard, but this was a bit of an extreme reaction as this was literally the first time I'd even heard of there being a problem. A simple note would have done, but this note was insane. She was still staring behind me. I decided to try to ignore her and just go to my house. That's when she shouted out her window, Are you playing a game? The reaction made no sense. Are you nuts? I replied, as I officially ran out of patience. She shouted more nonsense and insults at me while blocking my driveway, which is right next to the mailboxes, with her vehicle, while I repeatedly told her to leave before I called the cops. This went back and forth like this for a while, but she eventually sped off when I pulled my cell phone out. Later, my boyfriend, who had not been home at this time this happened, had a chat with the neighbors. He said they seemed agreeable and reasonable and basically dismissed me of just being dramatic. The woman told a very different version of events, of course. I was annoyed that my boyfriend wasn't taking me seriously, but let it go. I think he just wanted to keep getting along with the man next door, as they sometimes borrow tools. They speak to him a lot differently than how they speak to me. They don't do anything rude to me while he's around. In fact, they don't speak to me when he's around at all. They always wait for him to be away. Anyway, I mostly just avoid them. Sometimes, the woman stares at me, but I just ignore her. Until recently, I have been mostly successful. Here's the creepy story. I don't sleep well at night when I'm home alone, and I'm always home alone now because my boyfriend is out of the country on business for months at a time. I often feel like there's someone just outside my house or at my door. Sometimes, my dogs act up at odd hours, but I never see anyone. I keep my house alarm armed and my pistol in my nightstand. The other night was one such night. I didn't sleep well and kept having a sinking feeling that something was wrong. Anyway, I got out of bed at about 2am because I thought I was scheduled to work at 3am. I had mostly given up on getting a restful sleep then anyway. As I left my house, I heard something to my left, the direction of my neighbor's house, but didn't see anything. I was always nervous in my driveway because the motion sensor light was broken, but there was always a lot of darkness between my door and my truck, so I always moved quickly to my driveway. I got in my truck and went to work. It turned out that I misread my schedule and didn't work at 3 that morning after all. Annoyed at the mistake, but grateful I'd get to go home and sleep a little more before the actual start of my shift at 7, I went home. I pulled into my driveway and didn't see anything in the beam of my truck's headlights. I always look around my truck before getting out. I turned the headlight off and got out. I took a few steps ahead of my truck, and then all of a sudden a large man called out to me, shouted really, from the shadows at the corner of my house. He scared me so bad that I screamed, reached for my pepper spray, and fell down. Not useful. He apologized in a tone that didn't sound sorry at all. It was my neighbor, and that wasn't much of a relief. Apparently it was my fault that he occasionally found trash in his yard, in Windy, Colorado. Complaining about this seemed to be a lot more important issue than scaring the heck out of me while I'm alone at night. He showed no real concern or realization that was even wrong at all. Again, I have no problem with neighbors bringing issues to my attention, but seriously, hey, can you make sure trash from your bins isn't blown into my yard is not a question that takes 10 minutes nor is it one that needs to be addressed at 3 in the morning. I'm not in agreement to keep the peace, but I know the trash isn't mine. We live in a windy area. Trash gets blown around in people's yards all the time. No big deal. But he would just not stop going on about it. He kept needlessly repeating himself and made some not quite but kind of threat about getting along. Think about the lines of, it would be a shame if something were to happen, type sort of threats. He was keeping me busy. I didn't even notice his wife flank me. Before I even knew she was there, she appeared from the shadows by a tree. She wanted to yell at me about some eggs. A few weeks ago, I found a bunch of eggs smashed on the road near our shelled mailbox. As the carton was right next to them, I thought the carton had obviously just been dropped. Not that someone was trying to egg anything. I assumed my neighbor had dropped the eggs on her way to get the mail and just left them. She denies this, but I still think that's the most likely explanation because no one else has any reason to be out at our mailbox with eggs. But I didn't care enough to say anything to her about it at the time, so I just let it go and forgot all about it. Now she was accusing me of leaving eggs around, again, inexplicably expressing the grievance at 3am. Weird that she hadn't brought it up weeks ago when it happened, but I know why she didn't. 
My boyfriend was still here then. My boyfriend has been away on business for several weeks now, long enough for them to have noticed his absence. They were also probably aware that my motion sensor light was out. They sure seemed to know how to avoid my headlight beams. Being surprisingly patient, I explained that I knew nothing about the eggs. I mentioned that I later found a lot of the shells in my yard and figured a squirrel must have carried them there. She proudly informed me that she tossed them onto my yard herself. Apparently she thought that was okay, but someone dropping them in the first place isn't. Anyway, this is where I started to get over my shock a bit and started getting pissed. Initially, I had been somewhat relieved that the man in the shadows had been my neighbor, not some random crazy person, but now I was pissed. I had now been outside with them for like 20 minutes, while they accused me about stupid stuff. While I tried to be polite and agreeable even though I had nothing to do with it, but now everything wrong with the situation had just kicked in. I eventually remembered that I don't actually have to put up with any of this and cut her off mid rant and said, It's 3am, I'm going home, Good night." and turned on my heel. I heard her say something in an unkind tone as I left, but didn't catch what it was. They had staked out my house, waited for my boyfriend to leave, and long enough to be sure he was gone, all to complain about some insane stuff long after it supposedly even happened. If they have concerns, surely there are better times to address them than at 3am. What were they doing out at 3am anyway? And that man had totally purposely hidden a shadow at the corner of my house where he could avoid my headlights didn't reveal himself until I was out of my truck and exposed. And shouldn't the woman have walked up beside her husband, not gone around while I was distracted? They kept doing odd behavior, never enough that they're doing anything illegal or anything to report to police, but none of this is normal behavior. Honestly, I think these complaints are just excuses and they're really just taking the opportunity to intimidate me. I think they're messing with me on purpose. Then again, I could be wrong. Either way, I will be installing a motion light soon. I was so shaken up and had my adrenaline so high from someone scaring me from a blind spot by my house. Because seriously, that could have been someone else and a whole lot worse. The story starts several years ago. Me and my friend's interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which was when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom, so we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now, keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure that if we are going into any old building in the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was actually a chilly evening. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB area, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. We had been inside the hospital a few times, but never found anything strange, only the occasional sign of others having been or lived there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to the hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks, containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water, so nothing too heavy or valuable that would get damaged when tossed over the obstacles before us. A little ways off the road, it was dark if you clung to the buildings. We did for a while before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way over the first wall since the other way around to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain behind to be last over that wall. It was too high up for me to jump and haul myself over so I resorted to stepping on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over at the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy in imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months, people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse, and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15 chain link fence directly in front of us separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that, someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground rather silently due to their lightness. 
I was the third over because of a slight fear of climbing and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then set at the top straddling it with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me and one behind me who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing, then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a while because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up into the smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could really get cut up, so that wasn't an option. Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside, there was another drop down where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small, square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked amongst ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there, she said. What? Where? I could see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight and it was too dark. Hello, she called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine, and it was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of the hole in the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet, like the darkness had spilled out and weighed all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said in what I can only describe as a lustful tone gripping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath. Unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat, like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said slowly, that's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing maniacally, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does, and the way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there, and now. I was not about to risk some crazy guy coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. 15 foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were on the street and halfway down the block out of breath. So guy that was down there, let's not meet again. It was 2012 and my best friend Hannah had convinced me to join her on a weekend trip up north. She had, after searching for the longest time, found her dream car and was planning on traveling the 900 kilometer to the very north of Sweden to buy it. It was a secondhand door Suzuki Vitara in a purplish kind of color and I must admit I didn't share her obsession with it. But with her being the closest thing to a sister that I will ever get, I was happy to join her nonetheless. Hannah and I have always had each other, from the cradle and onwards. Sharing each other's love for adventure, we have traveled the world together. At the time this happened, we were both 21 and had recently returned from a trip in Asia. The man who was selling her the car had agreed to meet us at the small airport in Umeo when we arrived shortly before lunchtime and it started to snow heavily. The first snow of the season, no less. The parking lot was almost empty and when I saw the man standing outside the Vitara, I felt immediately concerned. He was dressed like a hunter. A lot of people in this area of the country live a lifestyle with hunting and fishing, so nothing strange with that really. But still, there was something about him that made me uneasy. He was nice though, smiling and waving to us, shaking hands with us both before walking us around the car and pointing all the tiny little flaws. He showed us the work he had done on the car and showed the paperwork from the recently done engine repairs. He made the impression that he didn't want to hide anything. On the contrary, he made a show out of being very forthcoming and honest. The snowing had now intensified and we were getting cold. He opened the car door for us and said, I got the paperwork at home. Let's close the deal over some coffee. Against all my instincts, I climbed in after Hannah, both of us now trapped in the back seat. I had no reason to feel threatened by this man who had been nothing but pleasant to us other than the alarm bells going off inside my head. I can't tell what it was that made me feel that way, but there must have been a some sign that something was wrong, something that my subconscious tuned to. The man was constantly talking. He showed the stereo, told us about the features of the car, about the places we drove past, about the wildlife and the nature. There was not a silent moment. After about 20 minutes, I started to notice that we were in no way moving in the direction of civilization. Instead, it seemed we were driving further and further into the vast wilderness. 
It struck me that he had us in the back of a two-door car, diving us into unknown territory and no one knew where we were. I looked at Hannah who was happily listening to the man telling stories about the area, and I noticed she didn't look at all worried. Maybe I was totally overreacting. We drove past a group of people standing by the side of the road, hunters planning their day or taking a break maybe. This truly is very different Sweden compared to the city. The car finally stopped outside a small wooden cottage with no neighboring houses apart from a small cabin that we drove past a few hundred meters down the road, but it had looked empty. We followed the man inside. He was still talking non-stop and continued to do so until the moment the door closed behind us. Hannah kept asking things about the car, and I could sense that her voice had a new undertone now, a thin, sharp tenseness that made me wonder if she too had started to feel that something wasn't right. I'll put the kettle on, he said, and as he passed us to go into the kitchen, he let his hand touch Hannah's hair and he smiled smugly. May I use the bathroom? I asked politely and made my way to the door with a little red heart on. I was washing my hands when I saw something in the stained bathroom mirror. Something was behind the water cistern. I pulled out a rolled up plastic folder and as I turned the pages, I felt my blood run cold. It was very violent pictures that looked like had been cut out from magazines, and they were glued to the paper. Surrounded by cut up pieces of handwritten text, put it together made a horrifying story about how a woman was lured into a car with the promise of getting to buy the car cheaply, and then it quickly turned into a horror story. I knew this will sound silly but when we traveled together, Hannah and I had a code word for whenever we felt it was time to get out of a situation. We had never needed to use it, just joked about it, but now it came in handy. I walked out of the bathroom and looked at Hannah and said, Potatoes. You forgot to buy potatoes. And that's too bad, because we really need some. The look on my face must have told her that the situation was no joke and she said, Oh, should we get some as soon as possible? The sooner the better, I replied. Hannah, always pretty and charming and capable of great acting, casually walked over to the man in the kitchen, tapped his shoulder and said, Excuse me, but I was wondering if I can go have a quick look at the cam belt. He upped something about it being in good shape and handed over the keys. We got into the car and speeded off faster than the weather strictly speaking allowed. We left the car at the airport and hoped we hadn't made a terrible mistake. What if he reported it stolen? It would be embarrassing to explain to the police, but nothing happened. He didn't follow us, didn't report it. We had to take the train since we had no plane tickets. The original plan had been to take the car home, and we didn't want to linger closer to the airport in case he came looking for us. Later Hannah asked what made me use the code word, and I told her about what I had found. It might have just been a fantasy, a sick game, and maybe he would never done anything to us. But right then and there, I was convinced we would have died if we didn't get out. I'm glad Hannah didn't need any convincing or proof, just the code word. I truly think that if we hadn't talked about it so many times before, about how we would handle a situation where we need to get out fast, things would have ended differently. Differently. Both of us knew that either of us ever used the code word, it's time to get out, no questions asked, just move. This happened to me two years ago. It was my first month on the job, and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. I'm a 38 year old male, I've worked security jobs most of my life, and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well known concert venues for years, so I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. The place I currently work is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartments with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in the back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers, and real estate agents and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It is located in a well-known tourist town in the United States. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor. The doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you are at. It will ring the company's cell phone and I answer and can come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a code to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's never really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off the keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I am the only security person here at night. A co-worker who was leaving told me the side iron gates that led to the parking lot are open on one side because they are stuck. This is nothing new and they often do get jammed. She told me the repair people would be in tomorrow, sometime to fix them but to do just some extra patrol out here tonight. This place sits across the road from a public park and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to bring in homeless at night who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, 
keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We are simply eyes and ears and to call the police if something comes up. Of course, you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases if you are in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I am to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious. Watch the cameras in the security office, which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for a day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3am. I had just sat down to eat my food when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, thanks for calling, resort name here. This is security officer James, how can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked how can I help. The man started to breathe heavier and laughed in silence. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office into the door he was at when it rang again. This time from call box number 2 which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you, they said in this raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. Then the phone rang again. This time I picked up and before he could speak, I let him know the cops are on their way and to leave the property now as he is on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. The guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they were a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you, the cops won't make it much here in time, they said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police but honestly the location of this place it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here and I figured this guy was just some homeless guy from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked the back lot just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. But a half hour passed, I had finished my food and was just about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked up and said my normal line then I heard, Where are the cops? I don't see them but I see you, the voice said. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and did not see anything. I went to the front door to look out there. There was nothing but darkness and a few front floodlights on. I know you're alone, he said. I basically told him to get screwed and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. The next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40 with long, stringy hair poking down in these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest butcher knife I've ever seen and make a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy. He continued slamming his body against the glass trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window but managed to bust his head open, so the window now had blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him and the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on something because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores but this is the last thing I need with this guy running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones, he would at least be trapped or slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yell the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held that knife up again before running to the darkness of the parking garages. 
I call the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't, and while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time his hood had fallen back. He was bald headed with wild, long, stringy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, die die, while making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming it into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looks like and I told him I have camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone and he had driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if he came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was daylight and the people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. This guy literally took all the 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8 a.m., I told her what happened and she said that they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone know who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after, but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or who he was. So crazy bloody guy with a knife, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in Chequamegon National Forest in northern Wisconsin, and after our experience, we did not plan to return unless we go with a large group of people. My girlfriend and I are from college, so northern Wisconsin was our go-to place for R&R. &R. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin and in the UP, but never to this area. We are not backpacking experts, but we have been to a number of national parks and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find the time away from work. We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature, but this trip made us appreciate the presence of other people around us in unfamiliar places. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail, like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote, and the only access is via logging roads. We plan to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, and hike back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wausau, and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the National Forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forest. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way to our own parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be campers, as they had a rusted out, bunged up pickup truck. As we drove past, I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. And before we rounded a bend, I glanced back into the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze of road dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we did not encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later after winding our way on the narrow logging road. There was no one else parked at the trailhead, a perfect chance to get some needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our packs and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lushness of the forest and the topography of the glacial moraine. After a solid 8 hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided ample space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about 100 feet behind the shelter. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our dehydrated trail food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a Nalgene filled with wine, and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing embers, we decided to head back to our tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day, but after lugging a heavy pack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs, but that night, there were no RVs or other campers to make noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lull me to sleep. 
My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she normally had some apprehension whenever we were sleeping away from home. I'm not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone chilling noise. It was pitch dark outside, and over the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent, hearing the noise again. Our old tent had mesh windows, but the backpacking tent we were using had no window. We could only guess at what was making the sound outside of our tent. We initially thought that an animal had got our food and garbage bag, which we left in the shelter, but the noise was too distinct, and it did not sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and scared, we did not know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight, against the wishes of my girlfriend. The knocking continued but we remained still as to not give away our location. For all we knew, whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. Then we heard it, leaves rustling, a branch breaking, voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We could not make out what was being said, but it sounded like a couple of people talking in the distance. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices did not seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there did not spot the tent or decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first light, we slowly got out of our tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was out there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. We quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put our tent away. When we got to the shelter, my girlfriend screamed in horror. On the entrance to the shelter, the wood was freshly cut. The word kill was cut into the shelter wall, and there were a number of axe and knife cuts where someone was chopping at the wall. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. We traversed the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting closer to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we neared the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time, but something was wrong. The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up and there was something stuck in the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood still stuck to the wiper and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning off the car. We threw our gear in the trunk and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, but I could not see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station by the nearest town, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper, and I tried to remove as much dried blood as I could. I filled up on gas so we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. This was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the Great American Road Trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long-haul trucker, I suggested that to save a ton of money, we would sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week, we'd gotten so we could set up a camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night after the first night where we felt scared until the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than 3 or 4 hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside a few must-see landmarks. We drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of people we met at a campsite, in the back of their pickup, because it got hungry and overheard them saying they were going to go. We met an 80 year old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar, played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm, got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them, spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Basically, every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look out to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was still light out, 
We grouped around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met some pretty cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off, and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man, who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting up about our trip, families, everything. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite, and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of us for one of us to go get up to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, if you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow. Jokes on the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within 5 minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about how something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We would just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point, it's pitch black out, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside of that circle. Suddenly, there's a red dot in the darkness, and it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen of the digital camera lit up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to ask to take pictures with us. It was an entirely strange thing to have this person taking a photo of us without asking or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like deer in the headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he was doing was a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things, and takes another photo, this time with a flash. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down, not a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make some BS excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the heck out. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, Be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rush back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV, and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I was shaking, I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in a full panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off, because now he knows exactly where our car is. That is the only night we not set up camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out the campsite. As we got into the dirt road, Ranger was walking towards our car with that same cold expression. Ranger, let's not ever meet again. This happened on a Sunday night when I was about 10 years old in the mid-90s. My family house was on a short street, a dead end created by a railroad track. We had a three-story house, which was the farthest from the tracks, with windows on every floor, two in the basement. The stairs from our bedrooms upstairs led directly to the front door, which connected to a closed-in mudroom slash porch, which also had a screen door and a glass door that only locked from the inside. Even friends and extended family would wait outside to be let into the porch, as that's where the doorbell was. From inside the porch, you could see right up the stairs to the window and the door. Across the house, parallel to the front door was the back door. Both had a large window in them. It must have been June because my older brother had a soccer game, and I only had a week of school left. I personally found watching him struggle on the field and being forced to cheer while being eaten by bugs really boring, and I just got in a box set of books I desperately wanted to be alone with. After about an hour of reasoning and pleading, I finally convinced my parents to let me stay at home alone for the first time while they went to the game. They were only going to be gone for a few hours, and although we didn't live in the best neighborhood, our neighbors were close family friends. I'd be fine. Mistake. Usually before a game we'd all go out and eat together, but since I was staying home, they ordered a pizza from down the street, my brother's favorite. I'd already been face deep in the first book for half an hour when the doorbell rang. Pizza. I walked up from my bedroom and down the stairs to my living room. I got to the bottom of the stairs, 
and my father was at the door having a conversation with the delivery guy. They were talking about soccer, so I just decided to take the pizzas and keep on keeping on, which is when I noticed the delivery guy staring at me, intently. He was a middle-aged Caucasian with an accent, and he was smiling at me in a way I recognized. It was the same smile I had on my face when I told my parents I was old enough to spend the evening in the house alone. Fake, but convincing. I walked past him through the living room to the kitchen and threw the pizzas on the counter and shoved my face into my book. My father talked to him for a few more minutes about sports, and then closed the door. My family sat down to eat and chat while I forgot all about them, the food, and the delivery guy. Before they left, around 6.30pm, my parents wrote down all the emergency numbers, gave me instructions not to open the door, and headed out when my brother and I waved them off, excited to finally have the house to myself, if only to read in silence. I locked the main door and headed up to my room to read. It was blissfully quiet, save for the sound of my dog's occasional barking in the backyard. I had just finished the first book, and immediately started on the next when the doorbell rang, and my dog lost it in the backyard. I was up in my bed immediately. I looked at my alarm clock for the first time since they left, it read 8pm. My whole family was at the game, and any extended family in the province was as well. No one would be coming over without calling, especially on a Sunday night. The doorbell rang again, and again, again. I remained frozen in place, my book crumpling in my shaking hands. I, for the first time, was completely alone and terrified. My sly kid smile flashed in my mind, I thought I was so clever convincing my parents I wasn't scared to be alone. And then another smile flashed in my memory, the pizza guy. And then the banging started, loud successive bangs that rattled me if not the house. And now from the backyard my dog was livid. I could hear him barking and whining at the back door. I wanted to call someone, but the only phone was in the kitchen, which involved walking right past the front door. I panicked. I was scared to leave my room, as my feet would be visible to whomever it was once I entered the hallway. But what if it was just a neighbor? I checked the alarm clock again and was surprised that only minutes had gone by, and my parents wouldn't be back for an hour and a half, minimum. I'd have to wait it out, so I did. I got up as silently as possible and closed my bedroom door. Eventually, all the barking, ringing, and banging stopped. I waited for a half an hour, and then opened my door and crept out of my bedroom. I crept down the hallway to the top of the stairs, trying to press myself into the far wall, as out of sight as possible. But all the lights were on, and I realized that it was obvious that someone was home. I peered quickly down the stairs in the window, looking through to the glass porch door, and saw no one. Luckily, no one was there. I tore down the stairs and ran for the back door and checked outside. Nothing but my dog, who was all too happy to run inside. I let him in through a crack and slammed the door after him, locking it, and I realized it hadn't been locked before. I turned to the phone, grabbing it, and about to dial my neighbor's number, when my dog started acting like he was going to the vets. A low growl accompanied by a crouch, backing away. I froze and looked in his direction, then followed his gaze to the window in the inner front door, where inside my porch, past the front screen and glass doors, stood a man I'd never seen before, and he was staring at me, livid. I froze, paralyzed with fear as I looked at him, and I couldn't look away. He was tall, slim, and had bags under his eyes. His hair was shoulder length and unkempt. He lifted his hand and placed it on the window, and then looked down, as he tried to turn the knob, twice, but it was locked. I came out of my paralysis the second his eyes left mine, and I moved quickly to the side of the wall that led to the basement stairs. It blocked us from being able to see each other, hiding. Hiding felt good. My dog, still in the corner, inched towards me, low to the ground and still growling. I couldn't breathe, my heart was pounding. This couldn't get any worse. Wrong. I saw you, boy. I saw you. Open the door. My stomach nestled in my throat. I started crying. I've never really had a flight or fight moment. Only flight or flight. But there was nowhere to go. Back upstairs led right past him, and going down into the basement seemed even more terrifying, as I'd have to walk past the window in the middle of the staircase that looked out into the alley leading to my backyard. I saw you. You can't hide forever. You have to pay. You have to pay. He screamed through the door window, shaking the door as he pulled on it. I thought he would just break the window and unlock the door, so I descended slowly down to the steps to the basement, going just halfway to put some distance between us. I stood still, waiting, and then silence. For a minute, nothing, and then the sound of the glass door and screen door to the outside opening and slamming. More silence. My dog straightened out, walked over to the top of the stairs, and then looked right past me, and started growling. I can still see you, I see you, I see you boy, and you have to pay. I jumped and turned my head, and through the window to the alley, I saw his face. He was laying on the ground, staring at me. I see you. I know you're home. I see you. I bolted up the stairs to the inner front door, ripped it open, and then locked the glass door to the porch, and backed up into the living room, closing the main door behind me, locking that too. I ran to the kitchen, grabbed the phone, and unplugged it, and turned back around. He was at the door again, this time outside the porch. 
I steered myself and ran up the stairs with the phone, dog in tow, to my parents' bedroom, which was the only room with a working phone jack and a lock on their door. And then the doorbell started to ring. I closed and locked their door behind me, left their light off, and plugged in the phone. I dialed my neighbors and got their answering machine. I dialed again, no answer. Every ring of the phone was matched by a ring of the doorbell. I called them over and over, finally whispering a message. Tom, it's Kevin. I managed trying to get into the house and I'm alone. I peered out of my parents' window and looked down into the front yard. He was still there, pacing, walking up and down the stairs, looking in the windows, walking out of sight as he entered the alleyway and then back into the front. I noticed my neighbor's car wasn't there. They weren't even home and it still hadn't occurred to me to call 911. So I hunkered down and waited for my dog, watching from the corner of the window. He walked back up the porch, tried the door and then the doorbell went off a few more times and then he walked down the stairs and headed back out into the street. He walked a bit down the sidewalk away from the dead end, towards the main road and then stopped, and turned around, walking back towards the house. He stopped again and looked up, directly at the window I was looking through, but the room was dark. He couldn't see me. Instead of turning back around, he continued walking down the street, and crossed the street when he reached the train tracks. He walked back up the other sidewalk, staring at my house all the while, and kept going until he reached the main intersection, and turned the corner. I stood in the corner of the window, watching the street for what seemed like hours, until my parents' car pulled up in front of the house, along with the neighbor's car. They all got out and my mother headed towards the house while my father started chatting with the neighbor's husband. I unlocked the door and booked it downstairs, instantly crying with relief as I unlocked the inner door, and then the glass porch door. I recounted the night's events to my parents in the kitchen through tears, and they had just started to calm me down, and that's when the doorbell rang. I started to shake and cry again, and my father burst out of his seat and barreled towards the door and swung it open. And there he was, the man. He stood there smiling a disgusting smile, and I immediately took off down into the basement. My mother was right behind me. I heard my father and him arguing loudly for a few minutes, and then my father slamming the door. My father called my mother and I back upstairs, and then after I made him promise the man was gone, I walked up into the kitchen. My father sat me down and explained the situation. Earlier, my father hadn't had enough cash on him for the pizzas. He had told the delivery guy that he would be back in 4 hours, but had to make the game and didn't have time to get more cash. The delivery guy agreed, wished my brother good luck in his game, and then had passed the message onto the guy who would be working the closing night shift. The delivery guy had misunderstood, thinking that he was to return immediately and collect payment. He explained it all to my father as if he had rang the doorbell a few times, and then had left. Not that he had been circling the house terrifying me for over an hour. He told my father he wasn't sure if anyone was home, so he looked around back, but only saw my dog. So he left, only returning, coincidentally, minutes after my parents returned, armed with a convincing story. Kids have such an imagination. Sorry that I frightened him. Suffice it to say, but I brought my books with me to every soccer game after that. This happened a couple weeks ago. I'm 17 and my parents were out of state for the month on vacation. I live in a small, nice neighborhood that has quite a distance from any other neighborhoods around us. My neighborhood likes to be involved with each other, so there's always neighborhood summer barbecues and neighborhood parties now and then. Everyone always attends to these, so I'm very familiar with who lives in the neighborhood as I can name off a majority of them. My neighborhood is always dead quiet after 9pm as the kids are inside by then and families are usually heading off to bed. I meant to spray paint art and I decided I wanted to work on a painting in my garage at around 10pm because it was cooler by then. Mind that the garage door is fully open. I'm setting out a tarp so I can start painting when I hear someone walking on the sidewalk. I look up expecting to say hi to a neighbor going on a late night walk around the neighborhood. Instead, it's a man I thought I couldn't recognize at first glance due to it being dark and the only descent light source around was from the garage. He was at least 6 foot 3, lanky, and looked completely normal from what I could see. The man stood at the end of my driveway facing me. With the little light stretching across the driveway hitting his face, I didn't recognize him. I live in a very friendly state where we're usually nice to strangers and make conversations. I thought nothing suspicious as he could have been just a neighbor I wasn't familiar with, so I just struck up a conversation like I usually do. Hi, how's it going? Uh, hi, it's going good so far. Sorry, I don't really recognize you because it's so dark. Oh, I'm Xavier. I don't think I've ever met you before. Did you just move into the neighborhood or something? Uh, yeah. I moved into the corner house up the street. You moved in with the Millers? Yeah, the Millers. I moved in with them. They're my cousins and they're letting me stay with them until I figure some things out. I thought nothing of this, as this seemed normal for a family to let a member of theirs stay with them for a while and the Millers are just those kind of people. Well, I better get going. I need to finish something. It was nice meeting you, Lanny. I never introduced myself, I think. Oh, the Millers told me all about you. I thought nothing of this as well because I would babysit the Miller's kids frequently and my family is close with them. Xavier kept walking and I thought nothing of what just happened and started painting. The next morning I went on a run to my high school that was about 3 miles away. 
My high school is on a common road that always has cars on it. As I was nearing the school, I heard a car pull up behind me. I stopped running and turned around to see a beat up car with the windows rolled down. A smiling man was sitting in the driver's seat. He looked to me in his mid to late 20s and he had a fairly handsome face. Hi. I probably had a confused look on my face as I didn't recognize the man, but I knew his voice from somewhere. Xavier, we met the other night. Oh, hi, sorry, I didn't recognize you. It's fine. Hey, you're pretty far from home. That's quite a long run. Aren't you tired? I can give you a ride home if you'd like. Oh no, it's fine. I like running. Thanks for the offer though. Wanna go out for a cup of coffee? No thanks, I don't drink coffee. We don't have to get coffee then. I'll pay for you. Come on, I wanna go get something with you. No thanks, I'm not really interested. Oh come on, let's go. Hop in. He reaches over to open the passenger door and beckons me to come in. At this point, it's clear that I don't want to go and I step off from the grass and back onto the sidewalk. I said no, sorry. Come on, just get in the car. It's not a big deal. I gotta go. Some friends are expecting me. That's when I fall and sprint to the school's track and called a friend to pick me up. While waiting at the track for my friend to pick me up, Xavier's beat up car goes down the road, away from the direction of my neighborhood. Few bad things happened in my city, so I didn't think much of what happened and shook it off, which was stupid of me to do. A couple of days later there was a neighborhood barbecue. Although my parents weren't home, I didn't mind going to the barbecue alone because it's always a blast. I hung up with my neighborhood friends like I usually do. I saw the Millers and had a friendly conversation with them, which soon turned to, oh I met Xavier the other night. The Millers didn't know who I was talking about. They said they didn't know and Xavier, no family member moved in with them. I told them about what happened at the school the other day while I was on my run. The Millers and I are freaking out about now. They call over one of our neighbors who's a cop, we'll call him John. John lives a couple houses down from me. I tell him about the confrontations I had with the guy and what he looks like. He told me to call him or the cops if I didn't feel safe or if I encountered the guy again. John patrolled around our neighborhood for a few weeks. Neighbors kept a lookout for Xavier and didn't let their children out late. There was no son of Xavier for two weeks. I got back from a friend's house late at night. I pulled into the garage and went inside, turned on the lights, and I was making something to eat. Then there was a soft knock on the front door. It was late. I got back from a friend's and my guard was down so I walked across my house like I usually do. From the front door, you can hear footsteps if someone is walking to the door normally and not trying to hide their steps. I thought it was just a friend. I looked through the peephole and saw a wide smile that belonged to Xavier. He was at my door, late at night and he had a large backpack with him. He heard my footsteps and I could hear him say, I'm sorry about last time. I didn't mean to be like that Laney. It was just a bad day, through the door. I wanted him to go away. I meant to yell, get away from me, through the closed door but all that came out was a lame whimper. I just came to apologize, open the door, I don't mean any harm. He tries to wiggle the doorknob, his voice in constant pestering gets louder and louder. At this point I'm freaking out and I couldn't think at all. I couldn't remember where I put my phone. My family doesn't have a house phone either. Xavier began pounding on the door and repeatedly pushing on the doorbell and kept repeating, open the door Laney, open the door, they're waiting for us. My dog heard the ringing of the doorbell. I don't think he heard the soft knock because he was upstairs somewhere, but when my dog hears the doorbell, he's always excited to go look out the front window and see who's standing on the porch. If it's someone he recognizes, he'll just stand there quietly looking at them until one of us opens the door. When it's someone he doesn't recognize, he barks. He's a German Shepherd and his aggressive bark is very loud. My dog comes running down the stairs, looks at the window and he doesn't recognize Xavier, so he starts barking at him from the window. Xavier laughs and I hear him say, They never told me you had a dog. You're smarter than they said you were, Laney. With my dog barking, I guess I snapped back into my senses. I realized I left my phone in my car in the garage. I called the cops and John. By the time they got here, Xavier was gone. I gave a description to them and they drove around the area for an hour looking for the guy, but they never found him. I stayed at a relative's house for a couple of days until my parents got back and we changed all the locks in the house and installed a security system along with floodlights. My parents had me on lockdown. John patrols around the neighborhood for a while after his shift ends every night now. Xavier, let's not meet again. I'm from the middle of nowhere, born and raised, which can get awfully boring. In order to shave off boredom in my particular little corner of nowhere, my friends and I often enjoy something called contra dancing, which is basically New England folk dancing, where one pairs off with a different, random partner at each dance. This hobby would bring us to all corners of the area and in contact with lots of interesting and usually older people. One night, a friend and I had driven about 40 minutes into the woods to this old townhouse. It's an incredibly scenic little area, even at night, great view of the stars, crickets chirping, people dancing in the tiny town hall. A perfect hot summer night with friends and about 60 others, again mostly old town folk. I had even made cookies for everyone to enjoy, which was announced at the beginning of the dance and was applauded by everyone there. I had danced maybe two dances when an older man in his mid-sixties approached me for a dance. This was far from unusual, in fact, most of my dance partners were over 40. I had seen this guy at several contra dances, so he definitely wasn't new. 
This guy came off kind of creepy though. Most of the older guys struck 18 year old me as grandfatherly, but some just are uncomfortable to be close to. I refused him, saying I promised my friend a dance. He insisted that I dance the dance after with him. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed, trying to be as perky as possible so he didn't know he was making me uncomfortable. You look so beautiful tonight, was the first thing out of his mouth when we paired up for the dance. I kind of just smiled and nodded. I didn't want to be encouraging. He was sweaty, had a walrus mustache, and was bald except for a crown of grey hair. The dance was a particular extravagant one, with a move called a gypsy, when the partners stare into each other's eyes while circling around each other into a swing. He started making remarks under his breath during this move, such as, get over here and can't get away from me, while pulling me closer. Gross, but nothing too bad. I heard you made the cookies. They were delicious. I'll have to get the recipe out of you, or just make you my wife. Then I have them all to myself. I almost stopped the dance to get away from him, but I shut down and refused eye contact and conversation. I was sufficiently grossed out, but it was nothing too bad. I pulled my friend aside after and told her about him, and then enjoyed the rest of my night. After summer dances, the young people often drive down to a small pond and swim to get off the sweat and grossness of the dance. Skinny dipping is encouraged, as this spot is really in the middle of nowhere, no houses around, and an absolute amazing view of the stars. My friend and I spent about 20 minutes hanging out in the water, with people slowly leaving until we were the only ones left. That's what I thought at least, until I saw a figure standing at the bank of the pond staring out at us. I didn't call out, assuming it was one of our friends. I swam closer, starting to get out of the water. It wasn't until I was actually fully out of the water, clothed only in a t-shirt and underwear, that I recognized the old man from before. I lurch a fear and wrongness I felt in that moment I will never forget. I have never seen anyone above the age of 25 go down to the pond with us, and he was fully clothed and not there for a swim. He also wasn't saying anything. Shannon, we have to go now. I yelled back at her. The pond bank was narrow and it was hard to scramble around him. I was pretending I couldn't see him, that he wasn't there, or that I didn't care he was there. Shannon was about 20 feet behind me when he turned to follow me back to the cars. The rocks were painful to walk on and made it hard to move quickly. I heard you guys were coming down here, he said. At this point, Shannon was just coming near him. She did not recognize him from earlier stories, it wasn't reacting to the creepiness as strongly as I was. Haha, yeah, sometimes we cool off down here, Shannon replied. He got between me and her, blocking her from the car. You know, you and your friend look like sisters. I heard she made the cookies. Do you cook as well as her? I'd love a pair of you at home. This is when the situation really hits Shannon. We're alone, with this guy who's apparently followed us to the middle of nowhere, with unknown intentions. It was nice talking to you, but we have to go now. Come on, Shannon. I was practically running to the car, throwing the words over my shoulders. He put a hand on Shannon's bare shoulder, which spurred her after me. Come on, you two. I'm just trying to have some fun. I was already in reverse by the time Shannon got in the car with me. We tore out of the dirt road at about 50 miles per hour and hit pavement at around 70. I almost peaked when I saw headlights turn out from the road, following us. Since I was about 40 minutes from home through all the back roads, I took a gamble and headed towards the nearest gas station, followed the whole way. We stopped at the station, right in front of those huge windows in front. He slowed down, looked at us, and then sped away. I haven't seen him at a contra dance since, which is the scariest thing to me, as he used to be a regular. In my experience, contra dancers are a loyal bunch, but this guy just sort of drifted in for a couple months and disappeared just as quickly. Still makes me uncomfortable to think about. Here is a little bit of background. I was 20 at the time. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super known coffee chain downtown close to the Turtsy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless coming in and out. I felt relatively safe though because I got to know the people there and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic. I used to even take walks after work in the area, especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skipped to a couple of months into the job and I was friends with everyone I worked with. We were all super close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers last day. There was about three guys who had been in there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out which was not unusual for my location. On my break I decided to walk down to a nearby drugstore so I can get a farewells card and maybe a small gift for said co-worker. I walked out and put my earphones in and before I could press play I hear the door open behind me and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me and started walking beside me matching my pace exactly. I turned to look and it was one of the guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me. He tried to ask for my number and I kindly told him no. He persisted and I with a short temper told him to screw off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise. He stood there as I walked away and by the time I went back they were gone. I proceeded to tell my coworkers about the encounter and we laughed it off. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. Every shift after that he would already be there just hanging out or would walk in mid-shift. 
sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. I assumed he was just another homeless person because how else was he always able to be around? My shifts were sporadic. Some days I opened, some days I closed, some days I worked mid but it didn't matter he was always there. At that point I started feeling paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He never ordered anything, never talked to me, and luckily wouldn't follow me. He would just sit there, watching me. I started mentioning it to my coworkers, and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to wash dishes in the back or organize the cooler. My coworkers would also try and place themselves to try and block me from his view. I started feeling uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed, a coworker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close, they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Then one day of him just staring, I was working the register that day. He walked up and ordered a water. I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name just in case. He took his water and sat down. I had mentioned him before to my manager, but because he hadn't really done anything, we couldn't do anything beside note it in the manager book. The next day I worked with my manager. It was him, two other co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other, but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register and they weren't gender specific. I walked around the bar to the lobby area. I had to pass this table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him get up before going inside the bathroom. I sat down to do my business when someone rattled the knob. I shouted out that it was occupied, but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I finished. When I opened the door, no one was there, and walking back I noticed him adjusting back into his chair. I was super freaked out and told my boss. He couldn't tell him anything because we had no proof that it was him. Later that shift he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed that he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't and that it wasn't even his name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him if he does something like that he can't come back. The man apologized and actually stuck to the rules every day after that. He went back to just watching me. Cut to Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would be scheduled to work certain Thursdays after close to deep clean the store. We would stay until 1am. This was one of those Thursdays. We were almost done and I had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished and as I walk out the bathroom I see him peeking in with both his hands, pressed to the window eyes wide just staring at me with this super intense look. I froze for a second just staring back. I notice on one of his palms that is pressed to the window, a purple foam heart. He doesn't move at all. I freak out and run back into the bathroom. I shout, Hannah Hannah, he's here, he's back. She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help me hide me from him so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walks towards the bathroom shouting back, what are you saying? What's going on? As soon as she gets close she sees him. I told her again, he's here, he's watching me. She started shouting through the window, you need to leave, if you don't leave we're calling the police. I step out a little to see if he'll leave and he's ignoring her and his eyes were fixated in my direction. I step back into the bathroom and my lead continues to shout at him to leave and threatens him with the police. About 5 minutes pass and he realizes that I'm not stepping out until he leaves so he does. The next day my lead and I told my manager I want to file a police report and he tells me to wait until he talks to his boss. He shows up again that day and I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home a friend convinced me to call the cops. So I text my boss that I don't care what he or his boss says I'm scared and I'm gonna file that report. I dial 911 and tell them a summarized version. They tell me they're going to send someone to where I live to take the official report. The two officers were nice and supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get cops involved since I wasn't harmed. The officers told me that I should have called right away and defend me saying they could get him for harassment. I thank them and they tell me that if he shows up to dial 911 so they can take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later when I was comfortable again with downtown, I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked at and as we round a corner I see him and so I ducked into a little corner store and my friends follow. I told them I saw him and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view we left the store and that was the last time I saw him. I just hope that he never comes back. I'm in a school still and work for my family member on certain weekends at a local college selling concessions at the stadium. It's about once twice a month and the stadium is off towards the edge of town. It's Friday night and I just gotten out of school and I had to go straight to work. I get to work, work for 4 hours, half shift tonight, and my boss, my aunt, tells me we need more spoons for tomorrow's event. We sell ice cream, and these events have like 5,000 plus people at them. I say okay, and I'll go grab them on my way home. The only store open with heavy duty spoons is all the way on the other side of town, and I still wanted to go meet up with some of my friends and mess around, 
I decide to take the faster but more sketchy way around the outskirts of town. I live in a weather bipolar state. It snowed last night but I figured the roads would be fine enough even if they weren't plowed. I take off to the store and the first 5 minutes go by and nothing's wrong. I haven't seen a single car or any buildings the entire time. But keep in mind it's approaching 9pm and I'm on the outskirts of town and no one really takes this way in case they really have to. All of a sudden I see something in the corner of my eye, and it looks like a man, roughly 5 foot 8 I'd say, wearing shorts, t-shirt, and a backwards hat. He's in the ditch, walking in snow when it's 10 degrees out. My first thought is to pull over, but I'm on the phone with my mom at the time and she warns me not to as some things have happened before in this town. I consider stopping, but for some reason I tell myself not to. I wasn't really worried about anything. I pass the man, going about 40 miles per hour. Like I said, roads aren't the best. I drive not even 500 feet past him and immediately, a car that I did not see at all before turns on and pulls out of a field entrance off the road and starts to follow me. At first I thought I just was focused on the man in the ditch and didn't see a road and that's where they come from, but I later found out there was not a road there. I start to approach the town again and have to take some turns to get to where I'm going. I turn left, the car turns left. I turn right, the car turns right. I go around a roundabout and skip my turn and go twice as no one else was there, car follows. At this point I start to worry a little, but maybe they just need to go to the store also. I then pull up to a stop sign and I turn without my turn signal, the car follows. Now at this point I should have went straight to the police station, but I still didn't think much of it. I'm 2 miles from the store, where plenty of people will be. I take a few more turns and the car continues to follow me. I completely blew a stop sign at a non-busy intersection and the car does a quick stop and go and catches up. At this point, I have two turns till the store so I'm still not worried. I turn into the store and the car turns also. The store also has a gas station, so I pull there first to act like I was getting gas. The car sets off to the side of the road, in between gas station and store, and just sits there. I wait about 10 minutes and the car doesn't move. At this point, I start to get worried. I call my friends I'm supposed to meet up with later on and give them the license plate for worst case scenario, then take off to the store. I cross the street and the car comes straight behind me. I'm freaking out on the phone, not knowing if I should call the cops or not. I go and park as close as possible to the store, and the car parks three rolls behind me and a couple down. It's getting late at this point and the store is closing soon, there's only a couple others in the lot. I turn my truck back on and go park on the complete opposite side of the lot, get out and I completely bolt inside the store. I get spoons and take my time in the store. I go to call my friends to walk back outside and my phone is dead. I look out the sliding doors and suddenly there's a white van next to my driver's side. Looks like no one's in it but the back windows are covered and it's running. I run to customer service and explain everything, but they think I'm some young kid messing around. At that time I didn't see the original follow car, but no way I'm going outside with that van next to my truck. After waiting for about 30 minutes, the van pulls forward, and the original car appears from the side of the building. I wait another 10 minutes and dash outside. I speed to my friend's house, and when I get there I park at his garage. My one buddy asked why there's a big orange mark on my tire, and my heart sinks. When I was inside, the follow car must have marked my tire. After inspecting the rest of my truck, we find a small pipe dropped in the bed of my truck surrounded by snow. It was wrapped in duct tape. It was not mine. I was alone, no phone, scared, in a part of town I'm not familiar with. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked outside. Last December, I was visiting my family down in Florida and we spent some time in Treasure Island. My brother and I took my dog down to the beach at about 2am to play some fetch and drink and have a good time. If you walk along the water, you can reach a few restaurants and bars and hotels that line the beach. Out of nowhere, we see someone walking pretty quickly in our direction from over there and a few minutes later, we can make out that they're being followed. My dog is arguably pretty well trained, we work search and rescue, and I've never once had her run off without permission and never once has she not instantly returned when called, but that changed that night. She was about 5 feet from me and I saw her hackle shoot up and I went to grab her collar, but she took off in a full sprint, making some truly terrifying barking and growling sounds. We obviously took off after her and she reached the first person and stopped between them and the people behind them. She was barking and growling and lunging and I finally caught up and put her on a leash. She's never reacted in that manner so it was scary. The group following her ended up being three men that were probably in their early 30s. They started booking it in the other direction. I turned around and the person being followed was a young woman around my age. We asked if she was okay and she just broke down in tears and collapsed into my brother. So she got into her phone and rang her friend's number to have us talk to her. 
We were able to figure out where she was staying and walk her back to her hotel where we met up with her friends and we all exchanged numbers to talk a later time. The next day we all got together where we learned she had gone out for a walk on the beach, stopped for a drink at the bar, drank a bit, and then just wasn't feeling right. So she left the bar and soon noticed three men left after her. She had been walking for about a mile at that point, terrified and slowly getting more and more screwed up. She doesn't remember much about that night and we knew she was probably on something, but we had no clue she'd been drugged. We're still friends now and we're all going to meet up for spring break when we're all back in Florida. i never been more proud of my dog and more grateful that we were in the right place at the right time. I hate thinking about what could have happened. I'm an extremely outdoorsy female and love to spend a lot of time in nature. I spent the better part of my early 20s living in remote northern locations and exploring a lot of Alaska, Yukon, and British Columbia. I have many odd, frightening, and bizarre stories that came up from my time in the north, and this is one of them. In the summer of 2012 when I was 22, I'm 26 now, I was living and working in a pretty remote town in northern British Columbia from May to September. The place I worked at was a campground in the provincial part of the Alaskan Highway, 4 hours north of Fort Nelson and 2 hours south of the Yukon-British Columbia border. The best part about this park was the fact that it had beautiful natural hot springs, which attracts tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived in an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place where I had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service, and no internet, and driving 4 hours to Fort Nelson every 2 weeks to get groceries and do my laundry. Life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips in the springs, make some traveling friends, and spend quality time in nature getting to know the flora and fauna of the landscape. My job at the campground was being a park facility operator, gatehouse attendant, wildlife interpreter, and sometimes had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was much different than the feeling of living in a city, as far as safety goes. In the city I'm from, there are people around. You're aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are quick to respond and neighbors are also a plus. However, in the woods, I felt more vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away, and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily get broken into. Plus, it was pretty dark and anyone could sneak around easily at night. One night, at probably around 2 in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and I'm awoken up to a very loud banging on my trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed and see a car with its lights on, and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. To the door I say how can I help you, and one of the guys, clearly hammered out of his mind, starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me, and the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to talk to them. They look visibly shaken and I can tell they are desperate for my help but don't have the mental capacity of a person sober enough to coherently tell me what's wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically he says that him and his friend are on vacation, came up from Fort Nelson to party, they had a really long drive, were at the hot springs, they were having beers, and they were sorry about having beers. And then he drops the bomb that somebody is running around the campground, stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and notice he has blood all over his clothing. I say, someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, yes, someone's running around stabbing everybody. Then the other guy yells, come on, let's go, and they hop into the aforementioned car and speed off before I can question them any further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door, in the darkness, alone, thinking there's a maniac running around wielding a knife. I have no phone and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger, and his cabin is about a 5 minute walk away from my trailer. I remember that I have a radio so I run inside my trailer, lock the door, and try to get the ranger on the radio. His radio is off of course. The only thing I can do at this point is go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on his door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived and I tell him the whole story. While I'm there, he calls the police and they tell him that they are on the way and they will be there in four hours. The ranger grabs my gun, walks me back to my trailer and says, don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night, listening for any sort of disturbance around me. The intense kind of listening where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made that you almost feel deaf from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze. My heart drops. I can hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavily and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm just sitting there on my bed in my trailer as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break the window and stab me. I'm still listening intently to the heavy breathing and that's when I hear a grunt, a very non-human sounding grunt. 
I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is and I peer out the window of my trailer and a bison is scratching its back on the side of my trailer, causing it to rock back and forth. The RCPM get there at around 6.30am and proceed with their investigation for 10 hours. They close off the springs in the entire campground. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night until the investigation is over. Apparently there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group, and booked it back to Fort Nelson. Not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy to tell me about the incident, of course. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer, he was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friend stopped by my trailer to try to make it seem like they were innocent. Drunken logic. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. I just hope that I never have to wake up to someone like that at my door again. A couple of years ago, I was still adjusting to the adult dating scene. I was using Tinder, and though I had been on a few dates and had a few hookups, it was mostly just situations where I either wasn't that interested in the guys, or it was strictly a one night stand. It was a college town, not where I went to school, about 45 minutes from my parents' house, and I went on a few dates there. It's a cool city to hang out in, so it was always worth the journey, even if a date didn't work out. I started chatting with this guy who I matched with on Tinder. He wasn't exactly my usual type, but he was charming enough. He was a little bit of the stoner slash alternative type. He was funny and confident over the phone as well. I usually made it a rule for myself to chat on the phone at least once or twice before meeting up with guys, even just to gauge if we would be able to carry a conversation. It's not the same when you're only texting. We hit it off over the phone well enough to the point where I felt we should give hanging out a shot. We talked about how I went to karaoke night often at a local bar close to where I attended school. He said he and his friends liked going to karaoke too. Great. He lived in the previously mentioned college town and I agreed to attending karaoke night with him and his friends. He said they were hanging out at a local coffee shop near where he and his roommate lived and I could meet them there. A girl he knew worked there as well and he said she'd give me a coffee on the house. Before leaving, I texted one of my friends where I was going, just to be safe. When I arrived, I could clearly see into the coffee shop. I could see a group of four scraggly looking dudes and one girl behind the counter. As soon as I pulled up, I got a nagging bad feeling in my stomach. As soon as I got out of the car, the guy I had been chatting with left his group and came out. He said they were leaving right now so we should just go. Not that I really cared about the coffee, but what happened to the coffee I was promised. I asked exactly what the plan was and he said they were going to head back to his place before heading to karaoke. He didn't ask if I wanted anything from the shop and didn't even ask if I wanted to come in. By this point, his friends came out and they all got close to my car. I was getting pretty bad vibes at this point. He isn't acting charming or funny like before on the phone. Everything felt forced. There was an air from the group that they were only pretending to be friendly. Nobody introduced themselves, but they just kept saying how awesome karaoke at the bar was. The girl inside at the counter had gone in the back of the shop and because she was friends with them, I didn't know if I could trust her. Thinking quickly, I said the plan sounded great and I could drive and meet them there, that I didn't want to leave my car there. This apparently was a problem. The one car in the parking lot, which I assumed was one of theirs, was the girl's. They said they walked there, but it would be a lot better and faster if I just drove them back to the house. At this point I'm freaking out a bit. Everyone's close to my car and me. I tell them a stupid lie and say that I have a bunch of stuff from school in my car, and it's pretty messy on top of that, so not everyone will be able to fit in. Mind you, they are right by my car, standing in front of it. They can see through my windshield into it. It's got like a backpack in it, and that's just it. I just lie and say I'm kind of embarrassed because the floor's messy. I'm saying anything I can get to get out of this. I tell them I'm really sorry, but if they order an Uber, I could just meet them at their place. I'm not budging on not letting them get in my car. The guy I'm supposed to be on a date with tells the other guys to head back inside the coffee shop, and now I'm alone with him. He asks why I can't just drive everyone. He tells me it's not a big deal, and that it's just easier if I just drive everyone there. I stand firm that there's not room and my car's messy. I tell him I promise to meet him at his place if they order an Uber or walk, just text me his address. He says that it'll take too long to get back to his place, so I should just meet them at the bar instead. He won't give me his address. He texts me the address to the bar, and I apologize about the car thing. I tell him I'm so excited for karaoke and I'll meet him there. I smile and act as naturally as possible, and then I get in my car and try to drive normally while in view. As soon as I'm out of sight, I take off and just drive in different directions haphazardly before heading back home. I was constantly watching in my mirrors to see if anyone followed me, and thankfully nobody did. Not long after arriving home, I got multiple texts from him. He told me I was just another girl pretending to be nice and that I deserved to die. Clearly I made the right call. I blocked his number and blocked him on Tinder. I never heard from him again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. 
My parents had taken my sister and I out to a movie, and then to get ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though. My parents were happy and proud of my sister. We had a great time, and we took up our time getting home. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my room to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember thinking that it seemed a little more chilly in the house that night, but that's the only thing out of the ordinary I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew it was bad because I heard fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really bad. I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there, and her and my parents were standing very close. My mom looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked my mom what was wrong, but she didn't want to tell me. She said we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door, I heard my dad talking to a 911 operator and telling them that when we got home, he found out our back sliding glass door shattered and objects strewn about the kitchen. He went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me. The police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside and flashing lights illuminating our entire street for hours. They never found anybody in our house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. The thing that gets to me is that nothing was stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did take was our canned food out the pantry and stacked them into a small pyramid on our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to different parts of the house. It was like someone had been in our home and did things for reasons that only made sense to them. As the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mom a question. They talked quietly, and I'm sure they thought I didn't hear. I pretended not to be listening, but I heard everything. We kept magnetized letters on our fridge, and we used them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mom if the message on there that night was done by any of us. It wasn't. I watched my mom turn pale when we told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day. It said, always watching. The police didn't find any fingerprints. They said the intruder had to be wearing gloves. For the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. Within a few months, we decided to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area. We moved to a house several miles away. We were never bothered again, but I do still think about it. This happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck still stand up sometimes to this day. I just wish that we never experienced something like that again. In April of last year, my boyfriend and I were walking home from our friend's house, and I had just finished my first year at college and we wanted to go out and celebrate and have some fun. We live in a rural town and our friend lived on the far side of it so our walk was about a half an hour or so. I had a drink or two and smoked some of the joint they had rolled. Smoking makes me paranoid and this night was no different. Anyway, we left at maybe 10 or 11 p.m. and everything was perfectly normal until we got to the end of the long street that would eventually lead to my house. This street always feels so long to walk on, like hours can pass and you can barely make a dent in the amount of steps made. The street we turned onto this road was maybe 10 blocks from my house. A few minutes after we turned onto this road, I felt like something was off. But my boyfriend said that I was stoned and reassured me that it was just that. This white pickup truck that was parked in front of some house turns on and begins to drive slowly away and would then park. I watched it to see if it was just me being paranoid or not, but it proceeded to stop a couple houses down and sat there with the car still on. As soon as we get close, it would drive away, parking a little further away. This continued on until we got to the end of my street. At this point, I kept telling my boyfriend that I'm not paranoid and that this truck was screaming with us and he had gone quiet. A couple houses down from mine, this truck drives to the end of the street, my house on the corner. There's a dead end by my house because we live near a river. It stops for a moment at the dead end and proceeds to turn on their high beams and begin to slowly drive towards us. My boyfriend sticks his arm out in front of me, stopping me from walking any further as this truck continues to approach. My house is so close, yet so far. This truck slowly drives by us. The windows are tinted but we can see two silhouettes. And because they had blinded us, we didn't think to look at the license plates or even the model of the truck. My boyfriend, being pretty quick on his feet, waited until the truck disappeared from sight and took my hand before racing to my house and locking the door. He had thought about turning down one of the other streets so we could try to lose them, but he figured he'd wait until they were out of sight to book it to my house so they wouldn't see which house we went in. We looked out one of the front windows very carefully and saw this truck come back into view and began to drive around the block. I'm assuming looking for us. 
This went on for about 10 minutes. I called the police to inform them that we had been followed, but without the license plates or model, they could only keep their eyes open for suspicious white trucks. I was adamant that these people had to know one of us, if not me, because they drove until they were beside my house. Whether they actually knew it was my house or not, I don't know. My boyfriend tries to insist that it was probably a bunch of kids trying to mess with us, but I don't believe that. A few days later, we heard that someone was picked up and was last seen in a white truck. Since this night, there have been stories in the paper and online that people have been grabbing people and these people were trafficked in the area. I'm still seeing reports even today. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. So when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. This time she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't close by. We lived out in the country and the closest town didn't have what she needed, so we went to the bigger town slash city about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store, as my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day while she got whatever else she needed. While we were there, I noticed an older man, tall, skinny, semi-ill looking, that was paying a lot of attention to us. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles and I said sorry, and since then I had seen him like 5 times and every time I felt a shudder and I looked around and he would be somewhere staring at me. I told my mom and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well known name brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle and she was on the other. I ended up finding it. I reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. He said something like, you're too pretty to be eating that. It'll rot your teeth. And I freaked out. I pushed past him and ran back to my mom and said, found it, let's go. And she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers. And unfortunately, we had a lot of groceries and the old man got in the line next to us and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself. I was keeping a very close eye on him and was relieved when he exited the store, but unfortunately that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store, I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car and got behind us as we went to go leave the parking lot. I was freaking out. My mom told me it would be okay and that she was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said, we were about an hour away from home and the back roads made it even longer. We were about 5-10 to 10 minutes away from home and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said, No, call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with the shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening, and he had an idea. Since we lived way out in the country, my parents' neighbor was about half a mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway that you can't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house and saw my dad and our neighbor with their guns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. So far since that incident, my family nor I have seen that man again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened a few years ago, in my old one person flat. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right for a few days. Like I was sure that food in the fridge was less than I put back the last time, I found pills for my couch on the floor, stuff like that. I lived alone back then, so there wasn't anyone else with access to my flat, or so I thought. Well, one night I woke up around 1 in the morning sweating from a nightmare. Since I was drenched in sweat, I decided to take a shower. So I put my phone up in the bathroom for music, turned on the water, and enjoyed my shower. A few minutes in, I heard the door move. I never closed it but it still never moves. I took a look at the shower curtain and saw a shadow against it, and a look at my phone confirmed someone was there, since I could clearly see a reflection on my screen that showed someone was standing next to the shower curtain. It took me a lot not to scream and to keep acting like I didn't notice anything, while silently taking the shower head off the holding and turning the water all the way to hot. Our water got really hot when you cranked it all the way to hot, and a few seconds later steam was raising and the water hurt my feet flowing to the drain. I turned around, ripped the shower curtain open, and held the shower head right at the person behind. It was a woman and she screamed in pain. I whacked her in the face with the shower head and jumped out the shower and ran to the door, taking the key out of the lock and locking it closed behind me. A little later she started to bang on the door, but the door didn't give. I called the cops and went to the kitchen to get my big kitchen knife, just for safety. 
I felt like my throat was closing up when I saw it missing and realized there was only one place where it could possibly be right now. The police came and arrested the woman, who turned out to have been the former person living in the flat and was evicted after not paying rent. Seems she made a copy of the key and came into the flat when I was at work and sometimes at night. I just hope that I never have to experience that again. This happened 5 years ago. I was 25 and used to live alone in a small flat in England, about an hour south of London. It was a medium sized town well known for being a good place to live, with excellent schools, low crime rates, and minimal unemployment. The kind of place where people didn't panic if they left their front door unlocked when they left for work. My flat was on the first floor above pavement level, midway down a the hill. There was nobody underneath me, my flat was a kind of bridge with a footpath below it and my kitchen window was directly over a pavement on a fairly busy road. The flat had a small galley kitchen, a living room, and an upstairs bedroom. There was nobody beneath or above my flat, and because of the hill, my kitchen window was literally face on with the pavement and where people walked. There was a printing company opposite that went out of business and then just grass. I always used to close the blinds once the sun had gone down, but liked having the kitchen window open during the afternoons. It had a safety latch so it didn't open far enough for anybody to reach in and I was not on the ground floor, so I didn't worry too much. One day, I got home from work early, about 5.30, and as it was summer I had the kitchen window open and the blinds open. I'm chopping garlic for my dinner, glance up and see an older man literally stood on the pavement watching me, only a few feet away. I glare back as if to say go away and decide to walk out the kitchen into the living room as if I'm talking to someone. I walk back into the kitchen, glance at the window and the man is still there watching me with a small smile on his face. At this point I am slightly panicked, I am alone, nobody's around as I have no direct neighbors. I go into the living room and sit against the wall, clutching my phone. I didn't want him to be able to see me at all. A lot of front doors in England have a kind of two door system, directly on the street you have a glass door, normally with decorations on them so you can't see everything in and out, just blurred images, and a proper wooden door inside. I had been out for smoke so the glass door was shut and locked but the wooden door was wide open. From where I'm sitting, I can see the glass door, and I see a figure walking towards it. Sure enough, as it gets closer, I can see that it's the man from the pavement, standing at my front door and trying to look in. He tries opening the door, but luckily, I lock the outside door after my smoke, and it was a strong door. He drops a cigarette, says, screw it, and after about 15 to 20 seconds, he turns around and walks away. I run to shut and lock the wooden door and go to the kitchen window as he walks away and down the road. Just before he turns the corner, turns around and smiles at me, making eye contact. A few days later, it was on the local news that a man matching his description chased down a group of young women in my neighborhood. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go hiking with my son who was eight months old at the time, with my dog named Henry who was an Irish wolfhound and Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and then meet them later. I drove to a wooded trail about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, still chilly but tolerable with the sun shining. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was smiling and laughing. I would wear him in a forward-facing hiking sling in the front of me at the time. Henry was excited. We started off on the hike and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. Towering trees mixed with pine. A crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at points. We would periodically stop and all three of us would play. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone about three miles and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s. Henry was snarling and lunging for the man, before I even completely registered what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. My bumps were goosed at this point. Henry would not calm down. This is very unusual behavior for him, but... None of he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry, Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange, which I found a bit odd. The guy was staring very intently at my son. He then laughed slightly and said, Oh, he should be. It's a good thing he's with you. Then he motioned to something around his neck and said, I'm just out here taking pictures. It's a hobby of mine. Except he wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck or anywhere that I could see. He had a canteen around his neck. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eyes off this guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he had tried anything. I am positive this guy felt that. The guy looked at Henry for a few seconds, then at my son again. He took a few steps off trail so there was room to get by and so that Henry couldn't reach him when we went by. As I warily walked by him, he was like 10 feet to my left, 
He muttered something about how he used to be able to see his kids. I kept looking back as we walked away to make sure he wasn't turning around to walk our way. He did continue to stare after us for several minutes though until I could no longer see him. We kept hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars would park. There was no one there and luckily I still had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away and they took us back to my car. There was no son of the guy we encountered. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away and I am sad that my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He was really the best dog ever. So thanks Henry for being gentle yet fierce. I hope I never have to see that photographer ever again. This story happened about two years ago when I was 19 and my foster sister, Kira, was 16. It was the summer before I was going to college and I mostly lived with my mom and Kira except for every other weekend where I'd stay with my dad. Now, summers where I am can get really hot and humid, so we had a habit of waiting to walk the dogs until 6 or 7 p.m. because that's when it'd be cooler but still light outside. On this particular evening, mom wasn't going to be home until late, so it was up to me and Kira to walk the dogs by ourselves unless we wanted our younger dog, Samson, to throw tantrums due to pent-up energy. Even though we lived in the countryside and could have walked them down our street, Kira and I decided to drive out 20 minutes to a park instead. At around 7.30 p.m., Kira and I harnessed our two dogs, packed them up in the car, and drove them to the park. Let me quickly explain the layout of the park so that's easier to understand why we get nervous halfway through our walk. This park isn't very big, but it's popular because of its loop. The entire park is surrounded by a mile-long looping road with its attractions, like playgrounds, ponds, and a small country hall, spaced about in the inner side of the loop. The outer side is just grass, trees, and one playground at its end. Thus, it's common and expected to pass people walking the loop at least two times if you're walking in opposite directions, but not if you're walking in the same direction. Any cars on this road can only drive in one direction because it's a one-way road. At first, everything about this walk was normal. I parked the car, we clipped our dogs to leashes, and we started on the loop. Every so often, we'd stop so I could take pictures of our good boys, particularly of Kira trying to wrangle Samson, who pulls like his life depends on it and weaves around because he wants to smell everything. It was while I was taking one of these pictures that the first encounter happened. A man, who looked to be in his 40s, walked past us, walking the same direction we were, up towards the playground on the outer side of the loop. He smiled at Kira, nodded, and said, Hello, you have cute dogs, and kept walking. I honestly didn't think anything of it. We're at a park at a time of day where it's common to walk around due to the cooler temperature and people where I'm at are generally friendly. We smiled back and said, Hi, and thanks. And that was that, or so we thought. This man passed us again only 10 minutes later, directly across from where we'd seen him previously. Just like he did before, he smiled and said, Hi. This time, Kira and I looked at each other once he was ahead of us and shared the, well, that was weird, expression. Just 10 minutes earlier, he had passed us walking up towards the playground and subsequently broke off from the loop, and he'd been walking in the same direction as us. This time, though, he cut in front of us and he did it in a way where we had to stop to avoid running into him. He nearly touched Kira with how close he was walking. That was already weird in and it of itself. The other weird part was him cutting past us in the opposite direction. It came off almost like he wanted to walk by us again, but just like before, Kira and I brushed this weirdness off. The guy could have been enjoying a rambling stroll and doing his own thing for all we knew. Not even five minutes later, the same man passed us again, once again cutting so close past us that he nearly brushed shoulders with Kira. Again. This time he walked up behind us, then did this weird directionally slant walk to cross the street and go in the opposite direction, cutting us off again. I told Kira to hustle so we could get to our car and get out instead of doing a second loop. When we were almost to our car, we noticed a car creeping along behind us. We pulled to the side and stopped to let it pass, but for a second it stopped too. We figured whoever was in the car was getting ready to park, so we started walking again. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did, so we stopped again and the car stopped with us. This was when Kira got nervous. We hadn't seen the middle-aged guy since the third cutoff, so we figured I had overthought the whole thing, but here we were, with this tinted windowed car acting weird. Was it the same guy, back with his car? A different guy? We couldn't tell. Before anything could happen though, another car idled up to the one next to us, and whoever it was sped up to the expected 5 miles per hour. We got to our car pretty fast after that and practically picked up the dogs to get them inside of it. We got in and got out of there. My mistake, however, was neglecting my rearview mirror and the well-advised rule not to drive straight home if you're worried a stranger's taking too much interest in you. We got home at around 8 something. The sun had finally disappeared behind the horizon. Mom wasn't home yet, so we got the dogs some water, locked the doors, ate a late dinner, chilled in the living room, and talked about things that didn't really matter. 
It was almost 9.30 when the scariest part of this whole ordeal happened. There Kira and I were, sitting on different couches, talking about something, when we noticed the ceiling briefly light up over where Kira was sitting. Due to our long, slightly curvy driveway, it's common to see headlights stream through the window, light up the ceiling, fade, then intensify. It means someone's just come home, so when the ceiling above Kira lit up, we thought nothing of it, assuming mom was finally coming back from wherever she went that night. Mom has a habit of pulling in then checking her phone for whatever knows how long before coming inside. After a couple of minutes, I noticed the small, motion sensor light mom set up on a table on the porch light up. Right after the light went off, we both heard the storm door open, but we didn't hear anyone pressing the code keys of our lock or jiggling the door handle, like mom usually does right away. The moment the storm door creaked open, our two dogs jumped up and ran to the door, barking like mad. Our golden greyhound mix, Calvin, has a deep and scary bark. Samson, who is a big dog, jumps up on his hind legs and scrabbles to one of the small windows in a desperate attempt to see who's outside. Immediately, the storm door slammed shut, and we heard heavy footsteps on the cement of our porch. Calvin started going nuts and jumped up on Kira's couch, standing on its back instead of the cushions to look out the window. Samson ran out the room and went out the doggy door that leads to the back porch, which is a ramp going down into a fenced off portion of our yard. I sat there, my mind steadily going blank as my heart sped up and my limbs refused to move. Kira gets up and spins around and looks out the window but can't see anything because, besides the motion light on the porch, it's too dark. So, naturally, she gets up, grabs a stray dog toy which just so happens to be a tug of war rope with a ball on one end and opens the door. I tell her very calmly to shut the door and stay inside. She ignored me and stepped out onto the porch. She comes back inside after not seeing anything, but, to my utter disbelief, she disappears into the kitchen, comes back with a knife, and goes outside again. This time, she's gone for a handful of seconds before running back inside and slamming the door shut. Breathless, she tells me she ran out a bit into the yard and saw the outline of a man by the rundown dog kennel we don't use anymore. When she saw him and froze, he moved. This time, she listened to me when I told her to lock the door. I managed to call mom and she convinced me to get up and make sure all the doors were locked, including the basement and making sure the dogs were inside. After mom got home and looked around, finding nothing, we called the non-emergency number for the police, not wanting to bother them in case we were overreacting. Two cops came by and walked around our yard and found nothing. We got the sense they didn't believe us, but instead saw us as two overexcited girls with exaggerated imaginations. Still, they humored us and told us, after we told them about the park, that if we think anyone might be following us, or if someone's acting a little too creepy, not to drive straight home and to check if anyone's following us. Then, they left. But when we heard those footsteps and Kira went outside, she swears she saw someone. The dogs don't run up to the door like that and bark their heads off if no one's there. I don't know if whoever was at our house was the same guy that ran into us at the park. If it was, I don't know the reason why he cut in front of us multiple times. I don't know if he was in the car that inched behind us and stopped when we stopped. I don't know what would have happened if Calvin didn't have a scary and manic bark. I don't know much of anything, but what I do know is, if you're out and about, minding your own business, and a stranger is taking a lot of notice of you, following you, frequently running into you, or whatever, trust your gut. Don't drive or walk straight home, meander, get to a public space, or just take your time. Pay attention to your surroundings. You never know who is watching you. This happened a few years ago when I was an 18 year old girl in high school. I worked at a store in the mall of my mid-sized midwestern city, and that evening, I worked a closing shift. I was walking back to my car in the snowy darkness when a black SUV pulled up beside me. A woman opened the window and yelled, Hey, excuse me, I need your help. She was a round-faced woman in her 30s or 40s and spoke with a very heavy Spanish accent. She went into a story about how her sister got into a car accident and the woman needed to get gas in her car before she could help the sister. However, she could not find a gas station and had no money. And she even said she had driven around to several churches to ask for help, but no one would help her. She was difficult to understand and did not tell the story super clearly, but I understood that she needed to find a gas station and she needed me to pay for it. She told the story between sobs and she seemed so desperate that I was moved to help her. I told her that she could follow my car to a gas station that was just across the highway and that I would buy her some gas. At the gas station, I parked in front of the store and was surprised when she did not pull up to a gas pump, as I had expected. I got out of my car and said, okay, don't you want me to buy and pump gas for you? She then said something like I had misunderstood her first story. She didn't need gas. She needed money to give to her sister, and added a bunch of other facts I don't remember to continue the story. Her accent and changing story was difficult to understand. I said, well I don't have cash on me, only my card. I mean I suppose I could see if there's an ATM inside? She immediately replied that she knew there was, which definitely is suspicious in hindsight, but I didn't pick up on it at the time. 
I agreed to go in and get her some money from the ATM, and as I turned to go inside, she said, Wait, but if you give me money, I will have to repay you somehow. I said, No, that's okay. You don't have to. She said, No, give me your phone number so I can contact you to meet up later so I can repay you, or give me your address and I will send the money to you. I refused both, and she tried again several more times, begging me to meet up with her later to give me the money. This probably lasted 5 minutes or so. Finally, as I refused her last time, she said in a very chilling way, don't be so nice. Despite all of this, I for some reason was still convinced she needed my help, and I went into the gas station to use the ATM. However, in my teenage wisdom, I could not remember my PIN number, and was unable to withdraw money. I went back outside to tell the woman, and she rolled her eyes, puffed something under her breath, and very quickly got into her car and sped off. I never saw her again after that. As I drove home, I became suspicious about the scenario. I figured out after a while that the woman was definitely trying to scam me for my money, but it disturbed me more that she tried so hard to get me to meet up with her later and give her contact information. I just hope that I never have to meet someone like that in the future. When I was young, I used to live in rural Pennsylvania. Where I lived wasn't quite suburbs, but the houses were all within walking distance of each other, and we knew nearly all of our neighbors. My small neighborhood was blocked off from the ones on either side by decent sized creeks, and to get to them, you needed to climb down a fairly steep slope. This is an important detail later. My friend Rachel was a bit younger than me, by two or three years. I was 11 at the time. We had decided to go on a bike ride and ended up dropping our bikes and helmets at the top of the hill leading down to one of the creeks and we went exploring. We were making a racket, I'm sure, squealing as we jumped around trying not to get wet. We noticed bubbles in the water and became concerned for the swans that lived down at the other end of the creek in the pond. Out of nowhere we heard a man chuckling and he was standing at the top of the hill above near where we were standing. I said nothing. He asked what we were doing and slowly started making his way down the rough terrain of the slope. He obviously didn't know where the path to come down was. Rachel answered him that we were trying to find out where the bubbles were coming from and that she was scared it would hurt the swans, as there had never been any bubbles before today. He told us he could take a water sample and test it if we could bring it up to him, then asked our names and how old we were, still making his way down to us the entire time. Rachel told him her name and had started to say mine when I stopped her by grabbing her shoulder. I had an extremely bad feeling about this man and I was very uncomfortable with the situation. I parked my head up looking off to the side and asked her, Did you hear that, Rachel? I think your mom is calling us. I turned and dragged her up the path across from where the man was climbing down at and we jumped on our bikes. I noticed this man's car parked next to where we put our bikes. Our helmets were missing. We heard the man scrambling after us screaming that he hadn't heard anything. We started pedaling back toward my house, as Rachel lived in a different neighborhood, and the man started following us in a car after he finally reached the top. The man was still trying to get us to talk to him, so I turned off into my uncle's yard where I saw my cousin out cutting the lawn and started yelling for him. He was a big dude, 16 or so at the time, and the man in the car burnt rubber speeding off when he saw we were no longer alone. We ended up calling the police and we were not the first girls that had the same issue with the man of that description and that car that day. So whatever that man's intentions were, I'm just glad that Rachel and I didn't have to experience them. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This was my very first apartment and I was so excited to be in it. My freshman year I lived in a dorm on campus, and before that I just lived with my mom, so I had never lived on my own before. The apartment was a two bathroom and two bedroom and I shared it with my friend who I had known since we were 13. I had just turned 20 when all this happened. Josh was my friend and it was his first year at the university, so naturally I showed him around. We did pretty much everything together. Fast forward to the homecoming football game. We attend a university that's crazy into football and we're actually a pretty good team, so the homecoming game is a big deal to everyone. Josh was so excited to go out because it was his first homecoming game. He was going to go with this boy he started flirting with and he wanted me to come along. I don't really remember why I didn't want to go, I just didn't. Josh got mad at me, we said dumb stuff to each other and he left, so I was alone for the rest of the night. I had, still do, a small dog, Poppy, who lived with us. She was around a year old at the time. We actually had a pretty relaxing night in the beginning. I took a shower and put on face mask and Poppy and I watched TV in bed and stuff. I remember listening to a song on repeat the entire day because that's what I do when I find a new song that I like. To this day, I still can't listen to it without being reminded. We went to sleep around 10pm I think. I wasn't keeping up with what was going on with the football game, so I really have no idea if it was just ending or whatever, but I knew not to expect Josh home early because he was going out with the guy he was seeing. Dinlan afterwards. There is a strip of bars along one of the main roads running towards campus, and that's where they would be. That's where everyone would be after the game ended. I don't know what time it was, but I woke to cabinets being slammed and really loud noises. 
It was really dark in my room and the only thing I could see was that the kitchen lights were on. I saw the light coming through the bottom of the door. It sounded like people were going through our kitchen cabinets one by one. Poppy was at the edge of the bed barking like a crazy dog. I had never seen her act this way. I was struggling to keep myself awake because I'm a really heavy sleeper, not anymore, and I just knew it wasn't Josh or Dylan, but some stupid part of me decided to call out hello, but it was weak sounding and I really don't know if they heard me or not. Suddenly my bedroom door opened. I shot up. Poppy was snarling and trying to lunge at the stranger in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything because the light from the open door was kind of blinding. I just saw his figure. He was wearing a hoodie and he stood there for maybe 15 seconds and I was just staring at him. The whole time Poppy was trying to screw him up. He quickly closed my door and I don't know why I just didn't move. Then my door flings open a second time and we're staring face to face again for the same painfully long amount of time. My heart was racing and I remember thinking he's going to hurt me. Now that I look back, I should have screamed or something. Poppy was at the very edge of the bed now, vicious and snarling. She sounded like a big dog honestly. And then he slammed my door shut. As soon as he did, I jumped out of my bed and locked my door. I heard them take my car keys. I was terrified they would find my car and steal it since I had just parked directly outside. I frantically called 911 and was sobbing the whole time. I said, someone is in my house, they came in my room, please help. And it took them 30 minutes to get there, when I know that there were cop cars everywhere surrounding the bar since it was homecoming, which I live a 5 minute drive from. When I finally came out, the living room and my roommate's bedroom were completely ransacked. My roommate's TV was on the floor because they tried to carry it out, but I guess decided just to leave it. They stole my Xboxes and all my games. They stole my book bag with my textbooks and my homework in it. The two policemen got here and I told them everything and asked if I could call my roommate. Josh picked up the phone but was heavily slurring and I could tell that he was inside of a bar and could barely hear me. I just screamed please give Dylan the phone, hoping that Dylan was at least more sober than Josh was, so Josh put Dylan on the phone. And I don't know how, through my tears and sobs and through the screaming people and house music, but he heard me say that our apartment was robbed. He frantically said we are coming and hung up. They probably ran. While I was waiting for them, one of the policemen asked if he could try to take prints from my roommate's TV and I agreed. He proceeds to then drop his flashlight directly on the screen and as it shattered, he just looked at me. So then Josh and Dylan get back and the policemen totally change their tone. They get aggressive and say that they were targeted for a reason. I'm pretty sure that since it was homecoming, the robbers were not expecting me to be there and were trying to just rob apartments blindly. We also lived on the ground floor so it's easier to get in those than in the two story and three story apartments. Josh is in the military, but Josh looks just like any other regular college freshman boy. And his only friends at the time were literally me and Dylan, so we were the only ones who knew he was in the military. They tried to accuse Josh of stashing guns and drugs everywhere and that's why we got robbed. I literally was like, are you kidding me? They then tried to pull me to the side and say that Josh hired people to come rob his own apartment while I was inside. They asked me, how do you know these guys? I said, sir, I have known Josh since we were 13. We moved here together to attend university together. He just gave me a look. When they left, we got our locks immediately changed and then I had to take the next day off of school to drive to the nearest Nissan dealership, 30 minutes away, and then wait 7 hours for them to rewire a key fob for me. To the men who robbed me, and to the cops who accused my roommate of robbing his own apartment, I hope I don't have to meet you again. This happened to me 4 years ago when I was 16 years old on a school trip, but I still remember it to this day. I had recently graduated from one school and enrolled in another, more advanced one via special program. Germany's system of education is sometimes complicated. There were about 20 people who did the same as me and we were all put in one class to catch up with the regular students. To get to know each other better, the class went on a 3 day trip to a youth hostel in our county town. The trip was organized by our school and overall pretty nice. Two of my friends had transferred with me and we had fun, except for the second evening. It was late summer and the sun was still up despite it already being around 7pm. One of my friends, Sarah, and I decided that we wanted to go for a walk before accompanying our other classmates to the river to have some drinks. We wanted to visit the newly built benches along the river and just talk for a bit. To get to those benches, we walked over a long parking lot next to the river. Between the parking lot and the river, there was a small path which was, in some places, divided from the parking lot by a small grass strip with a few bushes and trees. On the other side of the parking lot, there was a bridge approach which could be used by cars and pedestrians alike. This will get relevant later. There were some rocks in the parking lot to prevent cars from driving too far and falling into the river. My friend and I had some fun by jumping from one rock to the other. At some point, a man on a bicycle, probably in his early 20s, emerged next to us on the other side of the parking lot. He applauded us for some weird reason we didn't understand. My friend applauded back ironically and we just continued walking but stopped jumping on the rocks. 
When we arrived at the benches, we chose the first one we came across and sat down. Bicycle guy stopped right next to us, got off his bike and just lingered. I started to feel uneasy but since there were no free benches left, I thought he just wanted to hang out there too. At some point, he pulled out his cell phone and called someone. Even though he was right next to us the whole time, I couldn't understand him because he was speaking a foreign language. Sarah and I sat there for about 1-2 to two hours until it started getting darker. Bicycle guy was still right next to us and still on the phone, circling the area around us and just generally creeping us out by continuously staring at us. At this point, Sarah had also started feeling uneasy and we shared our feelings about this guy. Since it was almost dark, there was no one around anymore. We wanted to return to the hostel. The second we got up and started walking towards the parking lot, Bicycle guy also got onto his bike. My heart sank into my stomach when I realized he was going the same direction. Just slow enough to stay next to us. He continued following us. When exiting the bench area, Sarah and I took the path next to the river to get to the parking lot. Directly at the beginning of the parking lot, there was one part where the path had one of the strips with trees next to it. Bicycle guy directly went past us and onto the parking lot, passing the trees on the right side. We went to the left. He continued staring at us before he went further ahead. The second Sarah and I set a foot on the path, I stopped her and told her that if he turned around after the trees to get onto our path, which he would have no reason for if he didn't want anything from us, we would turn around and run the opposite direction. Well, bicycle guy turned onto our path. We booked it out of there as fast as we could while desperately clutching each other's hands while bicycle guy was following us. There was not a single person around to help us so running was our only chance. We couldn't process what was happening to us in that moment, but we just knew that we needed to run. Remember the bridge approach I mentioned earlier? We went across the smallest part of the parking lot and went up there so we could take another route back. While walking up the narrow sidewalk, still grabbing each other's hands, we glanced down onto the parking lot. If I hadn't been sure that he was following us, then I definitely was in that moment. Down on the parking lot there was Bicycle Guy, circling the area and staring us down while we were almost running up the bridge. It got even worse. We were halfway up when suddenly, Another guy on a bicycle passed us and stopped a few meters in front of us. He started talking to Bicycle Guy who had been following us and then also stared at us. Bicycle Guy had basically called another friend over for whatever he was trying to do. Sarah and I immediately changed to the other side of the bridge approach and took the stairs down there. We chose to take a route where we wouldn't be alone on the streets. I was shaking the whole walk back. I am incredibly thankful for my gut feeling. To this day, I still think about this encounter when I'm walking somewhere alone in the evening or night. I don't think I'll be able to forget this anytime soon. For background, my family moved to the countryside from the city when I was about 7 years old, and I'm 21 now. Both my parents had grown up in the suburbs, and I lived in the capital of our state for about 10 years before we moved. It definitely took us some time to get used to the train tracks that ran by our house, the wild animals, the weird but kind neighbors, and the odd visitors. Another thing is that if you get off the main road and turn onto a long gravel drive to get up to our house, we can see the entire length of the driveway from certain points in our yard, which is about 3 acres. A few years after we moved in, my dad got a promotion at work, and as a result, started to go to conferences and business trips that lasted from a few days to a week, at least a couple times a year. My mom felt nervous about being home alone with two young kids. I was 10 and my brother was 6, and so we decided to get a dog. We knew we wanted a big dog, but something that would be gentle with my brother and I. After a few weeks looking at shelters, we took home Rocky. He was 9 months when we took him home, and already pushing 70 pounds. We believe he's a German Shepherd mixed with some northern or mountain breed. We aren't sure to this day, but he's a massive red colored dog with a long black muzzle and ears, and a fluffy tail that he carries over his back, and a white stripe up his nose. It wasn't long until he was 100 pounds, and an absolute force to be reckoned with. Even though he was very gentle with both my brother and I, loved our cats, it was a big ball of joy around anyone we brought into our house, he tended to be very territorial and aggressive with other dogs, and very protective of us, especially of my mom and I. Once, the electric company came to do work on the telephone poles on our property, without telling us first, and after 20 minutes they finally had to call us because Rocky had them trapped in their truck, and was jumping up and barking at their windows. I doubt he would really have attacked them if they'd gotten out of their trucks, but it was more than enough to make them think twice. This protective instinct came in very, very handy one day. It was summertime, my dad was at work, and my mom was home with my brother and I, since she was a teacher and off for the summer with us. My mom was working in our garden, and my brother and I were playing close by, with Rocky watching over all of us. Rocky all of a sudden sounded the alarm, throwing his head up in the air and barking and hallowing. He makes a deep woo-woo noise. I looked up to see a dirty white pickup truck pull off from the main road and into our driveway. This wasn't necessarily alarming at first, as people sometimes used our driveway to turn around when they got lost. But the white pickup truck slowly ambled up our drive, and I could see something strange in the bed. It was lumpy and discolored, but I couldn't really tell what it was until he pulled all the way up to our house. 
where our other cars were, and honked the horn to get our attention. It was meat. Giant, red chunks of meat with some of the limbs of various animals still attached. It was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Just a weird man who looked to be in his early 50s, driving a pickup truck full of meat in the southern July heat. I immediately just got a really, really bad vibe from the guy, and I remember my mom telling my brother and I to go inside, and we did, but watched out the glass door. Rocky had surprisingly been quiet at that point, but was now next to my mom, and she had her hand around his collar. The guy rolled down his window and asked my mom if she wanted to purchase some meat. My mom said no and to please leave our property. Instead, he went on about the different types of meat and asking how much we wanted, beef, venison, pork, etc. My mom asked him to leave again, but instead, he decided to get out of the nasty white pickup. As soon as his feet were on the ground, Rocky went ballistic, barking and snarling. This finally made the guy stop. He looked at Rocky, looked at my mom, and asked, Does your dog bite? And my mom, deathly serious, replied, Only if I tell him to. The guy took one more look at Rocky, and I'm guessing he decided not to mess with the giant, snarling beast. He got back in his truck, backed up, and headed back down our driveway. I don't know if he was really selling the meat or not, but apparently he'd been around to our neighbors, who also had gotten a really bad vibe from him. We'll never know what he was really up to with his giant slabs of meat in the bed of his pickup truck. Maybe he was just a weird guy trying to sell some sketchy meat. Maybe he was looking for something else. We never saw that guy again. Rocky's still kicking it, by the way. He's almost 15 and completely deaf, but he's still out in the yard on summer days, watching over us. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago, by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7,000 feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up slash make dinner, etc. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up this steep tree filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Now the day before I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement, before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I started hiking up the steep hill to hand the bag. It was so steep I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another 5-6 to six step push to the next tree I could just lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making up this hill ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about 100 feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement at about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage, slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest, and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die. And I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12-15 foot cliff onto the boulders below, like hundreds of 5-20 to 20 foot boulders. So I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. Then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which is just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent, so she didn't wander off like I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after I kind of snap back to it, I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order. I call my dog back to me. He comes and sits against my feet as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned slash stuck there for a moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there so I let him lean against me while I try to collect myself. This is when I realized I'd completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast up to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline dumps going right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever is up there. Peering and peering, nothing. But I just heard but I had just heard something, we both did, and whatever it was didn't get away, or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kinda just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake slash bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon slash sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in, 
I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes, but some raggedy stuff with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something. But I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment, so I stare for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared. And I also had to get off that hill before total dark, or I could be seriously hurt slash risk dying trying to get back down. So carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up, and look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him, and eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking, I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark back, or at my dog, but when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent, and was walking around the camp growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out. But I was positive I had zipped it so the zipper tap slash openings was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my pistol. I fired a single shot into the air as the sun was setting, climbed into my tent without eating, and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I had made it to the last camp, about four miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. They sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They started to tell me they are planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning, so I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on, other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and a woman found murdered last year. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005 when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a rural area, a good ways outside the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about 1,000 acres, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about 7 hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. That car was so uncomfy, I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone else lease it that year yet and the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life I had been in scouts for a couple years and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land we settled in, the cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remembered that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out, then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they had been rooting so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there. Not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, hey, we're hunters, this is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. Weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and it looked like to be ski pants. 
Now this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnap the clip to his pistol holster. We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man all the while talking to him asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man and my dad stood straight up with a confused look on his face. I called out and said what's wrong and he called back saying it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring and as I got closer one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new, no dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of being outside for more than any more than a day at most. At that moment I looked at my dad and could see him get worried, almost immediately after I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched, and I knew my dad felt it too. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified so it felt like an eternity, but in reality it was only about 45 minutes. After returning we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out the next week when he was in the area. He also said that he never had an issue with people because his property was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping too. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found any trace of anyone, no mannequin or anything. That story still makes my hair stand on end. I honestly have no idea what that mannequin was. So this happened to me a couple of years ago when my now husband and I were living in a townhouse in a pretty decent area. My husband was working third shift as a corrections officer at our local corrections facility and I was working as a waitress slash bartender. It was an unusually warm night for mid-March so I took advantage and decided to take my husband's 80 pound Alaskan Malamute Siberian Husky mixed dog on a quick walk around the neighborhood near our complex. We get to the end of the street that leads into the complex we live in and across the street is a marathon gas station. I notice as the dog, Luke, stops to relieve himself that there's a guy across the street at the gas station with a case of beer in his hands. I have my phone out texting a friend and looked back up to notice the guy was near the stop sign, also relieving himself on the sign. I felt really awkward and instantly put my phone away and led Luke down the street on our path. At this point I think this guy noticed us and he crossed the street to where Luke and I had just been. I hear him walking a few feet behind me and just keep my head down staring at my phone with Luke glued to my hip. After about 10 seconds, I hear this guy's steps getting closer. Luke realizes there is someone behind us and he stops in his tracks. Mind you, he's a big dog compared to my 5'2 self, but I can handle him pretty easily and he's a very well trained dog by my husband. But I noticed his ears were perked up and his tail was straight up. I was glad that he was aware of our surroundings, but I still wanted to keep moving and away from this guy. This guy finally catches up so I tighten my grip on Luke's leash and pull him closer to me and step into the grass to allow this guy to pass us and keep Luke out of his way. Does this guy keep going on and pass? Nope. When I thought he was about to pass us, I stuttered out a small apology because Luke was pulling on his leash a little to investigate this guy and most people did get intimidated by him just by his size. The guy stops and just stares at me for a minute. Long enough for me to smell the cigarettes and booze rolling off of him and to notice he is probably in his mid to late 20s, dark hair, scruffy looking, and just dirty. He smiles and then finally seems to notice Luke trying to get at him and asks, Cute dog, what's his name? Instead of making up a name, I just say Luke. He then proceeds to ask me if he can pet my dog and before I can even give him an answer, he leans down to start petting Luke's head. Luke did not like that. Luke jumped at him as a warning and the guy backed up chuckling. I apologized and mentioned that he was very protective and made up a lie that he was trained as my dad's former K9 unit. My dad is a software developer. Instantly, I saw this guy's face change. He asked me what my name was and I gave him a fake name. He then asked me if I lived around here and I said I was visiting a friend of mine for the weekend. He then made a sudden step towards me and I'm not lying when I say I have never heard my husband's dog growl in the five years I have been with him. But the sound that came from my dog sounded like something coming from nightmares. Luke's hair was spiking on his spine and he was throwing himself up on his back legs and kicking his from legs at this guy. He had put himself completely between myself and the guy and snapping at him. This freaked the dude out so much he stumbled backward nearly dropping his beard. He quickly said, we'll have a nice night cutie, and stumbled off down the road. When I say my heart was pounding, it was deafening. I grabbed Luke's leash so hard and sprinted between the buildings until I got back to my townhouse and locked all the doors and collapsed by the front door. Luke was in my face the whole time kissing me and whining. This dog is the sweetest and most gentle creature I have ever met and hearing him growl and seeing him react the way he did made me realize that I needed to get out of the situation and fast.
If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Often, I enjoy walking my dog at nighttime. This is due to the fact that my dog is harder to walk when people are around with their own dogs. So, we tend to walk around parks in the area when they've been become somewhat secluded. My 120 pound black boxer slash lab named Loki could be somewhat considered threatening to most from what I hear. I figured his size would be used as a deterrent for anyone looking to cause nightly troubles. I was dead wrong. On one specific night in the fall of 2016, I could recall of an encounter that reminds me of why I am so reluctant to walk around once daylight falls. This specific park is one I have been to a couple times, and from what I remember, this park is usually secluded around 6.30 and later. Aside from a couple of joggers or very few other dog walkers, not many people walk the same path I take. I also like to put on my headphones and listen to music while I walk, but on this specific night I chose not to wear them since my phone was on low battery and I wanted to preserve it as long as I could. Anyway, the walk was going as usual. Loki did his business and we continued on our usual path. About midway on our walk, I realized that it had started to get really dark. Since he was done with his business, I decided to cut the walk somewhat short and we took a shortcut that kind of led us off the path. This path had a bunch of trees surrounding the area and there were still leaves in the branch. With that being said, I felt a weird feeling as if I was being watched. I could not for the life of me shake off the feeling of being watched. I peered back to see if anyone had been following me out of anxiety and every time I did, no one was there. In fact, no one was anywhere. This whole shortcut was essentially secluded. Suddenly, Loki stopped walking and also looked back. I told him, Loki, come on boy, we've gotta go. One thing I failed to mention was that Loki is a big coward. I noticed his tail was tucked between his legs, which is a telltale sign that a dog is afraid. I was also curious and a bit nervous but I surely did not want to find out what he heard or noticed. I just wanted to get out as soon as possible. I pulled a little and he began to walk, but every now and then I'd see him peer back. After maybe a minute or so of him walking, he stopped again and this time he began to growl. Despite being a coward, Loki is a bark but no bite kind of dog, so I took this chance to see exactly what he was growling at. It was quite dark, so I could not see well, so I used my phone's flashlight to see what was up. Trees, just trees. What he heard was probably some kind of small animal. Once again, I turned around and kept walking. He continued to peer back once in a while still, but this time I noticed it was a lot more frequent. I just said to myself, just squirrels, maybe a bird, and I ignored it. Then, I heard what appeared to be actual footsteps and branches breaking. There is absolutely no way a small animal could have produced a sound like that. Look, he turned around quick and still with his tail tucked, he began to growl and bark at a figure that I could only describe as a man in his early 50s, possibly late 40s, appear from out the woods. He was dressed in dirty clothing. His hair was long and was graying. He had one hand in his pocket and he said to me, Nice dog you have there, kid. What breed is he? He's a boxer slash lab, I replied. Oh, I love dogs. Mind if I pet him? He wondered. The man got closer and emerged from the trees. As he got closer, I realized that he was quite tall. Loki instantly got bad vibes. He ran behind me and started to bark at him. Actually, I do kind of mind. My dog here doesn't like strangers. Sorry, but it's probably not best if you pet him. I quickly stated. It's okay, really. He seems like a friendly guy. Just a little pet wouldn't harm him. The man retorted as he got closer. I felt extremely uncomfortable as he appeared to get closer and closer. I don't know why this guy couldn't take no for an answer. I'm really sorry, man. I'm scared he'd bite you or something. I told him as I began to walk away. I don't know why you just won't let me introduce myself to him. The guy replied angrily. This time I began to speed walk. I was very uncomfortable and my fight or flight instincts began to take over. He followed us and kept muttering curses to himself. I don't know if this man was under the influence of something, but he did not let up. I won't lie, I started to get a little angry. Why can't a guy just take no for an answer? He began to match my speed, almost as if he was trying to catch up to us. Loki and I both took this as an answer to start sprinting a bit. I don't remember much of the running, it was all a blur to me, but I do remember the spine-tingling feeling of hearing his footsteps rapidly increasing behind me. For a man of his stature, he was quite fast. I also realized that his intentions may have not been just to pet my dog. No one reasonable would go that far just to pet a dog that clearly wanted nothing to do with him. I looked behind me and he was in pursuit. Maybe about 10 feet behind me he was chasing us. Finally, the path led to the park exit and into the busier streets. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park. I made sure no one was following me and I even made sure to walk on the populated streets. After what seemed like an eternity, we got home but I knew for a fact that I was not going to get any sleep. From my window in the porch, I watched all night with Loki, just to see if anyone had followed us home. I also made a police report with my parents. After all, this guy seemed to have been quite suspicious and who knows what his true intentions were. Ever since, I haven't walked Loki in that park. I've also made it a habit of mine to walk on livelier streets at night. 
If I could give anyone one piece of advice, even if you live in a relatively safe town, do not ever let your guard down. This happened about a year ago to me and my husband. It was our 10th anniversary, so we decided to go camping, just the two of us, and of course our dog. There is a big national park slash camping area near where we live, little less than an hour drive. So that was where we were heading. It's basically a big forest with many small lakes, ponds, trails, and camping sites around. Pretty popular place during summer, but we still saw some people, even though it was late September and the weather was cold. We found a good spot next to a lake to set up our camp. It was a beautiful day, so we wanted to hike a bit in the forest. There was a nice long path that was going around the lake where we had our camp, so we chose to go that way. The lake was quite small, and there was another camping site by it. You could see there from our camp, and from there you could see our camp. They were almost on opposite sides of the lake. We walked past another camp, and saw a man there alone just standing and staring at us, not answering when we greeted him. He was maybe in his late 20s, around the same age as us. I thought at that point that maybe he was just shy and a little weird. He had a small tent set up and some other stuff all around the place, so I figured he had been there for a while. We just continued walking and didn't think much to it. Eventually we got to our camp and started to set up our tent before it's too dark. We made some food by the fire and just sat there enjoying the peace. Suddenly, our dog starts barking like crazy. She was tied to a long wire around a tree. We immediately realized that she wasn't just paranoid and that there was something really in the woods and it was near. It had been very dark for hours at this point. I took the dog to a leash and my husband started to look around with his bright headlamp. Our dog just kept barking. We were confused and sure it was some kind of animal, maybe a bear or a moose, but we couldn't understand why it wasn't scared of us and why it wouldn't run away. My husband went ahead to the path that leads to the other camp. Right when he got to the path, which was just less than 10 meters away from our camp, he saw something on the ground. I told him to go check it out and followed with our dog. He stopped, turned at me and said, it's a human, laying on the ground. The first thing I thought was that maybe they were hurt or dead or something. They just laid there not moving, facing the ground. We asked, are you okay? Are you hurt? And they just suddenly stood up. Turned out, it was the guy from the other camp. He was very scared of our dog and told me to not let her near him. I was kind of relieved that it wasn't some bear that was going to eat us, but I soon learned that a bear might have been less scarier than this guy. After he stood up, he walked straight to our campfire and sat down. My husband tried to ask him multiple times why he was sneaking in the dark forest without any light. He didn't give us an answer. We even laughed a bit and told him how we thought that he was a bear or something. But he didn't even smile, just stared at the fire, looking annoyed. His right leg was soaking wet. He probably stepped off the path and dipped it in the lake on his way to our camp. He sat with us for 30 minutes, not talking much. He also clearly wanted to know where our dog was at all times. I saw he had a knife hanging from his belt, but I guess it's not that weird when you're in the woods. Every few minutes he put his hand in his pocket and just peeked up whatever was in there. Kind of like checking the time on your phone without taking it out from your pocket, but it wasn't a phone he had there. I felt very uncomfortable and anxious by the whole situation. So, when the 30 minutes had passed, he again stood up and mumbled about going back to his own camp, and left. He never gave us any explanation of why he came to our camp or why he was stalking us in the dark. He tried very hard not to be seen when we found him. When I thought he was far enough, I told my husband that there's no way I'm sleeping in that tent. The biggest nope ever. Fortunately for me, he agreed and said that that guy might come back when we are sleeping. I just wanted to leave as soon as possible, so my husband started packing up things up. Our car is nearby, thank goodness, and I was guarding and looking around with the light if he comes back. Just when we had almost all of our stuff in the car, I saw a quick flash of light on the path from the guy's camp towards ours. He was coming back. Maybe he thought we went to sleep because he couldn't see our campfire anymore. So yeah, we got in the car and left real quick. I don't know if we overreacted, but I had such a bad feeling about him. Who crawls in the dark, wet forest alone just to stalk some strangers? What would have he done if our dog wouldn't have hurt him? What were his motives? I don't know and didn't want to stay there and find out. I'm just glad that we had our dog with us. There's a chance that she saved our lives. This happened to me when I was 19 and in college. I met a guy named Sam through a friend of a friend. Sam seemed nice enough and I would see him around but that's as far as it went. One day we managed to end up alone as I'm coming out of my building, he sees me and starts chatting me up. At first it was simple small talk, but I became uncomfortable once he starts complimenting me saying I have nice teeth. Not nice smile, but nice teeth. I thought this was a weird way to phrase a compliment, but I just ignore it. He then goes on to ask me, what are you? Meaning he wants to know my ethnicity. I tell him I am Latina. He asks if I speak Spanish and I say yes. He makes a comment saying he likes Shakira's music and that he likes her song La Tortua. He then asks me what La Tortura means. I tell him it translates to the torture. I notice his eyes get wide and he starts smiling. 
At this point I'm done talking to him and I tell him I have to go. I make a mental note to stay away from him after that because throughout the rest of the conversation he had a really creepy smile on his face. I get busy with classes so I forget about him quickly. One day I get a call on my cell phone from an unknown number. I decide to answer it and I hear a raspy male voice breathe heavily and say, La Tartura. I hang up and think what was that, but I just take it as a stupid prank and move on with my day. For the next week or two I keep getting calls from an unknown number but I don't answer. Weeks go by. I have forgotten about the phone calls when I end up running into Sam again outside my building. He starts making small talk again then with a giant grin he says, Have you been getting any phone calls lately? It takes me a second to realize that it's been him calling me from that unknown number. I don't want him to see me reacting so I say no, but internally I'm freaking out. He then goes on to tell me, I've been watching you through your window for weeks and you never noticed. For context, my dorm room window was split into three parts. One big glass pane in the middle, but two smaller panes on either side that you could open for fresh air. If those side panels were open enough, you had enough room to slip your hand in, move the curtain out the way, and get a good look inside. Obviously after that I was thoroughly creeped out and was wondering how many times he watched me dress, nap, or do any of the other things you do in the comfort of your own space. I ended the conversation somehow and wondered what I should do. After I calmed down I decided to report what he said to me to my residential advisor and then reported it to the director of housing at our school. Luckily the director took the situation seriously and encouraged me to report him to campus police. A report was made, they would have to speak to him to get his response to my allegations and I was told that in the meantime if he approaches me again I should come back and make another report. A couple of days later the director of housing comes to my dorm to tell me that campus police spoke to Sam and he admitted to them that he told me he had been watching me but that it was all a joke. He was told to stay away from me and I was told to report him again if he kept harassing me but it never went further than that. Over the next few days I end up telling the girls in my dorm what happened with Sam. They obviously think it's gross so we make plans to go out on campus as a group for the time being and to keep our curtains closed. Going out as a group definitely made me feel safer and everything was fine for a little while until, one day, we are coming out of the dorm dining hall and we run into Sam and some of his friends. He sees me, gets visibly upset, and starts approaching me yelling, why did you tell him what I said? I got scared thinking he might do something, but luckily my dorm mates rallied around me and rushed me out of there. I knew he was mad about reporting him because before this happened our mutual friend, a male, had told me he's mad that you reported him. Thankfully, this is the last time I was ever near that guy. The school year ended soon after this happened. I moved off campus, got a new friend group, and moved on. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't made a report and ignored him. When I was 16 I used to attend English classes that were for people of all ages. So I was used to having colleagues older than me that also wanted to improve their language skills. I was really close to another girl my age back then, Jasmine. She was much more popular than me, so she would always introduce me to new people. One day I noticed this guy in her group. He was 32 and very talkative, always smiling. For some reason though he made me feel uncomfortable from the get go. I think it's because he would stare at me for no apparent reason. While everyone was talking as a group, he seemed to address me specifically every time, but I didn't give him much thought. As the days passed he started waiting around before my classroom door and started conversations about my friendship with Jasmine, my high school, my family, etc. I thought it was weird that he was so interested, given that he was much older, but I felt guilty for feeling bad, like he was just being nice and I was being mean to think he was weird. I should have listened to my instinct. Instead I forced myself to answer, to make small talk. He told me how close he was with Jasmine and that made me feel a bit safer. When I asked her about him though, she said she didn't know him that well, but that he seemed nice enough. One day I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. When I picked it up it was him. He said he got my number from Jasmine. I was upset and confronted her about giving my number to him and she said he insisted so she ended up agreeing to it. He started calling me all the time, like 2-3 to three times a day, to ask about my day, say he missed me and wanted to chat. He started telling me private stuff about his life because he felt like he could talk to me since I was so mature for my age. I didn't like it so I stopped answering, or would make an excuse and quickly hang up. Then he would send me messages, that's when things started getting worse. The messages would vary in tone, sometimes they were really childish, with lots of emojis. He would wish me a lovely day or say he was thinking of me. Other times they would simply say, you're so pretty, too pretty, with no context. He would say he was glad I didn't have a boyfriend, that I should never get one or he would be mad. I never answered to those and showed them to Jasmine. I told her I didn't want to see or talk to him anymore before or after class and she said she would help. I started going to class late so I wouldn't meet him in the corridors. I leave class immediately after the end, but I saw him watching me. I could feel he knew what I was doing but actually sort of enjoyed it. I felt like it was a game to him, making me feel uncomfortable. He stopped talking to Jasmine and everyone else, but continued to message me saying, I miss you or why are you so busy? I blocked his number. I thought that would be the end of it and started relaxing a bit, but one day I was talking to another girl outside the school and he showed up. 
with a big smile and said that it's been too long and why I wasn't answering his messages. He acted like he was worried about me, that I was studying too much, etc. He invited me to go have a coffee with him in his house. I told him no and went inside, where I pretended to study in the library until he left. He waited around doing nothing more for an hour. I started really being scared then. Since that day he invited me to his house, he became more aggressive, making fun of me whenever he bumped into each other in the corridor, saying stuff like, still busy or I'm in no hurry. He found my social medias and sent me messages there, each time more explicit. He would comment on my pictures saying I was sexy and that he knew what I was up to, teasing me. I blocked him everywhere but I always felt like he was watching me all the time. He stopped talking to me but would always stare at me in class. One day I was going back home alone after class. I noticed a car was right next to me, driving slowly and when I looked it was him. He talked to me through the window and invited me in, said he would give me a ride home. It was a residential street, not many people around. I said no and continued walking. He kept insisting and saying he knew where I lived he could drop me there. I started walking fast then, stopped interacting with him at all. I just wanted to get to the main road so there would be more people around. He got angry then, said get in in a voice I almost didn't recognize. I looked at him in shock and his facial expression had changed completely. He had a dark look in his eyes, no smile at all. He looked like he wanted to hurt me. So I ran and got into the first shop I saw, a mini market. I waited until his car left and then sped home. After that I didn't want to go back to class. I asked my mom to change classes. I never told her why, for some reason I felt ashamed, like I somehow caused the situation. I finished the semester without incidents and thought it was all over, but after two years, yes two whole years, he came back. By then I was starting university and any thoughts of him were out of my mind, until he created a new account on Facebook and started messaging me again, like nothing happened, like no time had gone by. He said he was hurt I cut him out of my life, that he wanted to be my friend. I blocked every account he made without ever answering. One day to my panic he showed up in my campus. I went to a university that was close from home but still, it couldn't have been a coincidence. He was just across the street, watching me. I hurried and got into a bus before he could talk to me. The next week I wasn't so lucky. I was eating a snack at the cafeteria with a group of friends and he just suddenly came by and introduced himself to everyone, like we were old friends. I could barely breathe. My friends noticed I wasn't feeling well and he seemed to enjoy their confusion and my fear. I pulled him aside and asked him what he was doing, asked him to leave me alone. He said he wouldn't and again had that dark look he had in the car, years before. The creepiest part was just how different it was from the expression he had around everyone else. He looked like a different person. I told him I would tell everyone, and he said he knew I wanted him. He knew I was just a dirty little tease, but that he would get me. My body and mind just shut down when I heard that and I ran back to my friends and started crying. When I finished telling them everything, he had gone away and I never saw him again. When I was 16, what feels like eons ago, I started going to high school that had a public library in it. Upon entering the front doors of the school, there was a wide hallway with the entrance to the library being a straight walk from the school entrance, so it wasn't like outsiders had to walk through the halls to get to it, but it really bothered me that anyone with a library card could be in our school at any given moment that it was open, even if they were only supposed to check out books or use a computer. Having said that, I rarely saw adults that weren't school employees in the library during school hours. My family didn't always have the electricity on, much less the internet, so I would often stay after school to do my homework in the library where I could use the computers. The librarian's desk was in the middle of the library and there were maybe two dozen computers off to one side, in four or five rows. Other than that, there were a few small rooms where the book club would meet or someone could study privately, which were locked up when not in use. One afternoon I had a research essay to do, I think it was about Homer's Odyssey, so I had asked my dad to pick me up two hours after school ended. I went to the library immediately after my last class and chose a computer close to the librarian's desk. Blissfully, only the librarian and I were in the room. I was really pleased to be able to work quietly and started plugging in away at my assignment. 30 minutes into writing, I heard the doors of the library open. I didn't look up, but I could hear a man speaking boisterously to the librarian, with her responding in a very chummy way. They were talking like they knew each other very well. After a few minutes of chatting, the librarian excused herself. I can't remember if I heard her say why, but she bustled out of the room and did not return before I left, more than an hour later, which hadn't happened before. I can't say for sure, but I'm almost positive that she was supposed to not leave the library unattended while it was open. They actually closed it when she took lunch sometimes because I'd seen the back in X minutes sign on the door previously. Almost as soon as the librarian left, this adult man decided to use a computer. Being that we were the only two people using computers, you would think he sat nowhere near me, right? He sat one chair away from my right. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was a very large man in every sense of the word, but otherwise, he looked like your average guy with generic black frame glasses. After the first peripheral glance, I tried to avoid looking over at this guy. 
I also told myself that the librarian knew him, so he's probably okay. Just subdue checking his email. Nothing to be paranoid about. As I'm continuing to research for my essay and make notes, I start hearing this guy giggle in between clicking the mouse. At first quietly, but he starts chuckling within a minute. I didn't want to, but I felt my whole head turn to look at this guy's computer. His monitor was showing what appeared to be a photo covered by colorful jigsaw puzzle pieces. As the guy clicked on the puzzle piece outlines, they disappeared, revealing the picture underneath. When I first looked at it, the picture was completely visible except for two pieces. The image was a naked man posing with his arms over his head. The creep looked over at me, still chuckling. I had the feeling he was canvassing for my reaction, which was unmasked disgust. I logged off and moved to a different computer, which I thought sent the message that he made me uncomfortable. I logged into my new computer and as soon as I started typing, the guy got up, walked over, and sat down next to me. I promptly stood up, kicking over my chair, unplugged the computer, I wanted to log out really fast, and ran out. My dad wasn't going to be there for another 30 minutes, at least. So I waited in the bathroom. Whenever it was about time for me to get picked up, I walked toward the front doors to leave the school and I decided to peek in the library. The creep was sitting at the computer still, but his body was turned to face the doors and he was looking straight at me, with a big grin on his face. I dropped out of school that year, and this honestly played a part in that decision. I felt so vulnerable, and looking back I think that librarian might have been secretly creeped out by this guy and was playing nice in front of him. She might have made a lame excuse to leave the room so that she didn't have to entertain him, which I would understand if she wasn't leaving him alone with an underage student. I didn't trust the school to take it seriously, especially the librarian, so I didn't tell anyone. I just hope that guy isn't prowling around the high school still. Last year I, a 20 year old female, had taken the morning off from work so I could pick up my friend from a pretty serious medical procedure. It had been a tense time and I really just wanted her to get through it okay so she could begin to heal and feel better. I live in New York and her appointment was right off of 42nd Street by Grand Central Station, which is arguably one of the most well populated, busy areas of the city. I had just gotten off the subway and was walking east past Grand Central Station when I made eye contact with this dude walking towards me, and half a block away. He was a thin, looking guy with really creepy eyes, and he was looking basically directly into my soul. It was incredibly unsettling. We were far enough away that I tried to play it off, looked down, and casually strafed to the right a bit so that our paths wouldn't cross. When I looked up, I noticed he mirrored my movement so our paths were directly aligned again. I strafed again to the left, and he again moved to be in line with me, eyes still locked on me. I felt a sick feeling in my stomach and started to freak out a little. He was getting much closer now and we were basically trapped in a group of people so I didn't really have space or time to cross the street. I also didn't want to turn around and go the opposite way because then my back would be towards him. I took my headphones out and kind of slowed down, but he was absolutely still coming for me. When he inevitably got close enough to me that we were within arm's reach of each other, I guess my fight or flight took over and I grabbed him by the shoulders and shoved him aside, sidestepping him. He was full on attempting to collide with me. The group of people around us barely reacted, which is crazy to me. I thought I dodged a bullet, except after shoving him out the way, he began screaming at me. I yelled back at him, what were you doing? Get out of here, you're creepy, keep moving and other random phrases that just fell right in the moment. Deep down I think I was just hoping if I made a scene someone would step in to help, but nobody did and then I noticed that he'd stopped walking and had fully turned his body around to face me again, and then began to walk toward me again. He was yelling at me this time, calling me disgusting, crude names, telling me he was going to smack me and teach me a lesson, etc. I absolutely panicked and began jogging away, only to look back and realizing that he was now jogging after me, still threatening me and screaming at me. He was getting closer and all I could think was find a cop. You're at Grand Central. Where are the cops? Now one stranger noticed or intervened. He was literally 10 feet away from me when I finally just ran up to the biggest burliest dude I could find and yelled help at him. He was a little surprised and didn't do much, but this younger couple next to us stepped in. The guy got in between us and started telling the creepy dude to get lost, that he's making a scene and that he needs to go, etc. While the girlfriend consoled me. The guy glared at me one last time until he finally turned and started walking away, still cursing. I thanked the couple and continued along my way, making it about 5 paces before absolutely breaking down in tears and calling a friend. Thank god for the coffee place nearby that let me loiter while I collected myself before going in to pick up my friend. I thank the universe for that brave couple that stepped in to protect me. To this day I wonder what the man would have done to me if I hadn't shoved him aside or if that couple hadn't stopped him from chasing me. Just goes to show, no matter how many people are around you, if you're having a bad feeling, listen to it. And don't be afraid to yell for help. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. 
To give you a little background about myself, I'm a female from a South Asian country. That being said, there are some states which are relatively safe. 2019 had been a rough year for me, but by October, I started feeling rather better and decided to take a solo trip for my birthday. I spoke to some friends and decided to head to the small village down south. My brother helped convince my overprotective mother as he'd already been there. To put her mind at ease, I decided to get pepper spray. Unfortunately, we couldn't find one, so I kept a bottle of deodorant and a knife handy. I decided to stay there for five days and booked a room at a guest house only for two days, thinking I'll check out this guest house that my friend had suggested and hopefully move there. To tell you a little bit more about this village, everyone is extremely friendly and warm, and they have tourists coming from all over the globe. Once I got to the room, I was a little paranoid because it seemed a bit dingy. Forget about a security system, the latch on the door was barely functional. The first night was a bit unsettling, but nothing happened. The next day was my birthday, so I rented a bike and went on exploring the village. Sometime after lunch, I decided to check out the guest house that my friend had recommended which was a little secluded but extremely peaceful. As I reached there, I was greeted by the owner, who showed me around. This place had big huts on one side and a row of small rooms on the opposite side. I decided to take the latter as it was cheaper and I didn't plan on being in the room much anyway. We exchanged numbers and I told him I'll move in the next day. The next day, I got there and had lunch with the owner and he told me about the history of the place and a bit about himself. I realized that he wasn't around when my friend had been there. I was trying to read him, seeing if I was getting any creepy vibes from him since I was going to spend two nights there. I didn't see any red flags in particular. After lunch, I went to a restaurant that was right behind the guest house. I met some of the locals whom I was already acquainted with. Along with them were two new guys, one of whom was from my city. The three of us instantly clicked and started hanging out. Once it got dark, we came back to my guest house to chill, when the owner told us that he's planning a bonfire with some of his guests slash friends who were sitting at another table. An hour passed as we ate and played cards, but those guys didn't seem like they were in the mood for a bonfire and soon left the place. Since the owner had already set things up, we decided to spend some time by the fire with him. We were all sitting and talking up until midnight, when the other two boys decided to take off as they weren't staying there. I told the owner that I head back to my room too. He tried to convince me to stay a bit longer, but I didn't want to be alone with him. My room's door had around 4-5 to five locks, but only two of them were functional. So I locked them and realized that the windows facing each other did not have any panes and the curtains were made with scraps of thin cloth, which meant anyone could peep inside and see everything, so I went into the bathroom to change and clean up. As soon as I stepped out and started taking my stuff from my bag, I heard someone whisper my name. Twice. My heart skipped a beat and I froze for a few seconds. I decided to ignore it and quickly shut all the lights. Before going to bed, I decided to keep the bin right in front of the door, so in case someone tries to open it, it would make some noise. I took out my deodorant and knife and kept it right next to my pillow before laying in bed. I kept looking at both the windows on the side to see if anyone's outside. After about half an hour, the metallic door started rattling violently, as if someone was trying to force it open. Instantly, I stood up and got hold of the knife and deodorant. My mouth went dry and my heart started beating fast. I didn't know if I should scream because I only knew of one other girl who was staying in the opposite hut. After what felt like forever, the door stopped shaking and I collapsed into the bed. I checked the windows to see if anyone was walking by, but no one did. I tried to think of what it could have been. Maybe it was just the wind, but the currents hadn't moved one bit. It had to be a person. I don't know when, but I passed out soon after. I woke up around 6am to see that it was almost bright outside. I closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep, when it started happening again. Frantically, I shut up in bed again, ready to attack. But once again, it stopped after a few minutes. I didn't understand what was happening. I went closer to the door and got a look at the bin that I had kept by the door. It had moved away from its original position. Yes, something definitely happened. Not knowing what to do, I decided to go back to sleep. When I got out of the room later, I tried to read the owner's face but it was just as hard to read as the day before. What worried me the most was that I had to spend another night in that room. I decided to not let that thought spoil the day and went out with the two friends I'd made for a trek and then to watch the sunset from a hilltop, where all the locals gathered to play music in the evening, including that owner. My new friends and I went somewhere else after that and then around 10 decided to head back to my guest house for dinner. As I was nearing the hotel, I got a text from the owner, asking where I was. I didn't think much of it because it was late and he was probably wondering if I was safe. I didn't reply as we were almost there. When we sat down on the futon, the owner said I was just about to text you and show me the message he typed on his phone. I was just thinking about you. I'm not sure what that meant. So I looked at his face trying to read him and realized he was trying to do the same. Quickly I decided to act normal and told him where we were. We all sat, met a couple more people, ate, smoked, and around 11, the guys decided to head to their guest houses. 
At that point I got up and told him I'd head to my room too. He looked at the time and asked me why I was ending the night so early. I told him that I was really tired from all that walking and that I wanted to be up early. He didn't push any further as there were other people around. I went back to the room filled with anticipation and dread, but thankfully nothing happened that night. The next day I checked out, but my bus wasn't until 5pm. I didn't want to be left alone with the owner, so I met up with the guys, leaving my luggage at the reception which was also the eating area. When I came back, I picked up my bag, and thanked him, and left in a hurry. I still have no idea if it was the owner or the only helper that I saw around. Whoever it was trying to forcefully get through my door, let's not me. I may have been 8-9 to nine years old. I lived in a nice little middle class neighborhood. One of my best friends, Raven, lived across the street diagonally, one house down, so I often spent evenings at her home after school. Raven's mom would always call my mom to let her know I was leaving and to expect me in the next minute or so. This way mom knew to unlock our front door. Often she stood and watched from the screen door to make sure I got across okay. I had begun noticing this beat up red car, possibly an old Volkswagen or Buick, that would pass by almost every night as I ran back across the street. I would always head home just after dark, so possibly around 8.30 any time I was leaving Raven's house. It was always rolling super slow, speed limit was 25 miles per hour, and I want to say this vehicle was always passed at maybe half that. One night as I was leaving perhaps a bit later than usual, I stepped out the side door of Raven's house just as the car was about to pass the house completely. It stopped in the road and backed up as I approached the side of the road. The window rolled down just as the car stopped in front of me. A little woman with short reddish brown hair and blue framed glasses was smiling sweetly at me. Hi sweetheart, it's a little late for you to be out right now, isn't it? She asked me, her voice was low and pleasant. No, mom lets me, I'm just walking home, I replied stupidly. Oh gosh, how silly of your mom, there's all kinds of bad people out late at night. Where do you live sugar, I'll give you a ride. Just then, my mom came bursting out the front door and screamed, leave her alone, as she began running to me. The woman's pleasant demeanor dropped and I heard her mutter a word, possibly f as she slammed her foot on the gas and took off at well over the speed limit. She didn't stop at the nearby stop sign, just blasted through it to make her escape. I got a nice lecture that night but also a lot of tight hugs. My mom was super glad that she chose to look out the storm door to check on me instead of just letting me wander home. I could have been taken, and she told me as much. I cannot remember if the police were called, but I never interacted with any officers. This doesn't end here though. Like most little kids, I really liked setting up lemonade stands. Like most little kids, I also enjoyed handmaking and baking cakes and brownies and cookies and also selling those at my lemonade stands. About two weeks after the prior incident, a beautiful sunny Saturday, mom helped me with the baking and helped me make lemonade and set me up in the front yard with my sign. She had been paranoid ever since the prior incident and had hardly let me out of her sight aside from school and the bus, and this was no different. She stayed outside with me all while I sold my little treats to passerby, until she had to run to the restroom. It would obviously be a pain to take everything down and bring it inside while she went and then to bring it all back out and set it up again. She figured I'd be okay for a few minutes, considering it was the middle of the afternoon and usually canappers aren't that stupid. Mom left me alone for several minutes when she went to the bathroom and presumably went to grab a snack as she was gone for 10 or so minutes. A familiar face walked up, about 8 minutes in. She appeared from around some bushes down the street. I didn't see her in the distance walking up. I honestly saw her stand up from behind some bushes and brush herself off and begin walking towards me. Her clothes were smart and sophisticated looking, almost like a pantsuit. It was a real clash with how ratty her car had been, but that same placating smile was on her face and her eyes glinted behind the same glasses. Aw oh, cute, a lemonade stand. Hi again sweetie, sorry for bothering you the other night. I didn't realize how close to home you were. Mama told me to not talk to you, go away. I said it as meanly as I could muster, but mom had rightfully and made me so frightened of this woman that I'm sure I just sounded like the scared little girl I was. Come on now, Mary. She spoke my real name, first and last, and my eyes got big. I'm a friend of your parents. I lived on the street, remember? We met at the pool this past summer. I had no recollection of her. If you're their friend, why did you leave so quick? Mom, I began shouting for my mother. This made her crouch down in front of my table, eye to eye with me. We don't need to do that. I just want to talk to you. You like to bake, right? I have a really fancy kitchen with a nice baker's oven. All sorts of cool gadgets to make baking cupcakes and stuff like this super fun. No, 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 mama. I stood up and pushed the table into this woman and started running for the front door. This woman kicked the folding table away and started to chase me until my mom appeared in the doorway. She flung the door open and I barreled into her and the woman stopped running and stood in the yard. What are you doing to my daughter? My mom shouted at her. My god, your child is rude. I was just trying to buy a cupcake and she shoved the table into me and ran. Now I have lemonade all over my clothes. The woman lied through her teeth. I don't think she was expecting my mom to come back. That's the lady from that night, in the car. I was now trying to get around my mom and hide behind her. My mom pulled out her cell phone and this time I know she called the police. 
The woman immediately ran off back the direction she came. The cops appeared, one took statements while the other one patrolled the neighborhood searching for her. They ended up finding her car parked at the grocery store that was up the road about half a mile at the other end of the neighborhood. They waited for her to show up and claim it. She never did. They couldn't find her. So, random lady in the red beater, please, let's not meet again. This happened a couple years ago when I was 16. I had just recently got my first job at a chain sandwich shop. It was located in the shopping mall outlet at the far end. There were quite a few businesses around it, including a restaurant down the way and a super target on the other side of the mall on the far end of the parking lot. My parents were always super protective and taught me at a young age to be aware of my surroundings and protect myself, and rarely even let me walk alone to begin with. On this particular day, I had left my phone at home because I wasn't allowed to have it at work and had a daily time limit on it anyways. Thanks mom. I had ended up finishing up my shift early, and my mom was still shopping at the Target, so told me to go ahead and walk over to meet her. I began walking towards the Target and had to wait for passing cars. One silver car stopped and let me walk across. I smiled and waved thank you and the man in the car did the same, and turned on the street going the direction I was walking. I didn't think anything of it, as it was a relatively busy parking lot and most of the shops are over on the other side by the Target. A minute or two goes by and I spot the same car now driving in the opposite direction towards me. I make a mental note but think I'm just overreacting. That is, until he turns back around. At this point I'm concerned and notice I'm now a part of the mall that's a little less crowded with a more empty parking lot. I get this uneasy feeling in my stomach that he's following me, and to test my hypothesis, I switch my direction. Instead of heading towards the target, I walk towards the restaurant. The car immediately turns into the parking lot. I switch into freakout mode and speed walk to the front doors. In my time of panic, I didn't realize that the parking spots for the restaurant were completely empty. I pull on the doors and they're locked. They were apparently closed on Sundays. At this point, the man in the gray car was parked in the lot in front of the restaurant watching me. The way he was parked, I would have to pass this car to go back on the path I originally was on. I stand there a moment pretending not to notice and think about what to do next. I obviously don't want to walk any closer to the car than I already was. I decide to cut through the side shrubbery of the restaurant and head towards the closest shop I could find. The gray car comes out of the parking lot still following me and I bolt into the dollar store across from the restaurant. I see the gray car park and I walk up to one of the cashiers and explain what happened and I ask if I could use her phone to speak to my mother. She says of course and tells me to stay in here until my mom comes to get me. I call my mom and tell her about the car and she of course freaks out. By this time, I think the man in the car caught on because he eventually backs out and leaves. My mom shows up and thanks the cashier lady and we drive to the Target. Aside from us both being shaken up, we were okay. It definitely ruined me for walking alone again. Now that I'm an adult and live on my own, I carry pepper spray and a pocket knife anywhere I go just in case. I rarely walk anywhere unless I'm with someone or it's only a few minutes away. It still scares me today to think of what could have happened, or what that man's intentions were. So, to the man in the gray car, let's not meet again. This all happened last summer when me and my childhood best friend, we were both 15, decided to go camping for her birthday. We were originally supposed to be a 5-6 to six person group, but it ended up being just the two of us. So we met at her grandma's house, me with my scooter and her with her mom in a car, and headed to our camping site for the next two nights. The camping site was very deep in the woods beside a public trail, but there were still neighbors who had a lot right next to the one we were using. My friend's mother warned us to not go take a walk on the left side of the trail, which would lead us to the weird and possibly dangerous neighbors. We obviously listened since we didn't want any trouble at all. So after unpacking most of our stuff, her mother left, letting us alone in the middle of the woods with only a 50cc scooter to get out in case of emergency which, don't get me wrong, is very useful but not very fast. So we started doing our thing, eating junk food, listening to music, catching up on both of our lives, since we haven't talked in a very long time. She moved away a few years prior to this so we don't get the chance to talk to each other that much. The sun was slowly going down, it was getting darker and darker. We were talking and singing when we heard an ATV coming on the trail. It was coming from the left side. Me and my friend freaked out a little so we basically just locked the door and ran to the back of the camper. The ATV stopped on our camping site. We could hear two adult males talking to each other about whatever knows what. It took something like 5 minutes but they finally left. At this point we weren't that worried because we thought it was just some curious people who wanted to know if there was anyone in the camper, which had already been robbed in the past, so we just continued our stuff, listening to music and all. By this time it was already dark outside and the moon wasn't out yet, leaving us with no other lights than our candle. There was no water and no electricity in the camper, which also meant we had to go outside to use the bathroom. Fortunately, it was a full moon night so eventually the moon would come out and we will be able to see outside pretty well. So again we were talking, everything else was quiet, no music, 
No animal noises either, and then we heard an ATV coming our way once again, so we turned out all the candles and stopped talking, waiting in silence. We quickly sat on the ground of the camper to make sure no one could see us from outside, because the curtains were still opened and then we listened. The ATV stopped a little before coming up to our camping site and everything went silent. A couple minutes after that we could hear footsteps all around the camper. Yes, it could have been an animal, but with the ATV sound and what happened after, we know it wasn't an animal. The steps eventually faded away. We then quietly moved to the back of the camper, closing every curtain, making sure the door was locked. We brought two knives with us. We eventually heard another noise. We immediately went silent and we hit the candlelight. We then heard the noise again. It was like someone was trying to open the camper door just by turning the handle. We then heard footsteps going all the way around the camper and we could hear the person testing every single window to see if any of them were opened. We were almost crying. After they tested all the windows, the steps faded away with maybe one hour of tranquility and silence during which we were quite panicking. When we finally calmed down, we heard noises at the door once again, but this time, it sounded more like someone was trying to unlock the door with the lockpick. We could hear the lockpick inside of the mechanism and then the person would try to turn the handle. After 5 minutes of trying, the person probably got mad and started turning the handle angrily and punching and kicking at the door. We were freaked out. I had my brand new iPhone in one hand, hesitating on calling the cops or no. No service was available at this location, but 911 can still work most of the time. The noise was still going on at the door and all around the camper. This lasted for at least 30 minutes. The person was trying every window and then at some point gave up once again. We then started to make up a plan. The noise at the door happened a couple more times. We acted as if we were more than two people in the camper, so we started acting like my friend's mother and sister were there, as if one of our guy friends was there, and we acted like the noise woke us up and we screamed at the people to go away, and we got mad. Our plan worked, I guess, since we heard multiple people running away. The next morning after making sure everything was okay, we got out of the camper and we saw that a bunch of the plants next to the camper had been stepped on. There were footsteps everywhere in the mud and everywhere around the camper. Since it was daytime and my friend's mother was supposed to come back to see us, to make sure we were okay, we decided to sit outside waiting for her. We were walking around waiting when a car slowed down in front of our campsite. It never stopped but we saw the driver staring at us. Then maybe 10 minutes later it went by again and again and again, always giving us that menacing stare. When my friend's mother finally arrived, we asked her if anyone tried to prank us or make a joke and she went on and asked every possible suspect and no it was not a prank. Everyone promised that if it was them, they would have told us but it really wasn't them. We didn't sleep alone this time. We had someone else come sleep with us for the second night. I'm just glad they weren't able to open the door to the camper. So I'm 23 now but when this happened I was 17. In my last year of high school I was the art girl. I was working on my portfolio so that I could apply to art school. I mainly did landscapes but part of the requirement for our portfolios was life drawing. Obviously my high school didn't have any life drawing classes so my art teacher linked me up to a life drawing class at a local university which is one of the top art institutions in the UK. So for my school I had to get a half hour bus to the center of the city and then walk maybe 15 minutes of a long stretch through the student district. It was a six week course and this happened the fifth week. The class was really interesting and I learned a lot since this was my first time working with life models. I was pretty confident and not too worried about walking alone at night. The class finished at maybe 9pm and it was pretty dark by the time I got out. So four weeks walking there and back, uneventful. Fifth week walking there, totally fine. Fifth week walking back to my bus stop, also totally fine. Five minutes at the bus stop, it was very freaky. So the stop I had to wait at was outside the expensive private school in my city. There's a strip with about four bus stops and it's also pretty busy. So busy that people don't even see what's happening right in front of them. So I must have been one of the first people there so I'm standing just outside the shelter because I'm smoking and obviously I don't want to be a jerk and make other people breathe in my smoke. So there's only about a few minutes left to my bus and I'm minding my business when this guy comes and stands super close to me. Like not as in infringing a bit of my personal space here close. Like, literally, I can feel him standing against me. He must have been in his 40s and just had that general creepy vibe and looked really grubby. So obviously, I'm a bit freaked out and sidestep away. So does he. I look at him and he has the creepiest smug grin. But at this point, I'm like, okay, he's trying to freak me out and he knows I know. I step away again, like fairly far away this time. He follows me again and is literally standing with the front of his body dead up against the back of mine. Honestly, I do not know how nobody noticed this or called him out. We were outside the shelter and it was dark. People are on their phones or their own conversations. I guess it must have been just that. I literally just froze in the moment, even though there were people around who would have helped. 
I don't want to overreact, maybe it's just a misunderstanding. I don't want to seem rude. So anyway, it gets worse. After dodging this creep for a few more moments as time dragged in slow, finally this bus comes around the corner. I know if I get on this bus before this guy, he is going to sit next to me which is what I want to avoid. So politely I gesture and say after you. He gives me that creepy look again and says no, you go first. I insist but he refuses again. There's a big queue now and I don't want to hold anyone up, so reluctantly I get on right before this guy. I get on the bus and do the only reasonable thing which is to sit next to an old lady right at the front of this empty bus. The seats are only in pairs so there's no way he could sit beside me now. Like I said, this bus is almost empty, so where does he sit? In the seat directly behind me. I'm just sitting trying to ignore him, which is pretty difficult to do when this guy keeps leaning forward and literally playing with my hair. I have really long hair and his hands are on it. I pulled out my phone and tried to text my mom but the sending bar would just stick. It happened to literally every time I tried to message her. Obviously I was scared to call her, I didn't want him hearing what I had to say. I messaged my friend and told her what was happening and that I thought that if I got off this bus the guy would most definitely follow me. I still had a 10 minute walk home after I got off this bus up a long straight road. So my friend calls my mom and tells her what's happening. My mom then calls me and relays what my friend had told her. Now, I'd been on this bus for about 15-20 to 20 minutes and my stop was coming up in 5. It's not a big city. My area is suburban and I don't know everyone but I think I recognize most. I'd never seen this guy before. He wasn't local to my area so I reasoned he had definitely been on this bus longer than his stop. Anyway, my mom called. I just said to her, I will be getting off this bus in 5-10 to 10 minutes. You need to get to X Street now and meet me. As soon as I said that, the creep pushes the button for the next stop. Literally as soon as I say it. He stands up and makes sure to bang into my arm and drag his body hard across me as he walks past. Stares at me from the door and through the window as the bus drives away. I'm not 100% certain if he actually had bad intentions or if he just got off on a 17 year old girl who was on her own. The fact he pressed the button as soon as I confirmed someone was meeting me makes me think he did intend on following me. I didn't go to the final week of that class. This happened this past year, my senior year of undergrad. I attend a big university with two bus stops. The first one is for a smaller portion of the school and the second one is the main one that people use, but they're pretty far apart. I got out of class and was next to the small bus stop around sunset. This guy, I'll call him Eric, comes up to me of all people in line and starts asking if this bus would take him to one of the student housing areas. It was kind of odd because it was partway into the year, but whatever, he seemed genuinely confused. I explained yes, this bus would take him there and his stop is the same one I get off of. He asked if he can wait in line with me and he was nice so I said sure. We're talking and waiting for the bus and it doesn't come so I decide to walk to the main stop and he follows. Again, at this point it's not creepy because it's just small talk. We walk to the other bus stop and we just jump on one over there. Eric sits next to me and is berating me with questions that I'm now answering very shortly. Then everything he says is flirty, like, yeah, come see my pool so we can tan. Let's work out together and get sweaty in the sauna. All very weird or random and I just don't say much because everyone on the bus can hear the conversation. He then asks for my number, which I lie about, but this guy says okay let me call you. Obviously, I get a call and Eric's just confused and I just say oh my bad. I knew he would call it again so I just gave the right number. Now I'm regretting telling him my stop, but I still get off with him. He's continuing the flirty comments but the street I'm parked on is opposite of his route home. I say goodbye and wait till he's out of my sight and to get in my car and drive away. At this point it's late and he was gone so I just went home and forgot about it. He texted me a couple times the next few weeks, all of which I ignored. Eventually he stopped and I forgot about the encounter. Fast forward a few months and I rarely use the bus anymore because I have a parking pass. One day after class I decided to go to the Vons right next to my original bus stop. I park in the farthest row because it's very busy and my car is in the middle of the row. I'm on a quick mission so I'm rushing down the first aisle and some guy turns around to check me out but I ignore it and keep going. I felt the guy's eyes on me still and thought how do I know this dude. Then I get in line and there he is at the front of the line grinning at me. It's Eric from the bus and I'm like screw this so I switch lines. He checks out way before I do and leaves. I get my stuff and walk out to my car. I was parked just far enough that you couldn't see my car, just the direction it was in. As I get closer, there's Eric standing right in front of my car. This was disturbing because he wasn't waiting at the door of the store or in the middle of the lot. Nope, right at my car. He positions himself in between me and my car and he's grinning and he says, I know you. I played dumb saying sorry you must have me confused. He says no you're from school. I say no that's not me, I don't go to that school. He believes me and starts aggressively asking me out. I say no thank you, I have a boyfriend. 
He says, okay, so you can't have friends? And I look at him and say sarcastically, do you really want to just be friends? He just grins at me and replies no. He then says, don't worry, when you're single, I will find you. The way he said it was very unnatural and creepy. He finally gets out of my way and lets me to my car. He watches me leave the parking lot and I drove to my brother's house just because of how unsettling that encounter was. On one occasion, I came from a group project and had to take the bus. It was crowded when I got on, so I sat in the first seat I saw. I could hear the conversation behind me and instantly recognize Eric's voice. The girl he was talking to seemed to be really into the conversation surprisingly. But now here I was on a bus to a school that I told this creep I didn't go to. I tried to get off quickly but somehow Eric and the girl got off before me. I'm relieved and try to keep a distance. I don't see them anymore and turn a corner and there he is again waiting for me. He doesn't move though, he just grins at me and says, Hi, are you going that way or this way by now? He used my real name and the fake one I used when I played dumb at Bonds. I just walk away and call my friends to meet on campus. The shelter in place was issued the next week and I moved home. Luckily I never have to see Eric again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story is from my days as a gas station clerk. This happened during a football Saturday, so the store was full of people from the moment I walked in. Most of the night is a blur because it was just cashiering for the first 6 hours of my shift. It was around 3am and things were finally starting to taper off. There were only a dozen or so people in the store. I just usually kept my head down and focused on the transaction in front of me so I wouldn't get overwhelmed, only looking up now and then to make sure the store isn't on fire and no one's stealing the wine case. I wasn't even looking around when I saw him. I just saw something strange in the corner of my eye and spun my head to look at him. When I got a good look, I was startled. This guy's skin was almost translucent white and he was soaking wet. His teeth were gritted and looked too big for his mouth. He was shaking as fast as he walked past the counter. I could hear the bathroom door slam from around the corner. I went back to my transaction and told myself that I needed to remember exactly where he was. I couldn't forget he was in the bathroom. I rang out the next few people, watching for him the whole time. After another 10 minutes or so, the store was suddenly empty. Customer rushes tend to be like that, from 100 miles an hour to just nothing. I knew he was still in the bathroom. I thought about going to knock, but I felt repelled. I had no intention of going near that door. I look at the clock and it's nearing 4am, which is when I need to start brewing coffee for it to be ready when my manager comes in. The coffee grounds are all in the supply closet behind the counter, so I tell myself it's totally fine to go get them. It satisfies both my paranoia and my arrogance as well. I'm still doing my job, but doing something I believe to be tactically the best move. If for whatever reason the guy opened the bathroom door and tried to run behind the counter and do something to me, I could shut the door and lock it from the inside. Besides, the bathroom doors are old and loud. I can easily hear them open from inside the closet, so I can just come out and wait near the panic button until he leaves. This all seemed like a very good idea at the time. So I decide to go get the coffee packets and I'm listening carefully while I load up on all the flavors I need. I figure I will only be a minute or so so I don't even turn the lights on. I'm listening carefully and I don't hear anything. I still don't hear anything. Then I hear a weird noise. It sounds like the water pipes in the back hissing at first, but it's too ragged. I suddenly realize the noise is breathing and it's getting louder. Then it's right on top of me. That's when I stood and turned to leave and saw him in the door frame. We just stood there both staring back at each other. Later when my manager reviewed the footage, she saw him leave the bathroom by slowly pushing the door open. Without making a sound, he had wandered behind the counter and peeked into her office, stepping in far enough to trigger the automatic light. After that, he had wandered behind the food surface counter before making his way to the open supply closet door. The next thing she saw on camera was me flipping out. I stepped backwards, my body shaking so hard my knees almost buckled. At this point, I think he realized how absolutely horrifying this entire scenario was to me. He put up his hands and started apologizing awkwardly. He was really twitchy and still gritting his teeth. I basically went on autopilot for a moment and said I wouldn't talk to him until he got out from behind the counter area. He walked backwards until he was barely on the other side of the employee's only entrance, standing next to the soda machine. He began asking for an iPhone charger, telling me he was lost. He said he had no money and just needed to charge his phone here until he could call for help. I told him I don't have an iPhone charger and I couldn't help him. He sighed and looked down for a moment, seeming to think about what to do. Then he flipped his head back and screamed as loud as he could. He then punched the soda machine, hard. I backed up and ran around the counter, up to where the panic button was under the register. I watched him as he walked around the store, punching the walls and kicking the counters and screaming. I heard myself shouting over and over, get out right now. 
After a second he stopped and turned around to look at me. He quietly apologized before wandering out of the store and running off into the dark. At this point I was shaking, but tried to pick up and keep working. I started brewing the coffee, checking the windows to see if he was out in the parking lot, but I couldn't see him. After another few minutes, a regular came in and told me a strange man had come up to him asking for a ride. He said the guy was soaked and his teeth were gritting. That's when I decided to call the police. They found him in the parking lot next door, screaming and punching the moving trucks. They took him to sober up and calm down. They informed me that he was very sorry for losing his cool and he was just very drunk and very lost. He had come from out of state for the game and got separated from his friends. In the end nothing bad happened, but it made me realize that something easily could have. My skin still crawls thinking about this guy. He saw me shopping for school supplies and things for my new apartment one evening during my first week of grad school and decided I was his mark. I had just moved to my new college town, didn't even have a cell phone yet after leaving the one my folks paid for during undergrad behind. As I left the parking lot with my purchases, I noticed this truck pull up behind me at the exit. It was late and there weren't too many people out. I pulled out and so did he. It was a few miles down a long retail street with lots of stoplights before my turn. As I drove, I realized the guy in the truck was trying to get my attention. Over the next few miles, he kept trying to get me to look at him. Some red lights he would end up ahead of me, some behind or beside. At every light he positioned himself so he could stare at me, either directly or in one of his mirrors. His gaze was unwavering and my anxiety rose. He was driving oddly, speeding up close to my bumper, hitting his brakes when he was in front of me, swerving close to my car a couple of times. Finally, at a red light where he was beside me, I glanced over and absolutely started to panic when I was met with an unbelievably empty, unwavering stare. He saw that I was terrified and he was following me, and he was trying to force me to pull over. At one point I scooted through an intersection on a hard yellow a couple of cars ahead of him thinking I could shake him. Nope. He went around the cars to the light and ran the red and got back in front of me. A freeway entrance ramp came up and I tried to fake him out by putting on my signal and getting into the merge lane for it. He took the bait and started up the ramp. I quickly got out of the merge lane and continued straight. Again, I'd hoped to lose him but he drove his truck down the embankment to keep following. At another light where he was beside me, I pulled through the light and then he turned at the last possible second. He made a U-turn and ran another red to follow me. My panic really ramped up at that point, with no cell phone, no sense of direction, and a new city. I really didn't know what to do, so I turned on some music and forced myself to sing along and forced myself to go to the speed limit so I wouldn't crash out of terrified stupidity. I decided to drive to the supermarket across town because I remembered it had a police station in it. He followed me all the way there. He burned out of the lot as soon as he saw all the cop cruisers parked out front. I filed a report and asked for a police escort home. I insisted because something told me this creep was waiting for me to leave the police station. He was. As soon as I pulled out, I saw him. I pulled over and told the officer following me and he went after him but the truck had taken off and the cop couldn't catch him. The police got the surveillance video from the first door. It turned out this jerk had been dodging me the entire time I was shopping. I saw my surveillance footage following me through the store. I saw him follow me out, close enough to grab my elbow. I saw footage of him circling the lot in his truck, waiting for me to pull out when I took too long to unload my cart. My heart sank. I was able to remember six of seven digits of his plate and the make and model of his truck. In the end, the cops did nothing. They said it was a he said she said since the surveillance video didn't catch him doing anything particular unlawful, it was a losing case to try to charge him with anything. I ended up trading vehicles with a friend for a couple of months to try to feel safer and went on with my life. I had no idea what this guy did just a handful of months later until almost 15 years had passed. I was watching a Discovery ID show about the kidnapping and murder of Sandy Jeffers. I almost fell out of my seat when I saw the mugshot of her killer, Aaron Lee Skeen. It was him. I was so disgusted the law enforcement did nothing in my case that I tracked down the investigator in the murder case and, after verifying some things about his vehicle that were changed in the TV reenactment to weed out people making stuff up, she took my contact info and official statement. She could neither confirm nor deny that my run-in was with Skeen, but qualified her statement by saying at least you don't have to worry about him anymore because he got life without parole. I only wish something could have been done when he terrorized me. Perhaps things would have been different for Sandy. So yeah, creepy murderous stalker crazy dude, let's not ever meet again. I go for a short run every night, right after sundown, when it's finally cool out. I always take the exact same route, a loop through a quiet and sparsely populated neighborhood. And now I realize how easy of a target that's made me. A short section of the route passes by an unlit park. A couple of weeks ago, I'd seen a guy hanging out behind a truck that was parked next to the entrance. 
and it was so unusual to see someone else up there that I decided to be extra cautious, turn around, and head back home. I didn't get close enough to get a good look at his face. A few days later, I saw what looked like the same guy by the park again. I figured I was probably just being paranoid, but I decided to turn around again just in case. I hadn't noticed any activity by the park in the last several days, so I resumed my normal route and didn't even think about the guy I'd seen up there. Then last night, as I was passing by the park, I had this inexplicable feeling that I was being watched. I couldn't spot anyone nearby, but the park extends into pitch black darkness, so someone could easily hide there unseen. I decided to just keep running, look confident, and try to hurry past the park as quickly as I could. Suddenly, I smelled a strong wave of cologne in the air that immediately put me on edge, and I'm pretty grateful he was wearing it so it tips me off. After I smelled it, I had no doubt in my mind that there was somebody nearby, but still, I didn't see any movements in front or on either side of me, and I was afraid to turn around. Immediately past the park, there's a bend in the road. There's a house in the corner as you turn down the road. The house has lots of tall bushes in the front yard. I normally run right past those without even thinking of it, but since my gut instinct was blaring like a siren, I quickly moved to the middle of the street as I rounded the corner. I shot a glance behind me to see if anyone had actually been nearby. I saw a man slowly walking through the front yard of the house on the corner, looking towards me. He paused behind the bushes, as if trying to remain hidden. I could see his jeans and a pair of black white sneakers, but little else. His slow footsteps were so creepy that I can't get the image out of my mind, as if he was trying to be quiet as he could. If I hadn't made the split decision to run into the middle of the street and away from the yard, I would have been within grabbing distance. I turned on the flashlight on my phone, aimed it right at the bushes hoping it'd startle or blind long enough for me to get some distance between us, and started sprinting at full speed down the road. It was probably the fastest I've run in my life. At the end of each block, I glanced behind me to check if the man was there. Fortunately, I lost sight of him. If he decided to sprint after me, I'm not sure what I would have done. From what I could make out, this guy was at least a foot taller than me. By the time I got home, the adrenaline had dissipated and I was shaking with fear. I couldn't sleep at all that night. What scares me most about the whole thing is that I'm 99% sure this was the same guy I'd seen hanging out in front of the park recently, and now I can't shake the idea that he'd been watching me and calculating the right time and path to try to sneak up behind me. He knew that I always ran past there around the same time. I thought that he was probably watching me from the darkness in the park last night before quietly moving out of it and starting to follow me makes me sick. Needless to say, I won't be running past the park at night anymore, or running alone at night, period. The terror I felt when I turned around and saw the guy's shoes slowly moving behind the bushes and his head facing me is like nothing else I've felt before. I live in a small town, the kind where almost everyone knows each other, and it also really creeps me out to think that this might have been someone I've seen around town in the past. Part of me wishes I could have gotten a better look at his face for the police report. So this encounter took place approximately 10 years ago when I was 15. I was from a suburban area where my part of town was divided into a grid, approximately 8 blocks long and 8 blocks wide. Me and my friend Jesse were walking home from another friend's house who lives on almost the exact opposite of corner of the development from me. We were on the way home and as usual I walked him to his house and then walked to mine. We noticed a blue Ford Bronco was circling the blocks throughout our walk, but didn't really think anything of it. We got to his house and we hadn't seen the truck for a few blocks. I assumed I had nothing to worry about. I get another two blocks or so and I see the truck again. He was parked on the side of the road, but you could hear that his truck was still running. He followed me all the way home, but was sure to not take the exact same route. I got to my front porch and could see he's parked just a few houses down on the same side of the street. I mentioned it to my dad, an absolute mammoth of a man, and he went out to see the truck. He saw it and started walking down to it when it took off. Two weeks go by and I haven't seen the Bronco since. This walk home was almost a daily routine at this point. We had a snow day from school and just me and my sister were home. I'm playing on the computer when something catches my eye. Directly to my right is a window and there's a man standing in it. Now this window is on the first floor, but still approximately five and a half feet off the ground, by level house. This man's entire head and body still fit the window. He's got curly hair, a full beard, and looks to be pretty big as he fills almost the whole window. We locked eyes and I ran out to confront him. I know, stupid. He ran off down the street to the same blue Bronco parked in almost the same spot as last time. He pulled off faster than I could catch him. This time I called the cops. I gave them as much information as I could, and basically all they said was they'd keep an eye out for him. I showed them where he was, and they were able to confirm it by the footprints in the snow leading to and away from the window. Now what had me a bit concerned was I wore a size 12 shoe. My dad, who was still significantly larger than me at this point, wore a 14, and his shoes were still a bit smaller than the imprints in the snow. Well then, we're screwing with Bigfoot now. A few weeks go by, and there hasn't been any more weird encounters. 
My head's been on a swivel every time I'm out of the house. I don't want to say that I was looking for a problem at this point, but I was. I was kind of hoping that this dude would show up and try something. I was ready for it. I wasn't ready. Me and Jesse were walking home from the same friend's house one night and we saw this Bronco again. Screw it. We're young and stupid dudes, so we figure we're going to trap him. We went completely out of our way to go to the only dead end in the development to try to get to him once we confirmed he was following us. You never knew it was a dead end unless you knew the area because there were never and still aren't any dead end or no outlet signs. I guess he had an idea to what we were doing because he knew where we both lived. He didn't follow us down. We thought it was the perfect plan because of how many moves he'd have to make to turn around. Several cars parked on the street and it's not a cul-de-sac just a row with no outlet and thought we could run up on him when he tried to back out. He outsmarted us that day. The next day on the same trip from the same friend's house on the same road we see him again. I walk my friend home and figure screw it, I'm fine. I dare this dude to come out at me, and he didn't. This happened several more times over the next week or two, until the guy decided to make his move. I was on my way home after just leaving Jesse at his house. I got another block before I saw the truck. I'm walking perpendicular to his truck when as soon as I'm in his path, he turns on his lights. I ran up the few blocks to my house and waited on the porch to see where he was and what he was doing. This time he stayed put just a few houses down. I told my dad again and he went out to see. Truck's still there. Me and my dad start walking down to the truck and it's still not moving. This ballsy dude had the audacity to get out of his truck to confront us. Terrible idea. He gets out when my dad is still 25 feet from the truck. I guess my dad is about 6 foot 4 and under 300 pounds with a body built by Bud Light and manual labor. This guy though had some size on him. What I saw next was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. So my dad's not much of a talker, and at this point he's already got a problem with this guy. The guy gets out of his truck with the most sadistic smile on his face. My first thought is the guy has a gun. I yelled to my dad that he might have a gun, and all he yelled back was, I got it. Well, he definitely had it. They walked up to each other, and before a word was even said, my dad swung. The dude was done in. Before he even started to crumple, my dad hit him again. He hit his truck and hit the ground. I never saw the guy again, and after just moving back into my parents' old house with my young son, I hope I never do. So big dude with the blue Ford Bronco, I hope you never come back to my window. So this happened about 14 years ago. I was 21, and it was the days of MySpace. I never used my real name online, it was in the mode of constantly posting pictures of me smoking, etc, so yeah. I happened to work at a local sandwich shop, and upon taking an order from a customer, I hear, hey, aren't you, enter my MySpace name. To which I asked why, of course, and he proceeded to tell me his MySpace name and I realized we have randomly commented on mutual friends' pages. Okay, whatever. He and his friends sit in the dining area and eat their lunch, but before leaving he came back to the counter. I thought he wanted a refill on his drink, so I went to the counter to ask him what he would like. Would you like to get drinks with me sometime? I was a little surprised, but fresh out of a bad breakup and was ready to date, so I said sure, why not? I told him to message me online later and we could work it out. Cut to two days later, it's Friday, and he picks me up and we head to a bar across town. I had known this bar was there forever as I grew up there, but had never been inside. We were the youngest ones there by about 30 years and there was literally only 10 people total inside, including us and the bartender. Weird. Whatever. We have a few drinks, play some pool, and it's time to leave. I kept my pace and only had two cocktails because I didn't want to get drunk with someone I didn't know. He, unbeknownst to me, was about to be pretty tossed, so we leave, not wanting to go home, I agreed to go to his house and hang out some more. He lived with his grandmother at the time, and had a pool table. We wandered the house for a bit, him showing me random pictures of him growing up, awards won, etc. We play a game and I let him know I need to be getting home. I lived about 20 minutes away by car. He says he's too drunk to drive and that I should stay. Now, I lived with my mom and we didn't always see eye to eye. So calling her 2 to 3 a.m. and waking her up to ask for a ride was not in my list of plans. I told him fine, I would walk. It would have taken me over an hour to walk home, but I was not about to sleep at this guy's house and would have rather taken my chances. The route home didn't go through any bad areas and I had been a pedestrian for years at that point, so I was used to walking everywhere and was fine with it. All of a sudden, he can drive and doesn't want me walking home alone. Again, whatever. We get to my house and I thank him for the ride and now he tells me he is too drunk to drive and can't drive home. The place my mom and I lived in was three stories and I had the whole bottom floor to myself and a makeshift living room with couches so I figured screw it, seep it off on the couch and go home in the morning. By now, I had already decided this was going to be the only date we ever went on. Not because of the whole driving situation, but I just wasn't into him. He proceeds to lay on my bed the minute I let him inside like some stray dog or something. So being tired and annoyed and just basically over it, I said fine, I'll sleep on the couch. 
Well, I don't know how long I was asleep, or how he even stayed awake, because it took me forever to fall asleep knowing he was there and this was all just too weird. I wake up to this guy's hands around my throat, well, kinda of woke up. I remember laying there with my eyes closed and my mind thinking, what's going on? So I pretended to roll over to basically let him know I wasn't unconscious, and he stopped. 20 minutes later, same thing. This time I sat up, pushed him away, and started yelling at him. What are you doing? Get out. Now. And the strangest thing was, it was like he wasn't even fully there. His eyes were open, but it's like he was in a trance and wasn't even fully aware of what was happening. I grabbed his keys and wallet off the table, opened the door, shoved him outside, threw his keys and wallet at him, and slammed the door. He never knocked or anything, and I kept the lights off so he couldn't see me watching him through the window, phone in hand ready to call 911. My mom was two floors above asleep. He kind of staggered off where I couldn't see him, so I just sat on my bed listening. 30 minutes later, I heard his car start and drive off. I logged onto MySpace right away, blocked him, and blocked his number in my phone. I showed my boss his picture the next day, explained the situation, and just let him know that if I ever saw him walking again, that I was walking to the back until he left, and to just tell him I quit. Never heard from him again. I, a 23 year old female, grew up in a rural area in Ontario. It was the kind of place where you never locked the doors because you knew everyone in town. The all too trusting small town mentality stayed with me once I moved to a big city for university. I got an apartment in a student area with a college nearby and plenty of bars within walking distance. I lived with a guy friend, Roddy, who was a few years older than me from the same small town. I would go to the bars with friends on the weekends and stumble home by myself around 2am. One night on my way home, my neighbor Kyle and I met in the hallway both headed to our own places. He was also drunk and good looking. He said hello and invited me inside. I ended up staying the night with him. He was nice and it was a fun night, if not a little awkward. We didn't exchange numbers and it didn't seem like we cared for anything to come out of it, so I went home in the morning and that was that. Fast forward to two days later. I was asleep in my bed and my roommate was half asleep on the couch with the TV on. He heard a sound that might have been the door creaking open but he ignored it in his tired state. A few minutes later he opened his eyes to see a naked man standing in front of him, lifeless and staring into his eyes. It was Kyle. Roddy tried to talk to him and ask him what he was doing here but he didn't respond. Roddy ran to my room and said, uh, I think Kyle's here to see you. So I followed him out into the living room and saw completely naked Kyle, staring at us with the most serious and concentrated eyes I had ever seen. Roddy tried to talk to him and asked him to leave, but once again he didn't respond. Instead, he went into our kitchen and opened the fridge. He proceeded to take our butter out and start smearing it all over his face and chest, saying nothing, and still with a completely serious look on his face. Roddy and I ran to my bedroom to talk about what to do. While we were in my room, Kyle walked down the dark hallway that led to us and stood in the dark right before the light of my room could reach him. All you could see was his silhouette and he started whispering hi, hi, repeatedly. Roddy and I ended up calling the police and staying in my room until they came and took him back to his house. They said he must have been on drugs but probably wasn't a threat. I agreed I didn't think he was a threat, but I didn't sleep well that night knowing he was a thin wall away from us in that apartment. My family decided to fly across the country to visit me in LA, where I live. We thought it would be nice to visit Catalina Island. When we arrived, it became apparent to us that it was off-season. It was late November, the weather was cold, and as a result, the island was nearly empty besides locals and a few straggling tourists such as ourselves. Our first priority was to ditch our luggage so we could explore the island, so we immediately checked into our motel, though that word hardly does the place justice. I called a motel because all the doors to the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality our room was one of the 20 to 30 quaint guest house looking buildings arranged in sort of a horseshoe shape around a walkway, with rooms on either side of the path. The entrance to the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe, and if you walked dead straight, you'd reach the room we were given, essentially on the corner before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So from our room, one path led back to the street, the other further into the secluded maze of rooms. After a day of exploring and having just finished dinner, it was time for the cold, dark walk back to the room. Catalina Island is a decent distance from the mainland, and it gets dark. I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and walked ahead of my parents to the hotel room, telling them I just wanted to go to sleep. And I did immediately. I was already losing consciousness as they entered after me, drifting off without so much as a good night. I then woke up to my mom saying my name, a harsh whisper. The room had two beds, my parents' bed closer to the door and mine further in the room. My mom's voice cut through the silence again. She sent a concern for me. I didn't blame her, considering my mental state at the time. Groggy, I rolled over. What? I asked. 
As my eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains, I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in my bed. Her eyes got wide. If I'm in my bed, who was she talking to? We both looked back to where she was previously looking to see a hooded figure in all black standing over their bed. This was horrifically startling as it was on an island in the middle of the ocean and wake up to see a hooded stranger looming over you. This moment seemed to last forever. My mom's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice I've never heard her use before. Then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way it crouched was so absolutely unexpected, even in regards to this already unexpected situation, that it terrified me. It seemed animalistic. I knew two things. The hooded figure had been standing over us sleeping, and it's not acting in any sort of way that I could understand. As opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago, the series of events that unfolded when my hulking ex-military dad woke up happened in an instant. Suddenly, we were out the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mom was screaming, get him, get him. My dad was running down one path of the horseshoe, further into the hotel, shouting through sheer adrenaline. I ran down the other path, towards the street. When I got there, not a sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to the room to find my dad quietly walking back, his head low. He gets really close to me and I hear him say, it's a kid. The explanation, some young teen, tall and lanky as I am in my 20s, wearing all black including a black hoodie, went into the wrong room, our room, the one time my parents just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mom woke up when he entered, and seeing a tall person in a black hoodie, thought he was me, assumingly leaving the room, and when the hooded figure crouched, that was him when he realized his mistake and panicked. He was scared of us. As I got back to the room, my mom walked out and hugs this kid, who is now crying his eyes out. I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with murder in his eyes. So, to the now traumatized kid from Catalina Island, sorry for the misunderstanding. For a bit of backstory, I live in a big city which is mostly a friendly place, but like all cities, it has its rough areas. There are two main spots that are known to be particularly rough, and for the first 14 years of my life, I lived in one of those areas. So though it can naturally be a bit uncomfortable, I tend to be pretty unbothered by odd people talking to me in the street. Anyway, I moved from one rough area and moved to a safer one, but it's very close to where I originally lived. I know both of these areas pretty well, to which helped me with what happened 5 months ago. I had some stuff going on in my personal life and going through phases of bad anxiety as it is. I had to make the decision to take some time off of work but wanted to try and stay in a routine and be productive. I went to the dentist way past when I should have. So I made an appointment and when it rolled around I walked there. My dentist is in the rough area that I now live close to. On my route home I have to walk past a pub on a main road which has a super bad reputation. Anything you can think of, it's happened inside or just outside of this pub. Anyway, I noticed someone sat on the bench outside the pub. I have my headphones in but see him saying something so I assume he's asking me for something and take an earplug out. He asked me if I want to join him for a drink, this was around 11.30am by the way, I just said no thanks. Now as soon as I got a few steps away, I had this bad feeling like something was just not right. As I mentioned though, I was going through a phase of bad anxiety so I chalked it up to just being that. After about 2 minutes I go to turn left and see the man walking in my direction in the corner of my eye. I told myself it was nothing but took my headphones out anyway just in case as I was about to walk through a narrow road that leads to a car park and is always very empty. All of a sudden I hear him shouting at me, hey miss, I'm talking to you, wait. He catches up to me and tells me, I'm not a creep but you're too beautiful to let go. I try and stay polite but also make it clear I'm not interested. He asked if I was single, I said yes, but he asked what I was doing that night, I said I had no plans. I 100% know I should have lied and as the truth came out I was really annoyed with myself but whatever. He seems to get the message and I say I really have to go so I carry on walking thinking that it's the end of it. So I make my way across this big car park. At the end of the car park is a cycle slash pedestrian lane that has a massive wall on one side with two lots of steps that lead to a car park to a retail park and bushes on the other end and it's super narrow. I get into the lane and hear footsteps like someone is running, probably a jogger. I'm getting paranoid until right behind me I hear, at least give me your number. I finally start to panic and realize actually it's not my anxiety and this is super shady. I give him my number but change the last digit and this guy proceeds to attempt to drop call me. Clearly my phone doesn't ring and then he starts getting annoyed saying I need to give him the right number. He then has his hand basically on my phone, standing way too close to me and orders me to type his number in and drop call him. Creep now has my number. Still not enough for him, I reiterate that I'm on my way somewhere and seriously need to get going. 
He then grabbed me by my elbow and I had a massive adrenaline rush. Next thing I knew I was at the top of one of those sets of steps that lead to a much busier and open space. I ran as fast as I could. Luckily one of my friends works in one of the stores in the retail park so I ran over to it practically looking over my shoulder the whole time. I find my friend, visibly shaking, can barely speak, she asked if I'm okay and I just burst into tears. I gather my thoughts and tell my friend what just happened. He's been calling my phone this whole time. She takes my phone and notes his number and then blocks him. She takes me to the staff room and convinces me to file a police report which I do. Unfortunately though, I found out street harassment is not actually illegal where I live, but because he made physical contact it might not be a complete lost cause. The police tell me they will be in touch. Now fast forward until around two weeks later. A mom's friend who knew about what happened sent her an article and asked her to show me. I genuinely couldn't believe my eyes. It was about a man who had followed a girl and then assaulted her in the same rough area. At the end of the article is a picture, it's him. I haven't heard anything from the police and since he had already been charged, I figured there wasn't any need for me to contact them again. My heart goes out to the girl and although currently in jail, I really hope neither of us ever have to face him again. His charge was pretty serious so he will be there for a long time thankfully. The following experience happened to me a few years ago when I was on the train home from school. It was around 10pm at night as I had stayed back in a public library to study. One thing you should know is that my train line is particularly dodgy and you can meet some truly weird people on the train when it's late. When I got into my carriage that night it was particularly empty apart from three women sitting on the opposite end of the carriage. I sat down and plugged my earphones in to watch YouTube. My train ride usually takes around 45 minutes. About three stops into the train ride and the only other person who had gotten onto my carriage at the time was a man who was wearing construction clothes. He sat near the three women, so I assumed he knew them. I turned my attention back to my video. A few minutes later, I noticed that the three women who were sitting on the opposite side of my carriage had moved to my side. I didn't really think much of it as I was engrossed in the video I was watching. That's when I noticed someone take a seat opposite of me. It was the man who had gotten on earlier. He asked me my name, but he was giving me a weird vibe so I pretended like I couldn't hear him. I had my earphones in after all. He then proceeded to tap my knee to gain my attention, there was no use ignoring him, so I removed my earphones and looked at him. He was a big guy, probably around early 40s and he was clean shaven. He asked me my name, to which I gave him a fake name. He then asked me how old I was. I was in my school uniform at the time, so I told him. He reached out his hand and introduced himself. Not wanting to be rude, I extended my own hand to shake his hand. This is when things started to get weird. His handshake was super weird. His grip was abnormally tight and he seems to pull my hand towards him as he shook it. I quickly withdrew my hand. He then asked me if I had a girlfriend as he thought I was quite attractive. Alarm bells began to ring in my head and glanced over at the three women who refused to even look over my direction. Seeing as they would be no help, I would just have to look out for myself. He then took out his phone and started showing me a picture of a girl who seemed to look around my age. He then asked me if I thought she was beautiful. Again, not wanting to be rude, I simply nodded and said she was. He then asked me if I would be interested in marrying her. I just started laughing as I thought he was just joking around, but his eyes were dead serious and he just glared at me. He repeated his question, to which I responded that I did not know her and that it was inappropriate. He suggested that I give him my number so that he could arrange for us to meet. This seriously creeped me out and I politely declined stating that I was busy with school and that I was not looking to get into a relationship. As I said this, the train was coming to a halt at a station. I was still three stops away from mine, but I decided that it was time for me to get out of the situation. I apologized that this was my stop and that it was nice to meet him. As I got up to leave, he extended his hand for a handshake and thanked me for talking to him. I didn't want to shake his hand, but I did not want to trigger him so I reached out my hand. Suddenly, he grabbed my hand and pulled it towards him. His eyes were full of anger. He then asked, What, you don't want to marry my daughter? I will break you. I quickly broke the grip and left the carriage. As it was nighttime, there were always police officers patrolling the platforms. I rushed towards one of the officers and told him everything that happened. I then described his clothing and which carriage he was sitting on. While waiting for the next train, the same officer came up to me and told me that officers had picked him up two stations down and thanked me for letting him know. Although the officer asked for my details, I was never notified as to what happened to him. I just hope that I never have to experience a man on a train like that in the future. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was about 19 and I transferred to a college very very far from home. My parents had raised me pretty dependent so it didn't upset me. I saw it as a fun challenge. One of the biggest changes to get used to was not having a car. I could have gotten one, I guess, but it would have just been a hassle to find places to keep it when I wasn't at school, etc. So I just opted for the bus instead. 
I'm not a big fan of person-to-person -person interactions, so I always made sure to sit up front, hopefully by myself, with my bag in the other seat, and not only headphones in, but a book open as well. All friendly signals to please go away. Thing is, I'm not that great at actually telling people to go away. I had gotten on the bus to head to the mall for a bit, and I realized someone was talking to me. I paused my music and looked up. A homeless man was asking if the seat was taken. There weren't really a lot of people on the bus, but I felt awkward and very rude saying no, like I was judging him. I didn't want to appear unkind, so I moved my bag and then made a big show of putting my music back on and raising my book up to read. I had to keep pausing my music because the man kept talking to me. I kept trying to downplay it to myself that it was just his idea of small talk, even though the questions pointedly fixated on details about me, my age, how pretty I was, if I had a boyfriend, I lied and said yes, of course, and that didn't dissuade interest at all, and so on. It was a very, very long 20 minutes. He kept getting closer, never overtly touching or filling the space in a way that I could make an obvious complaint about, but by the time we arrived he was practically faced completely toward me, and was definitely blocking me from moving to another seat. Finally my stop came and I jumped up. He was perfectly nice about moving so that I could get by, or so I thought. Turns out he was actually just getting up himself to get out of the same spot, not pausing for a moment and talking to me. Great. It was the middle of the day on a crowded street, so I didn't feel like I was in imminent danger, and therefore felt that anything other than open welcoming would be the height of rudeness for me. I smiled awkwardly and moved on toward the mall, only for him to fall in step with me, continuing to ask for details about myself and my boyfriend. Being naive, I tried to cut him off with, oh, I'm headed to the mall, but of course that only gave him the chance to say, me too, and well, we headed there together. He started talking to me about how good of friends we were now and how close he felt to me and so on. Honestly, I checked out a good while ago and was trying to find ways to ditch this guy. I ducked into the first store I saw when I got to the mall and he followed me in. I was at this point not even making full sentences, just mumbling things about, oh sorry, I need to, and then I tried to lose him down another aisle. It didn't work. I finally made a turn he couldn't follow quick enough and literally hid behind some shelves waiting for him to go by. I dashed out of the store and he saw me and yelled at me to wait and ran after. I ran down the strip and dashed into a random store and went straight to the back to the dressing rooms. I hid in one of them for as long as I felt that I could and then I peeked out and saw him in the larger mall area, scanning. He finally moved off down the wrong way and I stayed in the store another half an hour, pretending to look at clothes. I don't know what the shop girls must have thought, I was clearly shaken and to the point of tears, but I had called on my mother by that point and was keeping her on the phone. When I left, I ran out of the mall and went around to a different bus stop, in case the man would be back at the first one. I was so scared that he would show up again and this time follow me to my apartment. There's a lot I didn't do right in that situation, but I'm just glad I was lucky enough to lose the guy. I can't say what my job was, because what I did was literally the name of the company, but it had something to do with law and a small basement office. This office had two main rooms and a bathroom. The boss worked in the room in the back, while the rest of us, three in total, worked in the front. This wasn't a place where clients came and met with us, it was just where we got work done on computers and packages sent before leaving. Oftentimes I worked alone the last three hours, which in reality was great. I got to listen to whatever music I want, sing and get stuff done on the computer. On occasion my boss would come to pick something up or just get a bit more work done. And on this day he did, but he came in with an older gentleman that I didn't recognize. My boss explained that the man was a customer from one of the companies on the top floor and he left only to realize he really needed to go to the bathroom and asked to use hours. My boss stuck around near my desk until the man left and then got to work. As I continued to work, I began to cough and wheeze a bit. Breathing became painful and, at first, I didn't know why until I gradually got a whiff of smoke, cigarette smoke. None of my co-workers smoked and I don't know if I'm allergic or intolerant to cigarette smoke, but I instantly feel ill whenever I begin breathing it in. I shrugged it off and watched my breathing being sure nothing bad was happening to me and not soon after my boss grabbed his coat and began to leave. He said, your co-worker will be coming in a bit just to pick some stuff up and as he opened the door, the scent of smoke burst through and on the ground were cigarette buds from what he said. Thus, he continued with, and let's have you lock the door behind me too. I couldn't agree more, that was creepy. But if it was the man who used our bathroom, it wasn't too strange to assume he'd hunkered at the bottom of the stairs to take in some smoke before leaving. When my boss left, I made extra sure that the door was locked before continuing with my work. Another hour had passed by, about an hour and a half remaining of work when I began to smell smoke again. My heart sank as I turned my eyes to the door and quietly got up from my chair. I usually took off my shoes at work. Like I said, we didn't have clients come there. We were pretty chill when it came to wardrobe, but even with them off, I tiptoed over to the door and pressed my ear against it. I didn't hear anything at first, however, the scent of smoke was prominent there. 
For one reason or another, I decided just to go back to my desk and wait until my coworker got there. Not 10 minutes more in though, I heard this click, click, click sound. It was subtle and I had to look around a spot where it was coming from. It was the doorknob of our office. From where I sat, I could see it just slightly jerked back and forth. The person was doing it slowly as I was sure they were trying to be quiet. By this point, I called up my coworker to come sooner. In some ways, I felt safe. I was in a locked area after all, but who knows, right? After calling him though, the scent began to diminish and the doorknob stopped moving. I tried to listen for someone going up the stairs. I didn't hear anything for a long while until I heard someone coming down them. It was my coworker. He came in and said, there are like 10 cigarette butts out here. I explained further what had happened as he came in and locked the door himself. I also explained the man who'd come in to use our bathroom prior. Like I said, I couldn't be sure if they were the same person. There wasn't much to take from the offices. The computers were fairly old, wouldn't at all get a good chunk of money from them, and everything else was paper. We weren't at all at a place that kept money around. So if it was him, I can't fathom what he saw that he'd feel the need to come back in to steal. My coworker somewhat brushed it off. He figured that the person was gone, all was fine, and went to pick up what he needed to. He ended up staying for a while, I'm not sure why, perhaps he felt like he needed to. Because as I began finally finishing up my work, the smell of smoke came back. My coworker and I looked at each other, almost as a way to confirm that we both smelled it. The click clacking of our computer stopped and we just waited and waited and waited. We didn't take our eyes off each other as the click, click, click came back. I just didn't want to deal with this and go home as soon as possible, but I shirked the thought of walking out there. My coworker was far more fed up. He stood, stopped at the door, unlocked it, and opened it. There was a man there. I didn't get a good look at him. I saw him raise his arm, freeze, and then he disappeared and sprinted up the stairs. My coworker walked me to my car soon after, told our boss about it, and we made it a rule that we always lock the door from that point on. Especially me, because after that day, every now and then, I'd smell smoke and hear the doorknob attempt to twist. Whenever I did, I either called up my boss or waited every now and then, and then I heard the steps leave. Frankly, we should have put a camera up or called the police, something at least. When my coworker described him to my boss, it seemed like he was the same man who used our bathroom, but that is just speculation. We have no idea what he wanted or if there was a purpose. Be careful letting people use bathrooms, they could have ulterior motives. When I was about 8 or 9, my family took a trip skiing to a small resort a couple of hours from where we lived in Spain. The resort itself was a sleepy little town of about 400 to 500 people max, with a few small supermarkets and hotels, and not much else. Typically, we picked the worst time possible to embark on the trip, which we had been planning for a good few years. The night after we arrived there was a blizzard, and so we spent the first half of the week locked in the hotel. Although we were able to go outside for the remaining few days, we had little to do given that the slopes were shut. The story I want to tell comes from those first few days locked in the hotel. Despite my parents' annoyance at the timing of the trip being a nightmare, myself and my sister, who was 11 months older, were having a fantastic time. Locked up in the mountains with nothing to do, we were able to spend our days running around the hotel, eating sweets and watching the TV in the lobby. I should probably mention at this point that the hotel was somewhat of a maze. The large bar restaurant area where my parents sat each day reading was at the center of the hotel. The myriad of smaller rooms then connected to the bar area at random points, shooting off in different directions. These rooms often had no discernible function, each one had the same mahogany interior, and they were full of couches, fireplaces, and antiques that allowed for great games of hide and seek. The rooms would often have offshoots themselves, connecting to new rooms which would then connect to yet more useless wooden caves. As such, it was possible to be four or five rooms away from the main hotel area at any one time, without knowing exactly where you were or how to get back. Anyway, at some point along the weekend, myself and my sister decided to play hide and seek. Bearing in mind the above, it was almost an impossible challenge to find the hider. At one point in the game, I was just about to give up on searching for my sister until I heard her voice from what sounded like a few rooms away. After successfully navigating the web of rooms, I emerged to find her sitting on a couch alongside a German man with gray hair, probably in his 60s if I had to guess. As soon as I emerged into the room, the man turned to me and told me he was taking my sister to the swimming pool and asked if I wanted to come. I remember immediately thinking it was odd that there was a swimming pool that we hadn't heard of. My parents had been complaining that morning about how much TV we were watching and so I was sure they would have taken us there if they had known about it. And besides, the hotel did not seem of the size to be able to host one. I told the man that I have to ask my parents first and told my sister to come back with me to find them. He immediately replied that I should go and that he should take my sister on ahead. I told my sister that she absolutely had to come with me, but excited at the thought of the swimming pool, she said she didn't want to. 
We began to argue with the man taking my sister's side and encouraging me to go ask my parents permission whilst he waited with my sister. I dug my foot in, telling my sister that our parents would be very cross if we went somewhere on our own. And after a few minutes bickering, she eventually gave in and came back with me, giving her assurance to the man that we'd come back. Of course, when we told our parents, they were livid. My dad went back to the room to try and find the man, but with all the offshoots and given that all the random rooms looked the same, it was almost impossible to be sure that we were in the right one. In any case, there was no sign of him. I remember my dad screaming at the hotel lobby that he needed a list of all male guests and their room numbers, but of course they wouldn't give it to him. We spent the rest of the trip by our parents' side, terrified at the thought of being locked up in a blizzard with him. Thankfully, we never saw the man again. My mom and I normally shopped at the market just a few minutes away from our house. My mom had been shopping there for 20 some years at this point and was friends with most of the workers, so I was friendly with them too and was always happy to talk to them. Whenever my mom got distracted talking to someone, I, with the attention span of a 6 year old, would wander around the aisle. My mother would keep an eye on me to make sure I didn't get too far, but if she was distracted, one of the employees would usually be around and gently guide me back over. One day though, we went to a different market that I couldn't remember having been to before, and we didn't go back to for nearly a decade. We were walking around the aisles when my mom ran into her friend. They started talking, and I, not realizing that I no longer had a store full of adults keeping an eye on me, started wandering around the aisle. My eyes caught some colorful display, I think flowers or balloons or something, and went over to look. Once I was satisfied with my inspection, I turned back to the aisle only to find my mom wasn't there. Huh, that had never happened before. I looked around a little, though not moving from my spot near the colorful displays. Since it was right near the registers, there was a decent amount of people nearby, which I'm thankful for now. As I was looking around, an employee came up to me. He was older than my sister, she was 12 or 13 at the time, and younger than my dad, in his mid-40s, which was about the only way I could gauge age. Now, I would say he was probably in his early to mid-twenties if I remember right. Hi there, he said sweetly, and that tone you normally speak to kids in. I cheerfully said hello, actually stepping a little closer. Are you looking for mommy? I say yes, happily explaining that I had last seen her talking to her friend and that I could normally find her easily when I wandered away, so I wasn't sure where she could have gone. Does she leave you alone often? Not really. My older sister was normally with me, my mom wasn't. She was 12 or 13 and she was super mature, so if my mom had to leave her for a little bit, she knew I'd be okay. And she never left us alone in public, just at home if she needed to run somewhere, never for very long. And my dad was at work a lot, and didn't come back until late usually. Where do you live? Well, you wouldn't know it, I just learned my address. We just learned how to mail a letter in school, even took a little class trip to the mailbox in our school corner to send them out. I knew how to write my address now, and I knew how to say it. Where do you go to school? Who picks you up? Well, I go to the local elementary school. I don't know the address though, sorry, but I know which street it's on because I wait on the sidewalk for my mom or daycare sitter, depending on the day, so I see the street sign a lot since I'm usually waiting for a while to be grabbed. It had only been a few minutes since I last saw my mom, even with how much information I was dumping, I was a very fast talker, but I was starting to get a little antsy. Not because I was uncomfortable talking to a stranger, but because I had skipped lunch that day specifically to call my mom into letting me get a bagel from the store next door, which is why we were at the market in the first place. My mom was holding us to the bagel to make sure I didn't try to eat it too fast and choke, which I had done several times in the past. I wanted my bagel, and while I liked talking to this grown man who made me feel smart and was oh so interested in my life, I liked bagels more. Plus, if I caught my mom when we were near the bakery section, I might be able to use my charm and get a cookie. So I gotta find my mom now. Oh well, I'll walk around with you and help you find her. You wouldn't lead me through the market you work at where you can easily bring me to the back room, meet locker, or any number of places? Yeah, sounds good. Ozzy. I look around to see my mom, the relieved look on her face slowly changing into something more anxious. I smile happily and wave her over. She immediately grabs my hand and I can tell she wants to chide me, probably for leaving the aisle, but she seems more occupied on the man in front of me. Before I can even open my mouth to introduce him, or remember that I never got his name, he quickly says that he's glad I found my mom and he needs to get back to work and practically runs to the back of the store. My mom puts her hands on my shoulders and looks me in the eye, her expression a lot more worried now. What was he talking to you about, she asked, her voice more serious than I'd ever heard her. Can I have my bagel? My mom opens her mouth, pauses, and goes into her purse to hand me my bagel. Between bites, I happily tell her about the conversation and everything I remembered. My age and grade, pickup schedule, likes and dislikes, my literal address. My mom gradually became paler, then became red with anger. She brought me over to the manager, and I don't remember much about the conversation. 
The police weren't called. We went home, and my mom told me I wasn't allowed to walk around the store anymore. No more talking to any stranger, even if they worked at the store we were at, unless she was with me. If I ever saw that man ever again, I was to run away, find someone I know, and ask for help. If all else fails, scream at the top of my lungs. If my mom had found me, something bad might have happened. If not in the store, then in front of my school, and if not in front of my school, then my house. A little over a decade later, I've never seen the guy again. Let's keep it that way. I had started hanging out with a very nasty crowd. They loved to party, never had their own cash, destructive, impulsive, you get the drill. An ex friend of mine, we'll call him Bob, started hanging out with me quite a bit more and more as the weeks passed by. Bob worked as a pizza delivery driver. He never, I mean never washed his clothes to which he owned maybe three outfits, including his work uniform and only women's clothes. The women's clothes he wore to be punky, I saw no shame in that. Even thought it was kinda cool how he didn't care what others thought about it. But that also means he liked my clothes, so like a little sister might do, he constantly took my clothes. Keep in mind, he also barely showered. Often, he even woke up before 5pm in time for work, he jumped off my couch, took a pack of my cigarettes without asking and sped off. Within the four month period he stayed in my home, I literally saw him go to take a shower about five times. Long after the situation was dealt with and he was gone, I left that home with a stench. He paid nothing, not a single bill, never contributed to groceries, cleaning, nothing. Nor was he on my lease, yet he established residency in my home legally. It didn't bother me so much at the time. I was at my rock bottom and was basically just happy to have someone be there with me. I considered him to be my goofy and annoying best friend, until that wasn't enough for him. He began to become obsessed with me. Very quickly he went from basically having everything he needed in life for free, while he kept any money or tips he made, but decided on his own accord that we were to be together. If I'd return home from work, friend's house, etc., he'd cry and follow me room to room, asking repeatedly why we can't just be together, that we were best friends already, we should date. I was not attracted to him. Going through a divorce at the time, I did not want to ruin our friendship. It got to the point where I avoided going home. I'd stay with my mother or friends because he'd cry and follow me, desperately trying to convince me to be with him. I'd almost often find him in my bed at this point, and he quit his job to have a better chance of seeing me. I had told him if this continued, I would no longer allow him to crash there. At one point, after avoiding him for a few days, Bob really started to come out of his shell. He cornered me screaming, I'm sick and tired of being rejected by you. It's not happening anymore. Now I was scared. I never saw him as a threatening individual before, just a goofy character. I asked him to leave and he was no longer welcome. He refused. He said by law, he was required a 30 days notice to be evicted. When I spoke with the police, they understood my situation, but explained he'd either have to be evicted or I'd have to get a restraining order. I filed the restraining order, which they immediately granted me, but he chose to ignore it. Once he left my home, I locked all doors and windows. When he returned, I showed him the order, to which he replied, I'm not leaving. I tried calling the police every time he showed up, but by the time they'd get there, he was gone. There were shoe prints on the door and cracks from all the attempts he made to force it open. It never shut correctly after those attempts, and they were never able to officially serve him because they supposedly couldn't find him. I honestly believe they tried once, then gave up. I provided them with his plates, friends' addresses where he'd stayed, previous employment, everything needed. I'd stay up late, hearing his vehicle, it was very loud and easily identified, slowly drive by my home, staring at me. Day and night. At one time, he even hid behind my front door, had a mutual friend knock, then jumped out, shut the door open, and entered. Even went as far to message my young, underage nephew who he met maybe one time on Facebook to try and gain sympathy and convince him to get me to change my mind, crossing even more obvious boundaries. It was a living nightmare. Eventually, he moved on to his next obsession, and I was somewhat at peace. Several months later, he was on our local news for attempting to slit his ex-girlfriend's throat and beating her until she was unconscious, until a neighbor brushed over and he fled. All I could think was how that could have been me. When I was 18, almost 10 years ago, I had a phone call that completely changed my life. I got woken up at almost 6am by an unknown number. I figured it was my boyfriend, now husband, since his phone number usually showed up as the famous unknown number. He usually called me before going to work at around 7.30am, but sometimes he'd call me at 6ish if he wanted to talk to me while waking up. I answer, he says what's up, and I'm still half asleep but start talking. He tells me he has a little problem and that he wants to see me. Being 18 and the fact that I started dating him recently, I also was down for this. He tells me how he absolutely loved seeing me last weekend and how good I looked. 
He basically described what we had done during the weekend. If I remember properly, his parents weren't home for the weekend and we had the house and the car to drive around. And we had lots of fun obviously, and how much he loved some of the things I did to him. I replied and I was more and more awake and we were having a really good time. Then I noticed it was almost 7am, time where he usually takes a shower, eats, and gets ready to go out the door. And I basically ask him, so this is fun and all, but aren't you going to get ready for work? He replied with, uh, no, I think I'll skip work today. How about I come over? Now the thing is, by then I was pretty awake and although the voice that was talking to me was very similar to my boyfriend's, something threw me off. My boyfriend doesn't say, uh, no, like this guy does. Besides, I knew that unless he was sick, my boyfriend would never skip work because he was scheduled on shifts and missing his shift was a big deal that could get him fired. I kind of froze. He noticed it so he said, oh babe, you're right, I should start getting dressed, so you want me to come over? By then I swear that his voice was back to my boyfriend's voice and I just felt silly. So what if he wanted to skip a day at work? Maybe he just wanted to see me. So I tell him, yeah, sure, come over, it will only be us here. He replied, great. Then he asked, where's your house? The last time I checked, I'm pretty sure my boyfriend knows where I live. He had been coming over for weeks now. I laugh it off and tell him, ha, huh, you know where it is. That's when he laughed, and his laugh was absolutely not my boyfriend's laugh. I instantly ask him, you're not my boyfriend's name, are you? He said, can you just hang on please? I need to go grab something. Meanwhile, I get a text from my boyfriend. I figure that maybe this is just a sick joke. Maybe he coordinated it perfectly. Maybe he's sick and his voice doesn't sound the same. The text from my boyfriend said, at the subway, going to work now, love you. I texted him saying, why are you texting me? We are talking right now. At which point my actual boyfriend called. He was very confused at first and figured someone had hacked into his MSN. When I told him it was by phone, he reassured me that he absolutely did not call me and that whoever it was, it was not him. He had to go as the subway train was there, but that he will call as soon as he was at work. Then, the other guy called back, I picked up, and I asked him, who are you? What do you want? I pretty much went crazy on him. He said that his name was Mike, that we had met a long time ago, which was impossible because my phone number was fairly recent, and that he just wanted to have fun, that he didn't know I had a boyfriend. I asked him how did he know that I was wearing and what did we do and how he got my phone number. He just said, where are you? Why don't we meet? At which point I hung up. He called again. I didn't answer. Within minutes, I had called my mom to tell her what happened. She told me to change my phone number and not to stay home alone. I changed my phone number right away. I also alerted local police. They opened a file, but nothing ever came out of it. I still wonder how he knew what we did and what I was wearing. My boyfriend swore at the time he would never let any of his friends know all that, but his parents' house did have lots of windows and we weren't exactly careful. So Mike, let's never meet again. This happened while I was in college, five years ago. I was a transfer student and was 21 at the time. I was set up to be living in a building that was for students 21 or older and moved in a week and a half before classes began. This school was in northern Michigan so when I first arrived, campus was dead. I mostly kept to myself but was friendly with a few people in my building, namely one guy named Khalil, an exchange student from Lebanon. He seemed nice enough, though there was a distinct language barrier, so things were easy lost in translation. Our RD and RA, resident director, resident assistant, made everyone who had moved in have a meeting to go over basic rules and whatnot. At the end of the meeting, as I'm leaving the rec room, Khalil suddenly puts his arm up on the wall in front of me, almost clotheslining me. Caught off guard, I am peeved and creeped out about this. He begins explaining that he would like to be my friend and would like to go out for dinner to get to know me. He worded it oddly, so I wasn't sure if it was just a date or just a friendly invitation, but I attributed to his bad English. Like an idiot, I felt cornered physically and socially. I am awful with confrontation and could be too nice, so I agreed. He met right then and there, however, and said, I will get us a taxi and we'll go now. Ten minutes later, we're getting into this taxi and as I'm entering, I feel this sense of dread. I think, I barely know this guy, and Hudson's, the restaurant, is a couple miles away and we will be stranded out there with this stranger if it gets weird. As we drive, my guard rises higher and higher. He wants to know everything about me, and is throwing questions rapid fire. My age, dating history, physical preferences in men, religion, family, everything. I am thinking, this is going to be really awkward, and wanted the night to be over before we even get to the restaurant. At the restaurant, we both look at the menu for a bit. The waiter comes and takes my order, salad small and quick to eat and then the waiter asks what Khalil wants he says oh no I'm not hungry I just want to watch her eat 
What? Why would you ask me for dinner if you weren't hungry? And why did you just want me to eat? I was horrified. All of my family was in the lower peninsula of Michigan, eight hours away. I had no friends up here. The only local numbers I had were of my RA and RD. I speedy all of my salad as Khalil watches me, now talking about himself. He tells me about how he has anger problems and is looking for a woman to help calm him, but still be a submissive traditional wife. I am trying to hide the horror and uneasiness as I nod and eat. He continues explaining how he was known for his temper back home, and how his brothers have stopped him from doing awful things. At this point, red flags blinding my vision, it's time to end this. I finish my food and tell him to get a taxi back to campus. I intentionally sat in front of the taxi. I wasn't allowing the possibility of physical contact. When we get to the campus, we get in the building and I say a quick thank you and haul back to my room. Door locked, I get into my sweats and try to chalk it up to a weird experience and vow to avoid Khalil from then on. Around 12.30am, I hear a knock on my door. I was watching Netflix and took out my earbuds to make sure I was hearing right. The knocking continues. Not a courteous knock knock knock, but a closed fist pounding. I am petrified and making as little noise as possible. Get to the door and look out the people. I see Khalil. My room is at the very end of a long hallway. All rooms around me empty at this point, with a door outside of my room leading to a parking lot surrounded by woods. Knowing how isolated I was, I slink away from the door, making zero noise just waiting for the knocking to stop. About a minute later, it stops. He growls, I know you're in there. I will wait. My eyes widen in horror. I felt a mixture of rage and panic, but decided that confronting him then wouldn't be smart. So I quietly watch Netflix until I fall asleep. I have no idea how long he waited out there. The next morning, when I finally emerged from my room, I found a couple of pages taped to my door. Three handwritten pages from Khalil, explaining his feelings for me and his intentions of making me his wife. I went straight to my RA and explained everything that happened. She agreed to meet with Khalil herself, to explain to him how inappropriate he was being, and to tell him to leave me alone. He didn't. Notes kept coming. He came to my door dozens of times a day, and I became pretty much trapped in my room hiding from the psycho. It lasted for 8 days, but classes began and Khalil disappeared. I was told he dropped out and moved back to Lebanon. I found it eerie how he just vanished. Had he come here solely to find a wife, I'll never know. But Khalil, let's not ever meet again. It was the middle of the afternoon and I was home from college for the weekend, driving home from an auto shop having just picked up my car after some repairs. It suddenly started making a loud grinding noise. My car was very old, things were always going wrong, so I pulled into a shopping center parking lot and called my parents for advice on whether I should take it back to the shop or get a tow. I know very little about cars. My mom told me she would come and meet me at the shopping center and we'd figure it out. At this point, my phone battery was also dying, so my phone shut off after the call. As I was hanging out in the parking lot, a guy pulled over on the street in front of me, rolled down his window, and asked me for directions. I did my best to direct him, but instead of taking off, he then pulled into the parking lot and got out of his car. I found that a bit weird. It was broad daylight, I was in front of a shopping center, cars were driving by constantly, it's not like it was nighttime in an abandoned alley. So the guy started to make what seemed like small talk and I complied, still not understanding what he wanted. He introduced himself and asked what my name was and I offered my first name. He asked what I did. I said I was a student studying art. He asked where I went to school and I told him. He asked how old I was. He made a little more small talk and then I guess seeing that I was a bit more relaxed, he said he was a sculptor and that if I was interested in art, I would love the sculptures he had at his house. He said we would go there right now and look at them. Immediately that dull alarm in the back of my head got turned way way up. I was young and naive but I knew enough to never ever get in a stranger's car and immediately felt very uncomfortable. Though he knew how old I was, I looked extremely young. I started to put two and two together. He was getting increasingly more insistent that I get in his car and go to his house. He reached for my arm and at that point everything is a blur. I yelled that I had to go and ran from my car into the nearest store. It was a tiny game store so there weren't really anywhere to hide but I told the cashier about the guy and asked if I could wait in there until my mom showed up. The cashier assured me the man would not be let in the store and that he and his co-worker would keep an eye on me until the man was gone. I also asked them if I could use their phone to call my mom and let her know what was going on since mine had died. I kept watching the guy outside by my car, worried he would try to come in, but as soon as he saw me use the store's phone, he got in his car and took off. I wish the story ended there. The whole encounter really shook me up, but as I reflected on it, I realized, through the questions the man had asked, he had my first name and exact birth date by asking how old I was and getting my birthday. He also knew where I went to school, though thankfully it was several hours away from my hometown where I encountered the man. I asked a friend of mine what kind of info he could get based on what he had, and much to my distress, my friend showed me he was able to find out my full name, my phone number, and my home address with the info I had given the man. 
I felt like such an idiot. I had always been taught to be wary of strangers and not give them personal info, and I was baffled by how easy this guy had gotten personal info out of me just by pretending to have a casual conversation. Nothing happened for a few weeks and I started to stress less, and stopped thinking about the encounter, and stopped worrying about running into the man again. Then one early morning my cell phone rang, the number was restricted. I answered, there was heavy breathing on the phone, but no reply. I hung up. It happened again the next morning, this time a man answered, asking, what are you doing right now? I said I was trying to sleep. What are you wearing? I immediately hung up. The calls continued. The next time I picked up, I told him if he called again, I'd call the police. I got a few more calls from a restricted number after that but stopped answering, and eventually they stopped. I'm still not sure if the calls were from the man I met in the parking lot, but it seemed likely. It was just too much of a coincidence they started after that encounter. I spent a good year being afraid of that man. I still can't believe how foolish I was giving him info about myself so easily and it was an important lesson in how smooth and sneaky creeps can be and now I'm much more careful about what I say to strangers. I still don't know what he had planned if I had actually been foolish enough to get in his car, but I'm very glad I never found out. When I was 18, I worked in my college's residence building at the front desk and I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms and half of the third floor were student rooms. The whole building operated with a hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated, and all the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. and said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charged $2 to be returned when theirs is located. I gave him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or hotel guest and he replied student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account but I was caught up doing administrative duties and forgot. I used to trust people way too easy at this job but quickly learned not. Later on the night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came to the desk again and said he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I'd changed the batteries and I went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name and I told him he didn't tell me his. I opened the room door manually with the master key and I told him I'd have to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it, and closed and deadbolted the door locked. Really weird, but I tried not to think about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point, and some students were iffy about having their doors propped open for their room to be on display for anyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent and I thought he might be an international student since we had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought maybe it was also just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it, there was something underneath it that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out a little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it, and threw it under the bed. He said there was a leak under the fridge. He just kept trying to get me down on the ground, throwing branded problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up in the morning to take a look at it if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed. In the most steady, chilly manner, he said, Ella, it's okay, you can take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away and, trying to remain composure, said, no thanks, I need to keep them on, even though he was creeping me out. I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me, or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped toward the door to close it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no, I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me and focus on getting out of there. He once again tried getting me to follow him into the bedroom, saying the bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot any actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room. No dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no sheets in the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back to the international student theory, thinking he had just arrived today and hadn't got a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed and quickly gathered the door kit and left. Before I had reached the elevator, he came back out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed, you need to come back. 
I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in our back office and called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait, now that I knew he wasn't a resident. He tore the corner off a slip of paper I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it, then put it back on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing them he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which I decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously he didn't, that's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked him for a student card and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street and he said yes, but couldn't tell them what the building number was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months ago later and apartment 1200 doesn't exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept up the ums and the uhs and saying he didn't know. They'd ask, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anybody who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? And he kept fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point he tried to tell them he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office to say that I literally had never seen him before that night. He left, we didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything anything, but it was still unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured out that the room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came to the desk and told me they found the door dead bolted open, the TV on, and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night and when the creep let himself into the building, he found out. I never saw him again, and to this day, I still have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the creeps. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. The lesson I took from the story was always read through your lease slash rental agreement fully before signing. This takes place four years ago in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm originally from California, so trading up city life for a less urban life was very challenging for me. Making friends was hard, but I made the move to be with my dad who lived in an apartment complex with a roommate. My dad was a trucker, so he was gone for weeks at a time, while I was left alone to work and come home to a foreign place that I was slowly being accustomed to. My roommate was gone most of the time because he had a girlfriend, and he would leave his dog with me, so I never truly felt alone. I had an old lady for a neighbor that would come up and check on me too. That's how people were in that area, and I found it kinda nice how people knew their neighbors. I got to know everyone in my building's name after about 6 months of living there, except one. There was a man, I'd say in his early to mid 50s, who lived directly below my apartment. He looked, for lack of better description, like a creep. He was balding except for on the sides of his head, which that hair was straggly too. He was tall and kinda skinny, had outdated 90s glasses, and a thick mustache. He was the only person in the building who wasn't friendly, or at least didn't make the effort to say hello or introduce himself to me. He also happened to be the maintenance man for all five buildings. I didn't think much of this at first. I honestly don't care if you're overly friendly to me. I enjoy having space of my own and sometimes being too friendly and suspicious to me. That's just a personal problem, but I'm explaining why I didn't send up any red flags at first. One day when I was pulling out of the driveway to go to work in the morning, I noticed across the large lawn that led to the door to our buildings, the maintenance man was standing in the center, staring directly at me. Stare is the wrong word, more like glare. At first, I looked around confused, thinking perhaps he was looking at someone or something behind me. I was the only one there. Although a bit creeped out, I shrugged it off and continued with my day, forgetting all about it. The next day I was over at my neighbor Claire's apartment, the elder lady, and she happened to bring up a maintenance issue she had. But she mentioned that she would never ask the maintenance man for anything, and neither should I. I tried to ask her more about what she meant by that, but she ended up being very broad and said something along the lines of, he's just a known creep around here. Fast forward to the first incident. It was around 2am and I was still awake, but only barely, sitting on the couch watching TV alone in the apartment. I was starting to drift off into sleep when I heard a soft noise near the front door. Thankfully, the show was very low in volume, because I normally don't pick up on quiet noises most of the time. I turned off the TV and began listening. Next to the living room on the right side is the patio area, and on the left is the kitchen and the front door. The light from the moon and outside lamps were flooding through the patio glass door. 
so I could see the doorknob to the front door moving, not just moving, but someone was using a key. In an instant, the door flung open and I was on my feet, with nowhere to hide at that point. I stood my ground and saw the silhouette step into the kitchen. That's when I saw it was the maintenance man. My stomach dropped and he stopped dead in his tracks when he spotted me, looking as if it was unexpected to find me awake. I noticed he had a large coat on, even though it wasn't winter or even cold that particular night. I noticed that only because the jacket looked bulky, as if he was carrying things in it that I couldn't see. What are you doing? Was all I managed to squeak out. I was shaking, my knees feeling like they were about to give out. For reference, I was a 22 year old woman standing a whopping 5 foot 4, with no way to defend myself at all from where I was standing. He looked shocked, which made me feel like I had gained a little power from the situation. He retorted confusedly and angrily with, Your toilet is making a loud noise that I could hear from my bedroom. I was angry and terrified, and only reacted with more anger when I saw him scrambling for excuses. So you just let yourself into my apartment at 2 in the morning? I'm reporting this to management first thing in the morning. He stepped closer to me then. I backed up a few steps but still stood my ground, quickly turning on the light closest to me so he could see my fury. The toilet is rumbling. I need to check it. Now. Now I was trembling so hard I could barely stand. I had adrenaline and anger and fear all coursing heavily through my body. Get out. He started to take the liberty to look around the kitchen where he was standing. My head immediately thought, what if he goes for a knife? And that's when he said it. I can come in whenever I want. The sentence makes me shiver to this day. I didn't know what to do and felt the power over the situation quickly dwindling down to a bad feeling that something bad was about to happen. If you don't get out of my apartment now, I'm gonna start screaming as loud as I can. My voice was crackling and shaky, which made my heart drop into my stomach. I immediately felt like I was gonna be sick when he took yet another step forward towards me. Check the lease. I could come in whenever I want. I'll see you later. He winked at me, creating a wave of nausea and I felt faint. He slowly turned around and walked out, closing the door behind him and even going far enough as to lock it from the outside with his extra key. The next day, I contacted management as soon as their office opened. I could tell the conversation wasn't going anywhere when the manager sounded irritated right off the bat. When I told her that the guy entered my apartment illegally, she cut me off and told me that they do not allow any illegal activity and take what I was saying very seriously. I thought, yes, I've got him, until the manager said, you can't just throw around accusations without proof. This man has dedicated over 20 years to working for this company, and we don't plan on getting rid of him anytime soon. Perhaps if you had read over your lease like you should have, yes, she was actually scolding me, you would have seen the clause that states that a maintenance worker has keys to the entire property. And if there is a maintenance issue, they are permitted to access the property at any time of day. This floored me. It couldn't possibly be legal. But of course, I'm from California, and of course, I didn't read the lease carefully. When I moved there, my dad was already living in the apartment and I literally had nowhere else to go. So if I were to be living there, I was going to have to sign the lease no matter what. So I did. Needless to say, nothing got done. Fast forward again, a few days go by and I don't see Mr. Maintenance Freak, until I do. This time I'm pulling in after a long 10 hour shift at work. I haven't forgotten about the scary incident, but I put it in the back of my mind for the time being to concentrate on other things, although I lost sleep over it. I park my car facing the large lawn area again and start using my phone for a few minutes. I'm peering down on my phone and glance up for a split second before I see him there. He's standing across the lawn staring angrily at me. I mean furious. I quickly look back down and pretend I have not seen him, getting that sinking feeling again. As a paranoid person, I put the key in the ignition just in case and pretended to keep scrolling on my phone while subtly locking my door. I glance up again and this time he's walking towards me, very fast. I look in my rearview mirror, hoping to see someone that he may be stomping angrily towards, and of course no one else is there. It's nearly dark now, but when he gets about 10 to 15 feet away from the front of my car, I can hear him shouting something, but I can't make out what he's saying. Now I put my phone down and I'm watching him come right at me until he reaches my window and starts banging it all with his might and slams his body into the door. He's also fidgeting angrily with the handle, even though the doors are locked. My car doesn't have automatic locks, so I'm praying that all my doors are locked at this point. My hands are shaking so bad that I'm having trouble starting the car. When I finally do, I realize what he's saying, which was a repeated cycle of the following phrases. I'm going to get you. I told you I could come in whenever I want. You really want to take me on? I'll kill you. I peeled out of there so fast, not even knowing where to go. I drove to the next county over, found a motel, and stayed the night there. The next day, I took work off and went straight to the management's office. I told them exactly what happened, and no matter what I said, they didn't believe me. This maintenance man was apparently a gift to mankind or something. He was a monument to the company and they appreciated his 20 years of service and dedication to them over him risking someone's life with threats. Long story short, I lost it. I called her psychotic and ended up getting evicted. 
I reported all this to the police, but between the lack of evidence I had and his perfect record slash shining references from his employers that seemed to love him, the police said that there was nothing they could do to move forward at that point. My dad and I ended up finding a nice home about 10 minutes away from that place. I ended up inviting Claire, my older neighbor, to the new house a few months later. She told me there was a single woman in the apartment before the roommate and my dad had moved in there that also left in a hurry after something happened with the maintenance man taking photos of her walking to and from her apartment to her car. When she confronted him about it, he told her, I can do whatever I want. I guess in Kansas City, maintenance workers are considered gifts to mankind. Needless to say, it's been four years and I'm back in California. This happened when I was about 18 years old. I was big into running back then and lived in a town that was a suburb but had big swaths of farmland, as in smallish tomato and strawberry fields, not huge never ending wheat fields. I preferred running on the dirt at the edges of these fields because it was a lot easier on my legs than running long distances on concrete or asphalt, and I was using training for half marathons. This particular day I was planning to run an easy 6 miles. I told my mom and she suggested I do a loop and then meet them at the dog park about 3 miles from our house as my halfway point. This is pre cell phone area, but being careful I took a walkie talkie my dad always used and my mom took the other one. Now, the walkie talkie had a range longer than the ones my brothers and I played around with when we were younger, but it definitely did not work 3 miles away and I honestly had no idea what its exact range was. So I take off to my run, I'm planning to go on the sidewalk for a little bit until I get to the fields. I think it was lettuce or something then, but short small plants. I'm running in the dirt with the road a few yards to my left. I have to run south and then turn right onto a slightly smaller, less traveled road to get to the dog park. As I'm running on the first dirt part, my parents drive by and, being dorks, they hawk and wave and yell at me. I wave and then soon after I make my turn onto the smaller road. This one is road, me on flat dirt, small drainage ditch, forever of lettuce field, then a wall that is the backyard of some houses. I start noticing how quiet the street is and how few cars are passing me. Then I randomly start thinking to myself, if someone tried to do something, I could run to those houses. Then I hear a car, but this one doesn't pass me like all the others. I hear it slowed down so that it is behind me, just out of my peripheral vision. My senses go super alert and I immediately realize what an idiot I was to pick this route because I'm stuck out here with no one to help me and nowhere to hide. The car starts speeding up enough so that it's next to me and I glance over and see a man. Middle aged, white, dark hair. Totally normal looking. But I get it chilled down my spine immediately. He sort of leans over into the passenger seat and says in a super sweet voice, Hi, where are you going? Do you need a ride? I am scared and realize that this is not good. Immediately nothing has happened yet and he could be totally innocent just wanting to chat. But my intuition is in overdrive telling me I'm not safe. I hop over the ditch thinking at least that will make it harder for his car to follow me if I need to take off across the field to try and make it to those houses in the distance. Well this pisses him off. He guns it and gets closer to the ditch and in front of where I am and then he says in a voice I can only describe as bone chillingly evil, you know, you shouldn't be out here all alone. Something horrible could happen to you out here and no one would ever know where to find you. He put his car in park and is taking off his seatbelt when I remember the walkie talkie. Piece of junk is all static because I'm too far away, so I immediately turn down the volume and say loudly, hey dad, yeah, yeah I see your car, I'm over here by this red Buick, do you see me? Fake wave to no one. There was no car coming from the direction my parents were and when I had started talking, there was no one behind us either. But by the grace of the universe at that exact moment, a car turned onto the road. The guy saw it, looked at me, and sped off so fast he left skid marks. I have never run faster in my life and I was looking behind me every few seconds and thought he'd be waiting for me at every intersection I had to cross. I was shaking and I was scared and relieved when I got to the dog park. I told my parents everything and my mom called the cops. They took a statement but said it would just help if something actually happened to someone else. The weird part was, I was having trouble getting my story out and I was so upset and before I gave a description of the car, the cop asked, was it a red Buick? He wouldn't tell us why, but that just added to my feeling that I had nearly escaped something awful. This was back in 2013 when I was living in New York City as a 23 year old. I was living with my best friend from college on the west side near Times Square in K-Town. I was going through some tough times back then as I was unemployed at the time. I had a lot of time so I would go on walks by myself to clear my head time to time. One night I was feeling exceptionally depressed so I decided to walk to K-Town to grab a drink by myself. I walked into a Korean bar and I got some weird looks from the waiter as I asked for a table by myself. After ordering a couple of soju bottles, I was feeling pretty drunk so I decided to walk back home. However, as I was exiting out of the bar, this Korean guy followed me. He looked very normal, just like a nice Korean guy. He told me that he saw me drinking at the bar by myself and that he would love to walk me home to make sure I got home safe. I politely declined, after all, my apartment was pretty close. 
but he insisted and he looked so harmless that I decided to take him up on his offer. We walked like 10 minutes I think, and it was quite pleasant. We were both a little drunk, but I remember talking about all sorts of things, nothing personal. When we finally arrived at my apartment, I thanked him and wished him farewell. Now, my apartment was a 5 story walk up, and there was a main door where we needed a key to open to get to the building, no doorman. I didn't think much of it and inserted the key to open the door and went in. The door takes a while to close shut and it was my mistake for not checking before I went up the stairs. While I was approaching the second floor, I heard someone grab the door from closing and I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I literally got goosebumps all over my body and I felt like I was in danger. As I started to pick up the pace, I heard the footsteps going faster up the stairs. I lived on the fifth floor and I started to run up, clutching my keys in my hand. The guy started to run up the stairs as well and I could literally hear him getting closer and closer to me. This all happened in a couple of seconds, but it felt very long. I finally got to my floor and as I tried to open the door, I looked back and literally saw the guy's head on the staircase. I rushed to open the door and I managed to close the door right on his face. My heart was beating so fast and I didn't know what to do at that point. It was already 3am and my roommate was asleep. Luckily, he didn't knock or anything so I decided to just go to my room and hope that he's gone home. Around 7am, my roommate woke me up. She said that there is a man standing in front of our apartment door. My heart sank and I explained the whole situation to her. She and I went to the door and screamed that we were going to call the police if he doesn't go home. I looked at the people and he told me that he would only go home if I gave him my number. We then called the police and saw him being escorted out. My roommate had to go to work, so she left the apartment and called me a few minutes later. She told me that she saw the guy speaking to the police downstairs. Apparently, he tried to lie to the officers that I'm his girlfriend and that we got into a fight. My roommate went up to them and explained to the officers that I do not have a boyfriend and that she doesn't know him at all. The police let him off with a warning. About two hours later, I heard a buzz from the main door downstairs. Maybe it's the police? Surely, it can't be him again, right? I answered the intercom and I was shook. It was him again. Just give me your number and I'll go away, he said. I warned him that I'm going to call the police again if he doesn't leave. A couple of minutes later, I heard ferocious knocks on my door. He must have gotten in when someone was entering the building. I was so scared at that point, so I immediately called the police. Unfortunately, the guy ran away before the police got there. The worst part about this experience was that my roommate and I were so scared to leave and come back to our apartment. I would have anxiety every time I come home, worried that I might see him in front of our apartment door. For about a week, the police escorted us when we felt scared. Bless them. I never saw him again, but it was one of the scariest moments of my life. So creepy stalker dude, let's not me. I live with my girlfriend as expats in a pretty foreigner friendly Asian country. Most of the time we get by just fine despite only knowing a little bit of the language because most people we interact with on a day to day basis speak fluent English. We started out in a tiny apartment which we quickly outgrew. We found a gorgeous condo with nice amenities and decided to move in. This condo is owned and managed by a local owner rather than by an association or company. The building is a little bit older, which means that instead of key card access to our door, it came with a traditional key lock inside and bar latch, which is nice because it's more durable than a chain. Of note, our original building also had key card access to our floor, meaning that we could only ever access our own floor. Even the emergency exit stairwells did not allow entry to floors other than our own. This new place did not include this measure and I routinely enjoyed a walk up the 15 flights of stairs to the room as a bit of a warm up before going swimming. The quaint feeling of all of this changed about 2 months after we moved in. We were both starting new jobs and dragged our feet on some of the final touches of moving in into a place. That is the last time we ever do that. My girlfriend nudged me awake at about 3 in the morning. I wake up extra groggy and I'm unsure of my surroundings. But I snapped to full attention when she whispered with wide eyes, someone is trying to open the door. Now, the condo is 100 square meters, and the main door and the bedroom are at opposite ends. The bedroom itself has a rather sturdy door that was closed, and the aircon runs at night. So this had to have been some sort of commotion for her to wake up. I sprung out of bed and made it to the door in seconds. There was some guy outside our door, studying very intently at our lock. He was about my height, though probably 15 kilos heavier, and he was not a foreigner like us. Wrong room, I had to yell, because the door is pretty thick. There was a pause and then a thud, then a smaller tock 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 as he was knocking. From experience, I know that it's hard to hear through the door, and if English was not his first language, then understanding me through the door was going to be a real challenge anyway. Looking through the people as he kept up steady knocking, I noticed he swayed back and forth slightly, so I figured he maybe had a couple drinks and had the wrong room. I turned to my girlfriend and told her so, and that I was going to open just the key lock but not the bar latch and tell him he had the wrong room. She didn't love the idea, but what was a good alternative? I took a deep breath and undid the key lock. 
My hand shook as I turned the handle, and one hand braced against the door while the other opened it slightly. He must have been leaning close because I saw his face right at the opening, and I could smell beer on his breath. You've got the wrong was what I got out before he pushed against the door as hard as he could. The bar latch held, but it was enough that my girlfriend threw herself against the door, and with our combined force we shut it again. No, I yelled, go away, wrong room. And then he muttered something that sent chills through me. The door muddled the noise, having just woken up played tricks on my ears, and the language barrier filled in the gaps. But I could swear I heard him laugh a little and say, stupid boy. I froze. My girlfriend turned the key lock as he slammed his body into the door once, twice, three times, I lost count. Every time I pressed against it harder, but I could still swear the four screws that held the bar latch in place wiggled slightly. The thuds returned, and looking through the people, I could see that he was punching the door. His stomach face looked patient and annoyed as he swung his arm back over and over each time it hit my girlfriend and I could feel the vibration through our entire bodies. After what felt like an eternity, the pounding stopped and I looked through the people. He wasn't there any longer. I listened closely and I could hear the long ding of the elevator down the hall. He might be leaving. My girlfriend had both our phones, texting the condo owner on hers and shoving mine at me. She was calling the owner, but at 3am there was no answer. Frantic text of someone is trying to break in spammed the other end when no one was picking up. She messaged friends of ours who live in the next building, but we both knew it'd be hours before anyone responded to us. We calmed down a bit and agreed that we were going to be up for the rest of the night, but that we'd settle up with the condo owner in the morning and report it to the building management. There were security cameras in the hallways, so they'd be able to follow up. Then I heard the elevator ding again. I was shaking as I returned to the peephole and watched as the chunky man returned. He was hanging up a mobile phone and he retrieved something from his pocket, a knife, a multi-tool, and that's when I said he's back and I grabbed the biggest kitchen knife within reach and reached to brace the door. My girlfriend was almost in a full blown panic as she grabbed the cast iron skillet. That's when I realized for the first time that there was a chance that someone was going to die. The door handle was wiggling as he started to poke at the lock with whatever was in his pocket. If he opened one lock, the only thing between him and us would be four tiny screws in the bar latch and if he got in this condo we were going to defend ourselves as best as we could and that's where i realized we were foreigners and dealing with manslaughter charges in a foreign court system would be an absolute nightmare or if we severely injured him and he was able to communicate his story his way to the police while we struggled with an interpreter and of course this is all assuming that we would be the ones to overpower and subdue him all this is running through my head as i called the equivalent of 911 and shouted english into the phone until someone spoke english my brain wouldn't quiet down enough for me to be polite i finally got an operator that spoke english and i explained someone was trying to break into our condo that he had left and returned and gave him the address he sent a car and asked for an eta and he couldn't give me one he wandered off again but my spider sense was in full alert mode. It wasn't until half an hour later when several people wearing police uniforms and building management jumpsuits knocked on the door that I calmed down even a little. Still, I wasn't sure what to expect. One of the groups spoke English while the rest stood back. I explained everything in detail and pointed at the camera in our hallway, saying I wanted whoever it was found. One of the cops pointed at the nearby knife and raised an eyebrow, and I just confidently said, yeah, I would have if I needed to. After assurances and apologies and promises of follow-up, we received what we should have collected weeks ago, direct phone numbers to our building security room where cameras are monitored, as well as the local police station and the personal mobile number of our building security director. The sun was coming up and our condo owner called my girlfriend to comprehend what was going on. She promised us that she'd sent locksmiths there that day to install another deadbolt as well as a second bar lock if it helped us feel safe. The follow-up of everything was that the guy was indeed someone who got drunk and mistook the room. It was on the wrong floor. His wife had to come collect him more than once and he would be fined for the cost of installing the extra locks. So while it is a bit comforting to know that he's a random drunk instead of a burglar, I still explain to building management that I have no desire for an apology from him. I don't care if he feels bad. Police reports here can be messy and locals can hold severe grudges that I did not want to deal with. I will only keep from a full police report if I literally never see or hear from him again. So just as some background, I am male and currently 25 and still living within 15 miles of my old house. This happened when I was about 8 or 9, making my sister at the time 5 or 6. We lived in a quiet neighborhood that, once I grew up, I found out was actually a lower income part of town. However, we had some wonderful neighbors and it was thanks to these neighbors that a lot of potentially negative situations were avoided. At the time, my dad was working an 8am to 8pm job and my mother was a secretary at a hospital, which meant that during the day she was often at work. Usually my sister and I had a babysitter, but once I reached about 8 or 9, I began to be old enough to look out for us without a babysitter. Now mind you, this was the 90s which certainly were not safe but were much safer than they are now. Also, we had the previously mentioned neighbors who generally did a good job of keeping an eye on us in our house. 
This particular incident was one of the first times I was charged to babysit for my sister. She was in her high chair eating whatever my mom had left for us when I got a knock on our front door. And this was strange since we never got visitors on a regular basis, other than the boy across the street who would want us to come out and play, but he usually just yelled my name while knocking. I was young and naive and decided to open the door. There was a locked screen door beyond that. I left that closed and locked. Outside was a middle-aged man. I hardly remember his facial features or even body type. I remember his yellow shirt and dirty jeans. Can I help you? I asked innocently. No alarm bells going off yet. Hey there, are your parents home? Alright, first alarm bell. My parents teaching me not to trust strangers rushed through my head, but I still didn't quite fully grasp the potential danger here. My mom went to the store. She'll be back any minute. Weird half lie. I could have said she was here but in the shower or that she was laying down upstairs. I'm glad I didn't tell him that she wouldn't be back for quite a few hours, but looking back it's scary how naive I was. Well that's no problem. Hey, so look, my dog went missing and I think it went into your backyard. Do you mind if I can come in and we can go check it out? Okay, so I might have been dumb, but I wasn't that dumb. There was no way I was letting this stranger into my house, especially with my sister there. She was my first thought. Sure, I didn't want to have any harm follow me, but she was my sister and it was my job to keep her safe. I should have closed the door right then and there, but once again I went with a less safe but still not totally stupid route. Well, the gate should be unlocked. If you want to go check the backyard, you can. And promptly closed the door. Now, of course I was very curious if there was a stray dog in my backyard. Dogs are great. Even with the weird guy being around, I was pretty interested to see how his search in the backyard went. So I decided to go check the back window and see if there was actually a dog and, if so, if the man would catch it. Now at this point, I am sure you have figured out that there was no dog. And when I looked out the back window, I could see almost the entire yard, including the gate. The man wasn't there. This was mere seconds after I had closed the door on him. I waited for a few minutes, but he never showed up. After about 5 minutes, there was another knock on my door. This time I was much more wary and I didn't like this guy showing up. I was pretty tired of the whole ordeal, but I still hadn't fully grasped the situation. I kept the chain lock on the door and cracked it open. Did you find your dog? Again, I can't remember his facial features, so I can't really recall his expression, but I remember his tone was a bit desperate as well as annoyed. No, I looked all over the yard and I couldn't find him. I have a picture in my car if you want to take it just in case you see him. Nope, no more. I still didn't understand abduction, but I certainly was not going to go anywhere outside of the house with a stranger. I told him that he can leave a picture in the mailbox and we will keep an eye out. Once again, promptly closing the door. What followed is what really creeps me out to this day. Looking back, I was freaked out that I had to come that close to exposing my sister and myself to danger, but this really scared me. Suddenly there was more knocking on my door, not the screen door separating the door, the door itself. Like I mentioned previously, the screen door was locked and unless that was open, it was impossible to knock on the door itself. It freaked me out and I took my sister to my bedroom and crept back out to the kitchen where I could see out onto the front yard and saw the man quickly getting back into his car while my saint of a next door neighbor Joan stood on her front lawn smoking and watching him intently. It took a long time for me to add it all up and honestly, I had forgotten about it for a long time. When I finally remembered it all, I couldn't even believe my own memories. Either way, Mr. Yellow Shirt Man, yeah, let's not ever meet again. Also, thank you Joan wherever you are. You saved me on multiple occasions and I didn't even know it. When I was in 4th grade, my family was still living in Denver, Colorado in a small condo near my school. My brother, kindergartner at the time, and I only had to cross the street and walk between a couple of apartment buildings to get to the football field attached to our school. It was normally a pretty quick and safe trip to and from. My mother was taking night classes at NAU at the time, and her boyfriend, whom we lived with, would usually watch us in the evenings, although he wasn't off work until about 6.30pm. We grew up as latchkey kids, so this wasn't a big deal. One day, my brother and I were walking home together after school like we'd usually do and had just gotten to the street in front of our home when a white car pulled up in front of us. The man driving the car didn't seem like your typical weirdo, maybe in his late 20s and looking pretty clean cut. Looking back, the fact that he was driving such a fancy car, a Benz I believe, and wearing such a crisp outfit didn't really fit with our neighborhood. He asked my brother and I if our parents were home. I immediately got a serious sensation of stranger danger from this dude. I looked at our apartment across the street, then back at him, and in the most I'm not stupid tone I could find, I asked why. It doesn't matter, he replied dismissively. Are they home? He seemed a little more insistent with his question and glanced around. Yep, despite fully knowing they were not home and that my mom's boyfriend wouldn't be able to be there for another two plus hours, I figured it was better to lie and say yes. What are they doing, he asked, really looking us over. I then turned to my brother and ordered him, let's go, but he wouldn't follow me. I went to grab his hand and he quickly withdrew with a sharp no and looked back at the guy. 
The guy then looked at both of us and then back to my brother, and with a facial expression that made my hair stand on end, he said, Come closer, I have something for you. My brother started walking to the door of the car and the guy was reaching with his hand out, nothing in it, like he was about to grab him. I grabbed my brother's coat immediately and started hauling him towards our apartment as fast as I could. He was screaming for me to let him go, but I was terrified so I just kept dragging him. The guy quickly put his car into gear and literally peeled out of there. My mother's friend started picking us up from school after that and a PSA was issued to the community. I still get a little creeped out when cars slow down near me while I'm outside walking. Potential child abductor, let's not meet again. It was the middle of the summer and my parents had left for the weekend to go to our house in the Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away so it's no big deal for them to leave me alone for a few days. My mom had some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good. The first night I was alone I stayed up till 3 in the morning playing Xbox so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1. I had made plans to play some street hockey with my friends at 3 so I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers so when my parents are gone I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes on my phone scrolling through reddit and twitter and whatnot when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door and the thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about 2 minutes, ears trained and trying to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was just the wind or maybe my parents were home early, so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself, and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. Even though my house is old and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner to the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen. There was no way I wouldn't have heard another noise and there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen even if they were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I sort of chuckled to myself for being so stupid and just normally walked the last two stairs and turned the corner to the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen is a man staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face just staring at me. The thing I remember most most vividly wasn't his face or his smile but his arms. They weren't just at his side, he held them in the strangest most abnormal position I've ever seen. They were where one would normally hold their arms, but he had rotated them to the point where they were almost completely reversed as well as lifting them up and a little behind himself. Honestly I think I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back I can realize how creepy the situation was, but in the moment I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping slash pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I beelined up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. I sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob like you see in TV. Almost without thinking I immediately called 911 and nearly in tears told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would be here soon, I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. The guy was standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. I was paralyzed with fear, watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways. I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator was asking, hello sir, sir are you there, hello? I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arms to bring the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually the light returned to the gap and I heard the faintest of footsteps, slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to even speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe and I opened the door to the two of the men standing there as I almost cried. Nowadays my parents don't even leave me alone home anymore and I check every lock on the house before going to bed. Even working with sketch artists in a few lineups, the police never found whoever was in my house. I have no idea what he wanted or who he was, but regardless, let's not meet again, ever. I'm 29 now. The story happened 10 years ago at the time I was jobless and I found a job as a security guard in an office building. The office building was in a forested area, away from any busy streets like secluded. The person who had the job before me had a car accident and apparently was paralyzed from the waist down. Nobody was interested in the job since you worked during the night and the office building was so big it was just really boring, but hey a job is a job. Once I started, a supervisor worked me in for a week, what to do, etc. This was my first night working by myself. I came to work and took the shift over from my colleague at 9pm and he told me there will still be some people left in the building. Before I went up to the 15th floor, I closed the main entrance in such a way you could only exit when you're inside, so no outsiders could come in. 
After I did this, I went up to the 15th floor where these people still worked to ask them if they needed to go anywhere else in the building, and if not, I could make my round and close off all the other floors, which I did. So I made my rounds and found nothing peculiar. I went back to my front desk, this was around 11.30pm, and the last people who were working on the 15th floor were just leaving. And the guy told me he was the last one to leave and wished me good night. Once the last person left, I went up to the 15th floor, checked all the offices and locked it down. I went down to my front desk again, since there were no people left. I put on the alarms, which work on motion detection and also when you open a fire exit on every floor, except the ground floor where my desk was. Within 5 minutes I put the alarm on, on all floors. The alarm went off on the 10th floor and there was nobody on the building. The rule is if an alarm goes off, you first call the security company before you take action. I told them I would investigate the alarm and I would call them back once I checked it out. Otherwise, if I don't call back, they would send a police car to check it out, just as a precaution. I checked the whole 10th floor and I found nothing, went back to call the security company telling them it was a false alarm. I kid you not, the alarm on the 10th floor went off like 7 times in an hour, and every time I checked the floor, I couldn't find anything out of order, or even that there was someone there. Since this was my first day working alone, and the alarm went off so many times, the security company thought I was screwing things up and wanted to file a complaint to my boss, which would mean I would lose my job I just had for a week. In retrospect, the following was the dumbest thing I could ever do, because the alarm went off again, since I didn't want to call the security company again and cry wolf, I went up to the 10th floor without informing the security company. The only thing I had on me was a mag light, since security guards in the Netherlands are not allowed to carry guns. I went up to the 10th floor, checked the floor, and as before, found nothing. The only difference now was I pretended to leave, turned off the lights, and stayed on the 10th floor, listening if someone was there. In about 5 minutes, I heard someone or something moving. I was relieved and anxious at the same time, relieved I wasn't wrong and that there was something on the floor, anxious because of what was on the floor. I turned on the lights and tried to sound as manly as possible saying something in the line of, I know there's someone here, show yourself. As you can imagine, no response. So stupid I didn't go down to call for help, but stupid me went looking to whatever it was I heard on the 10th floor. I walked to the office I heard the sound from, turned on the lights, and found a little girl who couldn't be older than 13 with long brown hair, in white pajamas squatting and rocking front to back on a desk, looking straight at me. The scary thing was there was no emotion in her face or in her eyes. I collected my nerves and took the girl by the hand. I took her down to the front desk, offered her a coke but she didn't respond whatsoever. The only thing I could do was call my supervisor and told him about what I encountered. My supervisor's response was, stay there I'll be right over. The time I hung up on the phone until my supervisor came, I just had this underbelly feeling with this girl, that there was something really wrong with her. Before my supervisor turned up, he called me and told me to call an asylum which was pretty close to the office building I worked at, just to check if someone was missing. Why would there be a 13 year old girl in an office building with no houses nearby whatsoever? So that's what I did, I called the asylum, asking them if there was someone missing from the asylum, and I got the scariest response you can get. Yes, as a matter of fact, someone is missing. I gave them a description of the girl sitting next to me, and it was in fact the girl who was missing from the asylum. They told me she was really dangerous, and that I should watch my back at all costs. They immediately sent people over to take the little girl with them. A week later, my supervisor told me the story of the girl I found, since he talked with the people from the asylum. It turns out the girl killed her mom and dad and little brother whilst they were asleep when she was 11. Even in the asylum, she wounded staff members, either by stabbing them with a pencil or in another case biting a piece of a ear off. To this day, we still have no clue how she ever came in the building. We checked all the cameras and there was no footage of her ever entering the building. I grew up in a very safe, very affluent neighborhood. It was unheard of for anyone to lock their cars or houses, and when someone new moved to the neighborhood, it was mere moments before they were welcomed with open arms and open doors. Despite being surrounded by what could be described as one large neighborhood family, my mom was very particular about house rules being followed, one of which was never going out alone. Walking to a friend's house, three of us had to go, so two could walk home together after dropping you off. It was rare, but occasionally just two of us would be able to sneak out from under her watchful eye and run to the corner store a few blocks down for some candy or soda. One sweltering day during the summer, I turned nine. I found myself home alone and restless. I decided to take my sister's cool new 10 speed for a spin around the block a few times. Now, even though I was tall for my age, the bike was still a few inches too big for me. I decided that didn't matter, jumped on and started pedaling. My first stop around the neighborhood went off without a hitch. Birds were chirping, sun was shining, and the wind blowing through my curled hair felt wonderful. Second lap around the block I passed an older, unfamiliar car parked on the side of the road, and the sun reflecting off the huge scrape down the side temporarily shocked my vision into bright blue stripes which I furiously tried to blink away. The third lap, I saw the car pull off the side of the road heading towards me, and a tiny pit of unease began to grow my stomach as the driver slowed when he passed me. 
I chalked it up to being scared of being caught out being alone and continued on my way. I picked up speed as I rounded the corner towards my house and I decided to go for one more time around the block, but to make it quick so I'd beat my mom home and avoid the trouble I knew I'd be in if she caught me out alone. I hit the bottom of the hill next to our house with some speed and started to climb to the top, slowing more and more the closer I got. By the time I reached the top of the hill, I had to stop and catch my breath, teetering the too tall back at my hip. As I struggled to catch my breath, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, my arms locked on the handlebars, and every inch of my body froze. I had been caught, I just knew it. I heard a car creeping up behind me, and it just had to be my mom, but it wasn't. When relief should have washed over me, the unknown dread only deepened, further stiffening my frozen still limbs. I turned to see the same old car, with the same blinding scratch down the side, slowing down right next to me. The man stopped the car right next to my bike on the wrong side of the street, and through his opening driver door started to ask me if I had seen a stray dog running around, because his had come off the leash and run off. I froze. This cliché question is the one they warned us about in school, the one every kidnapper supposedly uses. I decided if I answered him firmly and rode my bike away that he would know his plan wouldn't work on me. Plus, he might just really be looking for his dog. This was my plan. My terrified body betrayed that plan and a trembling no is all I could manage. As I fumbled my feet to the pedals of this too big bike, his car door flew open and out he lunged. No, I said again as I wobbled my way past his open car door, his hand brushing the back of my shirt and knocking my back tires I pedaled as fast as I could the 50 feet to the next driveway I saw. I pedaled, legs burning up the drive, running my front tire so hard to my neighbor's front star that it bent the wheel. My body catapulted over the handlebars and I burst through the neighbor's front door. Eddie, Eddie help. My neighbor was not home. I ran into the kitchen, still calling in hopes I was wrong. What are you doing? A man's voice behind me and I froze. I slowly turned around, not knowing what else to do, and there stood my neighbor's son, home from college. I dissolved into tears, gulping out what happened. He tossed the bent bike into the back of his truck and drove me around the corner to the safety of my home. My mom was home and had the look of death in her eyes until she saw my tear-streaked face. The police were called. The neighbors were called. The car had been spotted frankly circling the block the few minutes following our encounter, but he was gone by the time police arrived. To this day, 20 years later, I still have a hard time riding my bike alone. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude so I've never had much luck with women and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either until the third month of using it when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again which was odd because bots almost never messaged more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but it definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly 8 hours from me by car, but I had to admit I really did like her quite a bit and I had been thinking about asking her if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she said who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week and called most days, and I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on the way there though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was, and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she would send me a slew of annoyed texts. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt roads and a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came onto an old looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up but it didn't look abandoned, just worse for wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. I took out my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent a smiley face in return. When I got out of my car to go knock on the door, I noticed someone was looking at me from one of the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy but figured it was just her father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and again, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile and even gave me a kiss which surprised me and I followed her inside. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise or... Katie looked confused and told me that her dad wasn't here. I still thought she was keeping up the act and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran out to our cars and when I questioned Katie she informed me that her dad wasn't there and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from out the window again. I got a better look of him and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. 
He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that, while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was had ran out into the woods but the cops were sure the house was empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bed was the room next to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her but she never used. I told her it was fine, the man's gone but she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out. I'm glad she did. Later that night I was still wide awake, watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point I wasn't even scared, I was just pissed. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door and there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived they did a sweep of the woods and found no one yet again. They told Katie and me that it'd probably be a good idea to stay at somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at our friend's house and I was going home. I left a little after Katie did, and I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking, something caught my eye. That man was standing at the corner of the house just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again, but I did text Katie and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever even went back into the house alone. I had to fly out to a small town I've never been to in order to look for a place to live. I'm moving there in the fall to start grad school. My boyfriend flew with me, and before the trip I researched all sorts of apartments on Craigslist and set up a bunch of appointments. Now, our first appointment was in the afternoon in this sort of remote residential area. The landlord sent a fine over email and asked me to call him an hour before the appointment to confirm that I was coming. I called, he didn't answer, so my boyfriend and I started walking to the house and just hoped that he would show up. Maybe 10 minutes before the appointment, he called me. Are you coming? He asked. He sounded like an older man and had this very strange, slow way of talking, but I just thought that he was just older. Yes, we're in front of the house now. He got extremely upset. We? Oh yes, my boyfriend's with me. You never told me you had a boyfriend. You never said that. It had never crossed my mind to tell him this information. Since my boyfriend would not be coming to live with me, he was just helping me look for apartments on the trip. I told the man so and after a very long pause he said, I'm sorry, it's just sometimes people don't tell me when they're married and it surprises me, I'll see you soon. Then he hung up. I told my boyfriend about what the man had said and he was immediately weirded out. He wanted to leave but they were slim pickings in terms of real estate at this point so I stupidly said that we had to stay. In case this place was the place. As we're discussing it, we see a man leave the house we're going to view. This man was young and extremely sketchy looking, greasy hair, furtive eyes. He took one look at us and ran out of the house to his car and pulled away from the curb with a screech. Okay, so now we're really weirded out, but this isn't enough for us to bail just yet. And as we look at each other wondering what to do, the landlord arrives. He's in his 50s, very tall and very strong looking. His eyes are completely blank and empty of warmth or emotion. He slowly walks up to us and says, I'd shake your hands but mine are dirty. What from? My boyfriend asked. Work is the flat reply. He asks us a lot of questions about me, completely ignoring my boyfriend. The entire time he stares into my eyes without blinking. What am I going to school for? What other places am I considering for living? Is my boyfriend moving to this town too? I try to give answers that are as vague as possible. Meanwhile, my boyfriend asks the landlord questions of the same kind, which he refuses to answer. Then he says, I propose of nothing. Let me show you the basement. At this point, I should have noped out of there, but I didn't. I kept thinking this was an eccentric old man from a small town, we're city folk and that we were just feeling paranoid. My boyfriend, on the other hand, wanted out of there, but he followed us as the man led us back to the house, away from the street, to this sort of detached shed. He opened the door and we saw that there were stairs leading down into the utter darkness. He flipped the switch at the top of the stairs and the light didn't come on. Normally the response for this is, oh, the lights are out, or something like that, but he just said, hmm, and so they walked down into the darkness. Then he stood there without moving in the dark and said, aren't you coming down? There's nothing to see if the light's out, says my boyfriend. The landlord just stands there for a long time, then slowly walks up the stairs and closes the basement door without saying anything. He took us into the house. Weird and increasingly creepy things ensued. The front door, the only exit to the house, locked automatically. And when my boyfriend tried to fiddle with it, the man got really upset and told him to leave it alone. He managed to get it open secretly though. The man kept trying to box us into small rooms and, according to my boyfriend, kept reaching his hands into his pockets. 
only to take them away when he caught us looking. On Craigslist and in person, the man claimed that there was a grad student already living in the house, but the evidence of that seemed arranged. There were neat piles of generic textbooks on the table, but not other things a 20-something might read. There was a bowl of fruit on the table, but no other food in the fridge or pantry, or utensils. There were maybe three t-shirts in the closet. This supposed grad student wasn't out of town, but the landlord couldn't say what school he went to or how long he'd been renting the house. Finally, the man had showed us every single room in the house but one. This one he refused to open, claiming it was just the attic and we didn't need to see anything up there. He gave us several reasons when we inquired. It was unfinished, there was furniture up there, it would smell bad. This last one I believed, because standing near the door, it smelled terrible. Finally, we made our excuses and bolted out of there. The man walked us out, pretended to go into his car to leave, and when he thought we had turned the corner, slowly sauntered back into the house. My boyfriend, fixated on the idea that there was something wrong with this guy, googled the man that night. We found out three things that he was a pillar of the community, known by a lot of the townspeople, and that there was no evidence of him owning or managing a real estate company, as he claimed on Craigslist, and he had listed his home address as the very house we had been touring, the house where the grad student lived. Yeah, we won't be renting this place. This happened sometime in 2011. I had been married for a little over a year and had given birth to a son a couple months prior. I was 23 and had just started working in a hospital while I took classes to finish my degree and hopefully apply for the police academy. I had met one of the security guards named Joe a few times as I frequently assisted in the ER with various tasks. As I got to know him he had a son a little younger than mine and was a veteran also applying to police academies and we formed a friendship. We exchanged numbers as he offered to help me train and give me pointers for the physical portion of the police test since I was out of shape after having a baby. One day while talking to him I mentioned how where I would study when on break was so loud and wish I could find a quiet place to sit. He offered to give me a tour and show me some all the hidden places employees would use. It was a Sunday so the hospital was quiet and I met up with him. We walked around and he showed me gray areas and offered to show me where the helipad was. We went through areas that were blocked to most staff. As we climbed the stairs and got closer to the roof, I started to get anxious and felt my stomach drop. I couldn't explain it and felt fear as we got closer. I'll admit, I'm afraid of heights and thought maybe that was it, but when we got on the roof, the fear got stronger but it was directed towards Joe. Something was off, and I had this feeling that at any moment he might try something and push me over the edge of the building. I just had to get out of there. Fortunately at that moment, the phone I carried rang and my coworker wanted to know where I was and if I'd be back soon to help her with something. I told him I had to get back and followed him back out making sure he was never behind me. After that day, I avoided Joe at work and would only keep text messages short. I felt bad at first thinking I was overreacting because he had never done anything to me to make me feel that way. As time went on though, the text became more frequent and he would try to ask me what I was wearing. I told him it was inappropriate as we were both married. I started seeing him more frequently and felt he was everywhere just lingering like he was waiting for me. Finally, one of my co-workers, Stan, asked me about it and I confided in him what was going on. I told him how I was scared to report him because he was part of security. I also mentioned how I would see him sometimes when I would leave at night around midnight and was scared that one night he'd be waiting by my car even though he didn't know what kind I drive. After that, Stan walked to my car every night I worked since we had the same shifts together. After he noticed I was never alone, he stopped bothering me. A few months later, I found out that he was fired for harassing another girl, who had the courage I didn't have to report him. I feel bad that I didn't speak up at the time and someone else had to experience it. So Joe, I hope we never meet again and I hope you never got into a police academy. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest where you left your doors unlocked and came home when the street lights turn on at dusk. After moving away for college, I decided to move back to my quiet, sleepy hometown in one of the two apartment buildings. I'm living there for roughly three months when one night I go to sleep early on a Friday night. Now, I'm a reasonably hard sleeper, so when I wake in the middle of the night to noises, I'm immediately alarmed. I'm going to describe my apartment layout for a better understanding. As you walk in the front door, the kitchen is to the left and the living room is to the right. There's a hallway straight ahead with one bedroom at the end. A bathroom is to the left in the hall and my bedroom to the right. I get up from my bed, walk around the end of my bed, and peek my head out of the bedroom door. I look to the left to see my front door open to the outside hallway. There's a loud voice coming from my enlightened kitchen. From my vantage point, I'm unable to see into my kitchen. I froze. I come to my senses after realizing that I've stopped unconsciously breathing. I take a shallow breath to study my mind and gather my bravery. There's no thought process about what to do at this point. I let my body and my instincts take over. I turn around and head back to the far side of my bed. I grab my phone from the nightstand and quietly remove it from the charger. Luckily, my bed frame is high enough for me to squeeze under without much difficulty. I immediately realize that there is no escape from my hiding spot if things turn south. 
I'll have to rely on luck to get me through this. I dial 911 and a woman answers and asks about my emergency. I briefly explain in a whisper that an unknown man is in my apartment and that I am currently safe. I lay there, listening to the chaos of my home, reassured by the presence of my cat, Marcy, laying under the bed with me. It seems to me that he's in a phone call based on the one set of rambling. I tell the operator this fact and explain my fear that he's going to bring other people into my home. He was making enough sound to allow me to give a play-by-play -play on the call. He starts screaming about killing someone. I'm unsure at this point whether he's talking to the person on the phone or if he knows I'm there. The voice is unfamiliar, but this does little to ease my terror. He then starts ringing the doorbell in the outside hallway and yelling for me to come out. My blood runs cold as I realize that he might come try to find me. Marcy is alarmed by the doorbell that hasn't ceased ringing and she creeps out from under the bed. I panic. What if he hurts her? I start whispering as loudly as possible to get her attention without letting him know my location. She senses my unease and crawls back under the bed with me. At this point it's felt like an eternity and I ask the operator how long until the police arrive. She is unsure but assures me that they are on their way. My town is roughly a 30 minute drive to the nearest city police but I assumed there's a highway patrol that would be coming soon. Little did I know that safety was in a rush to get to me. I hear him walking around my apartment and enters my extra bedroom, which is a storage room with a bed. He hasn't stopped yelling. I'm still unaware whether he is on the phone or not. I hear him mention that it must be a kid's room. I shush the operator because he's ceased his screaming for the moment. I hear more noises like he's going through boxes and throwing things. Then my fear is realized, as I hear him quietly enter my room. I see his feet walk closest to my vantage point. He starts going through my clothes and emptying my hamper onto the floor. He turns around and walks to my bed and sits down. I stopped breathing. I think he lays down at this point since the pressure of the bed lessens on top of me. He's deadly silent and I'm still holding my breath. They're shuffling and moving around and he gets up and walks out of my room. I take a shallow breath and steady my conviction. He starts making noise again like he's throwing and punching things. I inform the operator that he was just in my room and the police need to hurry. I don't know how long I can keep Marcy under the bed and concerned about what could happen if he finds me. He walks back into the kids room quietly. I shush the operator again because she is continually asking for a play by play. I hear him breathing from the other room. After the quietest few minutes of my life he yells, who's there? I freeze again listening for movement, nothing. I'm starting to get lightheaded from my shallow breathing. The silence is deafening and I fear he's trying to detect me. After a live time, I hear footsteps entering my apartment. I hear a man's voice say, hey bud, you're in the wrong house. I've never felt more relief in my life before this night or since. I hear my door close and I crawl from under the bed and break down. The adrenaline and anxiety take over as soon as the feeling of safety washes over me. A female officer comes around to my side of the bed and puts her hands on my shoulders. I'm trying to keep it together and failing miserably. She let me put my clothes on and I could hear three male voices coming from my apartment. The woman left and came back with a handful of clothes asking if any weren't mine. They all were, and I answered in kind. She shut the door behind her as she left again. I turned and looked out my window and see no lights from the cop car on the street. I look on my phone and realize the call to 911 took 19 minutes. I can't explain the feelings I had at this time since many hit me all at once. The door opened and the officer motioned to have me exit. Taking a first look at my home was almost as anxious as the event itself. My apartment was a complete mess. Clothes were everywhere mixed with garbage and other belongings from my shelves and counters. This man had removed items that he intended on taking and placed them in the outside hallway. They tell me that they found him on the floor in the second room completely naked, holding a bottle of lotion. In his vicinity, there was a winter hat with an unknown substance inside. They tell me to look and see if any of the clothes in the apartment do not belong to me. I tell them no. This man entered my home completely naked and destroyed my home. I noticed that the lid of my garage can was filled with cat poop. It seems that it had been separated from the rest of the bag. The rest of the garbage was littered across the outside hallway. They asked me if I would like to stay here or go elsewhere. They claimed my parents lived on the street and I had an officer drive me there. I explained to my parents what had just happened and in the next few days, I have to explain the situation to what felt like half the town. The ridiculousness of the story catches people's attention and becomes a slight joke. Now I should feel better knowing that he is in custody, but the events after the break-in do little to comfort me. An officer shows up with a subpoena to appear in court to testify, but I receive a call for a postponement. I just want this to be behind me. After a month, I call the phone number on the paper I received and ask when they are rescheduling for since I hadn't heard anything. The woman informs me that they mailed another and I had not shown up. I asked where was it since I have not received a summons. She tells me that they sent it to my address, but the wrong town. It has been two years since this happened and I've since moved three times. I don't know if I'll ever be content and happy anywhere, but I'm hoping that is not the case. He was released six months after his conviction for some reason or another on parole. He immediately disappeared and fled from his parole officer. So naked man, I hope to never meet you again.
So about six years ago, I was 21, and I was home from college for the summer and living with my parents. This is deep Texas suburbs, so the houses are all cookie cutter houses built around the same time by the same developer. Every few blocks there's a pool or a park of some sort. Well every year, the community people, I honestly don't know how this gets organized or by whom, have a rock the park event at one of the pools slash parks within walking distance of my house. Some old guys bring their garage band and cover songs by Aerosmith and the Eagles, etc. The pool stays open late, there's a playground, and you can hear the music from every corner of the park. It wasn't too loud though, unless you were nice and close. Well, my parents went on a dinner date that night so I decided, with my 21 year old brain, to pour some vodka into my coca cola bottle and walk up to the park for some tunes and have a good time. It's only about a block away from me, so I get there pretty quick and down a good amount of vodka cocoa along the way. I'm feeling pretty good by the time I get there, so I head right up to the closest bench, to the stage. They were just standing within some cones and speakers on the grass. There's a person sitting on the far edge of the bench, but I don't really pay attention to him first. There's a good four feet of empty bench between us. It didn't take long, however, for him to strike up a conversation. He had a bony face and looked to be about at least 30. He said hello, how are you, etc. I was polite back, but pulled out my phone so he might get the message that I didn't really want to talk. He asks if I'm having a good time, and like a fool, I tell him that of course I am. I'm a couple shots worth of vodka in. I shook my coke bottle and the small amount left and it fizzed. That was when he started to ease his way in. I stayed on the far edge of the bench, but as he kept talking to me, he kept moving closer. He asked if I lived around here and I said, yeah, don't worry, I walked. I honestly thought he was asking because I was not sober enough to drive. He told me he lived in some vague direction and then asked if he could have my number. I started getting uncomfortable because for the first time in my life, I was alone somewhere and in a compromised state. I told him I didn't know him that well and he said something like, okay well, get to know me. I told him I needed to walk around because the music was too loud and I had to make a phone call. I ventured to the other side of this large playground equipment with lots of climbable walls and tubes. I make sure he can't see me, but I know he watched me where I went. I texted a bunch of my friends from college, telling them what was going on and asking for advice. They told me to leave, but I knew he could see me and I didn't want him to follow. I started hitting up my friends from high school, hoping some might be home for the summer already. And luckily one of my friends was. I told her what was happening and asked if she could save me. She said she could, but that she couldn't make it for another 20 to 30 minutes, which was still well before the event ended. I went over to a different part of the playground where the swings were and took a seat where I could see the stage, hoping maybe he'd forget about me and leave me alone. Sure enough, the moment I sit, he's approaching the swings. He takes the one next to me and starts trying to be like, What did you want to know about me? What do you need to know? I was like, actually, I'm getting really tired. I am probably going to go home soon. I just want to enjoy the music a bit longer without talking. That was when he became adamant about walking me home. It was a suggestion at first, but the more I told him no and that I'd be fine, the more aggressive he got about it. My parents wanted to be home for another few hours, so if I did go home and followed, he'd know where I live and have me alone. He asked which direction I lived in and I pointed in the opposite direction of my parents' house. He got up and took a few steps in that direction, then turned back to me like he expected me to follow. I told him that I wasn't ready to go home, but it became very clear that if I was walking home that night, he was coming whether I wanted him to or not. He stayed near me for the next 10 minutes or so until my friend arrived. I saw her car pull up and immediately got to my feet like, hey, that's my friend, and I sped off towards her car. She parked and got out and started heading back towards the park. I was like, no, hey, we gotta go now, but it was too late. He followed me and touched my shoulder. He said, hey, wait, you promised to give me your number. I hadn't, but I felt rather trapped and figured that if I gave him a fake number, he'd be satisfied enough to let me leave. Sure enough, immediately after I spot it off, he calls it and starts looking at my phone, expecting it to ring. That's when my friend goes, hey, didn't your phone die? And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot, I'll get you later, man, text me. And I waved to him and we both sped walked back to her car. He didn't follow, but he watched us drive away. I told her to go to the opposite direction of my house and to take the long way around. So weird guy from the party that wanted to walk me home, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I am a 21 year old senior in college, living with three other girls in an old one story house. We are located about a 15 minute walk from main campus and the majority of our neighbors are college students. That being said, this town is notorious for being a little, well, sketchy. Millie is home to one of the first insane asylums built in America. After the majority of it being closed down slash abandoned for years, the final building was shut down about a month ago and the remaining patients were released. 
Now, I doubt this is directly correlated with my creepy experience, but I am not the only one who has interesting encounters with strangers since the release in this town. Two nights ago, after getting off work around 11.30, I came home to my roommates getting ready to go for a night out. I realize now how stupid it was, but we often had an open door policy, free for anyone to come over and visit as they please. We would lock the door at night, but the one time we forgot to really came to bite us. Around midnight, I was hopping in the shower as my roommates were heading out the door. We said our goodbyes and I told them I would be meeting up with them later. I had just stepped out of the shower when I heard what sounded like the front door slamming shut. I automatically assumed one of the girls had forgotten something, so I called out their names, no response. I then hear footsteps in the hallway. I call out again, no response. Fear and dread came over me, and I immediately grabbed my clothes and ran into my bedroom. I threw my clothes on, leaned my ear to the door, and waited in silence to hear if someone was in the house. I hear nothing. I decided that it must have been one of the roommates grabbing something and leaving again. So I head into the living room to get my phone. Six missed calls and it's still ringing. My roommate, Carrie, was on the other end. I answered and immediately could hear the panic in her voice. Lay, are you in the house? Me? Yes. Why? Carrie? You need to get out. Sam drove by and he said he saw a man walking through the front door. He called the police but you need to leave. Nothing was going through my head besides pure adrenaline and fear. I wasn't sure of the man's intentions but I sure wasn't going to wait and find out. While remaining on the phone with my roommate, I bolted out the front door and hid behind my car. I watched the house from afar, waiting anxiously to see any movement. As my friends approached in a truck, I sprinted out from behind my car and jumped in the back of their truck bed. Just as I did that, a dark figure scurried off into the woods running in the opposite direction. I can only assume he had been inching closer to as I was waiting for them to arrive. I screamed and we floored it out of there. I refused to go back into the house until the police arrived and had been triple checked. There were no signs of anything being touched or stolen, which makes me wonder what the man's intentions were. You can guarantee that I've locked my door every night since, and to the stranger who walked into my house while I was in the shower, let's not meet again. Back when I was 18 years old, I started working at a gas station. This was my first job. Near the end of my first shift, I was cleaning the hot dog rollers and a man walked in. He was rough looking, not in a bad way, but like he had been working outside all day. As soon as I set eyes on him, I got the gut feeling that I needed to stay away from him. Since I wasn't the one at the register, there was no reason for him to talk to me. However, the moment he saw me, he walked over and asked if I was new. I said yes, and he told me I was doing a good job and went on his way to check out. I noticed that he had a Jamaican accent which was weird to hear since I lived in Michigan. Honestly at that point, I thought that my gut was wrong about him. I was right the first time. During my next shift he once again came in and again I was cleaning. He came over to me and I still got the bad feeling in my gut. He asked me how my day was and I told him that it was okay. He then looked at my hand, I was wearing my high school class ring and I had put it on my left hand ring finger because I didn't want to scruff it up while cleaning with my right hand. He asked if I was married. I said no and I told him it was my class ring. He then asked if I was dating and I lied and said yes. He started asking me questions about my boyfriend, like how old he was, did I want to marry him, and if we were in a physical relationship. I told him I wasn't comfortable with answering that and he got mad but dropped the conversation. He would continue to ask me questions about my love life every time he would come in. After about a month and a half of this, I noticed that he would come in every day that I was working. This was weird because the days and hours that I worked changed from week to week. I asked my co-workers if he came in when I wasn't here and all of them said no. I also asked if any of them had told him what shifts I had been working but again they said no. This honestly freaked me out and I'd start to feel nervous when I would see his car pull in. One day he tried to give me his phone number and I politely told him that I wasn't interested in it. He got mad and was telling me that I needed to take it. My coworker at this point told him that he needed to leave. The next day he came in and asked me on a date and when I declined he told me that I was going to regret it. He asked me several more times and each time I said no. After a while of him asking I told him that it was never going to happen and that I had absolutely no interest in him and never would. This only made things worse. He told me that I didn't have a choice and that he would be here when I got off work and that I was going to go with him. When he left I called my father and told him what happened and asked if mom and he could come to pick me up at the end of my shift. He said yes. I didn't get off until midnight and about 10 minutes before my dad walked in and told me to act like I was going to go to my car as normal but he was going to be in there. A few minutes after the guy pulled in and got out of his car and was just standing there. As my shift was over, I hurriedly walked over to my car. He started approaching me and I jumped into the passenger seat and slammed the door shut. When he got to my door, my dad rolled down the window and pointed his gun at him. The man ran off and I thought that it was the end of it since he didn't come back into my work the next few days. However, it wasn't. About a week later, I was at the store with my mom when I got the feeling that someone was following us and sure enough it was him. We got out of there as fast as we could and from then on out, my mom and I were not allowed to leave without my dad. 
Everywhere I would go he would show up, even when I went to my friend's house who lived about a half hour from me. We caught him driving by the house several times. My mother also caught him following her several times, which freaked her out. We contacted the police and told them what was going on, but they said there wasn't enough evidence and that there was nothing they were able to do. To this day I am still mad at the police for not doing anything. He started coming back into my workplace and I asked my boss to ban him from the store but she said no. Later I would find out that they were friends and that is how he always knew when I was working. I also believe that she was the one to give him my phone number. Because it was around this time that I started receiving strange messages about how I looked, about my parents, and other creepy things. I got to the point where I was so paranoid that I wouldn't leave my house without my father. I had to have him drop me off and pick me up from work. And when I was at work any time I had seen a car that even somewhat looked like his, I would run and hide in the back room. Even my poor mother was paranoid and wouldn't go outside without someone with her. Finally, my father had enough and told me to quit my job and that he would help me pay the few bills that I had. Even after quitting my job, I was freaked out and decided to go stay with my aunt and uncle, who was a police officer, who live about 6 hours away from me. When I got there, it was the first time in nearly 6 months that I was able to relax. It didn't last for long. One night, my uncle and I went to pick up a pizza. Less than a minute after he walked in, the glass on my door was broken and hands were grabbing me. It was the Jamaican man and another guy. They got the door open and were pulling me out. I fought them as hard as I could. I got a few good hits on them, but it didn't do much good. Thankfully, my uncle came out and both of them ran after my uncle when he announced who he was and my uncle chased down the Jamaican man after I shot at which man he was. That day, he was arrested. Later on, I found out that he was illegally here and was deported. It took me about two years before I would go anywhere by myself. Honestly, it wasn't until I got my CPO that I was comfortable going places without someone with me. So Jamaican man, let's not meet again. I was in college and I lived in a house with five roommates. I lived on the second floor and the way it was set up is important. There were four bedrooms on the second floor and two bathrooms. Two of the bedrooms each shared a bathroom, which was accessible only by the bedrooms, not the hall. So I could walk through the bathroom into my roommate's room and vice versa. My door had both a handle lock and a deadbolt, which I used every single night because it was a habit I'd had since freshman year. Because in dorms, drunk roommates or floor mates tend to wander in and wreak havoc if you don't. The door to the bathroom, however, didn't have a lock, so I could never secure that. One of my roommates had her boyfriend visiting, and he'd brought a friend with him. I hadn't spoken to the friend or gotten to know him at all, and I didn't really have any opportunities to since I didn't hang out in any of the common areas of the house, and frequently didn't even sleep there because I was casually seeing someone at the time. My first interaction with him was about two days into his visit. I was coming home around 6am from the house of the guy I was seeing, and I walked into the living room. When I came in, the visitor was alone and shirtless in my kitchen, which is open to the living room. He didn't even say hello, he just angrily asked me, where were you, which I was taken aback by, because he sounded like a jealous boyfriend, but I told him I had been at my boyfriend's house and he said, you didn't tell me you had a boyfriend. Well of course I hadn't told him, I've never spoken to him. I made a weird face at him and went upstairs and didn't see him again for the rest of the day. I slept in my own room that same night, deadbolt secure. I woke up at around 7 in the next morning to him entering my room from the bathroom. Before I could say anything, he saw that he woke me up and said, sorry, I was looking for the bathroom. I replied, well, you're standing in it, so, and he retreated and closed the door. I didn't think much of it at the time because I was groggy and I just fell back to sleep. Now, despite all that, up to this point he didn't really creep me out, he just seemed weird. But later that day is when it got worse. I came home from my classes and went up to my room. He followed me and let himself into my room without knocking. The door had been closed, and I made it clear that that wasn't okay but he was being friendly, so we chatted normally for a couple of minutes because I didn't want to be rude. Then he decided to say, I think you're the one. The first moment I saw you, I knew you were the one and you're gonna marry me. Obviously, I was taken aback by this as this was only our third interaction and we'd spoken for maybe two minutes total. I told him that I had no interest in marrying him, that I wasn't even attracted to him, and told him to leave me alone now. I decided to leave and called the guy I was seeing and told him what was going on and he told me I could stay over at his house until this weirdo left. A couple of days go by and the weirdo was supposed to have left for good, so I went back to my house. I slept in my room that night with the door locked as usual. I woke up to hear someone trying to come in through my main door, but thought it was just one of my many roommates. Then, I hear the bathroom door open and someone walking into my room. I rolled over and he was standing maybe a foot away from my bed and said, Hey beautiful, where have you been? I said, weren't you supposed to leave? Why are you in my room? He said, I wanted to wait for you to come home. I couldn't leave without saying goodbye. And then he tried to climb into my bed with me and kept touching me while saying, Scoot over, I want to say goodbye properly. To which I started yelling. 
Get out of my room. I didn't invite you in. Leave now. I smacked his hands away from me and he got upset but left without much of a fight. I immediately left my house and went to my boyfriend's. The guy did finally leave later that morning. The next day, despite me yelling profanities at him and telling him how creepy he was when I last seen him in my bedroom, the guy still decided to find me on Facebook and try to add me. Nope, blocked immediately. So, creepy guy, let's not meet again. This is back in November of 2018 and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time. My family and I just moved across states. We had just gotten to the city where we planned on living after a long road trip. We were all hungry so decided to go grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us, we hadn't moved into our house yet. We decided to eat in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family so I finished way before them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business. We were standing just a little ways up from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground. I grew up in Florida so I wasn't used to seeing piles of autumn leaves, so it was just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings. When a man taps on my shoulder, my dog notices him and immediately tries to jump on him as she does with anyone, so I pull her back while I'm backing away from him. He looks to me in his mid 40s to 50s, he smiles creepily at me like it was forced. He says in his scruffy southern voice, you have my dog, my border collie. Immediately a red flag goes off in my mind, as my dog looks very obviously like a boxer, nothing like a border collie. I just say nervously, I think you're mistaken sir, this is my dog. Not even telling him how my dog does not look anything like he was describing. I look over to my parents car that was just a couple feet ahead of me, unsure of what to do. They hadn't even noticed the men approach me. They were on their phones. The man now asked me, well you would be able to come help me look for my dog, right? I can feel my stomach drop in that moment. I still don't want to make a scene as I'm probably overreacting. He then says something along the lines of, I have some money in my truck for you if I went with him. My hands are sweating at this point. He points over to a very sketchy, run down looking truck. I tell him I'm busy and I have to go, but best of luck to finding his dog. Still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now, I don't know why I didn't tell him my parents were right there. If I would have, I think he would have backed off. He then decides to grab my dog's leash and says he has dog treats at his truck and starts to walk away with my dog. I pull the leash away from him and say sternly, I have to go now. As I start walking away, he then grabs my wrist and rips the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He starts pulling me with him, mumbling something like, just come see what I have for you. My dog, the sweet girl she is, follows after us and starts barking. While he starts to drag me with him, I am pretty small 5 foot 4 and have no upper body strength, so I just start screaming to let go of me. My parents are alarmed, hearing me scream and our dog chasing after me barking, see this man pulling their daughter against their will. They immediately start sprinting after me. I start screaming, Mom, Dad. I think he got alarmed when he heard me yell out Mom, as she starts running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in their car the whole time. He makes a run for it and we didn't run after him. My parents were just glad they had me. This is definitely not a good way to start off our new life in North Carolina, not even have lived there a day yet. I do not wish this to ever happen to anyone, as it was terrifying, but my advice is for you, don't be afraid to use your words, even if they offend the person. I like to begin by describing myself, because I believe it's relevant to the story. I'm 25, male, and a bit above average height. I have been doing sports 5-6 to six times a week since I've graduated high school, gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break in my boots last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my granddad's birthday and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots are overkill for these woods, but I needed to try them. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It rained just the day before, so I expected a fair amount of mud and not so many people as they were easy scared off by the weather. Since the summer was extremely hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not so distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and she doesn't enjoy long distance walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up I would be doing the hike alone. The first half of the hike was perfect, the altitude difference along the trail is minimal, I barely broke a sweat and I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most 6-7 to seven people during the first 2-3 to three hours. 
and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks. There are deer and wild boars in these woods, nothing more menacing, not animals anyway, but I won't get ahead of myself. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. This road is asphalt, but deep in the forest and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I heard a car approach from behind me. It went past me, not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older, green SUV with a fresh registration. You could tell by the license plate. Probably an import. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time. Then I heard it come back. It drove me past for the second time, now very slowly, and I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble beard game going on as well. I assumed they were gamekeepers, even though their cars have a crest on the hood and on both front doors. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things, I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this, they have jeeps which are more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort, and again, I thought nothing of it. Then, my trail left the asphalt road and began snaking in the woods again. I walked ahead sincerely, gazing at trees and whatnot. Then, I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. An engine sound was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point, the trail was quite narrow, but if, for whatever reason, you want to drive a car in it, you could, just about. Now when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver, who was staring back, as I can only assume as he was wearing sunglasses. I calmly asked him, what's wrong, shall I let you go, in a polite tone as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing, and he soon disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that he was alone in the car, unlike earlier. I listened intently, standing still, since I wasn't sure what was going on. At this point, I was not scared, but there was a faint feeling of unease in the air, and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car and the engine stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I turned around and began walking towards my destination, at a much faster pace than before. Now I was a bit scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again, or to see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for these unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to use the bathroom. I saw a perfect spot, a very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up to it and began peeing. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I also had a sip of water. I had been camping there for a good few minutes before I headed back at the trail from where I deviated to pee. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I thought to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind, absolutely nothing. This made me realize, just a moment later, how alone I was. Except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail, in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back on the trail, since the small one to the tower was well hidden by trees and you couldn't see the main trail, as it was running perpendicularly to the small one. I looked at him and I was instantly chilled to the very bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing, with a baseball hat on his head. The only reason he was standing still, I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident with the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail thinking he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV from which the second man was missing, something in me snapped instantly. In hindsight, it's also illegal to hunt in these woods this time of year. I figured in the matter of two seconds that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion, towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right, it's the best call I will ever have made. He began running towards me, adrenaline blossoming within me, and began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was exhausted. It must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for a signal, but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while I began power walking, but still off trail straight ahead in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone got a signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me too seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot. You must have misunderstood the situation. 
Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this rather large forest. It felt like an eternity, but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to the station near my car, rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in and drove home. My dog welcomed me like I was coming back from a two year deployment. Dogs are just amazing, she must have felt that something shook me up. The boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for long periods of time. I called the forest gameskeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I come across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs, like 99.9% .9 of the time they are alone. I told them my story and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me that the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been reading local news but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet. I really hope nothing will be reported either. Gentlemen in the empty forest at lunchtime, let's not meet again. This happened a couple years ago. In 2016, I had just turned 18 and was in my second semester of community college. I was lucky to get to take a few specialized classes that were requirements for my major. These classes required me to drive about 45 minutes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to the main campus of my community college system. This is relevant because I was going to a town that I didn't know much about and didn't know anyone who lived there. There was a man in my class named Eddie. He was a big guy in his late 40s. We spent a lot of time in the lab for these classes and he was stationed right across from me. I was a bit more naive and unsuspecting at the time and wanted to be nice so I talked with him and my other classmates quite a bit. It was a lot friendlier to him than I would be nowadays. He started being overly friendly to me and would stand too close and ask too many personal questions. He'd flirt with me in class to the point it seemed to make other people uncomfortable to watch. He also started staring at me a lot with an intense look that scared me. Of course, being young and not wanting to hurt his feelings, I decided to ignore it as best as I could. I told my boyfriend about it, but again, Eddie hasn't actually done anything to me so there wasn't a lot I felt like I could do. A few weeks after that started, all of us were hanging out in a small break room type area, studying for an exam in our next class, which was about 30 minutes away. I was sitting at one table chatting with some middle aged women in my class, and Eddie was at the next table over messing with his phone. I noticed that I was going to get something from the vending machine and stood up. As I did, he tried and failed to discreetly turn his phone toward me and snapped pictures of me as I walked in the machine, got my drink, and bent over to pick it up. I realized what was going on as I was walking back to my seat with him still taking photos and I shot him a look. He put his phone away and just sat there staring at me. I was trying to look pissed but honestly I was just really freaked out. I excused myself from the table and called my boyfriend near tears, telling him what happened. He was angry and said that I need to tell someone but I said no, I didn't want to make a scene. He tried to comfort me as much as he could but I had to go to class soon afterwards. Our last class finished at about 9pm and since it was January, it was completely dark out when we all walked to our cars. I was actually texting one of my guy friends about what had happened when Eddie walked up to my car, stopped for a second and looked at me through my windshield, then slowly kept walking, watching me through my driver's side window the whole time. He was parked nowhere near me and the windshield was below zero so he had to have made a point to walk by my car like that. I was terrified and with my hands shaking I started my car and drove home as fast as I could, calling my boyfriend on the way and crying. After that, I decided I needed to talk to my professor about what was going on. I was so nervous, but I asked her the next week if I could talk to her privately when class was over. We went to her office and I told her about Eddie and what he had done and how he acted weird toward me. She told me that she had noticed tensed up and went quiet when he got close to me, and had noticed paying a lot of attention to me and told me she believed me about the pictures. She was honestly amazing with how she handled it. She promised me that she would move things around where I'd be away from him in the lab and asked if I wanted her to talk to him about it. I said no, that I didn't want to make him angry and she said that she'd respect that, but she was going to have the security guard stand at the door and watch me go to my car every night and that she'd tell the program director what was going on but Eddie wouldn't know that I had talked to her. By the time we had got done it had been around 30 minutes since class had ended and she offered to walk me outside. I'm glad that she did because when we came out the elevator to the first floor, Eddie was sitting there in the foyer alone. Everyone else had gone home. My blood ran cold but I tried to act as normal as I could. He seemed as surprised to see a professor there as she was to see him. She asked why he was still here and he said he noticed my car was still parked out front and wanted to make sure I didn't have to walk out by myself. I'm pretty sure I was as pale as a ghost but my professor gave him a look that I couldn't read and said not to worry. She's walking me to my car from now on and the security guard will be there every night. He said that was good and quickly said goodnight and left. It still chills me to think about what could have happened if my professor didn't walk me down to my car that night. I have no idea what he was capable of doing. After this, she rearranged our seating, made sure we were never grouped together, and I started making sure I walked out to my car at the same time as a few other women in my class. 
The security guard was usually in the foyer and we only had a couple months left of class, so there weren't really any other incidents, but I still caught him staring at me sometimes and he looked like pure rage. It's been a few years and I don't go to that school anymore and I'm moving to a completely different city soon. But Eddie, let's not meet again. I recently ran into an old coworker from our time we worked at the sandwich shop in the truck stop. We chatted for a while before he had to leave, but I started thinking about my stint at that place, specifically the creepy sandwich guy. In college, I worked some overnights at the truck stop. It was a pretty safe place in a smaller town, and there had only been three incidents in the four years the place had been open before I got hired in. One trucker got robbed, one group of ladies arrested for, servicing the truckers, and one OD. I was never really worried, even though my coworkers seemed a little concerned that I was a young girl working overnights at a truck stop when there was only one other employee in the whole place. Usually it was really slow, most of the time I'd get 3 or 4 truckers come in within the first hour, a couple people came in with the munchies and ordered 3 dozen cookies one time, but usually it was maybe 1 or 2 people an hour, if that, so I'd spend about 3 hours cleaning ovens, finishing dishes, deep cleaning the lobby, that kind of thing. And then I get to spend whatever time between customers doing homework. The overnight boss on the other side, the gas station side, was cool as long as everything was cleaned and tipped regularly. A few weeks before I inevitably left this place, a guy came in about 20 minutes before my shift was over. So it's about 5am by this point. My coworker had arrived early so he could fill out some paperwork he had to get done. So he was sitting in the back office already. I started making this customer sandwich, making chit chat like usual. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He told me he was driving from New York to Wisconsin, asked me a little bit about how my night had been. Nothing crazy. I wrapped up his sub, rang it up, and threw in a small discount for him since he seemed nice and I was just happy I was getting ready to go home for a few hours of sleep before I headed to campus. When I went to take his change, things went wrong. He dropped the coins in my hand, but suddenly he had his grip tight around my wrist. The next thing I knew, I'm on the other side of the counter on the floor. He had yanked me across the counter and still had a tight grip around my wrist. Thank god my coworker was there. The manager on the other side had slipped into the bathroom, so to this guy's knowledge I was the only one there at the moment. But my coworker, while filling out his papers, was looking at the cameras and had seen everything. He was out of the back just seconds after I hit the ground, and before I really knew what was going on, he had chased the guy outside. He didn't pursue him far, afraid that someone else was nearby who would come after me. So he ran back inside, locked the door to our side of the store and shouted to the manager to call the police. The cops came, they searched the area and watched the security videos, but nothing ever came from it. The guy disappeared and I never really heard anything about him. I put in my two weeks notice the following day after my nerves had calmed down. I was switched around so I worked during the day around my classes for my last few days, and they made it a policy that two people were to be working both sides of the truck stop and overnights from that point on. I still live about an hour and a half away from there, and honestly I haven't went back since my last day just because that memory is still in my mind almost 8 years later. So creepy sub guy, let's not meet again. This took place about 8 years ago. I had been single for a very long time. My kids kept telling me to get back into the swing of things, but I just kept making excuses. My nephew told me about this dating site. He said that there was no harm in talking to people, so I did it. I put everything out there so there were no surprises when or if they met me. I thought that if they still contacted me after reading all I had described myself and we matched, then maybe I would have coffee with them. I met with one gentleman who was way too regimental for my crazy life and kindly declined any more involvement with him. Another guy seemed too pushy and acted like I should be honored to be in his presence, but then there came, we will call him Richard. Now please keep in mind I had very low self esteem at the time. That being said, Richard seemed great. We carried on conversations for hours. He lived an hour and a half away, so all we could really do was talk to each other. We talked about our kids, dreams, goals, my daughter even friended one of his sons on Facebook. I was a secretary for some self-help meetings in my town, and he was going to school to be a counselor. Perfect, right? We talked for at least four months, but after a while, I noticed that he kept having small problems come up. Arguments with his mom with whom he was living, no money for gas, his truck broke down, his oldest boy was mad at him, just little things, you know? Not anything that would set me off, but it was his poor me to heck with it attitude. I tried to let that go and really be a positive influence in his life. His mother and boys loved me and told me that they had never seen him so happy. Time went on and we were still talking every day. I had an opportunity to come see him and of course, my daughter went with me so she could meet his son in person as well. I took him and his son out to eat at the only little coffee shop in that town. He knew I was on a fixed income but I paid anyway because he was going to school and didn't have an income as of yet. We had a good time. We met at his son's house on a hilltop town. We were having such a good time that we didn't notice that the snow was coming down hard and the roads were icing up so my daughter and I stayed the night in one of the rooms. It seemed like the closer we got to his family, the more distant they became to him. It was odd. The next day the roads were clear so we said our goodbyes and went home but before we left I received one extra hug from his son's mother-in-law. She whispered in my ear, don't fall for him. 
I thought that maybe there was something she didn't like about me. That came out of the left field. The next few days we didn't talk. I thought that was odd. Did I do something wrong? Someone from the self-help meeting told me that there was a man looking for me. She said he looked disheveled and smelled like alcohol. This wasn't a surprise to me because I helped quite a few people get back on their feet and maybe this one fell off the wagon and just needed to talk. As I was driving down my street, I saw a truck in my driveway I didn't recognize at first. It was him. He found out where I lived and was sitting in the front of my house. At first I was happy until I looked in his truck and saw him slumped over reeking of booze. At that point my fixed mood set in and I asked him in for some strong coffee. He told me that he had a blowout with his mother and she kicked him out and his boys won't talk to him. I got him some clean clothes and told him to take a shower. I figured we could sort it out the next day, in the meantime I was taking him to a meeting. He sobered up and agreed to go but the whole time at the meeting my friends were acting like I had lost my mind. Did they see something I was blind of? He went back to my house and he seemed okay, almost 2k like nothing at all happened. My son pulled me aside and told me he didn't like him much but I thought that maybe he was just being overprotective. I should have paid more attention. We went to the store because I wasn't prepared for the extra mouth and I bought 4 2 liters of soda, a gallon of milk, and 2 monsters for both of him and my son, some chips and other things for dinner. After we ate we all watched some TV and headed off to bed. I let him sleep on the spare bed in my room but in the middle of the night he tried to get frisky. At that point no, my grown kids were in the other room and something just didn't sit well with me, like he wasn't the same man he was before. The next morning my daughter came running out of the bathroom angry. She said in a loud voice, someone peed all over the toilet. He didn't say a word. Later we were all eating breakfast and he started to let food drop out of his mouth onto the table and floor and was spitting food while he was talking. He took three two liters and drank them back to back letting some run down his chin. Then, yes there is more, he took the remote and started to set future recordings for his favorite shows and deleting a few of my grandchildren's. He set recordings for weeks in advance. Wait, 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 what are you doing my friend? This is not cool. I told him but he acted like I said nothing. Then he went to the refrigerator and told me that I had to go to the store and buy more soda and stuff because it was all gone. Like it was gone. He even drank my son's monster and the whole gallon of milk. One day mind you, only one. At this point my daughter was also livid so she contacted his son and he proceeded to tell her that Richard's mother kicked him out because he wouldn't get a job and was stealing money and eating her out of house and home. His other son won't talk to him because he keeps asking for money and won't pay it back. He himself was mad at him for lying to me by telling him that he was going to school when he wasn't and using me as his next big meal ticket. Well that was it. I got all of his stuff together and took it to his truck and asked him to leave. It doesn't end there. He had loosened some bolts on his transmission making it impossible to move. He begged and pleaded for me to let him stay. He was at that point snot was coming out of his nose. He said that he just wanted to be close to me and if that meant sleeping in his truck he would do that and he couldn't live without me. Well no, I called his oldest son and told him that if they didn't come with a tow truck and get their dad his fate was not going to be nice. They arrived two hours later apologizing for their father's actions. We found out that through his son that for many years he had gone through quite a few unhealthy relationships and took advantage of a lot of women that fell for his lies. He still tries to friend me on Facebook to this day. When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We've always celebrated this as a family holiday rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to a florist, but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital boasting a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by my lonesome, cutting across campus to walk through a network of side roads populated with specialty doctors' offices that kept odd hours. The sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly hold surgery consultations or perform small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. As I was walking back through said deserted roads with a vase of flowers in a tow, I noticed an unkept 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of the car is hazy, I am left with the impression that there were at least two men within whose faces I could not see. Initially, I assumed that the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason they weren't passing by, so I made a point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them that they could drive safely ahead. They still refused to pass me by, continuing to creep along behind at a slow pace. Beginning to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than a destination, I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed. Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of spilling water from my vase, I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could. They hit the gas and again matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me, that there was no one in sight to notice, and I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot that I saw. The car turned in after me. Despite there being only two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot and there being no other set of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park in the numerous spaces available there. The driver instead opted to pursue me in the partially under construction back portion of this lot, behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction, coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet 
feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small prominence of rubble against my back. Face in hand, it jumped from its peak to land painfully on the other side, which fortunately was a plot of undeveloped land within sight of my high school campus. I took a quick peek back over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after it reached the top of the rubble pile and was nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all. They had no business there. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed and didn't stop until I was soaked with sweat in the dead of winter and panting in the student lounge on one of my classmates, who didn't seem to care when I told them. In retrospect, I should have told an adult, alerted campus security, and called the non-emergency line at the local police station, but I was young, foolish, insecure, and afraid of getting in trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have a signed permission from permitting me to do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation or was overreacting. I don't know what I would have even told the police had I called them, as I was entirely ignorant of the subject of cars and I couldn't have identified the make of it if I had been asked, and I couldn't see the faces of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited free if they knew I had been in any danger. Whoever followed and tried to trap a 16-year-old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day of 2016, let's not meet again. So when I was in probably second or third grade, we had an early dismissal. For those of you who don't know, that's when school goes for longer than half a day but we still get out an hour or so early. I remember sitting silently in class working on math problems when the phone rang. I joked to my friend next to me that I hoped it was for me. We all watched the teacher answer the phone because we knew that 90% of the time it meant someone was leaving class. When the teacher's eyes met with mine, I suddenly got pretty worried. My teacher said something into the phone and then asked me, when are you getting off the bus today? I thought this was really weird. My mom knew I would be getting home because she had to leave work early so she'd be home when I got home. I just told the teacher the normal time. The teacher talked for a few more seconds and then hung up the phone. I asked her what it was about and she told me that my parent just wanted to double check what time I got off the bus. I didn't really think about it too much for the rest of the day. Later I got off the bus and walked home without incident. When I walked in the front door my mom asked me about my dad and took my coat. I remember the look on her face when I asked her, why did you call the school to see what time I was getting off the bus? She looked shocked. She said that she hadn't called the school. I told her the whole story and she immediately started making frantic phone calls. I knew that something was wrong. I watched some TV while my mom talked. About 20 minutes later, my stepdad came home early from work. About 10 minutes after that, a state trooper pulled up. I was pretty scared because I thought that somehow I was in trouble. The state trooper asked me a few questions like, Has anyone tried to talk to you while you've walked from the bus stop? Have you seen anyone parked at the bus stop who didn't have a kid get into their car? Has anyone tried giving you a ride? The answer to all of his questions was no. I had never seen anyone suspicious as we lived in a pretty nice neighborhood and it was mostly old retired folk who live around us. My mom asked me to go upstairs to pack my bag as it was my dad's weekend for visitation. When my dad got there to pick me up, he was questioned pretty heavily by the state trooper. I had been eavesdropping from upstairs. My mom called me back down and I left with my dad for the weekend. My dad ended up teaching some basic self-defense, which I thought was pretty cool. I never heard anything about the situation and eventually I forgot about it. Fast forward to today. I was watching a horror movie when I then remembered the whole incident. I asked my mom about it and what she told me chilled me to the core. She told me that someone had called my school posing as my dad. This man knew my dad's full name, my full name, and my mom's full name. He kept saying that my mother wanted him to pick me up from the bus stop because she wasn't going to be able to leave work early. The school didn't even bother calling my mother. I believe that the only thing that saved me from being abducted was the fact that I had told the man that I'd be getting off the bus at the normal time, which was around 3.15. I had actually gotten off the bus at around 1.45. So creepy guy who wanted to abduct me, let's not meet. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For context, I am a 19 year old girl and was taking summer classes at a community college this summer. One of the classes I took was public speaking, which met Tuesdays and Thursdays. This guy, I don't even know his name, immediately gave off weird vibes. To get from our classroom that was on the second floor, he had to go down a hallway, down a stairwell to the first floor, through the main lobby, and out the sliding doors. He started waiting for me after class and followed me all the way down this route to my car. Didn't matter if I pretended to be on the phone, had both earbuds in, kept my head down, literally power walked away from him, gave him bare minimum responses, etc. He would wait for me, follow me slash try to walk with me, and the whole way would be talking to me and asking me questions, like asking me about each of the cars I drove to the school since my family has to share cars. Even after I suddenly dropped I had a boyfriend, so he definitely knows my car. I got a very bad feeling after a while of this happening and told the class's professor. She immediately took it seriously, notified camp security, and told me to always stay after class so she could walk me to my car. 
However, true to form, the guy stopped showing up to class for at least two weeks or so, so I thought it was fine and that the crisis was averted. And it was, until one day he showed up to class again. As soon as I saw him enter the room, my heart dropped. During this class, I slipped a note to my professor telling her he's the kid in the blue shirt, and she told me to hang around after class. I did, and so did the guy and another female student. Before he tried to talk to the professor about why he should pass the class despite never showing up or doing the work, the professor asked me and the other girl to wait in the hall. From the hall, we could hear him yelling aggressively at the professor. He eventually left and came out into the hallway we were waiting in and pointed at me and said, wait for me. Mind you, I have no idea who this kid is. I instantly got the creeps and rushed back into the room to tell my professor, who was equally creeped out. Having overheard our conversation, the other female student came back into the room approximately 10 minutes later and told me and the professor that the guy was just standing in the hall waiting for me. The professor called campus security multiple times, phoned the front desk multiple times, but she received no responses. So, we took it to our own hands and came up with a plan to leave the classroom together, pretending to be in a very deep conversation with each other, walk past the guy without even looking at him, and walk down the stairwell to the main lobby. His eyes bore into us as we passed him, and we entered the stairwell he stood up and followed us. The professor and I exchanged looks of terror but kept her cool act up, stopping at the main desk in the lobby and pretending to converse with the secretary. The guy passed us, still staring at us, and walked out the sliding doors where he was out of our field of vision. We literally had to track down the campus security ourselves and tell them everything that had happened, and my professor was furious. After we saw security camera footage of him lurking around, she contacted the local police because she and I both had that very strong gut feeling that this kid was not right and that we weren't safe around him. So that public speaking class was from 3 to 5 p.m. and I had another class from 6 to 8 p.m. So I would usually drive to Wawa or something in that hour gap. However, there was no way I was going anywhere because I knew the guy was waiting for me to do so. For over an hour, we, me, the professor, security, and secretary, tried to figure out who this kid was. None of us knew his name because he literally didn't come to class, there weren't photo IDs next to the class roster, and approximately half the original class stopped showing up so we couldn't use process of elimination. All we had was the security footage of him. I was escorted to and from my next class into my car at the end of the night. The security officer asked me to point out my car and when I did he said, oh wow, so he was parked right next to you. Confused, I asked what he meant and he told me that he had been watching more security footage and the guy got into the car parked right next to me, waited in there for a long time and then eventually left. The thing is, I knew for a fact that I hadn't parked next to anyone when I arrived at the school because the lot was practically empty since it was summer. After finally getting home that night, I was the only person home for a few weeks, go figure. Local police did drive-bys by my home all night in a well check. When I returned to the school two days later for my Thursday classes, I was informed of chilling information. Footage showed him waiting for me in his car on Tuesday after our shared class, which I had already been told, but it also showed him coming back to the parking lot at around 8pm when my last class got out and sitting in his car. I never told him about my schedule or any other classes I was taking. This whole time, my public speaking professor was filing reports, making complaints against the school for their incompetency, and even got a lawyer because she felt so uneasy about the kid that if he showed up again, she would walk out. I was in contact with the president of the entire college, the director of security of the entire college, police, etc. for days. They told me that he was banned from campus and everyone was on watch for him, and that if he was spotted he would be asked to leave until the director of campus security, middle-aged man, called me and told me that he identified the kid and talked to him, via telephone call, mind you. And he told me that the guy, and I quote, just wanted to be my friend, and told me that whatever I was doing with the guy, you know, literally running away from him, probably made him think I was flirting with him. My professors were absolutely furious and excused me from physically attending class for the rest of the semester. I still don't know his name, and I hope I never have to learn it. My new year resolution 2012 was to get in shape again. After my first kid was born, I lost my athletic interest but I had every intention of getting it back. So I started running 4 days a week with my friend Hannah who is a great runner slash motivator. We would run after work, 5-10km, to 10 kilometers, usually favoring the forest trail. It's the kind of trail that got lighting in the darker months of the year so you could run there anytime really. Once you turn on the lights, you got 45 minutes to run the shorter trails, and longer to run the longer ones. Then the lights shut off automatically. We had been running for about 2 months when we started seeing the same man hanging around the parking lot every time we got there. Thin man, 25 to 30 years of age, always dressed in sports clothes but never actually running. He never looked you in the eye either. We speculated that he could be homeless camping nearby because he was constantly there. We got used to seeing him, sitting somewhere close by, silently and always on his own. We felt sorry for him, he never seemed to talk to anyone or interact at all, but there was something about him that made us hesitate to talk to him or ask if he was okay. Can't pinpoint what it was, but something wasn't completely right with him. 
One evening Hannah didn't make it to our run and I decided to go on my own. I arrived at the parking lot, my car being the only car there. I did some stretching, turned on the lights, and set off on the 5 kilometer trail. I hadn't seen the thin silent man when I started my run. Perhaps it was getting too cold to sit there now since it was autumn, dark, and getting closer to the freezing point. He must have been here though, somewhere in the shadows, because when I got to the top of the first steep hill, I could hear heavy breathing somewhere behind me. I look over my shoulder and I see him. He is running like a man obsessed. In regular shoes, not running shoes, with his arms moving in a really strange, stiff manner as he was made of metal. His hands like arrows, straight in an upward inward angle, sort of like a sprinter but more extreme, moving like a robot. He had never done anything to harm me or anyone else as far as I knew, but the look in his eyes alone was enough to let me know that I needed to go. I started running faster, trying to create distance between us and I could hear his heavy breathing getting even more strained. I ran like my life depended on it, adrenaline pumping through my body and giving me new strength. I tore off my necklace and threw it on the ground thinking, I must leave a trace if he takes me, something must be left behind. I tried screaming, hoping someone would be close enough to hear me, but I couldn't scream my lungs out and keep up the phase at the same time. He was still behind me, maybe 100 meters behind now, but I figured that if I trip and fall, or run out of energy, or fumble with the car keys once I reach the parking lot, then I'm screwed. So once I reached the sharp turn on the trail, I went off the trail and ran straight into the dark woods. I ran only a short distance and then I laid down flat on my stomach, my hands searching for a rock to defend myself with if he found me. I realized that I was wearing bright running clothes with reflexes and neon coloring. I had ever felt so visible in the dark before. I could hear him reach the turn and thankfully he kept on running. I started to move slowly and as silently as possible moved further into the darkness. My heart sank again as soon as I heard rapid footsteps closing in from the trail. He realized that I must have got off the trail once he saw that there was no sign of me ahead. He stopped and I stopped. I could imagine him listening for any sound and I held my breath and prayed to make him go away. After a while I heard him say something in a language I didn't recognize and walk off. I didn't move. I feared that he would wait for me by the car and realize that I had to get off the trail and onto the main road and stop someone. I couldn't go back to the parking lot. I started to make my way further into the woods, knowing that I would eventually end up on the last part of the long trail and close to the main road. The lights on the trail suddenly shut off. That made me calmer at first, the dark was a comfort and protection, but then, after only a few moments, it switched on again. This could mean that another person had just started their run, and soon I would have someone there to help me, or that he was out looking for me. I decided against waiting to find out, and continued my way towards the main road. It was dark and I fell multiple times, my clothes getting wet from the damp vegetation and I started to get cold. After what felt like a lifetime, I could see the 10 kilometer trail ahead and I knew I was close to the main road. Soon I could hear the traffic. Once I made it to the road, I must have looked like I had been in a terrible accident. Blood from several small cuts from the falling and my clothes dirty. My bright runner shirt soon attracted the attention of a passing car. My waving and desperate shouting made it stop. The driver, a 40-ish man with his two kids in the back seat, spent the next 10 minutes or so trying to make sense of what I tried to say between the sobbing and the crying. He asked if I wanted to lift back to the parking lot and I told him no, please take me home instead. At home, my husband insisted on going to the parking lot to retrieve the car and calling the police. My husband went back for the car. The driver's seat window was smashed and my phone was gone. So was the photo of my daughter that I had been hanging from the mirror. I don't know what he was trying to do or why he chased me the way he did, but the look in his eyes, there was no doubt he had bad intentions. So creepy forest trail man, let's never meet again. This is a story from when I was 18, I'm 25 now. My mom and I were regular attendees of our local church. We both attended different midweek groups. I met with some of the younger ones and my mom went to one with some of the middle aged people. Anyway, my mom's group was about half a mile from our house and we didn't own a car so she would often walk there on our own. For the 7.30 start, this was fine in summers because it wasn't getting dark until around 9ish. When her group ended at 10, she would call me and I would start walking slash running to meet her to walk her home. We would usually meet not too far away from her group but we would always stay on the phone until we met. On the night in question, all was usual, she called, I got my trainers on, and locked the house and began jogging to meet her. I usually ran because it was good training for my rugby. In order to meet my mom, I had to cross over local park and go through a dark patch of trees behind some of the local houses. It was usually just before these trees that we met. Anyway, I'm running and my mom's walking. We are talking about her evening and who was there when she suddenly says, Joe, hurry up, I think someone's following me. My heart rate goes through the roof and I start to panic, so I start sprinting still with some way to go until I meet her. I tell her to stay calm and keep her updated on my position. My mom is tough, but short. I hear my mom scream through the phone and also hear it in the distance ahead. Get away from me, what do you want? I don't have any money and you can have my phone if you want. This panicked me. I ran like I had never run before. The distance I had to cover usually took me a good 45 to 60 seconds to run, but I did it so much faster. By now I can see them in the distance. My mom's screams were piercing through me. 
I could see the guy has her by the hair and is dragging her about. She was fighting him all the way. I shouted get off of my mom and charged in. He was tall and lean but had hardly any weight to him. What happened next is something of a blur and only through me and my mom talking about it have we come to some conclusion on what really happened. And the guy's injuries of course. He saw me and immediately let go of her. She fell to the ground sobbing and tried to run. I caught him fairly easy and took him to the ground hard. My mom says I took him clean off the ground before smashing his head slash shoulder into the ground. He grunted and we rolled but I beat him up. It's at this point that I blank out but apparently I hopped over the guy, headbutted him and repeatedly beat his face. Someone from the house was behind and had heard the screams and called the police. One guy from the street was a policeman and had come out to investigate. I remember him dragging me off the guy and it was then that I saw the blood and scratch marks on my arms. He had called me but I hadn't noticed it. The police arrived quickly and we had to be interviewed by them which is all still a bit blurry. Apparently the off duty cop had thought I was the attacker as I suppose anyone would have seen me beat up the guy. The guy was on their records as a thief. He had mugged a girl in town not that long before. When police interviewed him he claimed that he was just robbing her but I'm not sure. He's in prison now thankfully. You never think a bad stuff will happen to the ones you love until it happens. So, guy who attacked my mom, let's not ever meet again. In 2012, I worked at a tanning salon in a strip mall. It was across the street from a Walmart that was always crawling with strange people. The strip mall that my salon was located in was poorly lit at night. There was a sushi restaurant and an auto zone, but other than that, the other stores were vacant. We were open until 10pm while the other two businesses closed around 8 or 9. The salon was never overwhelmingly busy, so there was always only one person working at a time. My best friend also worked at the company, and the salon she worked at was a 50 minute drive from mine. This detail is important later. I'm a night owl, so I worked the 3 to 10 p.m. shift every weeknight. At some point in time, I started getting strange phone calls at 8 p.m. every night. It started off strange, but nothing to be alarmed about. The first time he called went something like this. Caller, hi, I am conducting a survey on women's shopping habits and I figured calling a tanning salon run by women would be a good place to start. We also send out a gift if you participate in our surveys. Okay, caller, do you typically wear jeans, yoga pants, leggings, skirts, shorts, or dresses? Feel free to list which of each you wear. Me, I wear all of those. Caller, great. Now when you wear dresses or skirts, do you ever wear pantyhose? Me, not unless it's winter. Caller, so how many tights or pantyhose do you own? Me, I have no idea, like five. Caller, that is great, so would you be interested in us sending you some free pantyhose? Me, I'm not really interested, I don't wear them enough to care. Caller, okay, totally understand. Would it be okay if I call you for a survey in the future? Me, sure. Caller, when do you typically work? Me, every weeknight. Caller, okay, great, talk soon. I shouldn't have given some random person my work schedule but they were already calling my job so there was no denying this person could find me if they wanted. Honestly, I didn't think anything weird about the call at the time. Later in the month we had a store meeting and the weekend sales associate said she had gotten a few weird calls from a guy breathing heavily and asking her questions. She didn't go into detail so I didn't make a connection. The next few times he called me it seemed normal enough. One survey was on skirts and skirt length and brands. The next was about dresses and their links and brands. He kept offering to send me pantyhose though. I kept telling him I don't wear them. He always said okay I just want to make sure I am offering them after every call as it is protocol. Then the last survey he called to have me do really scared me. Caller, when you wear dresses and skirts, do you wear panties? Me, yes. Caller, what material are they? Silk, satin, cotton, lace? Me, I'm not really comfortable with this. I think I'm done with the surveys. Caller, come on, I just want to know what you wear under that dress. I'll bring you some panties and nylons right now. Me, no thank you, please do not come here, goodbye. I hung up and freaked out. I called my friend at the other salon and told her about what just happened. She told me the same guy had been calling her location trying to talk to girls about pantyhose and panties too. She said he had even described to one girl what she was doing while she was on the phone with him. The salon she worked at had glass front windows with a desk facing toward the window. My salon also had a glass store front with the desk faced the wall. The next few nights were not great. He realized we weren't picking up the calls anymore unless he blocked the number. We had to answer blocked calls because if it was another customer and they complained, we would be in trouble. He started changing up the time of night he called, spoofy numbers, etc. His calls were getting creepier and creepier. Heavy breathing, telling us what we were wearing, saying he was picturing our panties. Really creepy stuff. I was afraid to be at work. I made sure to be on the phone with my friend from the other salon every night for my last hour or so. One day though, the calls just stopped. My salon had a waiting area by the desk when you walked in and then it had a very long hallway with 20 rooms. The last two rooms were the spray tan rooms which needed to be sprayed down each night at close. At the very end of the hallway was a door leading to the dumpsters in the back. To the left of that door was the washer and dryer for used towels and such. This particular night, 20 minutes to close, a weird guy walked in. I had the most intense feeling that this was the creep. 
I acted normal and asked him his last name. I'd never been here before. Okay. I explained to him how much a single tan on a regular night cost, like $24. I explained our packages, etc., but I knew my words were falling on deaf ears. He just stared at me with his mouth wide open, breathing heavily. He asked for the most basic bed for 5 minutes. Okay, huge red flag. Why even come in? I put him in the bed and immediately got on the phone with my friend from the other salon. She was the manager at her salon so she decided to close shop early and race over to me just in case I needed her. I had the back door propped open as it was hot in the salon and I wanted to get a cross breeze going while I cleaned the rooms. The dryer was also running which could have impacted my hearing. I was in one of the rooms near the front sweeping when I realized it had been 15 minutes and I hadn't heard this guy walk toward the front door yet. I had hoped he would just leave while I was sweeping up in a room so I wouldn't have to deal with him. So I go down the hall to listen outside the room he was in. The room was empty, he clearly had not used the bed as there were no marks or anything and the glass remained clean. I called out to see if he was still in the salon. Sir, no response. I called my friend so fast. I had a horrible feeling of dread. Where are you? I yelled into the phone. I'm pulling up, relax. Did he leave yet? She asked. I frantically explained to her what happened and told her loudly so he would hear if he was still in the store. Bring your bat. My friend comes in about three minutes later with a steel bat. Together we started going in rooms one by one. When we got to the sixth room, we heard the back door slam shut hard. We ran to it and locked it. We still checked the other rooms, but we both knew what had happened. He had been hiding in one of the empty rooms and bolted when he realized what we were doing. I don't know what the guy's plans were for me that night, but I'm also thankful my friend was there to save me. So, tanning salon perv, let's not meet. About seven years ago, when I was 17, my parents were out of town for a weekend and left me at home. This is a pretty common occurrence. My parents trusted me. I would usually spend these weekends away staying with friends or family as my parents' house is a bit creepy to be alone in, even during the day. We live in a small rural town where everyone knows each other and generally it's pretty quiet and pretty safe. Saturday I was supposed to stay with a friend, but her parents decided at the last minute not to let me stay. It wasn't a big deal that I had to leave. I was somewhat prepared to have to go home because her parents got weird about company sometimes. I left her house, which is about 15 minutes away from my parents' house, at around 9.30 or 9.45. While I was on the way home, I got a weird feeling that I can't really explain. I just knew that I didn't want to go stay at my parents alone. I called my brother and asked if I could stay with him. At the time, he was living with a woman who had a small child. He told me it would be quieter and easier for him to just come stay with me, since his dog would bark if I tried to come in the house. He said he would be at our parents' house in 20 minutes. After hanging up, I decided to stop at a gas station and grab a snack before going home so that my brother would be there when I got there. I pulled into the gas station. There were only a few cars in the lot, which is typical because this is a small town in the rural south where everything pretty much stops after 8pm. I parked and walked up to the door. There was a man standing outside the door smoking. He opened the door for me without saying anything. This is normal southern hospitality. I smiled and thanked him. Inside there was another man standing by the door. I noticed him staring at me as soon as I came in. He gave me that gross up and down look and said something to the effect of, Hey, what are you doing alone? Creepy. I just ignored him and walked towards the back of the store. He yelled after me and called me a name. I still ignored him. I figured he was drunk or high or just a jerk. Most people around here talk a big game but rarely back it up. I wasn't scared, just annoyed. I got my snacks and paid at the counter. When I walked back up to the door, both of the men were gone. I was happy to not have to deal with any more catcalling. I began walking across the lot towards my car, which was probably around 100 feet away from my door. As I was walking, I looked down on my phone to see if enough time had passed for my brother to be at my parents. When I looked up, the guy who had hit on me was standing at the pump staring. I looked at him for a second and continued walking. Hey, you know you're supposed to answer a man when he speaks to you, he said. I remember saying something snarky back to him and getting in my car. He looked pissed at my sarcasm. I locked my doors as soon as I was in the car, started it, and was thinking of nothing but getting home to eat my snacks and hang out with my brother. I put my car in gear and realized the man had disappeared. I looked around before pulling out of my parking spot only to realize that both men were sitting in a car facing mine across the lot. They were both staring at me and talking, occasionally even pointing toward me. I just stared at them, defiant and pissed. I didn't want them to think they scared me at all. While we were sitting having our staring contest, the man who had opened the door for me smiled and gave me the finger across the throat gesture, as in, you're dead. I rolled my eyes and pulled out the gas station, annoyed. To my dismay, they pulled out behind me. I hadn't been scared up until this point because, as I said, most people here are a lot of talk with no follow through. Instead of going home, I took a few back roads that connect back in a sort of circle to see if they were really following me, which of course they were. When they realized I was testing them, they drove up really close to me and started laying on the horn. 
I couldn't see their headlights, they were so close. I called my brother and told him what was going on. He told me to come home and he would handle it. I started driving home. The two guys were still in my car blowing the horn. Even with my detours, I was only about 3-4 to four minutes from my parents' house. I slowed down to pull in the driveway and was immediately relieved. At the end of my driveway, my brother was standing hands crossed in front of his stomach, clearly holding a pistol. I drove around him into the yard. The two guys actually started to pull in behind me until they saw my brother, then they hightailed it out of there. I have no idea what they would have done if I had stopped somewhere alone or kept driving. I'm thankful my brother was there. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their moms. I was home for the holidays from college and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We planned to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the west coast, the ball drop is at 9, so at around 8, we ventured from our hotel, walking to the block party about a mile away. On the way, we passed by a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spend 15 minutes dancing, but didn't get any drinks. We continued on to the block party, get some dinner, a glass of champagne. The ball dropped and they had a DJ, so we spent about an hour there dancing. After we got tired of it, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mom pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves soon after that because she was tired. It's about 10.30 at this point and Sarah, Rachel, and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun dancing. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was the one she hadn't had before. I went back to the bar to get a second drink and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was completely fine 10 minutes before. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel not worried, somehow drags my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decided to take me back to the hotel about a half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious and there were barely any sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us, who was walking near us, but they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I threw up all over myself, the both of them, and the sidewalk, etc. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have any memory of this. Still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to go grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now. He didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he could help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off. Something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm going to call the police. He left after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holiday ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door, and it's the EMT and his wife again. They came to let us know that a man followed us to the hotel, and they just saw him pop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to find him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body, and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that had happened. Feeling bad, I thought I must have drank way too much, but I had never blacked out before in my life. And the amount of drinks I had, two in two hours, since I didn't get to drink my second at the bar, didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some of it and had no memory of her walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something in my drink. To this day, I don't really know how it could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. This happened back when I was in 4th grade. It's always stuck out to me as odd, but when I became an adult, it dawned on me just how dangerous it was. I had been invited to a friend's birthday party, which was to be held at a popular pizza joint that had a bunch of arcade games and stuff. This pizza place was right next door to a small movie theater, and the movie Titanic just had come out, so there was a decent amount of people in this part of this shopping center. My mom had to run some errands to pick up one of my other brothers, so she dropped me off along the way. She said she was going to stay until others arrived for the party, but I knew she had a lot to do. The place was familiar to me, and I knew my friends were either already inside or would be there shortly, so I just told her to drop me off 
myself and I went inside. My mom had also arranged a ride home for me from one of my friend's parents. No one had gotten there yet, so I had to look around at the different games and then went outside the restaurant to wait for my friends to show up. There were a bunch of people outside the theater, lined up waiting to get inside for the early evening showing of Titanic. That's when I noticed that a couple, a guy and a girl, were standing by a car smoking cigarettes and looking over at me. A chunk of time had passed, probably like 20 minutes, and I was super confused why my friends hadn't showed up yet. I knew for a fact that I was at the right place and that I showed up at the right time. I was going over all the reasons why they might be late when the cigarette smoking couple came over to me and started talking to me. They asked me what or who I was waiting for. Obviously at first, I was hesitant to talk to strangers, but they looked to be my oldest brother's age, late teens, early 20s, so I had been around older people and wasn't too bashful or shy around them, conversationally. I explained to them I was waiting for my friends to show up for my birthday party, but they hadn't showed up yet, and they were all pretty late. The couple made some other small talk, they told me they were wanting to see Titanic, but when they showed up, all the tickets had sold off for the showing they wanted, so they were just going to hang out until the next showing, which they had successfully gotten tickets for. After a little while longer of waiting and talking with this couple, they asked if I was hungry. I said I was, and they offered to buy me pizza. As a hungry kid who was seriously looking forward to pizza, but was unsure if the party was still going to happen, I wasn't about to pass it up. We went inside and ordered and sat down. I ended up hanging out with this couple for a long time. They were being super nice to me, gave me money for the arcade games, bought me as much pizza and soda as I wanted. I had almost completely forgot about my friends and the party that was supposed to happen, until I saw what time it was. Almost two hours had passed, and I started to get pretty nervous slash anxious. I wasn't sure how I was going to get home. I didn't have a cell phone, this was 1997, and neither did my parents. My mom would be furious that A, no one showed up to the party, and B, I didn't seek out help from the restaurant or some kind of security guard or police officer, and C, I'd spend the two last hours with strangers, accepting food and money from them. I decided to ask this couple what I should do. This is where things started to get really strange. The guy turned to me and said flatly, you don't need to go home. Thinking back, I definitely couldn't fully comprehend the weight of what he said. I didn't know what to say, so I kind of shrugged in confusion and said I needed to find a phone. I went up to the counter and asked if I could use their phone, and they let me. I called home, but no one answered. I tried again, still nothing. I then told the people at the counter that I was trying to get picked up, but no one was answering the phone at home. I must have looked pretty panicked, because just then the guy from the couple came over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry, we'll get this figured out. He then gave me some more money to play a few more arcade games while he figured it out with the guys behind the counter. No idea what they talked about specifically, but I ended up playing another game and then went back to the table we were at. The guy came back over and said that they were going to take me home. He was being super positive and upbeat about it and was insisting that it was no problem whatsoever. His girlfriend was also being very insistent and supportive of the idea. Part of me was super hesitant because I was taught stranger danger and all that, but the other part of me was wanting to believe it was all really innocent and I was really grateful that these people had been so nice to me, fed me, and kept me entertained. They had even missed their movie to stay with me. I said that I wanted to try calling home a few more times. So over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I tried calling home a bunch but there was still no answer. I decided that I would say yes to these people and have them take me home. Again, I was young, impressionable, naive, etc. The people behind the counter must have been seeing this from the more rational side and realized something seriously fishy was going on. One of them had gone on break and called the police to come over and address the situation. Policeman shows up and comes over to figure out what's going on. I don't remember everything about the conversation, but what it ended up coming down to was who was going to take me home. The couple was still really insistent. Thinking about this as an adult, I find it strange that the cop was even considering letting this whole thing to be an option. As an adult, there is no question in my mind that the cop should have shut the conversation down and taken me home, but for some odd reason, they let me decide. I felt like I was being pressured. I remember going back and forth in my mind. These people had been so nice to me and had hung out with me and I didn't want to be rude, and I also felt really intimidated by the police officer. I remember this part as if it was yesterday. As I was thinking, the cop went over to talk to some of the guys behind the counter, and while he was away, the guy from the couple looked at me with a smile and asked, do you want to go with him or us? I told him I would go with them. Again, in hindsight, I still can't believe the cop let this happen. As we were getting our things to go, the officer did say that he was going to follow us the whole way, which was a redemptive assurance. The officer asked for my address and my parents' names. I got in the couple's car and told them where I lived and we were on our way. The girl was driving and the guy was in the front passenger seat. The entire drive, the guy was looking over his shoulder out the back window, glancing back and forth between me and the cop following behind us. We pulled up to my house and I went up to the front door while both the couple and the cop were parked on the street. Opened the door, went inside, and saw that my mom was looking at the window with a very confused and concerned look on her face. She went outside and found out all that had happened. It was furious. I didn't tell her the specific things that the couple had said to me. Again, I didn't understand the full gravity of the whole situation until years later. Going through the whole scenario in my head, if the cop hadn't followed us, I more than likely would have been abducted. 
Thinking about all the things that they had said and done, befriending me and feeding me and giving me money to play games, was them totally trying to come across as disarming and trusting and friendly. A totally screwed up situation that could have been so much worse. Hard to think about. I'm almost 30 now and have kids of my own and thinking about them in this kind of situation makes my blood boil. At about 8pm last night I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, neither of us own cars, and Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is an automatic ticketing system for public transport. So walking was our only option. It's summer over here so it was still fairly well lit and we were walking down main road so we weren't too concerned. We finally arrive at this cafe and sit down. I was paying but I only had my credit card and sure enough it was cash only. Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter so I just gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to go get cash. This is my home suburb so I know there's no ATMs around and my best bet is a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog so I don't keep Sally waiting and when a balding, sweating guy probably in his late 40s with a tank top and no shoes come pacing behind me as I pass the corner of the block. He walks behind me for about 100 meters. I didn't really think much of it. The gas station was the next building along. It seemed like he had just come out of a nice suburban house along the street and it wasn't the witching hour so I just assumed he was going to the station like me. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he follow me in. In my peripheral, I saw him walk past the door and out of sight. I looked around for an ATM they sometimes have inside. No such luck, so I go up to this man in his 30s at the desk and reluctantly ask if they're able to do cash out. He smiles and says, of course, and then asks, is he with you? I have no idea who he's talking about at first, and then he points to the man from earlier, pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, he didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't going back and forth just outside the door. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he was on drugs. I tell the clerk no, not thinking much of it at all. He says, oh, he was staring at you before. I thought he might have been your dad. I laugh it off. I honestly wasn't concerned at all. He was still ambling around outside and I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thank the clerk for the cash, but before I turn away to leave, he says, just wait and see if he leaves first. We wait for a few minutes in silence and the guy begins to pace back and forth directly against the front wall of the store, looking straight ahead and never into the store. It still looked like the man was just on a drug-induced amble and seemed harmless. Not once did I catch his gaze, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk, especially since Sally was texting me at this point asking, where are you? I thank the guy at the desk once again for his concern and assure him that I don't know the guy and I'm not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store and head for the door. The clerk asks if I want him to walk out with me, I say that it should be alright and begin walking away from the block. As I leave the store, the drifting man stops pacing and makes a beeline for me from the other end of the building. I seriously didn't think much of the guy at all until this point but for the first time he was briskly walking in a straight line towards me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I start power walking so that he doesn't think I'm actively trying to escape him. Still trying to convince myself that I'm just being paranoid and should be more casual. I don't look behind me to see how close he is. I've reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I heard the clerk run outside. He's yelling at me, go, run, run. I make a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He's grabbed the man by his shoulders from behind. The baldy man isn't even glancing behind him or trying to escape. He's just watching me run away. I keep running until I've crossed the road and then turn around, standing still. The clerk is still holding onto the odd staring man. The clerk and I are just looking at each other in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He makes a hand gesture to go and I gesture my hands thanks, you know, the clasp your hands together and shake them a bunch of times. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought food before walking back home a different way. Overall, odd guy at the gas station, let's not meet. Nice gas station attendant who went well out of his way to help my naive self. I'm definitely glad we met. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was selling my old car as I had bought a new one. I posted it on a couple of selling sites and Facebook. I arranged two visits that day and was home alone. It was broad daylight so I assumed everything would be fine. The first one that came made an offer a little lower than what I was looking for so I said I would get back to him later as I had another viewing. The guy from Facebook pulled up in a blacked out Range Rover and three other guys got out. I opened the car and explained why I was selling the car. You know when you just get a bad feeling? I wasn't sure why four people would need to come view an 8 year old car. He asked if he could take the car for a drive. At this point, I was not going to get in the car with him so I said, yeah, take it, I'll wait here with your friends. 
He asked me to get in the car. What if he just took it? I said, well, it wouldn't matter. That's what insurance was for. I was not getting in the car with him. The three guys left and didn't even speak to me, just to themselves, and I found that odd, but it made me feel very unsure if the car would come back. The car was not putting up a fight for or arguing over. He then pulled back up. He got out and offered the same price as the other guys earlier buying the car for his daughter. He wanted me to get in the car with him to go collect the cash. I said it was fine, his friends could take him if he needed to go, but I had another viewing and I would contact him later. I didn't want to walk back to my house as I had not decided to sell to the other guy as they were just giving me the creeps. He then offered more than honestly the car was worth if I went with him now. I said no and locked the car and started walking towards the main street as I had seen my neighbor walking down and shouted to him and his dog. They spoke to each other and drove off. I texted the other guy and told him the car was his and he was welcome to come over anytime to get it. I sorted and filled out the V5 and off he went. That night from my living room, the black Range Rover came back and parked outside. I live in a cul-de-sac so I am set back to where we had been. I told my husband and he looked out and he said that was strange and then my phone started blowing up. I politely said the car had gone and that I was sorry but I couldn't help. The car drove off and came back again 30 minutes later. This happened about 3 times that night and was a bit strange but thought nothing more of it as the next few days nothing happened. On the Friday 4 days later I finish work early and get back and get the dog ready to go out. We were going to head straight to the park and run like the wind. As I got to the end of the cul-de-sac the same car pulled up and one of the guys jumped out and said hello. I held the lead tighter and my dog was thoroughly unimpressed. She gave a bit of a grumble and he asked if he could pet her. I said no she is a guard dog and doesn't like to be touched and went to walk up to me. He then grabbed my arm and the dog latched into his forearm. Q was screaming there was only one other guy with him in the car and he jumped out and started to shout. This is the most placid and loving dog you will ever see and to be honest it was a warning nip as if she had meant to really hurt him she would have gone through the bone. His friend was shouting and pulling him away. I called her back and got her to sit with a few neighbors and came out when they went towards their car. I haven't seen their car since but honestly I wouldn't sell something that meant someone had to come to my home online again. So a stranger who clearly wasn't interested in the car, let's never meet again. When I was 11, we, my single mom, 9 year old sister, and 6 year old brother moved into a beautiful, older, craftsman style house. I heard it was around 80 years old back then in 1994. Soon after we moved in, we found out it was infested with cockroaches. I've never seen anything like it. We turn on the lights at night and they'd scatter from every surface. We had to store all of our food that wasn't canned in the fridge so they wouldn't get into it. We tried bug bombs and professional exterminators numerous times with no effect. Those things really can survive a nuclear war. Anyway, they weren't the reason we lived in the house less than a year before fleeing for our lives. I remember my mom discussing at our next door neighbor's creepy son with my grandma. He was in his 20s or 30s. She'd been doing dishes one day and looked up to see him standing directly on the other side of the kitchen window, staring in at her. Normally, she would have kept something scary like this from us kids, but about at that time, she told us to tell her if we ever saw him near the house, and we weren't allowed to play outside. So, one afternoon we were all doing some spring cleaning, when my brother said he found a cigarette butt in the upstairs toilet. Weird, since nobody in our family smokes. Being a dumb little six-year-old, he flushed it before telling our mom. I still remember her trying to get the entire story out of him, being upset that the evidence was gone, and thinking he might have been mistaken or maybe he'd picked up a butt somewhere outside of curiosity. She soon dropped it and we mostly forgot about it. I think it was a few weeks later. My brother was spending the night at our grandparents and my sister and I were the only ones upstairs. Our mom's bedroom was downstairs. My sister heard a sound like a screen door slamming, but she insisted it came from in the house and she was freaked out. I told her it was just from outside and to go to sleep. A minute later, we heard a strangled cough coming from just outside our bedroom door, a man's cough, and sounded like he was trying to keep from making noise. I whispered that we needed to get downstairs. We sneaked out of the room and I had the irrational urge to turn on the light in the bathroom, which was just across the hall from our bedroom, and check to see if anyone was there. Then just as strong of a feeling to get away from the bathroom and get downstairs now. The scariest moment of my life was when we were creeping down the stairs in the pitch black. It was a spiral enclosed stairway with walls, the perfect place for someone to hide. The stairway light was burned out and the wood steps were creaky, so it was terrifying making our way down. We got downstairs and woke up our mom, panicked that there was a guy upstairs in our bathroom. She started to tell us to go back to bed, but could see we were seriously scared. She went over to the bottom of the stairway to go up and show us that there was nothing to be scared about. Then she just had strong of a feeling to close the stairway door and lock it now. She did, called the cops, they found nothing and didn't really take us seriously. The next day, she called a PD detective friend of hers from high school to come over and inspect the house. Remembering the cigarette butt in the toilet, she had him look at the upstairs bathroom window. It was a high, narrow rectangular window. Not very big, but just wide enough for a person. Who knows how many times the intruder climbed our roof to get in and was upstairs while we were sleeping across the hall. 
The window swung up on hinges. When my mom's friend let the window drop, it sounded like a screen door slamming. He said the locks on all the windows were so old they were practically useless, and we needed to get out of the house immediately. We moved into my grandparents' house that day. When my mom went with her brothers a few days later to pack up some things, my back door had been smashed open, but nothing in the house was disturbed. A few years later, we heard the neighbor's son was arrested for attempted murder. I still wonder what might have happened if I turned on that bathroom light, if my mom didn't lock the stairway door, or if we didn't leave the house when we did. Backstory, my wife and I don't live together. She had become abusive over the last few months, mostly towards our daughter. Our daughter is almost 18 months old and is my whole world. I am unemployed at the moment, but my mother had been helping me out a lot. Today at around 4 p.m., I took my daughter to the store. I usually do this around the time she wakes up from her nap. My daughter is a very active child and can't seem to sit still for more than 10 minutes without getting cranky. I usually let her walk with me, holding her hand and patiently walking at her pace. I usually get just a juice for her, but had to get some extra groceries that I was short on. Flour, sugar, and some noodles. I also remembered we were low on milk and grabbed a gallon on our way back. With all that I was carrying, I wasn't able to hold her hand. I made sure to walk behind her, but that only makes her walk slowly. As we made our way to the registers, I was continuously urging her to keep walking, which she would do, but only for a second before her attention would be drawn to another rickety box with whatever was on sale, or she would see something colorful on a lower shelf. I was getting a bit frustrated, but I wasn't showing it in my voice. I kept urging her to keep walking, and she kept getting sidetracked. With everything I was carrying, I started to wish I had grabbed a basket. At the front, their customer service desk holds register 1, which was thankfully open. I want to take the time to mention that my daughter is very fond of saying hi and waving at everyone. I set everything up to get rung up, but the service attendant was busy with the return of the customer service area, so I had to wait. The entrance to the store is to my right, the only exit door is behind the service desk, which leads into the small foyer before leading to the other doors. As people enter, they have to pass the customer service desk. I was being fatherly to my daughter, trying to entertain her with patty cake and the itsy bitsy spider, while we waited for the cashier to check us out. My daughter would frequently wave at people passing and say hi in her squeaky toddler voice. Some people would smile and wave back, while others would stop to adore her. At this point, I'm used to people doing that. The lady was ready to check us out, and I told my daughter to hold my hand, since I wouldn't be looking her way. I had to pull my wallet out to retrieve my debit card to pay for the groceries and let her hand go for a moment. I kept looking her way to make sure she wasn't wandering off. The lady went to hand me my receipt when she all of a sudden yelled at someone behind me. What are you doing with this daughter? She bellowed as I turned to look at a man who had picked her up and started running towards the entrance doors. I was shocked. The doors didn't open since they were a one-way set of doors, and the cashier quickly picked up the phone yelling that she was calling the police. I was stunned to the point of immobilization, but quickly realized what was going on. I have a pocket knife that I usually carry on me so I can break the seal on my daughter's juice. I quickly ran after the man as someone started to make their way through the entrance doors. He didn't get a chance to run through though because I slammed my fist across his temple. I decided to not use the knife in case I might get in trouble. The man stumbled and I grabbed my daughter from his arms. He then proceeded to run out the door empty handed. The police arrived about 5 minutes later and asked me what I had seen. I explained that I hadn't seen the man's face since he had long hair and a beard. He was also wearing a hoodie, which wasn't that much of a surprise. They took the statement of several witnesses, including the cashiers, and had already had other officers searching the area. Someone had said the guy had ran behind the building, but the officers didn't find anyone. The police took us home and then asked more questions like, have you seen him before? Do you know anyone who looks like this man? And they proceeded to ask about the home life. CPS had been over earlier in the day to discuss my wife's mental health plan, and the police had been here earlier as well. The officers asked if we needed any groceries or anything. I told them no. The officers left, leaving me their cards in case I saw the guy around the area. About 20 minutes later, I got a knock at the door. To my surprise, the officers had returned with the largest box of Pampers diapers I had ever seen. A large box of wipes, about 6 large Winko bags of groceries, and a couple bag of toys. They had left us with a Christmas card saying I was a strong father to have had so much go on recently and that my daughter was lucky to have such a great father. There was a $100 bill in the car too, wrapped in a note that said to get a drink or two if I needed it. I don't drink so I'll probably get some extra Christmas presents for my mom and daughter. So, to the guy that tried to kidnap my daughter, I hope the police find you. Close to 10 years ago, my best friend and I scored the deal of the century. Living her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as Chip's rent so the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with random tenants for a year so we offered it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the link on the left side, and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off the hallway to the right. 
At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen and a backyard. It was an inner Melbourneian suburb, so it was totally fenced in with six foot fence on three sides, and the front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important later. My friend obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom with the window facing the gravel path slash fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months in bliss, great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was stellar. One hot summer night, we said our goodnights, and I went to bed and fell asleep immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that just for an over an hour before she heard a weird scratch in the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch, till she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity, till she heard the noise again and again, scratch, scratch. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whispered yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch 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 of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunch 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 continued, getting closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down and slammed the lock shut just as he reached the window. He looked at me but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was extremely terrified now and my housemate was crying. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked and ran back to my room and called the cops. I didn't know what the cops knew that we didn't but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all at 3 minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had vaulted the back fence, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay and then asked if they could come in and look around. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe. They took her statements and they asked if there was anyone we could stay with tonight. My housemate and I stayed at our boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in the house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated, and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the dude was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know, but all I can think is that we were so lucky that it went the way it did. This happened way back in October of 2006. At the time, I was just a 19-year-old kid always on the lookout for adventure. One Friday night after wrapping up a shift at McDonald's, I met up with some of my friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called White's Bridge. My one buddy Brandon said he had recently learned about it and began telling us the legends associated with the 100 year old wood covered bridge. Never want to turn down a spooky experience, we all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road and within minutes we were on the dirt back roads, surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was a blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were getting further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage he killed her and her lover after discovering them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads into days. He eventually came upon White's Bridge where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and deciding he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions, he hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I could tell now, the story is complete fiction, but we totally believed it at the time. After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right on an off-road I wouldn't have even noticed was there had he not pointed it out. I took the turn and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film, an old wood covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow line abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Maiku was known as somewhat of a risk taker, and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. 
Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested we get back in the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it in neutral and killed the engine, the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything to happen. The only sounds were the creaking of the bridge, the river flowing beneath us, and footsteps. Suddenly, the back driver's side door opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late 20s slash early 30s, long straight black hair, slim, and wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans. It's been a while, but this is essentially how I remember the conversation going. I saw your fire signal for me, she said. Uh, wait, what? I replied, totally freaked out and at a complete loss of words. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down down that way. I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you. She responded curtly. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointing ahead, towards a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and ever the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash at my place. I got plenty to drink and I interrupted them. No, lady, listen, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. You just got in my car and this is all really weird. I'm sorry, but you have to get out. She glared at me in the rearview mirror. If looks could kill, I would have been done for, but you signaled for me. She responded in an irritated tone. We weren't signaling for you. Get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came and disappearing into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends. They all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word, I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. We needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get to where we had come from, and the only way to do that was to pull onto the side road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on, and then reverse. As I pulled onto the side road, my headlights illuminated the three posted signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear she went that way. I didn't want to stick around though, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again, and from there began the journey home. We didn't have much to say on the ride home. I think we were all equally stunned. Except for Mike, who asked if he knew anyone that would be awake at this hour that he could score some weed from. I visited White's Bridge a couple other times after that, but nothing of no happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some people burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go and check it out. To the strange lady who entered my car out in the middle of nowhere at 2am, let's not meet. This happened in 2019. I was in my second year of college and living in a town home about a 10 minute walk from campus. I lived with two other girls at the time but they were all back at their parents house for the holiday. I work in healthcare and was working Christmas this year. A little bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there but one girl had moved out due to issues with her boyfriend. He was a jerk who abused our kindness and allowing him to stay there, was only supposed to come every so often but basically ended up living there. We told her she needed to kick him out after an incident with him one night after he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen and we told her we would have to talk to the landlord then. Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. At this point, it was affecting everyone and we didn't feel safe with him there, etc., so she moved out. Okay, so back to the story. It was Christmas Eve and I worked the next day, so I was getting ready for bed. Locked the doors, turned the lights off, and went downstairs where my bedroom is. I was scrolling on my phone for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point, when I heard what sounded like the chairs in the kitchen move. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls and sometimes they could be loud. But I remembered one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting while they were all gone at home. The noise was short lived so I brushed it off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door is being opened slowly. But my phone screen is lighting up my scared jaw drop face. So I can't act like I'm asleep. Where I'm laying in bed faces directly to the door, so we're just looking right at each other. So there I was laying in my bed while this guy has one foot in my bedroom with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably more than like 10 seconds of us looking at one another. He slowly takes his foot out and closes my door. I sit there just in complete utter shock. I couldn't make out what he looked like as my eyes were adjusting to the dark again from the phone screen. All I could see was a backwards baseball cap. I knew I had to call the police, but my anxious self knew if I called, it would alert my parents' phones that I called. Me being dumb, I was like, well, I don't want to make them worry. 
Also, I was scared he might still be somewhere in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I text the guy I was seeing at the time and tell him, some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He snatched me out of it and told me to call the police, and so I did. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they didn't have to break it down, and I told her no way, I don't care if the door is broken, I'm not going up there alone. A couple minutes later I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. They got in and asked me where I was. I came out of my room and they came and got me. They told me to wait on the back porch while two of them searched the house and one stayed with me. They didn't find anyone and I said nothing looked like it had been taken. They even tried to get fingerprints but were unsuccessful. They then started asking me questions and informed me that the back door was unlocked and had no signs it had been broken. I told them I had locked it. Luckily the guy I was talking to stayed with me that night but I still couldn't sleep. I kept having to go check every inch of the house over and over. I placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and my bedroom. The next day I informed our landlord and she refused to come out and change the locks, and she never ended up changing them for the rest of the time we lived there. Every time I go to bed now, I triple check all the doors have been locked, doesn't matter where I am. I have a dog now and he helps my anxiety of intruders, as well as a recent purchase of a ring doorbell. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think they may have made an extra key for him because he was basically living there, but I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, the house, or our belongings. If it were someone random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended and that could be many different possibilities. I don't know what their intentions were that night, but to the man who broke into my house on Christmas Eve, let's not meet again. Over the summer, me, my fiance, and my stepdaughter, then two years old, went on a vacation to Presque Isle in Pennsylvania. We stayed there throughout the afternoon and decided to get dinner in a nearby town, Erie, Pennsylvania. We go there and see a water fountain that kids play in. We think our kid would like that, so we get food and take her there. Now, it was kind of a pretty sketchy area, but there were also kids and it was still a little light out, like 6.30, 7pm ish. Me and my fiance sit down and watch our kid play for a bit. At some points, every kid wants me to run in the water with her, so I do. I kind of keep going back and forth between playing with her and keeping my fiance company. After playing with my kid for a while, I come back to my fiance. She looked kind of pale and said, go get our kid, we need to leave right now. I didn't know what was going on, but I got my kid. As I was turning to go back and get her, I noticed a group of about three really weird guys staring intently at us. When I looked over, one of them stood up a little bit and was giving me a stare. I grab up her kid and start following my fiance who is booking it. As we were walking away, she tells me that somebody is following us now. I look over and see the creepy looking, a shirtless dude getting into his old, beige sedan behind us. My fiance explains to me that the same man kept approaching her whenever I would get up to run around with her kid. At first he introduced himself and tried talking to her. She thought he was being benign but just trying to hit on her. When I came back he apparently bolted. I sat with her for a couple of minutes and then went back to play with her kid. Apparently as soon as I went he returned. He asked her if she was married to me. She said that we were going to be hoping that it was the end of that. He goes away before I came back to sit with her again. The third and final time I go to play with her kid he apparently came back. He told her that she thought she was a beautiful lady and asked if that was her daughter pointing to our kid. My fiance said yes and the guy said that our kid was also a beautiful lady and that his night was going to be made, whatever that means. Q and I come in and we book it. We're walking back to our car which is kind of far away. Erie in general was pretty abandoned outside of the park and we notice the car pull out and start driving extremely slowly in a street parallel to us. At this point, I don't think he knew we saw him. My fiance is freaking out and I tell her to wait near the vestibule of a closed Starbucks where we weren't in this guy's vision. We stayed there for about 5 minutes and I was watching the roads, not seeing anything. We continue walking but are still on high alert. I found my car parked outside of a McDonald's and we're now power walking to it holding our kid. I look behind and lo and behold the same beige car going at 3 miles per hour just barely inches out from the side street so I can see it. As my fiance and the kid are getting in, I turn around and stand at the back of the car and shoot this guy the death stare. After looking at his car for about 10 seconds solid, he peels out and speeds off past us nearly hitting me. Not sure what this guy's problem was, I assume that he wasn't tailing us for any good reason. Afterwards, I bring up the three guys that were staring at me. My fiance said that the pervert following us was sitting with them when he wasn't coming over to her and saying creepy stuff. During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. In the beginning, he was a loving, attentive, charismatic, seemingly normal partner. He made me mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. However, over the course of our year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private he began suffering delusions, compulsively lying, and creating art that focused on themes of murder. 
I was worried sick and his condition was exhausting, but I did my best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed that he shouldn't have to struggle with his mental illness alone. One time he vanished without a trace for a full day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone on his nightstand. I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours before finally discovering he had been involuntarily checked into a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him, seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour, bringing him his favorite books to pass the time, and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my boyfriend surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. In retrospect, none of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there, and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence that he was cheating on me and, secretly relieved, confronted him. I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new dark persona. He threatened to off himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I called the police. They weren't much help, but Tim left. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again, but he left me insane voicemails from different numbers for weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken and things returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying that they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds, clearly manic, and was posting a newly written song all over his social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. The song was pretty explicitly about my murder, but in a sort of clever, disguised way. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account, and he was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane rambling statuses, most of them about me. They flip-flopped between flowery love pros and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern, but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it'd be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough, and I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio. I ducked down and bolted into my favorite project manager's office, slammed the door, and unleashed upon her what it must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely speak, but Nancy was amazing, and she understood almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed a report. My co-workers later told me that Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. He is not a designer. He had brought with him a portfolio and an elaborately fabricated work history that sounded legit. At the end of his interview, he casually asked if I still worked there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had written a song for me, and it had been picked up by the local radio this morning. He asked my co-workers to let me know with warmest regards. That phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced behind it until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he wasn't enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day, but the incident helped me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing too. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio, but the CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, I moved to a different city, and that was that. Haven't heard from him since. But I discovered the most alarming part later. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown, and when he compared notes much later she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the same week it had all gone down. She said that she was worried about Tim's Facebook activity, so she removed the axe and hit it. Tim was so angry that he completely trashed their house and never came back. And if our timelines are correct, that must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. When I was about 12, I decided making a newspaper for my entire neighborhood was a really great idea. My friend and I were both at middle school and decided to get together once a month and write absolutely enthralling articles about the weather or when the pool would be open and then deliver our front slash back one page newsletter to every single house in our two street neighborhood whether they wanted it or not. We kept this up for about two years until the time of the story. So we were on our once a month paper route, if you could call, walking around our small neighborhood and putting a single sheet of paper in every mailbox of paper route. It was raining this particular time, so we had umbrellas and we were carefully walking to each mailbox, trying to keep our newsletter as dry as possible. This also meant all the cars that came by had their headlights and windshield wipers on, and also made sufficient noise with their tires splashing through the puddles. My point is that we knew when a car was approaching behind us. We were about halfway through on the street we weren't so familiar with, the one we didn't live on, when we noticed this souped up old white car coming really slowly up the street. Now, the way my neighborhood was set up, the only reason why you would be on the same street as us is if you lived there or you made a wrong turn. So there were even less cars on the street and the ones that passed usually were people that we knew. We continued walking from mailbox to mailbox while periodically checking to make sure the white car wasn't just parked. 
He was moving very slowly and the headlights and windshield wipers were either broken or just not turned on. This car drove slowly past us as we walked, going roughly the same pace as our steps if not slower. Something was so off about everything. There was no reason for this car to be on this road in the first place. We definitely didn't recognize it or the driver inside, and it was going so incredibly slow. Car trouble, I don't know. We pretended one of the houses was ours and walked up the driveway to avoid the car as it got close to us. It continued at the same pace and we watched it until it eventually disappeared around the corner. We laughed about it, thinking it was weird but nothing happened. It was all well and good until the car showed up at the end of the street behind us again, going just as slowly as it had before. What was this person doing? We were so confused and walked a little farther from the curb to avoid the car again as it came by. We didn't laugh about it this time. The car showed up a third time at the end of the street, and at this point we decided we should cut through some yards to get home. Better safe than sorry, right? We crossed the street, but the car passed again and we shrugged it off and kept going. The fourth time this car came around, it pulled up right next to us and the driver had his window down. Being 12 and living in a bubble, my friend and I hadn't really experienced shady people, but we knew something was up with this guy. He had a white towel draped over half his head, was wearing a white tank top, while we were in long sleeves and rain jackets, had his window down, and when he spoke his speech was slurred. We were polite and said hello and he asked us what we were doing through his open window. We continued walking as this interaction took place because we knew this dude seemed sketch, but at the same time we didn't want to assume anything and be rude. When we told him we ran a newspaper he immediately perked up and enthusiastically asked us about placing an ad. He also took his hands off the steering wheel and leaned over so he could get closer to the window. He smelled of cigarettes. My friend and I looked at each other, we knew something was wrong. We told him no, we don't place ads in our newspaper, even though we did. He told us we were pretty girls and probably cold. Our idea to cut through some yards was decided. We hurriedly said something about needing to go home and he began shouting at us from inside the car as we crossed the street. We bolted to a neighbor's backyard when we heard the car begin to move quickly and hid in some bushes until we were sure the car was gone. We stopped writing our newsletter after that. Meeting a creepy person while you're alone in the rain in your own neighborhood was a good deciding factor for calling it quits. So weird and probably high dude that tried to talk to a 12 year old me and my friend, let's never meet again. To start off, I am a 16 year old female. Okay, I was visiting my mom's apartment for the weekend with my sister. We go there every weekend or every other weekend to see her. We arrived at about 10 in the morning and brought in our pillows and movies or whatever from my grandma's car. We get inside and chill there for a couple hours watching TV before my sister says that she's hungry. My mom asked, okay, what do you want? I said I was okay with having a pizza and my mom said that she would have to run to Kroger's which is less than a mile away. She said she would also get some movies from Redbox. My sister then asked if she could go with my mom to Kroger's. My mom said she could and asked if I would be okay in the apartment by myself. I said I would because I knew I would. I'll be gone in 20 minutes tops, my mom said. She didn't like leaving me alone, but she thought it would be okay as she told me later. Now, my mom's apartment is kind of in a crappy place, where people have been spotted with drugs and thieves and stuff. But I was on the third floor in one of the many surrounding apartment buildings, with tons of neighbors. I would be fine. Okay, lock the door and you know not to open unless it's me. They left soon after and I was sitting in the couch, on my phone with Jerry Springer playing in the background. It was about 10 minutes after they left when I heard the doorknob jiggle. I looked up, not feeling scared right away, but also feeling a little wary. I should mention that I carry a pocket knife everywhere with me and the blade is about 3-4 to four inches long. It was sitting on the coffee table in front of me when I got up to go to the door. I'm only 5'3 and I knew not to open the door, so I grabbed a chair and stood on it to look through the peephole. That's when I got scared. On the other side was some guy, just standing there trying to open the door. Of course, being how I am, I tried to laugh myself out of being afraid because I had no reason to think he was going to do something to me. Maybe he just had the wrong room. I'd never seen him before and I don't know everyone in the building personally, but I had seen them all at least once, and he wasn't one of them. Hey man, I think you got the wrong room. He froze, his eyes glued to the door handle, and then at the peephole. He probably could tell exactly where I was when I spoke. I swear we made eye contact and the whites of his eyes were so yellow I thought he had jaundice. Then he all of a sudden started ramming his shoulder into the door, like full on shoulder ramming like in football. I jump off the chair and grab my phone and knife and run into a room with a window and lock the door. I call my mom's friend who lives in the apartment building across the street and start crying hysterically and said, Jess, someone's trying to break in, call the cops, bring Chris, please just get over here. She didn't even hesitate, I'll be right there. Within seconds of hanging up I call my mom. The guy is still hitting the door and he's yelling in frustration now. My mom picks up at after a few rings and I tell her what I told her friend and she was coming with Chris and she needed to get here quick. She was frightened and yelled that she was almost there. By the time I saw Jess make her way down two flights of stairs and across the road with her boyfriend, my mom was flying down the road and was there within mere seconds of me calling. They all race inside and I hear everyone yelling in the hallway. I unlock the door and peek outside of the apartment and see Chris holding the guy against the wall while my mom hugs me and Jess is screaming at him. 
Long story short, the police arrived and took my statement, and the man first denied it by saying, I thought it was my room, but then he ended up confessing that he wanted to see me and talk to me because he thought I was pretty. The police officers had him in handcuffs and ran a background check on him and what came up wasn't surprising. He had a warrant for an assault charge on a woman and had been arrested for kidnapping. Yeah, I hope I don't have to experience that again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was 19 years old and the only female working at a shop specializing in automotive batteries and things of that nature. I had been working there long enough to realize that most of the clients were male and oftentimes made for some awkward situations. For instance, I would get talked down to and patronized quite a bit or flirted with to the point where I would be somewhat uncomfortable. However, this never really bothered me. One day during a particular busy rush, a very tall man who was maybe in his mid-30s came through my line. This guy had some very strange energy, he seemed a little off. However, it was my job to be professional and assist whoever came through my line. I brushed aside the uneasy feelings. I just wanted to ring this guy out and get him through the rest of the line that was now trailing out the front door. I greeted him and talked to him as I would any other customer while I was processing his transaction. Things were going fine until he realized I was almost done. He started stalling, making up weird excuses as to why he couldn't use certain credit cards, how he needed me to put his battery on hold and he would be back, etc. I told him that I would hold it for him and that he could come back whenever he found the time. I figured he would leave at that point but he just stood there and just stared at me. Now that I think about it, he was more staring through me than at me. I was a bit uneasy but kept my polite, professional demeanor. Sir, if you're not purchasing anything at the moment, may I ask that you step aside so I can assist the other customers, I said. He completely disregarded my question and, in a slow, raspy voice, asked, So, what's your name? I didn't wear a name tag specifically for reasons like this. Customers had found me on Facebook before and it was really unsettling. Thinking quickly, I threw up my nickname. It's Rhea. Rhea, he said, as he kept staring. I just smiled awkwardly and said, Yep, that's me. By this point, my manager had realized what was going on and he proceeded to ask the man to step aside as well. After hearing it from my manager, the man walked to a corner of the store by some shelving and continued to stare while I was ringing the rest of the customers out. A bit of time went by and the line had cleared up but he was still standing there, staring and now smiling the most sickening smile I think I've ever seen. It made my skin crawl. Of course, my manager and coworker saw this too and my coworker grabbed my arm and said, Come on, let's go out back. As we were walking to the stock room, my manager asked the man if there was anything else he needed. The man muttered that there wasn't and left. I wish that was the end of it, but of course he had to come back in to purchase the battery. When he came back the next day, we again had a line. He let people go ahead of him and waited until I was free before coming up to the counter to make his purchase. I greeted him again and tried to remain professional, but it was hard considering how creeped out I was. I was again met with the same stare and the same freaky smile. I can't remember the entire conversation, but at one point, the questions he was asking became personal slash weird slash inappropriate enough for my coworker to cut in. He looked at the guy and then at me and said, Rhea, go take your break, before he basically pushed me out the way of the computer and rang the guy out. I stayed in the back until my manager came and got me, telling me it was safe to come out. We were all pretty creeped out but thought that was the end of it. A few days went by and we had all mostly forgotten about this creepy dude until he walked in again. This time though, he didn't look through the store, didn't approach the counter, didn't say a word to anyone. He just stood, jacked hood pulled over his head, in the corner of the store staring and smiling. The smile had become even wider and more sinister looking and at this point I started to freak out. I started shaking and feeling sick to my stomach. Then my manager cut the horrible tension by pretty much screaming at the guy. Hey, I'm sick of you coming into my store and pulling this crap. The creep paid him no mind and kept right on staring. This pissed my manager off and he walked out from around the counter and told the dude, Look man, if you don't quit coming in here and staring at her, I will not hesitate to call the cops. What you're doing is harassment so you need to get out of my store. At the mention of police, this dude's smile dropped and he slowly sauntered out of the store. We never saw him again, but I was immediately taken off closing shifts due to fear that the man would come back and try to catch me when I was alone. About three years ago, I was in a long distance relationship with a younger man, meaning he was only 17 at the time while I turned 19 in the relationship. His name is Peter. Peter was not a nice person to say the least. He thought that the first impressions he made on people were the only one he needed, and as such he stopped being nice, polite, or reasonable to people after the first meeting. I was young and saw past this thinking I could somehow change him. However, this abuse towards people around me and myself eventually became too much and I broke off the relationship with him. The breakup went smoothly all things considered, except he wanted me to say the words so he could play the victim. This had been a core element of our fighting because he hinted that he would wanted to break up, but instead of just saying it, he kept me on the hook and became even more abusive. 
I'm getting sidetracked, but the point was that I thought of the matter as resolved and entered a loving relationship with my current boyfriend shortly after this. Then came the day where Peter wanted to get his belongings back. I texted him a list of everything he had left in my apartment and he okayed it that it was everything. We also made an appointment for him to stop by my apartment around 3pm the following Thursday. I have no intentions of letting him get back into my house nor being alone with him, since he suddenly seems to have many mood swings after seeing me in another relationship. He has been blocked from my Facebook account, but somehow knew I was in a new relationship, which was a major red flag to me and my boyfriend. Thursday came and I felt eager just to be done with it. My boyfriend and I are walking home from high school when my phone rings. It's Peter. He yells at me that he has now been waiting at the train station for over an hour. I try to reason with him, agree to meet him there with his belongings since he needs to catch a train. My boyfriend walks with me to the train station, but we arrive only to find it vacant. I live in a small town and the train station is mostly used during rush hours in the morning and evening. It is also located rather bizarrely among normal residences and there are a lot of off alleyways leading all over town from there. I get a text stating that Peter can see us, but won't come out of hiding when my boyfriend is there. We leave his stuff on a bench at the train station, calmly replying that I'm not actually interested in meeting him. When I say calmly, I mean that my reply is calm. I'm shaking and my boyfriend is furious over this child's play. On our way home, I receive another text. This time, he states that he has a gift for me and it is in my mailbox. This freaks us out even more, mostly because this indicates that he might be waiting at my home. It is entirely possible that he watched us on the train station and then ran all the way to my apartment. However, there is no trace of him and nothing except a bill in my mailbox. By now, we figure that he is acting out of spite and proceeds to ignore the bombardment of text, calls, and so forth that follows that day. After a while, life returns to normal. Then I get another call, this time from my ex-elder brother who is worried about his sibling. Apparently he has disappeared, taking one of his brother's gas pistols. I am speechless, but since I haven't seen anything, I shake it off as another childish act. The same day my boyfriend sees police officers walking around the basement staircase on the exterior of the house we lived in, while doing some grocery shopping. He did this every day around 4pm. The next day, we are contacted by my boyfriend's mother. In the newspaper, there is a description of an unnamed young man from the same town as Peter, who has been arrested for attempted robbery of the pizza place I lived above. He was armed with a knife, a gas pistol, and lighter fluid, while stating that he was not attempting a robbery but was there to visit his ex, presumably me. Contacting the police, I discovered that he also had a mask, fake papers, and a wig and a duffel bag, which he had thrown down in the staircase when, around 4pm, he had jumped a fence and tried to enter the pizza place. This means that my boyfriend went out at the front door, while my ex was hiding right beside the front door armed. I have never been that freaked out before. The sad truth is that my ex never got charged with anything because he is a minor, has a father with a military background and money. Luckily after this, me nor my boyfriend ever saw him again. So this happened when I was in 7th grade, a 12 year old kid. At the time, it was just my mom, my brother, and I living in a rental in a rundown low-income area. We moved in during the summer before the school year started, and we were welcomed by our next-door neighbors, which wasn't too uncommon, but not super common at the same time for that area in Oregon. My mom worked 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day, so my little brother and I would ride the bus home every day from school. My cousin would also sometime ride back to my house with us and her parents would pick her up later. Important for later. One day when I came home, I noticed our small laptop we owned was gone off the counter. I figured my mom had moved it. Later when my mom came home later, we determined it was missing and that a lot of other things were missing like my iPod and wallet and my mom's safe with her handgun in it and lots of family valuables. We called the cops and reported a robbery and they came to investigate. They determined the person probably slid through the doggy door leading into the garage and then entered the house through our unlocked garage door. Cops stayed in their cars on the curb all night and said they would stay on watch for our house more than normal. I was terrified all night and my brother and I slept in my mom's room. The next day we locked all our doors. It was Wednesday and it was a random half day at my school so I rode the bus home around noon and my cousin came with while my brother went to a friend's house for the afternoon to hang out. I used the key under the mat my mom leaves for me and my cousin and I hung out for about an hour or two until her mom came and picked her up. After she left, I hear the doorknob of the closet right next to the front door slowly open and out comes this skinny, what looked like a 35 year old man that I recognized as our next door neighbor. He seemed to be constantly shaking, intense eyes, had a really unhealthy look to him because of the extremely sunken face. Terrified, I'm in the living room just standing looking at him while he looks at me, with a surprised look on his face. I think he thought everyone left when my cousin did, until his face changed to an amused smirk when I believed he realized that I was alone in his house. He begins to walk towards me while I stand there shocked, not sure what to do. He grabs me really hard on the shoulders. He seemed crazy and excitable with his intense eyes. 
I instinctively jump and buckle my knees to allow my full weight to be the force that rips me from his grip and fall down. He then bends down for me when I heel kick him as hard as I can. He then yells and falls to his knees. I use that time to run past him to my front door. I open it and run to a kid I rode the bus with's house about six houses down. He and his mom were there and she called the cops and my mom while I waited. The cops got to the house and he wasn't there but had managed to steal a few more small valuables. I gave my testimony that it was our next door neighbor and he was later caught the same day selling some of our stuff at the pawn shop in town. He ended up being a crystal meth addict, stealing our stuff to sell and pay for his addiction. He was super weak from all the drug abuse which is probably why I was able to get away from him. He also was apparently somewhat high when he spontaneously decided to attack me being that I was alone. He had apparently watched us for a few months, learning our schedules from when we left and got home. He took the time to take the key from under the front door mat while we were gone, get a copy, and then put the original back under the mat for my brother and I to use when we got home. The cops were surprised he was smart enough to do that, as he seemed to be mostly dim-witted with everything else due to the drug abuse. Either way, I testified against his physical attack, and he got a few decades of jail time being that he was already on parole for drugs. I was terrified and slept in my mom's room for the next year. About 25 years ago, when I was in middle school, 7th grade, I had a real bad problem with bullies. I couldn't handle the ridiculing I took while riding the school bus, so I started walking 3 miles to and from school every day. The path I walked was pretty safe, mostly on a sidewalk and always on a busy road, with the last 2.5 miles being a straight shot directly to the school. Back then, there wasn't a stigma attached to kids being outside on their own, so this wasn't deemed unsafe or noticed by anyone, or so I thought. I lived alone with my father, parents being divorced, and my mother saw me on weekends. He didn't see any harm in the walking and my mother wasn't aware of the bullying or the walking. I did not want her to know, so I continued unimpeded for over half the school year. Now, I wasn't really an active kid and I sure didn't like having to walk 6 miles every school day, so I assumed this was the motivation for the error I was about to make. One day on the way home, a car pulled up on the shoulder and stopped, about 100 feet ahead of me. That car looks familiar, hey it's my father, he's gonna drive me the rest of the way. I started to jog up to the car, seeing him in the driver's seat waiting patiently. Huh, his hair looks darker than normal today. Wasn't the inside of his car tan and not red? The thoughts left as soon as they entered and I caught up to the car and opened the passenger side door and started to get in. As I was tossing my backpack on the floor in front of me and swinging my legs into the car, I started saying thanks dad, but the sentence never completed. Before I knew it, I had shut the car door and we began to move. This isn't my father. This man was much older, by at least 20 years, hair obviously dyed black, and hands propped at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. The shirt he was wearing looked just like one my father would have worn. A short sleeved collared button down, brick red with black horizontal lines, not pressed but not too wrinkled either. He was smiling at me, which probably would have felt warm if it was coming from my grandfather, but instead it felt menacing. I heard a click and looked over at the door, which had just been locked. I stared at the door for a moment longer, then turned to face front and completely froze, terrified. Hello, I saw you walking. I figured I'd come give you a lift. I did not move or answer. His voice matched his smile, deceivingly friendly. We were roughly a mile away from home, and half a mile from the next turn needed to head in that direction. All I could concentrate on is how I was going to get out of the situation. Are you on your way home? This snapped me a little out of my zone. Yes, I want to go home, I answered. Stay calm, talk normally, don't act scared. Where is your house? I can take you there. Feeling just slightly relieved, I told him to take the next right turn. I felt myself begin to breathe and I realized how tense I had been. My body relaxed slightly and I finally moved and wrapped my hands around my backpack straps. We started to come up on the intersection and I pointed ahead, reiterating that this was my turn. Okay, but if you want, we could take a ride instead. It sounded like a question, but it didn't feel like one. The dotted line for the turn lane had begun, but he did not get over. Instantly, I tensed back up and my grip and my gaze on the backpack straps tightened. Through strained muscles, I choked out that, no, no, I really need to get back home. He swung the car into the turn lane and began to make the turn. Wide-eyed, I glanced up and verified that yes, indeed, we were making the turn. Are you sure? I'll make sure you get home before anyone realizes you're gone. Grip tightening further, I abruptly stated that no, I need to get home now. My father is expecting me home now. He's waiting. I just hoped it sounded more convincing than it sounded to me. We completed the turn. Sigh. Okay, maybe next time. We can meet at the same place tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's good. I just need to get home today. Now. My eyes were firmly trained on the road ahead of us, hoping that if I just focus on the direction to home, I would get there. The turn until my neighborhood was approaching and I informed him, again pointing towards the direction. The direction home. The next few moments were silent. As we came upon the turn, I reminded him, and to my slight surprise and incredible relief, he made the turn. For the first time, I had more hope than doubt. My old neighborhood consisted of mainly apartments, but in the back were a block of townhouses, which is where I lived. If you were unaware of the layout of the complex, the townhouses might go unnoticed. 
Right before we got to the area where I lived, I told him here, stop here. He pulled over to the side of the road in front of an apartment building. He unlocked the door and I hurried out of the car, backpack still in hand. I began to close the car door behind me. See you here tomorrow, same time. I paused for just a second and risked another look at the man. Still smiling, still terrifying. Yes, tomorrow, see you later. I finished closing the door and hurried off. I swung my backpack on the right way and briskly walked into the opposite direction of my house. I could hear the car still idling behind me and it wasn't until I was able to turn off that road and leave his view that I heard him start to move. He had to drive up to where I was walking to turn around and I glanced back as he was making an awkward turn instead of going around the block to leave. He caught my gaze and gave a slight wave before driving off. My hand was in the reluctant process of waving back, but I was slow enough that he was gone before I completed the motion. I turned my head and kept walking, and the moment I could no longer hear his car, I ran. As fast as my legs and heavy backpack would let me, I ran around to where I could hide between two buildings and hid there for a while, until I felt enough time had passed for me to feel confident he was not driving around waiting looking for me. It was probably 30 minutes, but it felt like hours to me at the time. I ran the rest of the way home, keeping a lookout, making sure he couldn't see me going through the backyards. I reached my front door, unlocked it, and almost spilled inside. I was moving so fast. It wasn't until I locked the door behind me that I felt safe. I didn't feel scared anymore. I was home. In the end, I told both my parents, and my mother forced my father to drive and pick me up from school for the remainder of the school year. And luckily for me, the bullying stopped the next year. My father didn't believe me and thought I made up the story to get out of walking to school. In his defense, me trying to explain that, no, the car was exactly like yours, except the entire color of the inside, and no, he did look like you just with darker hair, and it all happened so fast. It was worth his disbelief and annoyance every day in the car, so I never had to meet that guy again. So this happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma, who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, my grandma's really chill was a dream. I could stay out late as much as I wanted to without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel you're invincible. You don't really think about how many screwed up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't worried about walking alone at night. The day on which the story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8pm when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit, and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time and ended up leaving her house at about 10.30pm. At this point, the rain had mostly stopped, and this being my favorite type of weather, I declined my aunt's offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab. I'm still surprised she believed this, but maybe she just didn't care. So I went on my way, called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in 30 minutes, but not telling her that I was walking alone. If there was one thing that scared me, it were the huge train tracks which you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest, so I decided to take the longer way around through some sort of a nature preserve. I'm not sure how to call it. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into my view. Just as it's beginning, I saw a man. It was a small quiet town, so it wasn't common for the people here to be out this late, but I wasn't scared immediately. I only saw his back, but he looked like every other guy you'd pass by on the street. He didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't really care. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left, but when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks and got an ominous feeling. This man couldn't have already been out of view. It would have been impossible for him to move this fast. He would have had a run and I definitely would have heard him running on the metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it, which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought that he was hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eyes off the bushes. I hid behind a tree and decided to wait a few minutes to see if he was hiding there. After about 10 minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly, the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big and shiny. I could make out in the dark that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions. How did he see me? Why didn't I see the knife before? Where was he hiding it? He suddenly started to run in my direction, so fast. He ran straight past me hiding behind this tree and I was so relieved. When he was out of sight, I ran faster than I ever ran not stopping to look behind me, being frightened the whole way back thinking that he'd somehow find me and do whatever sick thing he had in mind. Luckily, I arrived home safely, my grandma waiting for me already mad. Looking back, this is one of the most stupidest things I could have done because of what happened a month after this incident. Two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found about 30 meters from it and the other one was thrown into the nearby river. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure that it was the same man whom I've encountered.
For context, this took place when I was 16 years old. I'm 24 now, so it's been a while, but this was one of the many stupid things I've done in my life where I could have ended up dead or even worse. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and me and my friends would often go to the Lloyd Center to go shopping or just to hang around the food court being degenerates. I was walking around the mall with my friend Crystal and my mom when a man at a pop-up kiosk stopped us. He said that he represented a modeling company and wanted to talk to us about modeling for their clothing line. I considered myself better looking than the average duck, spoil alert, I am about as plain jean as they come, and so I promptly announced that I wanted to sign up for the modeling agency, which my mom quickly shut down. I replied with a why, which got me in trouble later down the line with both parents, but that was the only start of my woes. I convinced my mom to allow me and Crystal to go off on our own and with a reluctant sigh, she allowed us to go off. Me, being the dumb kid I was, marched right back to over to the modeling agent and signed myself up with a phone number and email address. He said that he would be back in contact with me shortly to set up an interview with the company. That night, I went home and saw that I had a friend request from someone that shared no mutual friends with me. Hesitantly, I added the person and a message popped up. Hi, I'm such and such from the modeling company. You signed up with our agent earlier today and I wanted to get in touch with you. I know you're in the Portland area, so we wanted to set up an interview with you next week at 9pm at this location. Are you able to come speak to us? I responded with a maybe and logged off my computer. That's when my phone started to ring. I picked it up and it was yet another guy from the agency. This new agent asked me whether or not I could come and do the interview. I said maybe and bid him farewell. It was about here that my gut instinct started to kick in. Why would they set up an interview so late at night? And I googled the address and it was in an industrial park by the airport. I chose not to answer the onslaught of emails, Facebook messages, and phone calls that I was getting. This went on for about a week before I got radio silence. The guy on my Facebook blocked me, there were no more emails or calls. It was at this point I began to worry. What if I had allowed my career to not even blossom, let alone flourish? What if I had made a mistake? I was already in hot water with my father for telling my mom off at the mall the first time. So the school in my mind, I allowed the idea to fade from my mind of what could have been. About two weeks later, our home phone started to ring. My father answered the phone and as soon as he started listening to the message, his face became ash and he instantly hung up the phone, turning me to demand what I had done. I tried to feign innocence, but I knew the jig was up. We had just gotten a phone call from the Portland Police Department to warn our family about a ring of traffickers who were targeting young girls with promises of modeling and acting. They had stumbled upon the name of one of the men who worked for the ring and through that started contacting families of young women whose information they had gotten a hold of. The worst part of it all, they had my family's address and home phone number as well. I was grounded for the rest of the year, which was to be expected, but it was better than being carted off to some trafficking ring, so I couldn't complain. When I was finally allowed back to the mall with my friends, we walked by the kiosk where the modeling agent once peddled his false hopes and dreams. All that was left was an empty booth. This happened about four years ago. I had just graduated from high school and was a month and a half into summer break. Needing money for college, I began working full time for the school district I had just graduated from. Due to a music festival I wanted to attend as well as monetary concerns, I did not go with my family to North Carolina, which was fine by me. What 18 year old doesn't want a house to themselves for a week? Furthermore, my parents' house is out in the country, so I had little to no fear about my neighbors complaining about parties or being bothered in any way whatsoever, but I was wrong. I often take the back roads home from my friend's house, but on that night I decided I wanted some McDonald's, so I took the main drag and came home on a different route. This way takes you past a mechanic shop not a mile away from our cul-de-sac. It was between midnight and 1am and as I passed the mechanic shop I noticed a car's lights turning on. Or should I say light, for this car had only one headlight working. I remember thinking that it was strange that this car all of a sudden turned its lights on as I was passing, and began to become even more concerned when it pulled out behind me. But I tend to be paranoid by nature, nothing serious but I always question the person behind me is following me and whether they mean me harm, so I brushed this off as an unfortunate coincidence. But as I neared my street and the car was still tailing me, I started to become freaked out. I looked at my gas tank and my heart sunk as I saw I was on E. Either I pull up my street and go home, or I risk driving around some and seeing if this dude follows. Yet that option held the risk of my car running out of gas and leaving me stranded on the road and I figured I'd rather take my chances on my own soil than on the side of some dark and lonely country back road. So I turned onto my street only to have my heart sink when the one headlamp car makes the turn right behind me. At this point I know I'm screwed. With nothing left to do I began pulling up my driveway. It's a hill about 100 yards long. To my utter horror they begin to follow me up. Looking back, I should have called the cops, but there was no love lost between law enforcement and myself and at the time, I was too caught up to even consider calling them. If my family would have been home, this would have never happened. I could have called my dad and he could have grabbed his gun, but he along with the rest of my family were gone, 12 hours away at the beach. So when they began to drive up my driveway after me, I stopped to put my car in reverse. 
They responded by reversing as well, yet they stopped at the bottom, effectively blocking my driveway. At this point, I pulled forward again only to have the same jig and dance happen. They followed, I reversed, they reversed, and set at the end, blocking my escape. I quickly pulled up and turned my car around to come at them head on. By this time, they were halfway up my driveway, the furthest they had come up. Looking back, I was terrified, alone, and angry. Who did this person think they were? With my brights on and shining right into their face, I opened my car door and got out. I pulled out my pocket knife and held it in my left hand while I grabbed my hammer in my right. I used to keep one in between my sear and door. In some weird desperate mindset, I made a split second decision to grab the hammer from the head with the handle sticking out. My hope was that it would be mistaken as a gun. I began yelling at points of my hammer slash gun at the car, screaming at them to get out and what do you want? All the while, I held my hammer as a gun and prayed they would fall for it. Whether they did or not, I cannot say. Part Part of me believes they thought it was a gun due to my brights being behind me making my whole front side a shadow yet they could have just not wanted a fight. Perhaps they thought I was a girl or was timid and wouldn't resist so aggressively and violently. Who knows but it worked. They slowly backed out of my driveway and crept around the cul-de-sac. As they were leaving my street I ran after them hiding behind my neighbor's houses and at every driveway the car would slow down to a near stop as if scoping out the houses. Thankfully, they didn't pull into any driveways and they turned off my street altogether. After I was safely in my house, I ate my McDonald's by the front window with all the lights turned off, waiting to see if they'd come creeping back. Thankfully, they didn't, but that night I locked every door in the house, which I always did anyways, and slept with a hammer, machete, and baseball bat next to me and my pocket knife under the pillow. Complete overkill I know, but I was terrified. Now I know where my dad keeps his gun, so if it ever happens again, I'll be better prepared. Last year, I was dog sitting for my aunt. The dog is small, sweet, and a little skittish. I had worked most of the week, so I was just living in the house for the time being. It's a nice house, not big enough to feel empty if you're alone, but not small enough to feel cramped. The only rooms I used were the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and the guest bedroom. My last day of work this particular week was a double shift. I was excited because after this I had two days off. I planned on using them to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I usually try to keep good spirits for a double shift because regardless of the time and annoying customers, extra money is always needed. My old job was a barista and cashier. Mornings are always busy and nights are slow. On weekends, people are more concerned with coffee and breakfast than anything else we may have to offer. I was having a nice time, actually, because this day was turning out to be not as hectic as the previous ones that week, one even involving a small fire. As the morning rush line was dwindling, the limited tables in the restaurant came into view and I started people watching. As I slowly scanned the customers eating bagels and reading the paper, my eyes met a man at a laptop. He had long, dirty hair and a bit of a stubble. He stared at me with a little too much intensity. I wondered if he found my people watching rude, so I decided to clean and restock instead. It didn't take long for a line to reform, so I returned to my register. Once again, after the line died down, I could see the few tables in the front. The man was still there and he was still staring at me. Every now and then he would look at his computer and then back to me. It almost felt like he was looking right through me, or like he could see every part of me. It felt so uncomfortable that I went and cleaned in the back of the restaurant, out of his sight. After the next rush, I took my break and sat far away from the man. He was out of sight and I was out of his. When I came back from the break, the man was gone. My manager asked if I had interacted with him at all. I told her about him making eye contact with me, but that nothing else really happened. She told me that the man had been watching 18 plus content on his laptop and she had asked him to leave. So that was weird enough. The man had been watching that and stared at me. I really wish that this is where the story stopped. Hours passed and the rest of the day was entirely normal, despite me and a few female co-workers feeling a slight edge. We were in the process of closing, which is actually a process I really enjoy. We're well in and I'm almost done with my assigned jobs when my manager comes up to me again. She informs me that the man had found his way back in the restaurant at some point and she found him hiding in a back corner. She chased him out by threatening to call the police. She knew that earlier in the day, he seemed to be paying attention to me. She said I could finish up whatever I wanted or needed to, but afterwards she strongly advised me to get home as soon as possible. She also offered to walk me to my car. I took both offers and quickly got my things together and clocked out. My aunt's house was not far from work. It was a 5 minute drive at most, which was helpful because then I didn't feel the crippling anxiety for much longer. I got in the house and after triple checking that I had locked every door, got into my pajamas. But unsurprisingly, I was not ready to sleep yet. Now was the time to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I went into the living room. The living room consists of a couch, two chairs, a TV, a window, and the front door. Unfortunately, the porch light was broken and the window had no curtains. That had me a little stressed, but I was willing to take that over the only other TV in the house, which was the one that exists in the scary basement. Facing the basement TV included having my back to a sudden glass door facing the very dark woods. No thanks. I was setting up the TV when the dog started growling. 
I really didn't think much of it. As I said, the dog is skittish so he growls and barks all the time. I wasn't looking at him. I was muttering shush shush and figuring out how to work the TV. The dog didn't stop and started to get louder so I finally put down the remote and I turned to face the dog. I froze. The dog was barking at the window and there was an outline of a man at the window. The exact same build as the one at the restaurant. I screamed and luckily that was enough for the man to run away from the window. I stood there frozen for a while. The dog had calmed down but I hardly felt safe. So I went into the kitchen, grabbed a big knife, and called my mom. She did not advise calling the police, my mom never does, and instead came and spent the night with me. I told my aunt. I spent the rest of my time dog sitting clutching the knife anytime I slept or took a shower. My aunt also gave me permission to have one friend stay with me every night. Nothing else ever happened. I never even saw the guy come into work again. A part of me wishes I knew who he was or where he went, or what he even wanted with me. I'm glad he was a coward and that all it took to scare him off was my scream and an extra small dog. The year was 1995 and I was 16 years old. I lived in a three bedroom, tooth bath house in a middle class suburban community with my mother, two younger brothers, and our 140 pound Doberman, Turbo. From the front door of our house, relevant, you could see directly into our living room which had an open concept floor plan with the kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior years in high school. My brothers and I spent a decent amount of time outdoors. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in our house, and I suppose they knew that the only adult was gone when the only car was gone. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I never noticed anything off and I never noticed anything afterwards, so maybe we were just a random target. It was a Saturday and mom and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning, so to cool off, you would open up all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the back sliding door and front door wide open to get a cross breeze. Neither screen door was locked. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door in shorts and a tank top with unlocked doors. In my defense, there was 140 pounds of protective dog muscle on the floor next to me, and probably only for that reason am I alive. Around the approximate time I expected my family home from the store, Turbo began barking. Assuming he was barking their arrival, I told him to shush and try to go back to sleep. Turbo continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after 5-10 to 10 minutes of Turbo refusing to quiet and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing something was wrong. A man who I didn't know stood, seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming that the man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried the 10 steps to the unlocked screen door, constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized for my dog and for not hearing his knock. He never knocked. The man explained that he was from the phone company and he was here to check our lines. He never took his eyes off Turbo. Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see the street. Only unmarked, privately owned cars lined the street. I looked at the man who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans, and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door, but I was no fool. Phone company personnel A, always wear uniforms, B, always drive company vehicles, and C, don't come without being called, and D, don't work weekends. I looked at the man who had yet to look up from the 140 pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it. This got his attention. He met my eyes as I said, you have 30 seconds to show me identification or I'll open this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo. I then gave him all the meat in the fridge. I believe with absolute certainty that I would have been attacked if we hadn't had him. I like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would have been in the habit of locking doors. But what would a screen door latch do against an intruder? And that creep stood there and watched me for 5-10 to 10 minutes. Perhaps he was paralyzed in fear, but maybe he was working his angles and only Turbo's insistent display of his willingness to kill anyone who threatened to be changed his mind. That's my theory. Turbo is long past, but his legacy lives on, and two loving, loyal, and lethal when necessary dogs sleep in my room every night. For context, I'm a 5'3", 24-year-old female and working as a programmer for an IT company in the Philippines. Now the area where my office is in compromises of three buildings, Building A where my office is in, Building B, and Building C. To get to the other building, it would take you like around 10 minutes to get there, important for later. This happened to me a year ago around the end of February until March. I just got out of a bad breakup at the time and I really intended it just to focus on myself and not meet anyone yet. I just got out of work and it's around 7pm on a Friday night and went to my usual waiting spot, which has benches and is located at the back of our building near the entrance of the underground parking. For our company shuttle and Omar shuttle dispatcher is there. 
Now, I've known Omar for two years and is someone I consider now as a friend and we've been often chat about our lives, even the breakup with my ex then, and joke around. He's a 40 plus year old guy and he gives out this big fatherly vibe so he's really someone that I trust. That night, he was there and with someone new that I didn't recognize, our conversation went like this. Omar, oh hi. Good thing you're here, I would like you to meet someone since he told me he already wants to meet you for a long time now. And then this guy stood up and shook my hand. I greeted him as just to be polite and this new guy, let's name him Ray. He's average looking and a little shorter to my height, 5 foot 1 I think. And he instantly gave off an all 5 as soon as I shook his hand. I thought that would be the end of it, but he proceeded to talk to me for a few minutes while I wait for my shuttle to arrive. Omar has purposely left me and this Ray guy so that we could talk and get to know each other. I'm actually puzzled at this point because, one, I have no clue who this guy is and why he would be so eager to meet me, and two, I clearly told Omar before that I'm not into meeting anyone just yet. But for the sake of being polite and nice, I talked to Ray but we never reached any personal questions, exchanging numbers, social media accounts, or even telling him my full name. I just told him my nickname, and I left it just as that when I finally got on the shuttle. Fast forward to a week and Friday again, I got off at work in the same time and surprise surprise, Ray is there again with Omar and his security guard. They were chatting but as soon as I came, Ray instantly greeted me and at this point, I'm a little creeped out as I expected our encounter would only be a one time thing. I just said hi and brushed him off and sat on the benches to wait for my shuttle again and of course, as this guy doesn't seem to know the definition of personal space, sat beside me and talked to me again but this time he's asking for my cell phone number. I told him off and clearly said that I'm not giving out my number to strangers and just giving him one word answers just to give an impression that I wasn't interested at all. He would ask, why wouldn't you give your number, I just want to be friends. And I could see it in his face that he was getting frustrated every time I told him I wasn't giving it to him. This happened while Omar and the security guard was looking at us from afar, but this went on until I got on the shuttle again. As soon as I got home, I mindlessly scrolled through my timeline and saw a notification that I have a new friend request and guess what? It's Ray and he even messaged me with a, please accept my friend request. I just deleted his request, but now I'm pretty shocked since I didn't tell him my Facebook account, so how did he manage to find me? The following day was the last straw when I decided to get off at an earlier time so that I could avoid him, but to my surprise, he was there, again waiting for me, along with Omar and the security guard. Ray immediately ran up to me to say hi, but I brushed him off and dreaded the fact that I would have to wait with this creep again when I saw my shuttle isn't there yet. He immediately asked me if I accepted his Facebook request, and I decided to play dumb and said I haven't been active on Facebook and I haven't seen any requests. He got disappointed and he fiddled with his phone for a bit and then revealed his phone to show my Facebook profile and asked me if this was me. I said yes, and this time, I was completely ignoring him at this point and playing with my phone and told him that I wasn't going to accept his request because I don't know him. And then Ray grabbed my phone out of my hands angrily and said he was going to add himself using my Facebook account if I won't. I muttered a what the and grabbed my phone from him and with perfect timing, I got on the shuttle in a hurry and told the driver to go. At this point, I could confirm that this guy could be stalking me and now knows my daily schedule and social media accounts. I reported this incident to my manager and told her how this was already happening for some time now. She was surprised that I didn't report it earlier but I blamed it on my lack of assertiveness and fear that I might be overreacting to his advances. We reported the incident to office security and told them what happened and they couldn't do anything at first as, one, I need actual evidence about my allegations to him, and two, I only knew Ray by his first name and they would need more information than that. I didn't bother to ask where he's from or if he's even working in our office slash building which is dumb of me and I should have asked in the first place. My manager then decided that I should be at least accompanied by some of my office mates to confirm the situation and the guys volunteered to accompany me every time I got off work. They accompanied me for a couple days and no matter what time I got out, Ray was there to harass me. I felt bad for my office mates as they had to deal with his BS as well. First instance when he saw I was with my office mates, I could see the visible anger in his eyes and he would try to butt in our conversation even if we were ignoring him. At one point when I'm talking with my office mates, he let out an exasperated sigh and said, Can I talk to you for a second please? What do you want? I just want to talk to you. If you don't, I'll leave. Okay, and then I went back to talking to my office mates. He butted in once more and asked that I should introduce him to my office mates when I didn't. He proceeded to introduce himself instead which irked the heck out of my office mates and I as his behavior doesn't seem normal at all. After that incident, my office mates and I told my manager what happened and how dangerous this guy might be. She decided that we should escalate it to HR and have them deal with it immediately. Gladly, HR responded and took the situation seriously and began to do an investigation on who Ray might be. Same day, they sent an email that after searching through records, turns out Ray wasn't an employee at our office and they might need to talk to building security to find out more about this guy. HR also requested our office security to escort me and observe the situation. I honestly felt relieved as now I'll feel safe for the time being while they search for who Ray might be. He still showed up even if I got out late or earlier than usual, but never went near me when he saw I was accompanied by security but he would just keep his distance and stare at me, smile creepily and linger outside my shuttle until it left. 
HR contacted me for a meeting with him and my manager about some news on Ray and I was shocked by the information that they found out. Ray was not an employee of our building slash office, but in fact, a temp in the security office in building C. I then thought, okay, this creep is really putting an effort for someone who is clearly not interested and if he's a temp meaning there's a chance I won't be able to see him after this. But then what HR said chilled me to the bone. He was a temp assigned to work on the security cameras meaning he had access to all the building cameras. It has been his way to spy on me and the reason why he was able to be there at the exact same time I got out. HR has already spoken to his supervisor and gave a warning to Ray and of course, Ray denied the allegations even if I had witnesses against him. The supervisor wanted to apologize to me in person but I decided not to as I just wanted this to be over with. After that meeting, I never saw Ray again and I reckon he must have been kicked out after HR issued warning against him. As for Omar, I never seen him as well and I felt bad but he was also part of the people who enabled Ray and didn't do anything when I was clearly getting harassed. I received a bit of backlash from the security guards at the building for a while as well. Hearing them say that I was overreacting and I should have accepted his advances which was disgusting as I heard the same thing being said by female building staff as well. Nothing strange happened for a few days but then the security guard that was with Omar at the time when Ray was harassing me added me on Facebook but I didn't make much of it and just deleted the request. I'm still working in the same office and building as of today and been totally shaken up by the incident that I decided just to keep my distance from people so I could avoid from this ever happening again and to Ray please don't meet me again. Again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story is of my brief friendship with a guy that near stalked me, and I'm sharing it for some closure, I think. I started my freshman year of college at a university in my hometown that's pretty nice. I'm not going to share too much about it, but it has a smaller amount of students but enough that you don't really run into people often. I lived on campus and I was only 17 at the time. I had Tinder of course, as I was fresh out of a relationship and looking to experience new things in college. I matched with this one boy, Asher, who seemed nice enough. Pretty socially awkward, but I never really minded because I have anxiety issues myself and I'm really sympathetic to it. Because of that, I ignored a lot of warning signs I shouldn't have. We texted for a while and he seemed really nice and caring. He wanted to know a lot about me, which I wasn't too keen on sharing, but I told him the basics and we texted kind of regularly. He lived on campus as well and invited me to hang out. At that time, things didn't seem too sketchy so I was completely down. When I first met him, that's when things started to get uncomfortable. We hung out in his dorm, which is pretty standard overall. I got cozy with him on his couch. I'd say almost cuddling, but not quite. Still, really standard. When we started talking more, I realized how uncomfortable things really were. He kept making comments that just put me off, but I tried to ignore them. Things like, I've never really cuddled with anyone before. Sorry if I'm doing it wrong and so many comments about how he already liked me a lot and wanted me to stay forever. Weird word choice, but whatever, he's just trying to be nice, I let him down easy. I ended that hangout pretty quickly for some fake excuse, and went right back to my room. He kept texting me and professing how much he was into me, and I told him sorry, but I'm not looking for any kind of relationship, so I do not want to keep things romantic. A bad lie, but I'm very non-confrontational and I didn't want to be mean. That's when things started to get really weird. He sent me this long paragraph saying about how it was okay I didn't want a relationship now, and that he'd wait for me to save his virginity for me. We had never talked about anything sexual, I had never really even told him I liked him or flirted back. I just never turned him down. It was one of the creepiest messages I've ever received. Unfortunately, this was just the start of all the things we were to come. He wouldn't leave me alone even though I kept trying to de-escalate things, and I kept running into him all over campus. I wasn't sure how he suddenly was nearby when my classes ended, and I wasn't sure why suddenly we'd both be in the dining hall at the same times, even though I hadn't changed my regular routine, but I just tried to brush it off. Definitely a mistake. I ended up turning him down completely because I was getting creeped out and couldn't figure out how he wasn't understanding that I didn't want anything romantic or sexual with him, telling me how he was going to off himself and no one was ever going to love him. I've been in a manipulative relationship in the past, and I recognized that behavior right away and shut it down. I told him I couldn't be friends with him, and in my head that was that. He didn't reply for a while, but when he did, everything broke loose. I was luckily out of town at the time for a concert, so that made me feel a lot better. He went off, sent me paragraphs after paragraph about how horrible of a person I was, and how I needed to get put in my place, etc. I could handle that, I just ignored it. Then, once the regrets set in, he made it his mission to win my love however possible. He apologized profusely, told me how he couldn't be all alone and I was his only friend, and how much he loved me. Whatever, terrible, but I didn't care about that. Then, I guess to prove his dedication, he did the creepiest thing yet. 
it. First, he told me he was outside my room. We did not live in the same dorm building, and you can't get into the buildings unless you live there. I don't know who let him in. I wasn't there, and my roommate was out, so that was okay. I texted back at that point and told him to leave and how wrong and creepy that was, and he pulled out his last resort. He just sent me screenshots of my contact in his phone. On Apple devices, you could fill in tons of information and have a note section. Everything was entirely full. He knew my home address, my room number on campus, my parents' and brothers' names, my pets' names, my schedule. It was terrifying because I'm a fairly private person. My Instagram is my only social media and I do not share that much on it. I don't think I'll ever find out how he discovered all that about me. I blocked him on everything right away and reported him to school. The school did nothing at all. I still see him on campus, but it seems like he doesn't care about me anymore gladly. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled frequently, I was left home alone quite often. First of all, I'm going to try to do my best to describe you the layout of my house so you can better understand my situation. My house is pretty small since it's just my father, my dog, and me living in it. There's a long hallway full of full-size windows separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog loved to look out the windows, so we always kept them open enough for her to look out. I'm the last room at the end of the hallway, and between the two rooms is my bathroom and a spare room. All the rest is irrelevant. Let's get to it. It was around 11pm when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a long day, and I was mindlessly dancing around my house getting ready for bed. I just hopped in my shower, not knowing what was coming ahead, when my dog starts aggressively barking up a storm. I walk out the bathroom and go out and explore. I head to my room to throw some clothes on while my dog is still barking. Months before, I'm not sure how I managed to break my door handle, but you don't have to twist the knob to open it, all it needs is a small push. Scared, I barely managed to put a shirt on when my dog opened the door. I looked to see her enter my room, while in the midst of barking that's when I saw it. There's only one window that has vision to the opening of my room, and in the corner of it I saw a face. It was dark, so I took a second to comprehend what I just saw, but when I finally realized it, I screamed. My dad owns lots of guns, so when he heard me scream, he ran out with a pistol. He asked me what happened and could barely mutter what I saw. He ran outside to see if the man with the terrifying face was still near. We stood out there for maybe a minute scanning the area. A man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction from about 100 yards away. I knew it was him. I got that feeling in my stomach that you can't mistake. It was like he was trying to cover up that he was there by coming from a different direction. But he didn't fool me. You better stay away from my daughter. You see what I have here, you know what this does. Holding up his gun, I could have sworn my dad was going to shoot. The man brushed these threats off easily. My dad and I went back inside. He went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I could not sleep a week. I kept thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of the threats to him. We called the cops the next morning and they came and scoped out our house. He looked around the house trying to calm me down but I was still pretty shaken up. He went to the front yard and that's when he saw it. In front of the windows in the long hallway there were small bushes, nothing much. The cop from outside went to the window that had view of my room and there it was. If he tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, he failed. There were incidents in the dirt right in front of the window. That meant he knew where he needed to look for you and it seems as if he had come here more than once because of the broken pieces of bush and the divots in the ground. Turns out he was the nephew of my old neighbor and he had been staying there for months. Never rested, never got in trouble, probably barely got a slap on the wrist. But at least he's gone now. How long had he been watching me, I'll never know. All I know is I keep my door shut and I never keep the blinds open. To begin, I've always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house 8 years ago. At first I thought I was just being paranoid, but I could not help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school, I was always scared in the mornings when it would be dark during the winter or fall because where I live is just fast country lands. I live in Canada and although not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I never could rid myself of this eerie feeling. Even when I would come home from school, being home alone did not help. I would triple check my windows and locks to make sure everything was locked. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock since the door hinge was broken and detached from the door. Therefore, it would never properly close. I always told my dad to fix this door, but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen since my garage needed a four-digit passcode to get in. Now, my theory is that he knew the passcode of my house. Therefore, he had free reign for seven years to go through my things. At first, I thought I was being forgetful. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top, or maybe my dad accidentally donated it. But I should have known better. During my four years in high school, he never really contacted me. It was when I went to university that things started to change. Since I live in the countryside, I decided to go to a university an hour away. My dad did not want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time. 
so we came to the conclusion that it would be the best if I drive to and from school. Now I would leave for university very early in the morning around 6am and come back around 6pm at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time because I would be tired from my 12 hour days and now that I wasn't walking alone everything would be fine. When I would come home from university I would find certain things moved in my house. I am a neat freak and I like things a particular way in my house. When little things like my makeup or candles would be moved, I thought it was odd and would frequently bring it up to my dad, but he would just say that it must have been me who was doing it, but it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started getting weird notes in my mailbox. The writing on these notes looked almost childlike and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country style mailboxes at the end of my driveway where the little red flag goes up whenever we get mail. From my way back from university, I would always check the mail and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long, in fact they would only be one of three sentences that would contain odd questions like, where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now, why is that? I miss the scarves you used to wear. You don't close your curtains as much anymore, why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month at the beginning of the month. I would show my dad and at first he would say, oh maybe your cousins are just pranking you, or it's probably your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response saying that they never sent me any letters. Now that I am in my fourth year at university, the letters do not come as frequently, but two weeks ago something happened that makes me think that things are escalating. I came back home from university at 7.45pm and it was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up, so I checked the mail and it was just bills. At this point, I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now, so I am thinking maybe the notes will not come anymore. As I settle in for bed, I change into my pajamas, and I check the locks usually. As I checked my front door lock, I look out the glass panel on my door and I saw that the red flag on my mailbox is up. It's 10.30 at night so no way the mail could have gotten dropped off and plus I just checked the mail. I call my dad and tell him about it and he said not to freak out and that maybe one of our neighbors accidentally got our mail and just dropped it off since this happens frequently. I stay on the phone with my dad and quickly run down my driveway to check my mailbox. As I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's an unmarked vanilla envelope. I quickly run back inside and open the vanilla envelope and although there is no written note, I find something more disturbing. It is a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point I scream and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt who is a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and ask if I know anyone who could be doing this but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters like it and she has been staying with me the days my dad is out for work. I just hope that we're able to find whoever this is. About two years ago when I was 17, I received a Facebook message from someone named Dan who I didn't recognize. I had mutual friends with him and he looked to be around the same age as me so I wasn't alarmed. What follows is the messages. Dan, hello, have you been? Haven't seen you in a few years. Me, hi, not trying to be rude but do we know each other? Dan, um, yeah, you really don't know me? I didn't respond. Dan, wow, real nice way to treat a family friend. Me, sorry I just don't recognize you. Dan then sent a picture of me and him together from when we were little. And I mean really little. Like I looked maybe 2 or 3 and he looked 5 or 6. Me, oh wow, did our parents used to be friends or something? Dan, I was your neighbor. You really don't recognize me. Come on, I didn't move that long ago. He had in fact moved a long time ago. At least 12 years ago. So I honestly feel like it's not that uncommon for me to not recognize someone who I hadn't seen or talked about since I was 4. Anyways, the conversation continued like that. I apologized for not remembering him and just started catching up. He was being nice enough and I was bored so whatever, no harm, no foul. After we kept talking, I started remembering more about him. Like I remembered him coming over and swinging in my backyard and me going over to his house with my big brother and all of us hanging out together. Dan was a few years older than me, at least two but I can't remember exactly. Anyways, we kept talking on Facebook just messaging back and forth about normal things until it started to get late and I was tired and at school the next day so I told him I was going to bed. I closed my computer and just laid down and went to sleep. The next morning I woke up to a bunch of messages from him. Things like good night beautiful and sweet dreams, message me when you wake up, are you asleep yet, can't wait to talk to you. Literally there was almost 50 messages. I was creeped out but I opened the messages and glanced through them and just didn't reply. On my phone I have it set to where I don't get notifications from Facebook Messenger. At the time I was in a lot of group chats with different team sports and group of friends so it was just easier to at the end of the day check my messages versus getting a ton of notifications all day long. Some point during the day I had gotten more messages from him that I just hadn't noticed while I was at school he was saying stuff like, do you still live at insert address here? I did still live there. Does your mom still freak out about you hanging with boys? My mom has never freaked out over boys. Let's go out and catch up. Let me take you out and treat you right. It just kept going on and on with really random questions that weren't necessarily threatening but just somewhat creepy. 
He then talked about wanting to go on dates even though he didn't even live in the same state anymore that I live in so I have no idea how he would have planned on going on dates with me. The messages just kept continuing over the next week him telling me he wants to go on dates and asking me really weird questions about my mom, my brother, and my house and then he started asking about his house that he used to live in. I didn't reply to any of his messages but I was getting at least 50 a day. Eventually, I brought it up to my mom and just asked her if she remembered Dan from next door. Her face completely drained of color and she got super serious all of a sudden and she asked me why I was breaking him up. I told her that he had messaged me on Facebook and was trying to get me to go out on a date with him and was just trying to catch up. I didn't tell her he'd been messaging me 50 plus times a day and I wasn't responding at this point. She told me to block him and never message him again. I asked her why and this is a summary of what she told me. When I was 3 or 4 I used to play over at his house a lot. His mom would always offer to babysit me if my mom had to go out and run errands and he also had a little sister who was around my age so my mom figured it was a perfect opportunity for a play date between Dan, my brother, me and Dan's little sister. One day when I came home after one of these play dates, my mom was asking me and my brother what we had done that day. My brother started talking about how he had watched some movie. I apparently told my mom that Dan had brushed my hair for me. My mom thought that was a little weird that a 6 year old boy wanted to brush a 3 year old girl's hair so she asked a couple more questions and it came out that he wasn't brushing my hair. He had been taking a brush and was rubbing it all over my body while I was only in my undies. My brother didn't know anything about this because we had been in Dan's room and my brother had been in the living room with Dan's little sister. After that my mom didn't let me go back over to his house. Apparently when my mom confronted his mom about it, a huge fight broke out. Not physically, but a screaming match. It turns out that Dan had been doing similar stuff to his little sister, but it had escalated farther than that with me. My mom threatened to report them to the police or Child Protective Services. She did both. But before much could be done, they moved out and found somewhere else to live. They were renting the house. After hearing that from my mom, I immediately blocked Dan on Facebook. I wasn't quick enough, I guess, however, because he messaged a bunch of my friends on Facebook asking about me and had changed his relationship status to take and in a relationship with me. He then followed me on Instagram and found my Snapchat somehow. He liked and commented on almost all of my Instagram pictures and sent me a bunch of Snapchats. I quickly blocked him on both and luckily he never figured out my phone number. Luckily I haven't heard from him since. We were both 16 and 13 respectfully. My sister and I were home alone while my parents were out of state for a couple of days to attend the funeral of a longtime family friend. Our grandfather lived only a couple miles away and was originally supposed to babysit us, but he trusted my sister and I would be fine, and he would be on call if anything were to go bad. Well, of course, something did. Just our luck. It was around 10pm or somewhere close to that on the second night and I was upstairs in my bed trying to sleep after a long day of biking around with a couple of friends. My sister suddenly came running up the stairs which she almost never did unless she was in a hurry for some reason. She came into my room and was frantically talking to someone on the phone. I lied there in confusion while she talked. I don't remember exactly what was said, but when she hung up, she hugged me and told me that everything was alright and that grandpa was on his way. What had happened was that my sister was sitting outside on our stoop talking to a friend of hers on the phone when a pickup truck came rolling onto our driveway. My parents don't own a pickup so I immediately threw up a red flag. Once she saw a man get out carrying a duffel bag, that's when she came running inside and called our grandfather. My grandfather may have been 60 at the time, but he's no pushover. Being 6 foot 4 and having the strength of Godzilla with a Demeter to match when it comes to protecting his loved ones. He also owns firearms, which I wouldn't doubt for a second he would bring alone in case something really hit the fan. We also lived in an area where the police would take a bit of time to reach, which is another reason why my sister called him and not the authorities. Suddenly, we hear what sounds like a door being kicked open downstairs. Almost immediately afterwards, we began barricading my bedroom door. Since none of the bedroom doors had locks in them at the time. Once we're done, she looks at the window while I sit there, covering myself with my blanket. All the while we hear footsteps downstairs on our hardwood kitchen floor. My sister then looked around my room and asked if I had a bat or something, which I did in my closet. My Louisville slugger that I used when my parents made me play baseball when I was in elementary school. I also had a hockey stick, but who would use that as a weapon unless in a very circumstantial situation? She rummaged through my closet and found it, then stood next to the door while I ducked down behind her, thinking maybe I should grab the hockey stick, but it's much less intimidating than a bat. Unless this burglar has some sort of PTSD associated with hockey, then this is the ultimate weapon. We then hear the sound of a gunshot followed by a man yelling out in pain. The sound of both I can still hear even to this day when I think about it hard enough. My sister and I are standing by the door, almost sobbing when about a minute later, we then hear my grandfather yell out our names, asking if we were alright to which we both yelled out simultaneously that we were. My sister and I pulled the dresser and various other objects out the way of my door and we both went out into the hallway. We heard my grandfather on the phone with 911 as we stood at the top of the stairs. When the police and ambulance arrived, the man who had broken in was taken out on a stretcher, to which I later learned was shot in the abdomen. 
My grandfather had come in through the same back door and found the man in our kitchen looking through drawers. When he came at my grandfather with one of our kitchen knives, that's when he was shot. The man almost died from blood loss, but ended up surviving and I hope he's learned his lesson, both through being incarcerated and by being shot in the abdomen and almost losing his life. But, of course, you never know with certain people, especially the nefarious ones. This all started my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 and at a new school, so I didn't have many friends yet. I was in that phase where I thought I needed a boyfriend to have validation, so I was actively trying to find a date for the homecoming dance. A classmate suggested a junior in one of her classes, whom I will call David, to be my date and got him to ask me out. He seemed nice, so I said yes, a decision that would haunt me for the next two years. David and I had fun at homecoming, so when he asked me to be his girlfriend, I said yes. It's important to know that he was quite the loner. He was very much into science and often spent alone conducting experiments in his room and even at school at times. I just brushed it off as him being quirky and figured I shouldn't get in the way of his passions, but it wasn't long before I realized there was much more to his nice guy facade. Over the first several weeks of our relationship, we would talk over the phone and David would make increasingly inappropriate comments about things he wanted to do to me. I was 15 at the time and he was 17, so not only was I incredibly uncomfortable, but he was also nearly an adult making these comments to a younger girl. I kept telling him I wasn't comfortable with the things he was saying, but he always laughed it off as me being prude. I was fed up after a while and finally threatened to break up with him and that finally made him stop. I should have recognized the red flags and bailed at that moment, but again, I was dumb and felt I wasn't worth anything unless I had a boyfriend. Although the inappropriate comments stopped for the time being, he would still become increasingly possessive and downright obsessed over what I was doing at all hours of the day. He would intrude on conversations I had with my friends and want to know things that frankly weren't any of his business. One day when I was getting into the shower, he called and my dad told him I would call him when I was done. Instead of simply waiting like any rational person would do, he called a total of 4 times over the next 10-15 to 15 minutes to see if I was out of the shower yet. I began to feel suffocated, but every time I asked him to back off, he would cry about how depressed he was and that he only wanted to talk to someone to feel like he was wanted. I always fell for it like the dummy I was, but now I recognized the clear manipulation that it was. One day I finally had enough. I broke up with him in person at school and he bawled like a child. I didn't let it get to me this time however and firmly told him that I didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. Although he couldn't get his way, he still somehow convinced me to stay friends. I know I was an idiot, but things didn't end there. Over the next several months, David kept trying to get me to go out with him again, even going as far as to cry in front of other people to garner sympathy. Fortunately for me, David had earned a bad reputation throughout his school year, so no one really believed him. He would even try to trick me into a date by subtly suggesting we go see a movie as friends, which I always got around by inviting my friends to come along too. They knew what he was doing and never turned down the chance to help a girl out. In the last few weeks I spoke to him, he would sit on the phone for hours on and literally begging me to take him back, and thankfully I held on strong and kept refusing. One night his brother actually called me telling me he was crying hysterically. Eventually it came to a point where I told him I didn't want to hang out anymore because it was clear that he would not stop until he became his girlfriend again. He agreed to not approach me anymore, but I wouldn't be writing this story if it ended here. The very next day at school, David came up to me like nothing had happened. I once again reminded him of the conversation we had the night before about how we agreed to not hang out anymore, but he acted offended that I would even suggest such a thing. Eventually, my friends and I convinced him to leave, but of course it didn't stop there. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school, call my house, and my cell phone. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school and call my house. This was the days before smartphones, so blocking his number wasn't as easy. I tried to get help from the school staff, but the vice principal basically told me that there was nothing I could do because he wasn't trying to hurt me. I was frustrated, but thankfully David seemed to back off when it was clear that I wasn't going to give in. That is until I got another boyfriend. The following school year, my junior year, I started dating a senior named Justin. Not long after we went public with our relationship, I noticed David following me again. Now Justin was a football player and he was a pretty big guy with unresolved anger issues, so he didn't take kindly to this guy. He would hang out with me and my friends and David would hover over nearby, walking by every now and then and making it blatantly obvious that he was spying on me. One day, Justin walked straight up to David and confronted him. He didn't lay his hands on him or threaten him in any way, but he did ask, what are you doing, in a really angry tone. David simply muttered some kind of excuse and scurried away. We thought that was the end of it, but later in the day I was called to the principal's office. Turns out David claimed that Justin threatened him and blocked the doorway so he couldn't move. Justin denied it, of course, and told the principal I could back up his claim, which I did. Thankfully, nothing came of it, but this was only the first of a long line of incidents. 
Over the school year, David and his brother, who was a year younger than me, would try to get Justin in trouble every which way they could, even starting rumors and threatening his life. A classmate of mine overheard them talking about ambushing Justin and hurting him, but even though I brought this to the staff, nothing was done about it. All the while, David kept following me when Justin wasn't around. There was even an incident in the school gym one day when a bunch of classes had to stay there for the period. He and I both were there and he made sure to sit on the bleachers nearby, even following me when I moved. I was on the verge of tears, but then I saw two guys I knew sitting on a few rows down from me. They were cool with me, so I got their attention and, after explaining what was going on, asked them if I could sit with them to feel safer. They accepted and we ended up having a good time talking about music. In spite of this, things just kept getting worse with David. Finally, it came to a head when David's brother wrote a letter to Justin's sister. They had been good friends before this whole mess started, and in the letter David's brother threatened physical harm to me and to Justin. The sister gave the letter to Justin, who then came to me, and we both brought it to the principal. That was when the principal called everyone involved into his office and had a nice little chat with us. The principal showed the letter to David's brother and said, I can expel you for this right now, but I am willing to let it go on one condition. David and Justin were both about to graduate, so the principal gave them the ultimatum. He stated that David and his brother were not to contact me or Justin in any way, shape, or form for the rest of the school year, or he would see to that neither of them would graduate. I was pissed because Justin did nothing wrong, but in the end, we just wanted this whole mess to be over with. From that point on, David didn't bother me again, thankfully. Justin and I ended up breaking up that summer for unrelated reasons, and the following year I didn't have to see either of them ever again. A few years later, however, David tried to send me from requests on Facebook. I deleted the request and blocked them. I even unfriended and blocked the two mutual friends we had for good measure. Sure, I was being paranoid, but it made me feel better. There was one last incident involving David not with me, but with my younger brother. When he was 14, he took his then-girlfriend to see one of the Transformer movies and David walked in. Upon recognizing my brother, he sat behind him in his date and kept laughing uncontrollably at inappropriate times and even started kicking their seat. My brother tried confronting him, but it did no good. They didn't bother getting the manager because my brother's date was too afraid he would attack them if they tried to leave. Thankfully, that was the last incident I or anyone close to me ever had with him. I'm doing much better now. I'm 30 years old and, ironically, I ended up marrying one of the guys who sat with me in the gym that day. My advice to any teenagers reading this is that you should always pay attention to red flags and get rid of toxic people in your life. It's always better to end up alone than stuck with someone who makes you feel bad and treats you like your feelings don't matter. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending in college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at around 3am when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first and thought that the car was on the other side of the highway. Sure enough, the white Ford sedan passed me at a really high speed at around 90 miles per hour. It's worth noting for later that I also drive a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunk slash idiot drivers in the middle of the night so I pulled to the side of the road and let him pass me. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could hurt themselves or somebody else. The dispatcher answered and after telling them which road and exit slash mile marker I was at, told me they would send a car. The state police station was only a few exits away so I figured they would send somebody and I would just drive home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern Pennsylvania and traffic at 3am tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting up to speed so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed. Instead, they flipped on their high beams making it uncomfortable to drive and rode my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan and had just called out a different white Ford sedan, so I grabbed my registration from my glove box. Suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway. They must have shut off their car because the lights went out and I saw what looked like the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought this may have been a police car, they had a roof rack, and it could have looked like I had reached for a gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for the second time and asked the dispatcher if they had sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little curt with me and assured me that they sent somebody out. Dispatcher, we have sent a trooper out to find the car, sir. Me, I only ask because somebody is following me and acting weird. It could be a cop and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Dispatcher, are you pulled over? Me, no, they didn't turn on the lights. Dispatcher, let me try to get the trooper we sent out. As she was talking, the car again sped towards me and stopped inches from my bumper. Again, their high beams were on and again they slammed their brakes. I told the dispatcher, I'm pretty sure this is not the police behind me. The car sped to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time laying on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. Dispatcher, what's happening? Did you honk? Me. That's the car behind me. I don't think it's a cop. Dispatcher, I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that's him behind you. 
For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I would get pulled over and maybe get a ticket. Up until then, I was going to the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I get pulled over, I'm speeding and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate and the person behind me just kept up with me. The speed limit was 55 and they kept on my bumper the entire time, but this time they were swerving. I tried to signal for an exit then bail on it, but they followed. At the next exit, I took the off ramp and continued onto the on ramp and the car behind me followed the whole time. I thought about trying to go to a Wawa gas station, but the dispatcher and I thought that it would be unsafe. She was calm and talking to another person trying to send police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the state police station. Realizing that I was one exit away, I told her I was coming there and she said that she would have troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off to the exit, the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to get to the police station and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights, and turned into a parking lot. The story ends kind of anticlimactically as I pulled into the police station and met the troopers. Two of them went to find the car and I stayed with the third trooper. I think the dispatcher and her supervisor and the state trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow up or testify so I can only assume the person didn't get caught. I don't drink as a general rule, but once a month or so I'll go out with friends and binge. My friends and I had a great night at a bar in the city and they left. I was chatting up a cute guy so I decided to stay. I went back to his place. After post coitus, I'm ready to head home so I call an Uber to pick me up. I don't know where I am, I know the city I'm in but not my exact location. I ordered the Uber but it's taking forever. So I cancel it and try again. Pretty soon a car pulls up. I drunkenly mumble something like, is this the Uber? And I hop in. Mistake. Ubers apparently are supposed to have some kind of marking on their vehicle. The guy pulls away and starts driving, we're chatting, I'm fumbling for a cigarette and the next thing I notice is that we're headed for the highway, but in the opposite direction of where I thought we needed to drive, and we're going at a solid 90 miles per hour. Then I get a call from an Uber driver, he's there and I'm not, because I'm in the car with someone else. I start texting my friend frantically counting off mile markers for her. Then I realize that's going to do Jack, because she's probably drunk too. So I call 911, but I realize this guy is crazy. He's refusing to let me out of the car, so I've got to do it on the sly. It's been about 40 minutes now, I'm terrified. I don't know where I am, I don't know who this is, we're driving at over 100 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic. This guy is trying to get me to hang up my phone call. And also smoking pot, so I don't want to do anything that might provoke a violent reaction from him. I start chatting to the 911 dispatcher as if it's my friend, praying that they'll catch on. Hey girl, it's me. Yeah, I'm with someone right now. We're driving past highway exit. No sweetie, it's not my Uber. I thought it was, but it's not. It's a shame you can't come and meet me and bring friends. Thankfully, the operator catches on. He gets me to stay on the phone while he sends cops, and we develop a code. If I see cops, I'm supposed to casually put my hand out the window, which looks semi-normal because I'm smoking a cigarette. We pull into some random little housing complex, and he busts out some powder and forms two lines. I now have confirmation that he does drugs, which means he's probably emotionally volatile. I relay this to the operator in code, oh girl, I wish you were here right now. This guy just busted out the coke. You'd love it. He's taken a really big bump, man after my own heart, etc. Pretty soon, I can see the lights from the the cop car so I start waving my hand out the window. At this point I don't care if he's onto me or not. I don't know if he has a weapon but I slump down on my seat just in case things get hot. The cops surround us, get him out of the car, and then once it's safe they extricate me as well. They whisk me to the hospital for a drug test and evaluation and that's where my story ends. On my way to the hospital as I'm explaining all of this to the officer, I find out that of the guy's 40-ish years on this earth, he's been in federal prison for 30 of them for violent offenses. I want people to learn from my mistakes and if nothing else call 911 and stay on the line. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For background, I'm a 24 year old woman living in Australia and work at an establishment that caters for an adult audience. One night, as my shift is coming to a close, one of the patrons asks me to buy a drink, which I accept because employer policy. I talk him up to a couple of expensive drinks for the two of us, have a quick conversation, and make my excuses about my shift being over, but he should come back to see me soon. He starts to gaze at me and it feels uncomfortable. He stands up and with his creepy grin asks to walk me to my car. I know never to put myself in that position and politely decline and I tell him I might see him next time. I walk out past our biggest bouncer and the guy doesn't follow me. Great, nothing extraordinary, just standard par for the course of my profession. 
but sadly this isn't where our story ends. For this creep, it's only just the beginning. I'm off for a week after that night, but when I come back into work, I'm told a Patreon has been coming in every night for the last week asking for me. He says he wants to buy me another drink. Naively, I think, oh great, a bigger pay this week, and gets set for my shift. The night rolls on and who should roll in but our man of the hour, and he asks for me. So I saunter over and he buys me a drink. The whole thing I'm sitting there with him, he just has this creepy grin on his face. Not like a normal creepy grin, that's just normal. No, this is the kind of grin where he knows something you don't and is very pleased with himself about that fact. So we're talking and I'm getting him ordering himself drinks and trying to upsell him where I can. About half an hour goes by and I make my excuses to leave so I can try to spread the tips around. But this guy isn't having it, he won't let me leave and the more I insist the angrier he gets. He's practically hissy at me by the time I give a look to one of the bouncers, who promptly comes over and diffuses the situation, giving me an opportunity to walk away. Great, crisis averted, wrong. Bouncer doesn't throw him out, just gives me a buffer so this guy starts following me around the place, even attempting to walk into an employee-only area which is where another bouncer finally notices and kicks him out. I finish my shift and walk over to my car. There he is, I kid you not, sitting on the bonnet of my car. How he knew it was my car I will never know. He wants me to give him a ride and tells me how pretty I look. He's spewing greasy slimeball creep lines at this point and I'm not interested. I try to give him a hint nicely and decline to give him a ride, but again he just turns to me and grabs me by my arm insisting I give him a ride. I tell him to screw off and jam my key in his shoulder as hard as I can. He lets go and I push him with all my might so he falls down. I jump in my car, lock the door, and shove that key in the ignition. He's back up and banging on the window angrily to let him in. And I mean hard, so hard I think his hands or my window might break. I gun the accelerator and I'm out of there. When I get 5 minutes down the road and I'm sure I'm not being followed, I pull over to the side of the road and call back to work. I tell them what's happened and alert them that the other girls need to be careful leaving tonight. As I hang up the phone I break into tears. I eventually compose myself, pull back into the road and head home. I cry myself to sleep. Next morning word has gotten around and owner calls me to make sure I'm okay. I assure him I am but he insists I take some time off in case this creep comes back. He wants to put some distance between us, makes sense. A week goes by, then two, he's coming in every night asking about me and being told I quit and don't work there anymore. I lie to get him to stop coming in, you know, but he just keeps coming in and asking, clearly not buying it and then suddenly two and a half weeks in, he stops. Great, I am really needing money at this point so I'm happy to be able to go back to work the following week. Time goes on and everything seems to go back to normal. Same old chances but the good kind that leads to higher paychecks. Abusive guy doesn't come back in, I'm happy. I start being forgetful though. I think I leave a door closed when I leave the house but it's open when I get back. Lights on or off, food left out, things ending up in different places than I remember putting them sometimes moments before. I'm losing it but it's probably just the stress of everything that's gone down. One of my close friends who works with me reassures me that it's normal after being grabbed like that and it will pass. This keeps up for a month until one day I head out to work, get 15 minutes down the road and realize I forgot some clothes I'll need that night at work. I head back home only to find the lights in my front room on and the TV visible as on from the outside. I really am losing it, good thing I came back I guess. I head inside, grab my stuff, make sure to turn the TV off and the light out and head to the door. Suddenly I freeze, there standing blocking the door is the creep that grabbed me. I'm stunned, jaw dropped on the floor. Then after what seems like a lifetime of standing in silence staring at each other, him smiling, I scream what the, I'm screaming for him to get out and ask him what he's doing here, how he knows where I lived, all in one jumbled mouthful of confusion. He just stands there with that smile on his face while I'm loudly freaking out but stupidly not moving. I start gasping for air in a mixture of panic attack and bewilderment, then he decides to speak in my wake. The words ooze out of him and leave me chilled. Welcome home honey, you're back early. A switch goes off in my head, I throw everything I have on me at him and sprint to the back door. I'm out ski. I leg it faster than I have in my life, screaming bloody murder as I go. I hide in some bushes around the corner, tears running down my face, gasping for air. I check my pocket and my keys are still there, no phone though, I threw that at the stalker creep along with everything else. I sneak back to my house, jump in my car and dope out of there. I head to work, tell them what's happened and call the cops. Cops head to my house and send others to my work. Stalker guy is gone but when they turn up, they search the house and turns out he's been living in my crawl space. I'm paranoid that's what all those doors and lights and misplaced things was about. I pack up whatever I can fit in my car while cops are still there, that they'll let me take and I drive. Haven't been back since. I moved states, knew everything. This happened around 2006, when I was in my mid-twenties and my sister, the unfortunate main character in the story, had just turned 21. At the time, she and her boyfriend lived with my fiancé and I. On weekends, we went out to one of the two bars that had karaoke, air hockey, etc. This particular night, we were at the bar further out from where we lived in the city, a good half an hour by car. 
Everyone was having drinks, socializing with people we knew. It was one of those places, lots of regulars, singing karaoke, nothing out of the ordinary really. Except that night my sister started hanging out with these two older ladies who had a liquor store in their purses, and were quite sharing, although I didn't know it at the time. As she tended to drink a lot more than me, that was a score for her. Less money spent on drinks, but she ended up far more hammered than usual. Towards the end of the night, around 1.45, she was really very drunk. The aforementioned fiancé, my sister's boyfriend, and I were in a heated air hockey game, planning to leave as soon as it was over. She walked up to us and said she was going to smoke a cigarette outside. Nothing unusual, everyone did until we were done. About 5 minutes later, we paid our tab and walked out, but she was not on the porch area where smokers congregated. Okay, weird, but not alarming. We went out back of the bar to check for her, inside, in the restroom, in the large parking lot. It is notable that this particular bar was in a business park, so there were multiple businesses that were closed, as well as the Mexican restaurant next door that had just closed as well. We searched, asked everyone that knew us and those who didn't if they had seen her. No one had. I asked the workers from the restaurant that were sitting outside as well. They seemed nervous when telling me they hadn't seen her, but I didn't think on that much until later. By then I was in a full on panic after trying to call her cell about 15 times only to have a good voicemail. Being a bit inebriated myself, I started searching for her. Went as far as to take off my heels and start running down the highway searching for her as, honestly there had been times she would start walking home in the past, though never from this place as it was so far away from where we lived. The fiance and her boyfriend thought we should go to the house to see if she got someone to bring her home. Seemed unlikely but not unheard of. We get home and she's nowhere to be found. Just as we were about to head back and I was going to phone the police, I received a call from the PD on my phone. They indicated that they had my sister, that there had been an incident, and I needed to get down there. We rushed to the PD where we were taken into a room with my sister. Her face was red from obvious crying and bruises were starting to show on her arms and chest. She said that when she told us she was going outside, she thought we said we were leaving then, so she walked to the car. After a few minutes being drunk and tired, she sat down up against it to wait. A van pulled up and a young man was asking her directions to somewhere. She walked closer to try to explain when suddenly the back door flew open and two other men grabbed her and threw her in, taking off. They were rough with her, hitting her a few times while holding her down, saying they only wanted money. They snatched her purse from her, breaking the straps and searched it, quite haphazardly as they didn't find the $30 she had in it. After driving around a bit speaking in Spanish, she couldn't understand they pulled out a gun, making sure she saw it and put a bandana around her eyes, telling her that they'd let her go. She was driven to some woods by a neighborhood she did not know. The door was opened and they pushed her out, telling her to run, that if she took the blindfold off or turned around, they'd shoot. She ran and ran. Eventually, she did take the blindfold off and came to the first door she saw, beating on it and screaming for help. The police were called, she was picked up, and now we are back to my being there, hearing what I feared had happened. Report filed, police did a search and did locate the bandana she ripped off, but as she was so intoxicated and terrified, she was not able to give a clear description of the van other than white older model or the three occupants other than young Hispanic men. The investigation turned up nothing as no cameras caught any of this. We even had detectives in our home who said, look, we need the truth. If you got drunk and just went home with someone and didn't want your boyfriend to find out, we will file charges against you. Aside from the bruises, broken person, or trauma, there was nothing concrete to go on. That was unpleasant. I am still fairly convinced someone at the restaurant knew something given their suspicious behaviors when I asked about her, but the police were never able to find that link. All said and done, the guys were never found. Eventually, we just moved on. In different states, it's now just a story in our lives. It still makes me sick thinking of what could have happened, but thankfully it didn't. A little backstory, I was about 16 at the time, and I rode the public bus to and from school. This particular day, I had done some special effects makeup before the end of my classes, so I had fake blood running down my face and I couldn't be bothered to take it off before leaving school. Now I knew as I was boarding my bus, people would stare or ask questions, so I wasn't surprised when this man, who looked to be in his mid-30s, started asking about the makeup. The conversation was normal at first, just the usual, oh wow, did you do that yourself, kind of stuff. I answered the questions as normally as I would, and expected the conversation to be done and over with. But I was wrong. This man, he mentioned his name was Joe, started steering the conversation into strange territory, asking me if I had a boyfriend, to which I lied and said I did. He then proceeded to ask if my boyfriend liked the makeup and if I was on my way to see him now. I again lied and said he likes the makeup and yes, I was going to see him, trying to get Joe to believe someone was expecting me. The conversation died down for a bit until he said this, You know, you remind me a lot of my sister. He said with a grin. 
I just smiled in response, not really knowing what to say. After not hearing anything from me, Joe continued, My sister was kind of a jerk. She was always lying about me to her parents. I had fantasies about breaking her jaw. Now at this point, I was terrified. My bus stop was still another 20 minutes away, and I just wanted to be out of that situation. Seeing that what he said made me uncomfortable, he switched the subject, telling me about where he worked and what he does there. I just nodded along to what he was saying, remaining silent the entire time. Closer to my bus stop, he says to me, why don't you come to my house? I have a freezer full of pizza and ice cream. Maybe we could hang out for a while. To which I politely declined, saying my boyfriend was expecting me. Finally, I get to my bus stop and quickly get off the bus, speed walking all the way home, all the while calling a friend to inform them of what happened. Things were fine for a bit after that. I switched my bus route so I wouldn't run into him again. But one afternoon, I had to go to a store that was on my old route. I was nervous about getting on that bus again, but was happy when I didn't see Joe. I did my shopping, and as I was leaving the store, I saw Joe, standing out by the door, staring at me. The second I was out the doors, he walked over to me, a grin on his face, and wrapped his arms around me. I pulled away from him, telling him I was very busy and had to go. He then asked, well, what are you doing? I have time, I can tag along. I was very persistent, saying I really couldn't, I had to go, and I walked away, heading into a neighboring store that I knew would be busy. Sure enough, Joe followed. I ignored him as I made my way down a heavily populated makeup aisle, keeping my attention on some cheap lipsticks in the hopes he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I was wrong. Joe reached over my shoulder, grabbing a red lipstick as he leaned in close and whispered, This color would look gorgeous on you. I can't wait to see you wearing it. He then placed the lipstick in my basket and walked away, leaving the store. I remained in the store for about 20 minutes after he left, afraid to leave and make the walk home. After I mustered up the courage, I put the lipstick back, put away the basket, and called a friend to stay on the line with me until I made it home. Now I don't know if he followed me home or not, but I can say that after that day, the motion detector porch lights started coming on at night, and I started hearing knocks at my bedroom window. Thankfully, I moved shortly after and haven't seen Joe since. This happened two summers ago, while I was house sitting out in California for an older couple I had met at a conference for work. It had seemed like a dream scenario, the couple wanted to vacation in Hawaii for two weeks, but didn't want to board their cats, and I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again, where they happened to live, because I had loved it for the first time I went, and we figured that we could mutually benefit if I came out and house sat for them. So I flew out there, and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to take care for the cats, two of them, one that was extremely shy and I barely saw, which is important later, and their plants gave me access to their house and cars. These people were so generous, and before I knew it I had dropped them off at the airport and I was on my own. At first, it was really the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and making forays into San Francisco, Sonoma, Monterey. In the mornings I could walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the paths surrounding nearby Mount Diablo, and I was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there even. But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back Back to the house I felt really odd, almost like I shouldn't go inside. I shook it off and went inside anyway because it was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt, and I made some food for myself, went to bed, and was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time I had ever seen her close up. The entire time I had been there up to that point, she never left my host bedroom unless she didn't realize I was around. Again, I ignored feeling weird, and just assumed she had decided I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door that night though. I also remembered that about halfway through that night, I thought I heard someone walking around in the gravel outside my window, but after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and went back to sleep. The day after, in the morning, I still felt a little odd, but kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a little musical festival in Sonoma and went clothes shopping and had an overall great day. When I got back to the house though, I found the front door locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower second lock, and that's the only lock my key worked on, so I never messed with the deadbolt, but it was definitely locked. So I had to call my host and find the hide key, which, to their credit safety wise, was buried like a whole foot underneath a bush outside and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time. So I used that, went inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did, but with a different door. This time I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink, and when I turned around to go back into the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door, but I was still getting pretty bewildered. My own cats were whack, so I think in my mind I was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out the house, but I was coming up empty. I decided I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked and just wrote it off and started checking and triple checking locks when I went out of the house or into the garage. That night when I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, and so was the shy cat, who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave my room. But again, I just locked my bedroom door and went to sleep. 
The next morning, I felt awful. Nausea, body ache, I had no desire to leave the house, so I decided to stay in and Netflix for a day. This vacation stay was like a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in any hurry to get all the touristy things in anyways. But as the days went on, I started to feel that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into feeling incredibly washed. Around mid-afternoon, it got to the point that I was so uneasy that, even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach and then I left. When I got to my car, I started crying and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I couldn't not though because I didn't want to neglect the cats. So I drove back, parked in the driveway, and convinced myself after about half an hour to just go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would get over it and would be able to go in and at least feed the cats. And then maybe I'd go get a hotel room after, but my body physically would not let me inside. It was like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house saying I had already called the police and that they were on their way. In panic logic, I figured that would make anyone in the house leave, so I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and I did just that. The second I had finished saying, they're almost here, so if you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in my host room turned on, and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to the car, called the police for real, and proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house and didn't find anyone. The double doors in my host bedroom were left wide open. I'm so glad the cats didn't get out, and there was a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds, so they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken, and that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room as I stayed home sick. To explain this, the house was in an L shape and from the windows into the garden that were in my host bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. Also, the minute the police were gone, they said they couldn't prove anyone was there, there were no signs of forced entry, and we couldn't get a hold of my host immediately to verify if anything had been taken, etc., which once they were back, they verified that nothing had been taken taken so, so they said they'd patrol a bit but nothing else. The shy cat was right back into my host bedroom and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. So basically, I think the intruder had been there at least two days, forcing her to choose between two strangers and leading her to choose the one that was at least a little less strange, me. It messed me up pretty bad, especially because they didn't catch the person and didn't seem to have any desire to look, and I still had to stay in that house for the next three days. Nothing else odd happened and I didn't feel off the rest of the time I was there, but the damage was done. I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed since, but I am extremely glad my gut spoke up. I guess I'd rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. So about 5 years ago, I, male 26 years old, set out to travel the world. Being straight out of college had left me dead, ever more desperate for any job I was overqualified for and generally depressed. I felt isolated and alone in my small town in Washington and found the only way to get out, travel. My high school buddy suggested I look into Wu Fai Ji and volunteering as a way to travel cheap, and so I did. The way it works is quite simple, you work for around 25 hours a week on some farm for food and housing. The draw is that since the community of cheap travelers is quite big, it is a great way to meet new people, get outside of your comfort zone and just let yourself live and figure life out. Fast forward 8 months and I'm a seasoned cow patty shoveler. I started out in Washington, Oregon and went south to California. There, I was able to save some money I was paid under the table for some extra work and was now faced with a decision, where to go in the world. The excitement of being able to purchase a ticket to almost anywhere in the world got the best of me, and on the advice of my volunteering partner, I chose it at random. I went to a randomizer website and clicked the country button, Georgia. The country of Georgia. To say I didn't know anything about it was an understatement, but the fear of the unknown made it exciting and exotic somehow, and so I did it. I purchased a ticket and started browsing for a farm that could host me. There were a few options, and most were remote and hadn't even had an internet connection. I messaged every single one because few ever respond and got a response from one farm on top of a mountain. The pictures showed a traditional Georgian stone house with a large garden out in the back, a family with several cheerful children, grandparents having dinner, animals, it seemed warm and inviting. The description was written in good English and the requirements for work seemed reasonable. I was excited. After I flew into Tbilisi, the capital, I followed the instructions that they have sent to locate the farm, which wasn't an easy task. Few in Georgia speak English, the roads are screwed since few have been maintained since the fall of the Soviet Union and the country is generally poor. It took me around 20 hours of Soviet buses and taxis, weird serpentine roads and paths to get to the desired blue pin on my map. It was a dirt path leading up a steep hill into a national park up in the north of the country. There was nothing for miles on end but trees in their silence. As I got up that hill, I saw the house about half a mile away on even a steeper hill, surrounded by the trees. From that viewpoint, it seemed abandoned, overgrown, brown, and dreary. 
As I walked past the gate, Giri, fake name, the apparent owner approached me. He was a heavy, small, middle-aged guy with a big smile on his face. He shook my hand and in broken English started to show me around. He also smelled a booze. As he was showing me around, I noticed that there wasn't anyone there but us. I asked about his wife and kids and he brushed that aside and said something to the extent, they're away right now. By this point, I am creeped out. From browsing around, it was apparent that the farm was in deep decline. Apple trees and crops were dying, the roof of the small barn caved in, and the house itself full of trash and smelling of mold. It was obvious that Giri was going through a rough patch, but I wasn't going to turn around and just leave in the middle of nowhere, without a plan, having not slept for the past 36 hours. It was evening, and after feeding me well and trying as best as he could to hold a conversation in English, Giri showed me my room on the second floor and I went to sleep. I almost immediately blacked out from the exhaustion and stress, and would have slept for 10 hours if I wasn't awoken by a strange noise in the middle of the night. It sounded like something metallic and heavy was being dragged across the wooden floor, and that sleepy in-between state, I listened to it for a few minutes, thought nothing Nothing of it and went back to sleep once it stopped. In the morning, Giri, now sober and grumpy, asked me to repair some of the windows and doors in the house as he himself planned to go and fetch some components in a nearby village. Again, I got this weird feeling creeping down my spine. Something wasn't right. He didn't maintain eye contact and was evasive. There was no cell reception, no internet. Once he left, I checked around the house to get a general idea of the place, and it became apparent that the place was hardly ever lived in, like one of those abandoned houses. There was broken furniture, newspapers, and old photos on the floor, a shattered mirror, I took my phone and looked through the saved listing again. The photos didn't match neither the backyard, the garden, or the walls. Yuri wasn't in any of them. It was a completely different house. Now by this point, I am full-blown panicking. I pack my stuff and start to leave when I see a group of three men going up that first hill. There aren't any other paths I can take, so I go behind the house and rush down this hill into the forest. After some time, I stop and listen. I hear them in the house. They're clearly looking for me. Afraid of making any noise, I remain still, hidden behind a bush. I don't know how long I wait, but they were persistent. At some point, I hear them leave, so I count until some large number and proceed back into the house and path, and once I find it's all clear, I book the heck out of there. Never ran this fast. But I am still in the middle of nowhere. No traffic, no public transport. I reach a paved road and start walking in the general direction from where I remember coming. Hours go by and finally, a car drives by and stops. It was a really nice Russian family that gave me a ride to town. The listing disappeared from the website a few days later I left, and I haven't heard from Geary since. I've yet to make sense of that experience. I have traveled since and volunteered too and have yet to have an experience like that again, but I trust my gut feeling something was really not right. More than a few years ago, I was working as a burlesque entertainer in a gentleman's club. It was idly sitting at the end of the bar one night when a couple came in. Not unusual. I had no contact with them and thought nothing of their being there until later. A few days after that night, the doorman handed me a piece of paper that had two names and phone numbers written on it. Laura and Richard. I was supposed to call one of them, so I called Laura, who told me they had been the couple who'd been at the bar the other night. And they noticed me and thought I'd be perfect for a part in a movie Richard was producing. Would I be up for a meeting? Of course I would. Who wouldn't? I was told Richard would pick me up the next night at 7 and to wear something wild. 7 o'clock came the next evening and I was ready in a white lace dress with ostrich feather trim when Richard showed up outside my building so I went down, introduced myself and got in the car. We agreed to go to a local bar I knew well for the meeting but first we had to go back to his place so he could pick up some contracts he'd forgotten so off we went. He went in the house and came back out with a few manila envelopes and an open bottle of beer, a brand that I didn't drink. Plus, it's against the law to drink alcohol in a vehicle here so I stuck the beer into the window well of his jeep and we went to the bar. At the bar, he showed me what were supposedly scripts from this movie he was producing. In some contracts, it looked pretty legit. Richard was very nice and I was interested. I had made some plans to go out later with my soon-to-be boyfriend, so I excused myself to go call him on the bar's payphone and took my corona that I'd ordered at the bar with me to the bank of phones. As a dancer, I'd been taught by the other older girls to never let your drink out of sight. My boyfriend wanted to get going to another club, so I went back to the table where Richard was and told him I had to go. He didn't like that and tried a few different things to get me to go to the movie set with him, saying I could meet Mickey Rourke and check out the set. But all I really wanted to do was meet my boyfriend, so I declined, took Richard's card, and left. I never heard from Richard again, but a couple of months later, the police came around to the bar I was working at. They had two big books of mug shots and a stack of Polaroids with them, and they wanted to talk to all of us about a predator couple who had been setting up meetings with dancers by saying they were in the film industry, then drugging them. They showed me the two mug shot books and asked if I saw anyone I recognized in the pictures and I immediately identified Richard and Laura. They then showed me the Polaroids, which were trophy pictures of the couple in the act of attacking the poor drug girls, and asked if I knew any of the victims and where they might find them, in order to talk to the girls. I only knew a couple of women in the photographs, but there were a lot that this had happened.
happened too. Richard and Laura were prosecuted. He went to jail, but she didn't because she was from a wealthy family and she also turned witness on him. About 12 years after Richard was convicted, I saw in the newspaper that he was up for possibility of parole. So I wrote a letter to the parole board telling this story and urging them not to let him back out because he's a dangerous offender who should have to stay in prison for the entirety of his sentence. If I had drank that open beer he had handed me in his Jeep on the way to that meeting, I wouldn't have made it to the meeting and would probably have ended up in that stack of Polaroids. Girls and guys, always, always keep your eye on your drinks. Have fun, but be careful out there. So this happened about a year and a half ago. I moved to Los Angeles three years ago. First time living on my own and I love it. Even with everything that happened, I still love living here. So I'm a smoker, on average about three to four cigarettes a day. So thankfully I'm only at a pack, like every five or six days, whatever. Math isn't my strong suit. Anyway, I live in a non-smoking building so I have to step outside when I want to smoke. The first time I saw this guy, he was outside my building, sitting next to a dumpster. No big deal, probably just another neighbor I hadn't met. His name is Oz. The first time I I saw Oz, I was having a cigarette outside, and he just glanced over at me every once in a while, but that's it. Two days later, it's like 11.30pm and I'm heading downstairs to smoke. I look at the lobby of the building and see someone underneath a blanket behind some chairs. I see a cord going behind the blanket bulge, so I immediately assume someone's in the doghouse for the night and charging their phone. I have my smoke, head back upstairs, and go to sleep. A week later, it's the middle of the day. I've gotten some work done and decide to take a smoke break. I go and sit outside like I always do. Oz is sitting outside as well. This time he's got some paperwork with him. A lot of paperwork. At this point, I feel like I should provide a description of Oz. He's about 6 feet tall, early to mid 30s. He has a medium length hair that has been styled into dreadlocks. A full but short beard, if that makes sense. He was wearing worn down pants and jackets. Based on his face, he seemed like he cleaned himself up regularly, but his clothes made him look homeless, and sadly he was. So Oz is going over the paperwork in his hands when he looks over at me and says hi. So I responded kind. He then asked me how I'm doing today. I'm doing pretty okay, I respond. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Good. It's a nice day, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. So when are you moving? Now, that question came out of nowhere. Was he hoping to find a new place to live? Was he trying to move into this building? Was that what his paperwork was all about? I mean, if he's moving into a new apartment, great. I hope life works out well for him. But why was he asking me when I'm moving out? I know the building at the time had a vacancy or two, so if he was going to move in, why ask a question like that? Why make it sound like he's waiting for someone to move out so he can have a spot? My brain asked all those questions in less than a second of boss asking me that. After a couple seconds of being being stunned by Oz's question, I just said, I'm not moving anytime soon, man. My cigarette was over by then, so it was time for me to go to my apartment. Another week later, I go see a friend's stand-up set, and when I get back to my apartment at like 10pm, I see two police SUVs outside my building with lights on. I go inside because if there are two police vehicles already there, I can't do anything so might as well stay out of the way. The cops are talking to one of my downstairs neighbors, and I can't catch anything they're talking about. Two days later, notices have been put up next to the mailboxes that say, this man is not allowed in this building and it has a photo of Oz. Turns out the blanket bulge I saw was actually Oz, when he somehow managed to get inside the building and sleep in the lobby with an electric blanket. A couple of months go by and I don't see Oz. I honestly forgot about him by that point. When finally one day, Oz is there again, sitting outside the building with somehow even more paperwork. This time when he sees me, he's almost immediately hostile. So when are you getting out of here? What? I want my apartment back, man. I don't know what you're talking about. You stole my apartment and I want it back. I was so confused by this. I snuffed my cigarette out and went back into the building. This exchange pretty much repeated itself every few days for the next two weeks, each time making me more and more uncomfortable. On weekdays, I would get home very late, like anywhere between 11.30pm and 2am. Oz never had a predictable pattern to his appearances, so I started getting really nervous about going home. Like, I wanted to avoid going home so I could avoid being accosted by Oz. Finally, one Saturday after lunch, I step outside and have a smoke. Oz is there, and this time he's mad. He's saying that if I don't get out of his apartment by the end of the day, he'll get me. That shook me up a lot. I got back inside and stayed there. Around midnight, I decided to step outside and have a smoke, hoping against hope that Oz isn't there. But lo and behold, Oz is there. Wizard. He's sitting by the dumpster again, and I go to the opposite direction to inhale smoke. I see Oz go up to the stoop and stand in front of the door to the building. Great. With my second cigarette is done, I head to the stairs to get into my building. Oz steps to block me from getting to the door. Excuse me, I say as I try to go past him, but he stops me. You ain't getting in here, he says. Why? Because you don't live here. Yes, I do. No, you don't, man. You don't live here. Yeah, I do live here. Now, please move out of my way. Maybe if I stay kind, he'll let me go home, but no, he doubled down. Nah, man, you can't get in here because you don't live here. For the last time, I live here. Prove it, man. You got paperwork? Yes, I have a lease. Where? I was getting really irritated at this point, so my answer started becoming really cold. 
Like I was getting pretty rude to this guy. I don't carry it with me everywhere I go. Now move aside and let me in. No, now you need to get out of here. Move. Nah, now you need to get out of here or I'm calling my security team. No, you need to move or I'm calling the cops. Do it, man. My security guys are already on their way. They're going to screw you up. At this point, I was already stepping away from the door and pulling out my phone. I called the non-emergency number because in the moment I didn't feel threatened by Oz, but I should have called regular dispatch instead of non-emergency. Cops got there about half an hour later and Oz was still there. The cops came and got out of their car. One cop was holstering their nightstick and dropped it on the ground, then holstered it properly. The two cops that showed up separated and talked to Oz and I separately. I tell my cop that I was just trying to get back into my building, he's blocking me. He's been harassing me lately saying I need to move out. Oz, however, had a very different story. He claimed that I stole his apartment from him, stole his credit cards, and stole his insurance payouts. The apartment he claimed I stole from him isn't the apartment I live in. The cherry on top of this lack of a Sunday is the part where he accused me of throwing dog water on him. And an actual water bottle filled with a mixture of dog spit and water. That's the guess I have as to what dog water is. First he claimed I threw it up at him while I was standing on the sidewalk and he was on the stoop. Then he claimed I was on the fire escape above him and literally poured the water on him from above. Thankfully the cops knew immediately that this was a lie, but because I guess no actual crime had been committed, all they could do was tell Oz to go away. He was not happy about it, but he did. I hoped that Oz would not come back after that, but sadly I was wrong. Oz did come back just one last time. A few days later, it's the middle of the day and I'm walking downstairs to inhale fire. As I step outside, I see two cops, Oz and one of my downstairs neighbors. Oz and my neighbor are separated and giving statements to the cops. When my neighbor is done, his name is John. I go up to him and ask him what happened. John then shows me his elbows, both scraped up and lightly bleeding. One of his knees is also lightly cut up. Oz also had a couple of bruises and light cuts on him. John tells me that as he was trying to enter the building earlier, Oz was standing right outside and tried to force his way in. John stopped him and tried to tell him to leave. The two got into a small fight and the cops were called. I decide to sit outside with John while everything is being figured out and while John is waiting for his wife, a nurse, to get home and look him over. The manager of the building is called and helps the cops to look at the security camera footage for the front of the building. After looking at it for about 10 minutes, the cops and manager return. Sadly, the fight took place outside of view of the cameras. So it became a case of he said he said, so all the cops can do is tell Oz to leave once again. Since then, I have not seen Oz anywhere near my building and a sign has been put up outside the building stating, this building is not open to the public, no unauthorized entry, which is both comforting and disconcerting. This event took place quite a few years ago, so unfortunately I don't remember everything that happened, but I remember nearly all of it. Anyways, this happened when I was around 4-5 to five years old and on Easter Sunday. My family always gathers at my grandmother's house to celebrate holidays, birthdays, etc. So as we do every holiday, my mother and I started our hour-long trip to her house. My mother prefers to live away from all the city commotion, which explains the long drive. We were probably around 20 minutes away from our destination when my mom noticed that we were a little low on gas, so we pulled into this old, almost rustic looking gas station with just a handful of customers inside. It was red and white with a few festive decorations outside and lots of Easter stickers from the two large glass windows that were on either side of the door. My mom, having taught me not to talk to strangers nor open the doors for anyone but her, trusted me enough to leave me in the car alone as she went inside briefly to pay for gas. She told me she would be right back before going into the gas station. It felt nice that day, so the windows in the car were down so we could feel the breeze while driving instead of the AC. While I was waiting on my mom, I remember adjusting the colorful paper clippings in my Easter basket next to me, then looking out of the backseat window. When I looked over, I saw a tall, older man, maybe around 30 or 40 years old, approaching my window. He crouched down slightly and looked at me, Hi there, what's your name? I remember him saying. At this moment, I remember that I wasn't supposed to talk to strangers, so I told the man that my mom says I shouldn't speak to strangers. He then replied with, Well, we could be friends then. My name's Charlie, and now that you know, I guess I'm not a stranger now, huh? At the time, I thought he was right. In my mind, I thought, since a stranger is someone you don't know, this man wasn't a stranger anymore because I knew his name. The man and I had a short conversation that I don't quite remember. All I remember is him telling me that I had a nice Easter basket. At this point, I started to get a sick feeling in my stomach, but being a child, of course, I didn't know why. My mom then walked out of the gas station and noticed the man immediately and began approaching the car quickly asking the man what he thinks he's doing. The man seems to panic and he pulls my door handle violently. He quickly realized that it was locked, thankfully, and proceeded to reach into my window and grab me by one of my wrists and attempt to pull me out. This obviously scared me a lot causing me to panic and pull him against on instinct. This caused him to let go and take off running. My mom quickly ran to the car and I unlocked the doors. She grabbed me and pulled me into an almost painful bear hug. 
then inspecting me closely repeatedly asking if I was okay. I ended up with a slight bruise slash redness on my arm where he grabbed me, but other than that I was just shaken up. The reality of what had just happened set in at this moment and I remember just crying and holding until my mom right after I said I was okay. I don't remember anything after this point, but I recently asked my mom about it and she said that she called the police immediately after. To this day, my mom still says that this was the most frightening moment of her life and claims that if she had gotten there any later and came back to an empty car, she wouldn't have been able to live with herself. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.